61. There had been a flurry of activity and tight-beamed conversation on the bridge of the Queen Mab as another mazered message came in from the voice on the asteroid city on polar Earth orbit. But it was only a repeat of the previous rendezvous coordinates, and after five minutes confirming this, and with no other message following, the principal Moravex met back at the chart table. Where were we? said Orfu of Io. You were about to present your theory of everything, said Prime Integrator Astig Che. And you said you knew who the voice is, said Cho Li. Who or what is it? I don't know who the voice is, answered Orfu, vocalizing in soft rumbles rather than tight beaming or transmitting on the standard in ship comm channels. But I have a pretty good guess. Tell us, said General Bey Bin Adi. The Beltmoravex tone did not suggest a polite request so much as a direct order. I'd rather explain my entire theory of everything first, and then tell you about the voice, said Orfu. It'll make more sense in context. Proceed, said Prime Integrator Astig Che. Monmouth heard his friend take in a full breath of O2, even though the Ionian had weeks or months of reserve in his tanks. He wanted to tight-beam his friend the question, Are you sure you want to go ahead with this explanation? But since Monmouth himself had no clue as to what Orfu was going to say, he remained silent. But he was nervous for his friend. First of all, said Orfu of Io, you haven't released the information yet. But I'm pretty sure you've identified most of the million or so satellites that make up Earth's polar and equatorial rings that we're so quickly approaching. And I bet that most of the objects aren't asteroids or habitations. That is correct, said Astig J. Some of them we know to be early post-human attempts at creating and corralling black holes, continued Orfu. Huge devices like the wormhole accumulator that you showed us crashing into that other orbital asteroid city nine months ago. But how many of those are there, a few thousand? Fewer than two thousand, confirmed Astig Che. It's my bet that the bulk of the rest of the million things that the post-humans put in orbit are data storage devices. I don't know what kind, DNA maybe although that would require constant life support, so they're probably bubble memory combined with some sort of advanced quantum computer with some complicated post-human memory storage that we Moravex haven't discovered yet. Orfu paused, and there was a silence that seemed to stretch on for hours to Monmouth. The various prime integrators and Moravec leaders were not looking at one another, but Monmouth guessed that they had a private tight-beam channel and that they were conferring. Astig Che finally broke the silence, which had probably lasted only seconds in real time. They are mostly storage devices, said the Prime Integrator. We're not sure of their nature, but they appear to be some sort of advanced magnetic bubble memory quantum wavefront storage units. And each unit is essentially independent, said Orfu. Its own hard disk, so to speak. Yes, said Astig Che. And most of the rest of the satellites in the rings, probably no more than ten thousand or so, are basic power transmitters, and some sort of modulated tachyon waveform transmitters. Six thousand four hundred and eight power transmitters, said the navigator Choli precisely 3,000 tachyon wave transmitters. How do you know this, Orfu of Io? asked Suma Four, the powerful Ganymedon. Have you hacked into our integrator comm channels or files? Orfu held two of his multi-segmented forward manipulator arms out, flat palms up. No, no, he said. I don't have enough programming knowledge to hack into my sister's diary, if I had a sister, or if she had a diary. Then how? began retrograde Sinapesson. It just makes sense, said Orfu. I have an abiding interest in human beings and their literature. Over the centuries, I've paid attention to those observations of Earth, the post-humans' rings, 
and the data about the few humans left on the planet that the Five Moons Consortium has made public knowledge. The Consortium has never released public information on the memory storage devices in orbit, said Suma Four. No, agreed Orfu. But it makes sense that's what those things are. All evidence fourteen centuries ago when they left the surface of the Earth was that there were only a few thousand post-human entities in existence. Isn't that right? That is correct, said Astig Jai. Our Moravec experts at the time weren't even sure these post-humans had bodies. Not bodies as we think of them, said Orfu. So they sure didn't need to build a million cities in orbit. That does not lead to the conclusion that the majority of the objects that are in Earth orbit are memory devices, said General Bey bin Adi. Monmouth found himself wondering what the punishment on this ship was for espionage. It does when you look at what the old-style humans have been doing on Earth for almost a millennium and a half, said Orfu of Io, and what they haven't been doing. What do you mean haven't been doing? asked Monmouth. He planned to stay silent during this conversation, but his curiosity was too great. First of all, they haven't been breeding like human beings breed, said Orfu. There were fewer than ten thousand of them for several centuries. And then that neutrino beam, guided by modulated tachyons, I understand from the astronomers' online publications, shot up from Jerusalem fourteen hundred years ago. A beam aimed at nowhere in deep space, and then suddenly there seemed to be no humans left, none. Only briefly, said Prime Integrator Astig Chai. Yes, but still, said Orfu. He seemed to lose track of what he was going to say, but then said, and then less than a century later there were about one million old-style humans scattered around the planet, evidently not descendants of those ten thousand or so who disappeared. No build-up of population, just wham, bang, thank you, ma'am. One million people out of nowhere. And what did that tell you? asked Astig Jai. The formidable little European seemed privately amused, rather as a teacher might be, when a student suddenly showed unexpected promise. It told me that these old styles weren't born to begin with, said Orfu of Io. They were decanted. Virgin birth? asked Cho Lee, the Callistan's odd voice dripping sarcasm. Of a sort, said Orfu, his easy rumbling tones suggesting that he'd taken no offense at the sarcasm. I think the post-humans have and had a million or so human memories and personalities and data on bodies stored in those orbital memory devices. Who knows? Perhaps one satellite per human being. And they restocked the herd, which leads to the explanation of why the population appears to have peaked at one million every few centuries, dropped to a few thousand, then jumped back to a million as if by magic. Why? asked Centurion leader Mapahu. As with Monmouth, the Rockvex soldier sounded honestly curious. Minimum herd population, said Orfu. The post-humans seem to have allowed the old styles to breed only to half of replacement numbers, that is, one baby per woman. And then, only when there had been a death. And I've read the conjecture that the old styles live exactly one Earth century and then disappear. Enough to keep the herd going, given climate changes or whatever. Not so many they could overbreed or wander off the reservation. But the population drops rapidly. Then every thousand years or so, they restock the herd to its maximum size of one million old styles. Because women have only one child, the population begins dropping until the next restocking. Where did you read that old-style humans lived precisely a century? asked Cho Lee. He sounded shocked. In the scientific Ganymedon, said Orfu. I've had a broadcast subscription for more than eight centuries. Prime Integrator Astig Chai held up his very humanoid hand. You'll have to pardon me, Orfu of Isle. But while I congratulate you on your deductions about the purpose of the orbital devices 
and about the precise longevity we've observed of the remaining hundred thousand old-style human beings, at least until recent months, during which time there's been quite a drop-off in population due to these attacks by creatures unknown. You said that you could tell us why there are Greek gods on Mars, who the voice is, how Mars was so miraculously terraformed, and what is causing the current quantum instability on both Earth and Mars. I'm getting to that, said Orfu. Do you want me to condense it and put the whole theory of everything into a high-speed tight beam squirt? That'd take less than a second. No, no need for that, said Prime Integrator Astigche, but perhaps speak more rapidly. We have less than three hours before we have to launch the dropship, or not, during the era-breaking maneuver. Orfu of Io rumbled on the subsonic levels in a way that Monmut had long interpreted as laughter. The old-style humans are clustered around some three hundred localized habitation centers on five continents of Earth, correct? said the Ionian. Correct, said Choli. And the populations around these nodes vary, said Orfu. Yet our telescopes have never picked up any signs of transport. No major roads in use, no aircraft, no ships. Not even quaint sailing ships like the one Monmut and I traveled the length of Mars Valis Marineris in. Not even an occasional hot air balloon. So we assumed that the old-style humans were quantum teleporting, even though our Moravec scientists could never perfect that mode of travel. It was a reasonable assumption, said Sumafor. Reasonable, agreed Orfu of Io, but wrong. We know now, because of the quantum data left by the so-called Olympian gods on Mars, and on the other dimensional Earth where the battle for Troy is still being fought, what real quantum teleportation looks like. We know its footprint, and what the old-style humans were doing to get from point A to point B ain't it. If the old-style humans aren't quantum teleporting, said Centurion leader Mapahu, then how have they been moving instantaneously from one place to the other on Earth for more than fourteen hundred years? The old-fashioned idea of teleportation, said Orfu. Storing all the data of a human being's body and mind and personality in code. Breaking down the matter into energy, beaming it, then reassembling it elsewhere. Just as in the old TV broadcast series from the Lost Era, Star Trek. Trek, corrected General Bey bin Adi. Aha, uh -huh, said Orfu of Io, another fan. The general clacked barbed killing claws in embarrassment or irritation. Our scientists long since determined that storing such incredible amounts of data would be impossible, said Cho Lee. It would require more terabytes of storage space than there are atoms in the universe. Evidently the post-humans found a way to build that memory storage, said Orfu, because the old-style humans have been teleporting their butts off for centuries. Not true quantum-level teleportation of the kind our friend Hockenberry or the Olympian gods carry off, but the crude mechanical ripping apart of molecules and reassembling of them somewhere else. Why would they do that for the old-style humans? asked Monmouth. Why such an incredible engineering project for a few hundred thousand people whom they treat almost like pets, like creatures in a zoo? We've seen no signs of new human engineering, city building, or creativity for more than that millennium and a half. Maybe the teleportation itself has something to do with that cultural retardation, said Orfu. Maybe not. But I'm convinced that's what we're looking at down there. It's a case of beam me up, Scooty. Scotty, corrected retrograde Cinepesson. Thank you, said Orfu. The Monmouth he tight beamed. That makes four of us. You may well be correct that the old style humans have been using a crude form of matter replication transmission rather than true quantum teleportation, said Astig J. But that doesn't explain Mars or. No, but the post-human's obsession with reaching another dimensional universe does, said Orfu, not even noticing in his excitement and pleasure of the telling that he was interrupting the most important prime integrator in all the Five Moons Consortium. 
How do you know the posts were obsessed with getting to another dimensional universe? asked General Bey bin Adi. Are you kidding? said Orfu. Monmouth had to think that the stern asteroid belt Rockvec general had not been asked that question many times in his life or military career. Just look at the junk the post-humans left behind in orbit, continued Orfu, oblivious to the military Moravex taken abackness. They have wormhole accumulators, black hole accelerators, all early attempts at ripping through space and time, taking shortcuts out into this universe or to another one. Black holes and wormholes don't work, the Callistan Choli said flatly, at least not as transport devices. Yeah, we know that now, and that's what the post-humans found out more than fifteen hundred years ago, agreed Orfu. Then, when they had these incredible memory storage satellites in orbit, plus the crude matter replication teleportation portals for the old-style humans, who I would wager they were using as guinea pigs in all this experimentation. Only then did the post-humans start messing around with brain holes and quantum teleportation. Our scientists and engineers have been messing around, as you put it, with quantum teleportation and the generation of Kalabi Yao universe membrane holes for many centuries, said retrograde Sinapesson. The Amalthean was so agitated that he was almost dancing on his long, spidery silver legs. With no luck, he added. That's because we didn't have the one thing that allowed the post-humans to make their breakthrough, said Orfu of Io, and paused. Everyone waited. Monmouth knew that his friend was enjoying the moment. The million human bodies, minds... Memories and personalities that were stored as digital data in their orbital memory satellites, said Orfu. His deep voice was triumphant, as if he'd solved some long-pondered mathematical conundrum. I don't get it, said Centurion leader Mapahu. Orfu's radar flickered over all of them, a feathery touch on the electromagnetic spectrum. Monmouth thought that his friend was waiting for their reactions, perhaps for their shouts of approval. No one moved or spoke. I don't get it either, said Monmouth. What is the human brain? Orfu asked rhetorically. I mean, all of us Moravacs have a piece of one. What is it like? How does it work? Like the binary or DNA computers we also carry around for thinking purposes? No, said Cho Li. We know that the human brain is not like a computer, neither is it a chemical memory machine, the way the lost era human scientists believed. The human brain, the mind, is a quantum state holistic standing wave front. Exactly, cried Orfu. The post humans used this intimate understanding of the human mind to perfect their brain holes, time travel, and quantum teleportation. I still don't see how said Prime Integrator Astig Che. Think about how quantum teleportation works, said Orfu. Cho, you can explain that better than I can. The Callistan rumbled and then modulated the rumbles into words. The early experiments in quantum teleportation, done by old-style humans in ancient times, as far back as the 20th century A.D., worked by producing entangled pairs of photons, and teleporting one of the pair, or actually by teleporting the complete quantum state of that proton, while transmitting the Bell state analysis of the second photon through regular subliminal channels. Doesn't that violate Heisenberg's principle and Einstein's speed of light restrictions? asked Centurion leader Mapahu, who, like Monmouth, had obviously not been briefed on the mechanisms by which the gods on Mars, Olympus, Mons, QT to Ilium. No, said Choli. Teleported photons carried no information with them when they moved instantaneously from place to place in this universe. Not even information about their own quantum state. So, quantum teleported photons are useless, said Centurion leader Mepahu, at least for communication purposes. Not quite, said Choli. The recipient of a teleported photon 
had a one in four chance of guessing its quantum state. The quantum photon had only that many possibilities. And by guessing, utilizing the quantum bits of data, these are called qubits, and we've successfully used them for instantaneous comm purposes. Monmut shook his head. How do we get from quantum state photons carrying no information to the Greek gods quantum teleporting to Troy? The imagination may be compared to Adam's dream, intoned Orfu of Io. He awoke and found it truth. John Keats. Could you try to be more cryptic? Summa Four asked caustically. I could try, said Orfu. What does the poet John Keats have to do with quantum teleportation? and the reason for the current quantum crisis, asked Monmouth. I suggest that the post-humans made their breakthrough in brain holes and quantum teleportation more than a millennium and a half ago, precisely because of their intimate knowledge of the holistic quantum nature of human consciousness, said the Ionian, his voice serious now. I've run some preliminary studies on the ship's quantum computer, Orfu continued, and when you represent human consciousness as the standing wavefront phenomenon it really is, factor in terabytes of qubit quantum date on the wavefront basis for physical reality itself, apply the proper relativistic Coulomb field transforms to these mind conscious reality wave functions, you quickly see how the post humans opened brain holes to new universes and then teleported there themselves. How? said Prime Integrator Astig Chai. They first opened brain holes to alternate universes in which there were points in space time where entangled pair wave fronts of human consciousness had already been, said Orfu. Huh? said Monmouth. What is reality except a standing quantum wave front collapsing through probability states? asked Orfu. How does the human mind work except as a sort of interferometer perceiving and collapsing those very wave fronts? Monmouth still shook his head. He'd forgotten about the other Moravecs standing on the bridge, forgotten that they might be taking his sub and the dropship down to Earth in less than three hours, forgotten the danger they were in, forgotten everything except the headache that his friend Orfu of Io was giving him. The post-humans were opening brain holes into alternate universes that had come into being through, or at least been perceived by, the focused lenses of pre-existing holographic wave fronts. Human imagination. Human genius. Oh, for the Christ's sake, said General Bey bin Adi. Possibly, said Orfu. If you assume an infinite or near-infinite set of alternate universes, then many of these have necessarily been imagined through the sheer force of human genius. Picture them as singularities of genius, bell state analyzers and editors of the pure quantum foam of reality. That's metaphysics, said Cho Lee in a shocked voice. That's bullshit, said Summa Four. No, that's what's happened here, said Orfu. We have a terraformed Mars with altered gravity, and are asked to believe that such terraforming could be achieved in a few years. That's bullshit. We have statues of Prospero on a Mars where Greek gods live atop Mount Olympus and commute through time and space to an alternate Earth where Achilles and Hector are fighting over the future of Ilium. That's bullshit. Unless... Unless the post-humans opened portals to precisely those worlds and universes earlier imagined by the force of human genius, said Prime Integrator Astig Chai. Which would explain the Prospero statues, the Calabanish creatures on Earth, and the existence of Achilles, Hector, Agamemnon, and all the other humans on Ilium Earth. What about the Greek gods, sneered Bey bin Adi. Are we going to meet Jehovah and Buddha next? We might, said Orfu of Io. But I would suggest that the Olympian gods we met are transformed post-humans. That's where the post-humans disappeared to fourteen hundred years ago.
Why would they choose to change into gods? asked retrograde Cinepesson. Especially gods whose powers come from nanotechnology and quantum tricks. Why would they not? asked Orfu. Immortality, choice of gender, sex with each other, and any mortal they choose to mate with, breeding many divine and mortal offspring, which is something the post-humans could not seem to do on their own, not to mention the decade-long chess game that is the Siege of Troy. Monmut rubbed his head. And the terraforming and gravity change on Mars? Yes, said Orfu. It probably took the larger part of fourteen hundred years, not three years. And that was with the gods' quantum technology at work. So there's a real Prospero down there or out there somewhere? asked Monmouth. The Prospero from Shakespeare's Tempest? Or something or someone close to it, said Orfu. What about the brain monster that came through the brain hole on Earth just a few days ago? asked Summa Four. The Ganymedean sounded angry. Is it a hero in your precious human literature? Possibly, said Orfu. Robert Browning once wrote a poem called Caliban upon Cetabos, in which the monster Caliban from Shakespeare's Tempest ponders his god, a creature called Cetabos which Browning had Caliban describe only as the many-handed as a cuttlefish. It was a god of arbitrary power that fed on fear and violence. That's quite a reach in speculation, said Astig Che. Yes, said Orfu, but so is the creature we photographed that looks like a giant brain scuttling around on giant human hands. An improbable evolution in any universe, wouldn't you say? But Robert Browning had an impressive imagination. Are we going to meet Hamlet down there on Earth? asked Summa Four with an audible sneer. Oh, said Monmouth. Oh, oh, that would be nice. Let's not get carried away, said Prime Integrator Astig Chai. Orfu, where did you get this whole idea? Orfu sighed. Instead of responding verbally... A holographic projector in the comm pod atop the huge Ionian's pitted and scarred carapace created an image that floated above the chart table. Six fat books sat in a virtual bookcase. One of the books, Monmouth saw that it was titled In Search of Lost Time, Volume 3, The Garmont Way, fluttered open to page 445. The image zoomed in on the type on the page. Monmouth suddenly realized that Orfu was optically blind. He couldn't see what he was projecting. It meant that he had to have all of Proust's six volumes memorized. The idea made Monmouth want to howl. Monmouth read along with the others as the font floated in midair. People of taste tell us nowadays that Renoir is a great 18th century painter. But in so saying, they forget the element of time and that it took a great deal of time, even at the height of the nineteenth century, for Renoir to be hailed as a great artist. To succeed thus in gaining recognition, the original painter or the original writer proceeds on the lines of the oculist. The course of treatment they give us by their painting or by their prose is not always pleasant. When it is at an end, the practitioner says to us, Now look! And lo and behold, the world around us, which was not created once and for all, but is created afresh as often as an original artist is born, appears to us entirely different from the old world, but perfectly clear. Women pass in the street, different from those we formerly saw, because they are Renoirs. Those Renoirs we persistently refused to see as women. The carriages, too, are Renoirs, and the water and the sky. We feel tempted to go for a walk in the forest, which is identical with the one which, when we first saw it, looked like anything in the world except a forest, like, for instance, a tapestry of innumerable hues, but lacking precisely the hues peculiar to forests. Such is the new and perishable universe which has just been created. 
It will last until the next geological catastrophe is precipitated by a new painter or writer of original talent. All the Moraveks by the chart table stood in silence, broken only by the ventilator hums, machine sounds, and soft background communication of the Moraveks actually flying the Queen Mab at that critical moment as they approached the equatorial and polar rings of Earth. Finally, General Bey bin Adi broke the silence. What solipsistic nonsense, what metaphysical garbage, what total horse manure! Orfu said nothing. Perhaps it is horse manure, said Prime Integrator Astig Chai. But it's the most plausible horse manure I've heard in the last nine months of surreality. And it's earned Orfu of Io a ride in the hold of the submersible the Dark Lady, when the dropship separates and drops into the Earth's atmosphere in two hours and fourteen minutes. Let us all go prepare. Orfu and Monmut were heading for the elevator, Monmut walking in a sort of daze, the huge Orfu floating silently on his repellers, when Astigche called out, Orfu! The Ionian swiveled and waited, politely aiming his dead cameras and eye stalks at the prime integrator. You were going to tell us who the voice is that we rendezvous with today. Oh, well, Monmut's friend sounded embarrassed for the first time. That's just a guess. Share it said Astig Chai. Well, given my little theory, said Orfu, who would demand in a female voice to see our passenger? Odysseus, son of Laertes. Santa Claus, suggested General Binadi. Not quite, said Orfu. Calypso. None of the Moraveks seemed to recognize the name. Or from the universe our other new friends came from, continued Orfu, the Enchantress, also known as Circe. 62. Harmon had drowned but was not dead. In a few minutes he would wish he were dead. The water, the golden fluid filling the dodecahedral crystal cabinet, was hyper-oxygenated. As soon as his lungs completely filled, oxygen began moving through the thin-walled capillaries of his lungs and re-entering his bloodstream. It was enough to keep his heart beating, start beating again, one should say, since it had skipped beats and stopped for half a minute during his drowning process, and enough to keep his brain alive, dulled, terrified, seemingly disconnected from his body, but alive. He could not breathe in. His instincts still cried out for air, but his body was getting oxygen. Opening his eyes was a huge struggle, and all it rewarded him with was a swirling vision of a billion golden words and ten billion throbbing images waiting to be born in his brain. He was vaguely aware of the six-sided glass panel of the flooded crystal cabinet and of a blurrier shape beyond, which might have been Moira, or perhaps Prospero, or even Ariel, but these things were not important. He still wanted to breathe air the correct way. If he had not been only semi-conscious, tranquilized by the liquid in preparation for the transfer, his gag reflex alone would probably have killed him or driven him insane. But the crystal cabinet reserved other means for driving him insane. The information began pouring into Harmon now. Information, Moira and Prospero had said, from a million old books. Words and thoughts from almost a million long-dead minds. More, because every book contained multitudes of other minds in its arguments, its refutations, its fervent agreements, its furious revisions and rebellions. Information began to pour in, but it was like nothing Harmon had ever felt or experienced before. He had taught himself to read over many decades, becoming the first old-style human being in uncounted centuries to make sense of the squiggles and curves and dots in the old books smoldering away on shelves everywhere. But words from a book flow into the mind in a linear fashion at the pace of conversation. Harmon had always heard a voice not quite his own reading each word aloud in his own mind after he learned to read. Sigling was a more rapid but less effective way to absorb a book. 
A nanotech function flowed the data from books down one's arms into the brain like coal being shoveled into a hopper, without the slow pleasure and context of reading. And after sigling a book, Harmon always found that some new data had arrived, but much of the meaning of the book had been lost due to absence of nuance and context. He never heard a voice in his head when sigling and often wondered if it had been designed as a function for old styles in the lost era to absorb tables of dry information, packets of pre-digested data. Sigling was not the way to read a novel or a Shakespearean play, although the first Shakespearean play Harmon had encountered was an amazing and moving piece called Romeo and Juliet. Until Harmon had read Romeo and Juliet, he'd not known that such a thing as a play existed. His people's only form of fictional entertainment had been the Turin drama about the siege of Troy, and that only for the past decade. But while reading was a slow linear flow and sigling was like a sudden tickling of the brain that left a residue of information behind, this crystal cabinet was... The maiden caught me in the wild where I was dancing merrily. She put me into her cabinet and locked me up with a golden key. This information Harmon was receiving was not entering through his eyes, ears, or any of the other human senses nature had evolved to bring data to the nerves and brain. It was not, strictly speaking, passing into him through touch, although the billion, billion pinpricks of information in the golden liquid passed through each pore of his skin and each cell of his flesh. DNA, Harmon knew now, likes the standard double helix model. Evolution had chosen the double helix for a variety of reasons to carry its most sacred cargo, but primarily because it was the easiest and most effective way for free energy to flow, forward or back, as that energy determines the folds, joins, forms, and function of such gigantic molecules as proteins, RNA, and DNA. Chemical systems always move toward the state of lowest free energy, and free energy is minimized when two complementary strands of nucleotides pair up like a double shaker staircase. But the posthumans who had redesigned the hardware and software of Harmon's branch of the old style human genome had redesigned a sizable percentage of the redundant DNA in his decanted species bodies. Instead of right-handed twisting B DNA, the posthumans had set in place left-handed Z DNA, double helixes of the usual size, about two nanometers in diameter. They used these Z DNA molecules as keystones, lifting from them a scaffolding of more complex DNA helixes, such as double crossover molecules, tying these ropes of DX DNA together into leak-proof protein cages. Within those billions upon billions of scaffolded protein cages deep within Harmon's bones, muscle fibers, gut tissue, testicles, toes, and hair follicles, were biological reception and organizing macromolecules serving still more complex caged clusters of nanoelectronic organic memory storage clusters. Harmon's entire body, every cell, was eating the Taj Moira's library of a million volumes. The cabinet is formed of gold and pearl and crystal shining bright, and within it opens into a world and a little lovely moony night. The process hurt. It hurt a lot. Drowned and floating belly up now like a dead carp in the golden liquid of the crystal cabinet, Harmon felt the pain of a leg or arm that had gone to sleep and that was slowly, painfully coming awake again, the limb being pricked by ten thousand sharp, hot needles. But this was not just his leg or his arm. Cells in every part of his body, cells on every surface inside and out, molecules in every cell's nucleus and every cell's wall were awakening to the data flowing the free energy route through the Yan Shen York DNA circuits everywhere in the collective organism called Harmon. It hurt beyond Harmon's ability to imagine or contain such hurt. 
He opened his mouth repeatedly to scream from the pain, but there was no air in his lungs, no air around him, and his vocal cords merely vibrated in the golden liquid in which he'd drowned. Metallic nanoparticles, carbon nanotubes, and more complex nanoelectronic devices everywhere in Harmon's body and brain. Elements that had been there since before his birth felt current were polarized, rotated, realigned in three dimensions, and began conducting and storing information. Each complex DNA bridge out of the trillions waiting in Harmon's cells, rotating, realigning, recombining, and securing data across the DNA backbone of his most essential structure. Harmon could see Myra's face near the glass, her dark, savvy eyes peering in, her crystal-warped expression expressing something anxiety, remorse, sheer curiosity. Another England there I saw, another London with its tower, another Thames and other hills, and another pleasant Surrey bower. Books, Harmon realized through the Niagaral cascade of pain, were merely nodes in a near-infinite matrix of information that exists in four dimensions, evolving toward the idea of the concept of the approximation of the shadow of truth vertically through time, as well as longitudinally through knowledge. As a child in his crush, Harmon had taken rare sheets of vellum and even more rare markers called pencils and covered the sheets with dots, and then spent hours trying to connect all the dots with lines. There always seemed to be another possible line to draw, another two dots to connect, and before he was done the sheet of creamy vellum had become an almost solid smear of graphite. In later years, Harmon had wondered if his young mind had been trying to capture and express his perception of the fax portals he had stepped through since he was old enough to walk. Old enough to be carried by his mother, actually. Nine million combinations rising from three hundred known fax node pavilions. But this connect the dots of information to storage macromolecule cages was thousands of times more complex and infinitely more painful. Another maiden like herself, translucent, lovely, shining clear, threefold each in the other closed. Oh, what a trembling fear. Oh, what a smile, a threefold smile filled me, that like a flame I burned, I bent to kiss the lovely maid, and found a threefold kiss returned. Harmon knew now that William Blake had made his living as an engraver and not that popular or successful an engraver at that. Everything is context. Blake died on a hot and muggy Sunday evening, August 12, 1827, and on the day of his death, almost no one in the general public knew that the quiet but often angry engraver had been a poet respected by several of his better-known contemporaries, including Samuel Coleridge. Context is to data what water is to a dolphin. Dolphins were a species of aquatic animal driven to extinction early in the 22nd century A.D. William Blake quite literally considered himself a prophet along the lines of Ezekiel or Isaiah, although he held nothing but contempt for the mysticisms, dabblings in the occult, or theosophies so popular in his day. Ezekiel Malkant was the name of the marine biologist who was by the side of Almarini and Dajur, the last dolphin who died of cancer in the Bengal Oceanarium on the hot, muggy evening of August 11th, 2134 A.D. The NUN, Applied Species Committee, decided not to replenish the family Delphinidae from stored DNA, but rather to let the species join all other delphinidae and other great marine cetacean mammals in peaceful extinction. The data itself Harmon found as he stared naked out from the center of his own crystal was tolerable. It was the constant nerve-web expanding pain of context that would kill him. I strove to seize the inmost form with ardor fierce and hands of flame, but burst the crystal cabinet, 
and like a weeping babe became a weeping babe upon the wild and weeping woman, pale reclined, and in the outward air again I filled with woes the passing wind. Harmon reached the limit of his ability to absorb such pain and complexity. He stirred his limbs in the thick gold liquid, found that he had less mobility than an embryo, that his fingers had turned to fins, that his muscles had atrophied to weak rags, and that this pain was the true medium and placental fluid of the universe. I am not a tabula rasa, he wanted to scream at that bastard Prospero and that ultimate bitch Moira. This would kill him. Heaven and hell are born together, Harmon thought, and knew Blake had thought it first. Knowing that Blake had thought it in refutation to Swedenborg's Calvinistic belief in predestination. Truly, my Satan, thou art but a dunce, and dost not know the garment from the man. Stop that! Stop it, please, God! Though thou art worshipped by the names divine of Jesus and Jehovah, thou art still the sun of morn in weary night's decline, the lost traveller's dream under the hill. Harmon screamed, despite the fact that there was no air in his lungs to form the scream, no air in his throat to allow the scream, and no air in the tank to conduct the scream. The naked device, one of six trillion, consists of four double helixes connected in the middle by two unpaired DNA strands. The crossover region can assume two different states. The universe often enjoys assuming a binary form. Rotating the two helixes a half-turn on one side of the central bridge junction creates the so-called PX or paranemic crossover state. Do this three billion times per second, and one achieves a purity of torture never dreamt of by the most fanatical designers of the Inquisition's most ingenious racks, clamps, extractors, and sharp edges. Harmon tried to scream again. Fifteen seconds had now elapsed since the transfer had begun. Forty-four minutes and forty-five seconds remained. Sixty-three. My name is Thomas Hockenberry. I have a Ph.D. in classical studies. I specialize in studying, writing about, and teaching Homer's Iliad. For almost thirty years I was a professor, the last decade and a half at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. Then I died. I awoke or was resurrected on Mount Olympus, or what the beings posing as gods there called Mount Olympus, although I later discovered it was the great shield volcano on Mars, Olympus Mons. These beings, these gods, or their superior beings, personalities I've heard of but know little or nothing about, one of them named Prospero, as in Shakespeare's The Tempest, reconstructed me to be a scholic, an observer of the Trojan War. I reported for ten years to one of the muses, recording my daily accounts on speaking stones, for even the gods there are preliterate. I'm recording this on a small, solid-state electronic recorder that I stole from the Moravec ship, the Queen Mab. Last year, just nine months ago, everything went to hell, and the Trojan War, as described in Homer's Iliad, ran off the rails. Since then there has been confusion, an alliance between Achilles and Hector, and thus between all Trojans and Greeks, to wage war against the gods. More confusion, betrayals, a closure of the last brain hole that connected present-day Mars to ancient Ilium, and that caused the Moravec troopers and technicians to flee this Ilium earth. With Achilles gone, disappeared on the other side of the brain hole on a now distant Mars of the future, the Trojan War resumed. Zeus disappeared, and in his absence the gods and goddesses came down to fight alongside their respective champions. For a while it looked as if Agamemnon and Menelaus' armies had penetrated Troy. Diomedes was on the verge of capturing the city. 
Then Hector came out of sulking seclusion. Interesting how that part of our recent story parallels Achilles' long sulk in his tent in the real Iliad. And Priam's son promptly killed the seemingly invulnerable Diomedes in single combat. On the next day, I'm told, Hector bested Ajax. Big Ajax. Great Ajax. The Ajax from Salamis. Helen tells me that Ajax begged for his life, but Hector slew him without mercy. Menelaus, Helen's former husband and the aggrieved party who started this goddamned war, died with an arrow in the brain that same day. Then, as I'd seen so many hundreds of times before in my more than ten years here watching, the initiative of battle swung once again. The gods supporting the Achaeans led the counterattack behind goddesses Athena and Hera, with roaring Poseidon destroying buildings in Ilium, and for a while Hector and his men were in retreat to the city again. I'm told that Hector carried his wounded brother, the heroic Deiphobus, on his back. But two days ago, just as Troy was on the verge of falling yet again, this time to a combined attack of infuriated Achaeans and the most powerful and ruthless gods and goddesses, Athena, Hero, Poseidon, and their ilk, beating back Apollo and the other gods defending the city, Zeus reappeared. Helen tells me that Zeus blasted Hera to bits, dropped Poseidon into the hell pit of Tartarus, and commanded the rest of the gods back to Olympus. She says that the once mighty gods, scores and scores of them in their flying golden chariots and in their fine golden armor, went obediently quantum teleporting back to Olympus like guilty children awaiting their father's spankings. And now the Greeks are getting their asses kicked. Zeus himself, rising taller, Helen says, than the towering Stratocumulus, killed thousands of Argives, drove the rest back to the ships, and then burned their ships with bolts of his lightning. Helen says that the Lord of Gods commanded a huge wave to roll in, a wave that sank the blackened hulks of the ships. Then Zeus himself disappeared and has not returned since. Two weeks later, after both sides lit corpse fires for the thousands of their fallen and observed their nine-day funeral rituals, Hector led a successful counterattack that has driven the Greeks even farther back. It appears that about 30,000 of the original 100,000 or so Argive fighters have survived, many of them, like their king Agamemnon, wounded and dispirited. With no ships for escape and no way to get their axemen to the wooded slopes of Mount Ida to cut wood for new ships, they've done the best they could. Digging deep trenches, lining them with stakes, throwing up wooden revetments, digging a series of connecting trenches within their own lines, building up sand berms, massing their shields and spears and deadly archers in a solid wall around this dwindling semicircle of death. It's the Greeks' last stand. It is now the third morning since my arrival, and I am standing in the Greek encampment, a trenched and walled ark, little more than a quarter of a mile around, with the thirty thousand miserable Achaeans massed and huddled here by the smoldering ruins of their ships. Their backs are to the sea. Hector has every advantage, an almost four-to-one ratio of men who have better morale and adequate food. The Greeks are beginning to starve, even while they can smell the pigs and cattle roasting over the Trojan siege fires. Helen and King Priam had been sure that the Greeks would be defeated two days ago. But desperate men are brave men, men with nothing to lose. And the Greeks have been fighting like cornered rats. They also have had the advantage of shorter interior lines and fighting from behind fixed defenses. Although, admittedly, these advantages will be short-lived with food running out. No permanent supply of water here, since the Trojans dammed up the river a mile from the beach, and typhoid beginning to spread within the crowded and unsanitary Achaean encampment. Agamemnon is not fighting. For three days the son of Atreus, king of Mycenae, and commander-in-chief of this once huge expeditionary force, has been hiding in his tent. Helen reported to me 
that Agamemnon had been wounded during the general Greek retreat, but I hear from captains and guards here in the camp that it was only a broken left forearm, nothing life-threatening. It seems that it was Agamemnon's morale that was critically wounded. The great king Achilles' nemesis had not been able to recover Menelaus' body when his brother was struck down by the arrow through the eye, and while Diomedes, Big Ajax, and the other fallen Greek heroes received proper funerals and cremations on their tall biers near the shore, Menelaus' body was last seen being dragged behind Hector's chariot around the cheering, crowded walls of Ilium. It seems to have been the last straw for the high-strung and arrogant Agamemnon, Rather than being enraged into a fury of fighting, Agamemnon has sunk into depression and denial. The other Greeks have not needed his leadership to know that they have to fight for their lives. Their command structure has been sorely thinned. Big Ajax dead, Diomedes dead, Menelaus dead. Achilles and Odysseus both disappeared on the other side of the closed brain hole. But Gabby Old Nestor has led most of the fighting for the last two days. The once revered warrior has become revered once again, at least among the thinning ranks of Achaeans, appearing on his four-horsed chariot wherever the Greek lines appeared ready to give way, urging trench engineers to replace stakes and redig collapsed areas, improving the internal trenches with sand berms and firing slits sending men and boys out as scouts at night to steal water from the Trojans, and always calling for the men to have heart. Nestor's sons, Antilochus and Thrasymedes, who had few valorous moments during the first ten years of the war or during the short war with the gods, have fought splendidly the last two days. Thrasymedes was wounded twice yesterday, once by a spear and again by an arrow in the shoulder. But he fought on, leading his Pylian brigades to push back a Trojan offensive that had threatened to cut the defensive semicircle here in half. It's just after sunrise here on the third day, quite possibly the last day since the Trojans were moving, shifting forces, bringing up more troops, chariots, and trench-bridging equipment all during the night, and more than a hundred thousand relatively fresh Trojan troops are massing around the defensive perimeter even as I speak. I brought the recorder here to Agamemnon's camp because Nestor has called a council of his surviving war chieftains, at least those that can be spared from their fighting positions. These tired and filthy men ignore my presence, or rather they probably remember that I spent much time with and near Achilles during the eight-month war with the gods, so they accept my presence. And the sight of this wafer-sized recorder in my hand means nothing to them. I no longer know for whom I'm observing and recording these things. I imagine that I would be the ultimate persona non grata if I were to show up on Olympus and hand this recording chip to one of the muses who sought to kill me. So I will make these observations and record this recording only as the scholar I once was, not as the slave scholic they turned me into. And even if I am no longer a scholar, I can serve as a war correspondent, in these last hours of the last stand of the Greeks, and the end of this heroic era. Nestor, what is the news, and do you think your men will hold the line today? Idomeneus, commander of the Crete contingent. The last time I saw Idomeneus, he had just killed the Amazon Bramusa with a spear cast. Moments later, the brain hole closed. Idomeneus was among the last to abandon Achilles. The news is bad from my part of the line, noble Nestor. For every Trojan we've killed in the last two days, three more have taken his place in the night. They ready their trench, filling tools and spears for the attack. Their archers are still massing. It will be decisive today. Little Ajax. As different as the Iantes, the two Ajaxes had been. They had been as close as brothers. I have never seen this Ajax of Locris look so grim. The grooves and wrinkles on his face are so outlined in mud and blood that they resemble a kabuki mask. Nestor, son of Neleus, hero of these darkest of times, my Locris fighters engaged the enemy through much of the night as Deiphobus scouts 
tried to flank us on the north end of the perimeter. We fought them back until the surf ran red, our section of trenches filling up with our own and the Trojan dead, until they soon will be able to walk across on bodies heaped ten feet high. A third of my men are dead, the rest exhausted. Hector has sent new troops to replace his losses. Nestor. Podolarius, how goes it with the remaining son of Atreus? Podolarius, the son of Asclepius, is one of the last healers left to the Greeks. He is also co-commander along with his brother Machaon of the Thessalians from Tricca. Noble Nestor, Agamemnon's arm has been set in a splint, he has taken no herbs for the pain, and he is awake and rational. Nestor. Why is it, then, that he has not emerged from his tent? For his corps is the largest left to our army, but they shelter in the center like women. Their hearts are gone without their leader. Podolarius, their leader's heart is gone without his brother Menelaus. Teucer, the master archer, half-brother, and dearest friend to the murdered big Ajax. Then Achilles was right ten months ago when he confronted Agamemnon in all our sight, and told the great king he has the heart of a fawn, spits into the sand. Eumelus, son of Admetus and Alcestis, commander of the Thessalians from Fury, often referred to by the missing Achilles and Odysseus as Lord of Men. And where is the accuser Achilles? The coward stayed behind at the base of Mount Olympus, rather than face his death here with his comrades. The fleet-footed man-killer turned out also to have the heart and hooves of a fawn. Menestheus, the huge captain of the Myrmidons, a former lieutenant of Achilles. I'll kill any man who says that about the son of Peleus. He would never abandon us of his own free will. We all saw and heard the goddess Athena tell Achilles that he had been enchanted by Aphrodite's spell. You mean us? Enchanted by Amazon pussy, you mean? Menestheus steps toward Eumelus and begins to draw his sword, Nestor stepping between them. Enough! Aren't the Trojans killing us quickly enough, or do we need to add to our own slaughter? Eumelus, step back. Menestheus, sheathe your sword. Podolarius, speaking as the Achaeans' last healer now, not as Agamemnon's personal doctor. What's killing us is the disease— Another two hundred dead, especially among the Apeans who are defending the river bank to the south. Polixenus, son of Agasthenes, co-commander of the Apeans. This is true, Lord Nestor. At least two hundred dead and another thousand too sick to fight. Dracius, captain of the Apeans, just raised to the rank of commander. Half my men did not respond to muster this morning, Lord Nestor. Podolarius, and it's spreading. Amphion, another recently promoted captain of the Apeans. It's Phoebus Apollo's silver bow striking us down, just as it was ten months ago when the gods spread disease had corpse fires burning every night. It's what led to the first falling out between Achilles and Agamemnon. It's what led to all our woes. Podolarius, oh, fuck Phoebus Apollo and his silver bow. The gods, including Zeus, did their worst to us, and now they're gone and only they know if they're coming back. Personally, I don't care if they do or don't. These deaths, this disease, didn't come from Apollo's silver bow. I think it comes from the foul water the men are drinking. We're drinking our own piss and sitting in our own excrement here. My father Asclepius had this theory of origins of disease and contaminated water and... Master, learned Podolarius, we will rejoice to hear your father's theory of disease at another time. Right now I need to know if we can hold off the Trojans today, and what, if anything, my captains advise us to do. Necapolis, son of Anchises. We should surrender. Thrasymedes, Nestor's son, who had fought so valiantly the day before. His wounds are bandaged and bound up, but he appears to be suffering from them more today than in the heat of yesterday's long fight. Surrender my ass! Who is in our circle of Argives that so cowers from fear that he suggests craven surrender? Surrender to me, son of Anchises, and I'll put you out of your misery as quickly as the Trojans certainly will. Necapolis. 
Hector is an honorable man. King Priam used to be an honorable man and may well still be. I traveled with Odysseus to Troy when the Ithacan came to reason with Priam to try to get Helen back through talk to avoid this war. And both Priam and Hector were reasonable, honorable men. Hector will hear our surrender. Thrasymedes. That was eleven years and a hundred thousand souls sent down to Hades ago, you fool. You saw the extent of Hector's mercy when Ajax the Great begged and pleaded for his life, his long shield hammered into tin, snot and tears rolling down our hero's face. Hector severed his spine and hacked out his heart. His men probably won't be so merciful to you. Nestor. I know there has been talk of surrender, but Thrasymedes is correct. Too much blood has been spilled on this Trojan soil to hold out any hope for mercy. We would have given the citizens of Ilium none, would we, had we but breached their walls to more success three weeks ago, or ten years ago? All of you here know that we would have killed every man old enough or young enough to lift a sword or bow, slaughtered their old men for spawning our enemies, raped their women, carried all their surviving women and children into a life of slavery, and put the torch to their city and their temples. But the gods or the fates, whoever is deciding the outcome of this war, have turned against us. We cannot expect from the Trojans, who suffered our invasion and our ten years of siege, more mercy than we would have granted them. No, tell your man, if you hear these murmurings, that it is madness to surrender. Better to die on your feet than on your knees. Idomeneus. Better to not die at all. Is there no plan to save ourselves? Alastor, Teucer's commander. The ships are burned, the food is running out, but we will all be dead of thirst before we starve. Disease claims more every hour. Menestheus. My Myrmidons want to break out, fight our way through the Trojan lines, and make for the south to Mount Ida and the heavy forests there. Nestor, nodding. Your Myrmidons are not the only ones thinking about breaking out and escaping, brave Menestheus. But your Myrmidons cannot do it alone. None of our tribes or groups can. The Trojan lines stretch back for miles, and their allies' lines go deeper. They expect us to try to break out. They're probably wondering why we haven't tried it before this. You know the iron laws of combat with sword, shield, and spear, Menestheus? All Myrmidons and Achaeans know it. For every man who falls in shield-to-shield -shield combat, a hundred are slaughtered while fleeing. We have no working chariots left. Hector's chiefs have hundreds. They'll run us down and slaughter us like sheep before we cross the dried bed of the river's commander. Thracius. So we stay and die here today or tomorrow on the beach next to the charred timbers of our great black ships? Antilochus, Nestor's other son. No. Surrender is out of the question for any man here with balls, and defense of this position will be untenable in a few hours. It may be untenable during the next attack, but I say we all try to break out at the same time. We have 30,000 fighting men left, more than 20,000 well enough to fight and run. Four out of five of us may fall, verily be slaughtered like sheep before we reach the concealing forests of Mount Ida. But at those odds, four or five thousand of us will survive. Half that number may even survive the searches of the forest for us, which the Trojans and their allies will carry out, like royalty pursuing a stag. And half that remaining number may find their way off this goddamned continent and cross the wine-dark seas to home. Those odds are good enough for me. Thrasymedes. And for me. Teucer. Many odds are better than the certainty of our bones bleaching on this fucking goddamned motherfucking shit-eating piss-drinking beach. Nestor. Was that a vote for breaking out, son of Telamon? Teucer, you're fucking goddamned right it was, Lord Nestor. Nestor. Noble Apius, you've had no voice in this council yet. What do you think? Apius, shuffling his feet and looking down in embarrassment. Apius is the best boxer of all the Achaeans, and his face and shaved head show his years at the sport. Cauliflower ears, a flattened nose, 
permanent scar tissue on his cheeks and brow ridges, countless scars even on his scalp. I cannot fail to see the irony in a pious position in this council and my own effect on his life and fate. Never famed for his battle prowess, Apius would have won the boxing matches in Patroclus' funeral games held by Achilles and been the master builder of the Odysseus-conceived wooden horse if I had not begun screwing up the Homeric version of this story almost a year ago. As it stands now, Apius is in the council of chieftains only because all his commanding officers up to Menelaus have been killed. Lord Nestor, when one's opponent is most confident when he crosses the fighting space toward you with certainty in his heart that you are down for the count, unable to rise, that is the best time to strike him hard. In this case, strike him hard, stun him, knock him back on his heels, and run for our lives. I was at the games once when a boxer did just that. Laughter all around at this. A pierce. But it will have to be at night. Nestor. I agree. The Trojans see too far and ride their chariots too quickly for us to have a fighting chance in the daylight. Meriones, son of Molus, close comrade of Idomeneus, second in command of the Cretans. We won't have a much better chance in the moonlight. The moon is three quarters full. Laerces, a Myrmidon, son of Heman. But the winter sun sets earlier and the moon rises later this week. We will have almost three hours from the beginning of real darkness, the kind of darkness where you need a torch to find your way, and the rising of the moon. Nestor. The question is, can we hold through the hours of daylight today, and will our men have enough energy left in them to fight? We'll have to concentrate our attack and hit hard to forge a hole in the Trojan lines, and enough energy left then to run the twenty miles and more to the forests of Mount Ida. Idomeneus. They'll have the energy to fight today if they know they might have a chance to live tonight. I say we hit the Trojans right in the center of their lines, right where Hector leads, since he's concentrated his strength on both flanks for today's fighting. I say we break out tonight. Nestor. The rest of you, I need to hear from everyone here. It's truly all or nothing, everyone or no one in this attempt. Podolarius. We'll have to leave our sick and wounded behind, and there will be thousands more of these by nightfall. The Trojans will slaughter them, perhaps do worse than mere slaughter in their frustration if any of us gets away. Nestor. Yes, but such are the vagaries of war and fate. I need to hear your votes, noble chiefs of the Achaeans. Thrasymedes. Aye. We go for it all tonight, and may the gods watch over those left behind and those captured later. You, sir. Fuck the gods up the ass. I say yes if our fate is to die here on this stinking beach. I say we defy the fates. Go tonight at fall of true dark. Polixenus. Yes. Alastor. Yes, tonight. Little Ajax. Aye. Eumelus. Yes. All or nothing. Menestheus. If my lord Achilles were here, he'd go for Hector's throat. Maybe we can get lucky and kill the son of a bitch on our way out. Nestor. Another vote for breaking out. Mercapolis? Mercapolis. I think we'll all die if we stay and fight another day. I think we'll all die if we try to escape. I, for one, choose to stay with the wounded and offer my surrender to Hector, trusting in the hope that some shards of his former honor and sense of mercy have survived. But I will tell my men that they can make up their own minds. Nestor. No, Archipolis, most of the men will follow their commander's lead. You can stay behind and surrender, but I'm relieving you of your command and appointing Amphion in your place. You can go straight from this meeting to the tent where the wounded wait, but speak to no one. Your brigade is small enough, and it is on Amphion's left on the line. The two can merge with no confusion or need to reposition troops. That is, I am promoting Amphion if Amphion votes to fight our way out tonight. Amphion, I so vote. Theresius. I vote for my appearance. We fight and die tonight or fight and escape. I, for one, want to see my home and family again. Eumelus. 
Agamemnon's men told us, and the Moravec things confirmed it, that our cities and homes were empty, our kingdoms now unpopulated, our people stolen away by Zeus. Dresius, to which I say, fuck Agamemnon, fuck the Moravec toys, and fuck Zeus. I plan to go home to see if my family is waiting. I believe they are. Polypedes, another son of Agasthenes, co-commander of the Lapiths from Argosa. My men will hold the line today and lead the fight out tonight. I swear this by all the gods. Teucer, couldn't you swear by something a little more constant, like your bowels? Laughter around the circle. Nestor. It's agreed, then, and I concur. We'll do everything in our power to hold back the Trojan onslaught today. To that end, Baudelarius, I'll receive the serving out of all rations this morning except for what a man can carry in his tunic tonight, and double the morning's water rations. Go through Agamemnon's and dead Menelaus' private stores. Pull out anything edible. Commanders, tell your men before this morning's battle that all they have to do today is hold. Hold for their lives, die only for their comrades' lives, and we will attack tonight at true dark. Some of us will reach the forest on fate's willing, our homes and families again. Or, failing that, our names will be written in gold words of glory that will last forever. Our children's grandchildren's grandchildren will visit our burial mounds here in this accursed land and say, Aye, they were men in those days. So tell your sergeants and their men to breakfast well this morning, for most of us will eat dinner in the halls of the dead. So tonight, when it's true dark and before the moon arises, I will authorize our favorite pugilist, Apius, to ride up and down our lines shouting, Apete just as they do to start the chariot races and foot races at the games. And then we'll be off to our freedom. And that should have been the end of the meeting. And a rousing end it was, for Nestor is a born leader and knows how to wrap up a meeting with action items and energy, something my department chair at Indiana University never understood. But as always, someone breaks the perfect rhythm of the perfect script. In this case, that someone is Teucer. You, sir. Apius, noble boxer, you never told us the end of your story. Whatever happened to that Olympics boxer who stunned his opponent and then ran out of the arena? Apius, who, as everyone knows, is more honest than wise. Oh, him, the Olympics priests hunted him down in the woods and killed him like a dog. The Achaean chieftains have dispersed, gone back to their lines and their men. Nestor has left with his sons. The healer, Podolirius, has put together a detail of men to sack Agamemnon's tent in a search for food and wine. I'm left alone here on the beach, or at least as alone as one can be when pressed cheek to jowl with thirty thousand other unwashed men all reeking of sweat and fear. I touch the QT medallion under my tunic. Nestor did not ask for my vote. None of the Achaean heroes so much as looked at me during that entire debate. They know I don't fight, and they seem to like me no less for it. It's the way these ancient Greeks treat men who like to dress up in women's clothing and paint their faces white. There is no dishonor there in most of these men's eyes, only dismissal. I'm a freak to them, an outsider, something less than a man. I know I'm not going to stay until the bitter end. I doubt if I'll stay during today's battle, since the air here will grow dark with volleys of arrows in the next half hour. I don't have the morphing gear and impact armor that I had as a skolik. I haven't even donned the metal or leather armor that's so available from Achaean corpses all around me. If I stay, I doubt I'd last the day. The last two days have been a series of craven hours and timid cowering for me here, near the back of the line, near the tent, where the wounded are dying. If I were to survive the day, my chances of surviving the attack on the Trojans after dark would be near zero. And why would I stay? I have a quantum teleportation device hanging around my neck, for Christ's sake. I could be in Helen's chambers in two seconds, relaxing in a hot bath there in five minutes. Why would I stay? But I'm not ready to go, not quite yet. 
I'm no longer a scholic, and there may be no purpose to being a scholar here. But even as a war correspondent who will never be able to report his observations, this last glorious day of a lost glorious epoch is too interesting to miss. I'll stay for a while. The horns are blowing everywhere. No one's had time for those promised big breakfasts yet, but the Trojans are attacking all along the line. 64. To know that everything in the universe, everything in history, everything in science, everything in poetry and art and music, every person, place, thing, and idea is connected, that is one thing. To experience that connection, even incompletely, that is quite another. Harmon was unconscious for most of nine days. When he wasn't unconscious, he was awake only briefly, and then screaming in pain from a headache beyond all capacity of his skull and brain to contain it. He'd throw up a lot, then he would lapse into coma again. On the ninth day, he awoke. The headache rolled over him worse than any headache he had ever experienced, but no longer the scream-maker of his nine-day nightmare. The nausea was gone, and his stomach was empty. He'd later realized that he'd lost more than twenty-five pounds, he was naked and lying in the bed on the second floor of the Eiffelbahn cable car. The cable car is designed and decorated mostly in Art Nouveau, he thought, as he staggered out of bed and pulled on a silk dressing gown that had been thrown over the arm of the overstuffed Empire-era armchair next to the bed. He wondered idly where in the world anyone was raising worms to make silk. Had it been one of the servitor's duties, these long centuries of human idleness? Was it being artificially created in some industrial vat somewhere, the way the post-humans had created, recreated, actually, his race of nano-altered human stock? Harmon's head hurt too much to ponder the thought now. He paused on the mezzanine, closed his eyes, and concentrated. Nothing. He remained in the cable car. He tried again. Nothing. Staggering slightly dizzy now, he went down the wrought iron metal staircase to the first floor and collapsed into the only chair at the table near the window. The table was covered with white linen. Harmon said nothing as Moira brought out orange juice in a crystal glass, black coffee in a white thermidor, and a poached egg with a bit of salmon on the side. She poured the coffee into his cup. Harmon lowered his head slightly to allow the heat from the coffee to rise against his face. "'Come here often?' asked Moira. Prospero came into the room and stood in the brilliant, undespicable morning light that was streaming in through the glass doors. "'Ah, Harmon, or should we call you new man? It is a pleasure to see you awake and ambulatory.' "'Shut up,' said Harmon, ignoring the food, sipping the coffee gingerly. He knew now that Prospero was a hologram, but a physical one, a logosphere avatar forming himself from microsecond to microsecond, with matter being beamed down from one of the mass fax accumulators in orbit. He also knew that if he tried to strike or attack the old Magus, the matter would turn to untouchable projection faster than any human reflexes. You knew that my chances of surviving the crystal cabinet were about one in a hundred, said Harmon, not even looking at Prospero. The light there was too bright. A little better than that, I think, said the Magus, mercifully drawing the heavy drapes. Moira pulled a chair over and sat at the table with Harmon. She was wearing a red tunic, but otherwise showed the same hardy adventure clothing she had been wearing in the Taj. Harmon looked unblinkingly at her. You knew the young Savi. You attended the final fax party in the New York archipelago at the flooded Empire State Building. And you told her friends you hadn't seen her, but you'd actually visited Savi at her home in Antarctica just two days before. How on earth do you know that? asked Moira. Savi's friend Petra wrote a short essay about their attempt, mostly hers and her lover Pincus, to find Savi. It was printed and bound up right before the final facts. Somehow it found its way into your friend Ferdinand Mark Alonso's library. 
But how would Petra have known that I visited Safi before the New York Archipelago party? I think she and Pink has found something Savi had written when they went through her Mount Erebus apartments, said Harmon. The coffee did not come back up on him, but it didn't help his throbbing headache much either. So you know everything about everything now, do you? asked Mora. Harmon laughed and regretted it almost immediately. He put down the coffee cup and held his right temple. No, he said at last. I know just enough to know that I don't know much of anything about anything. Besides, there are forty-one other libraries sprinkled around the earth whose crystal cabinets I haven't visited yet. That would kill you, said Prospero. Harmon wouldn't have minded at that moment if someone had killed him. The headache put a pulsing corona around everything and every one he tried to look at. He sipped more coffee and hoped that the nausea wouldn't come back. The cable car creaked along, although he knew that it was traveling at more than two hundred miles per hour. Its slight swaying back and forth did nothing to keep his stomach settled. Would you like to hear all about Alexandre Gustave Eiffel? Born in Dijon on December 15, 1832 A.D., Graduated from the École Centrale des Arts et Manufactures in 1855. Before coming up with the idea for his tower at the 1889 Centennial Exposition, he'd already designed the movable dome of the observatory at Nice and the framework for the Statue of Liberty in New York. He, stop it, snapped Moira. No one likes a show off. Where the hell are we? asked Harmon. He managed to get to his feet and shove back the drapes. They were passing through a beautiful wooded valley, the car moving along more than seven hundred feet above a winding river. Ancient ruins, a castle of some sort, were just visible along a ridge line. We've just passed Caor, said Prospero. We should be swinging south toward Lourdes at the next tower switching station. Harmon rubbed his eyes but opened the glass door and stepped out. The force field deployed along the leading edge of the flat-sided cable car kept him from being blown off the balcony. What's the matter, he asked back through the open door. Don't you want to head north and visit your friend's Blue Ice Cathedral? Mora looked startled. How could you possibly know about that? There was no book in the Taj with that. No, agreed Harmon. But my friend Demon saw the beginnings of that, the arrival of Setabos. I know from the books what the many-handed would do after he arrived in Paris Crater, so he's still here, on Earth, I mean. Yes, said Prospero, and he is no friend of ours. Harmon shrugged. You two brought him here the first time, him and the others. It was not our intention, said Moira. Harmon had to laugh at that, no matter how much it made his head throb. No, right, said Harmon. You open an interdimensional door into darkness, leave it open, and then say it was not our intention when something really vile comes through. You've learned much, said Prospero, but you still do not understand all that you will have to if— Yeah, yeah, said Harmon. I'd listen to you more closely, Prospero, if I didn't know that you're mostly one of those things that came through the door. The posthumans spend a thousand years trying to contact alien others changing the quantum setup of the entire solar system in the process, and get a many-handed brain and a retread cyber virus from a Shakespearean play instead. The old magus smiled at this. Moira shook her head in irritation, poured some coffee into a second cup, and drank without comment. Even if we wanted to drop by and say hello to Setabas, said Prospero, we could not. Paris Crater has no tower, has not had one since before the Rubicon virus. Yeah, said Harmon. He went back in, but stood looking out while he lifted his own cup and sipped coffee. Why can't I free fax, he asked sharply. What? said Moira. Why can't I free fax? I know how to summon the function now without the training wheel's symbol triggers, but it didn't work when I got up. I want to jump back to Ardis. Setabas shut down the planetary fax system, said Prospero. That includes free faxing as well as the fax node pavilions. Harmon nodded and rubbed his cheek and chin. A week and a half of stubble, almost a real beard rasped under his fingers. 
So you two and presumably Ariel can still quantum teleport, but I'm stuck on this stupid cable car until we get to the Atlantic breach? You really expect me to walk across the ocean floor to North America? Ada will be dead of old age before I get to Ardis. The nanotechnology that grants your people functions, said Prospero, his old voice sounding sad, did not prepare you for quantum teleportation. No, but you can QT me hum, said Harmon, looming over the old man where he now sat on the couch. Touch me and QT. It's that simple. No, not that simple, said Prospero. And you're literate enough now that you must know that you cannot compel either Moira or me to submit to threats or intimidation. Harmon had accessed orbital clocks when he'd awakened, and he knew he'd been unconscious for most of nine days. It made him want to smash the pot, cups, and table with his fist. We're on the Eiffelbahn Route 11, he said. After we left Mount Everest, we must have followed the ha Shil shan route, up right past the Tarim Pandi bubble. I could have found Sonys there, weapons, crawlers, levitation harnesses, impact armor, everything Ada and our people need for their survival. There were detours, said Prospera. You would not have been safe if you had left the tower to explore the Tarim Pandi bubble. Safe, snorted Harmon. Yes, we must live in a safe world, mustn't we, Magus and Moira? You were more mature before the Crystal Cabinet, said Moira, with much disdain. Harmon didn't argue the point. He set down his cup, leaned forward with both hands on the table, stared Moira in the eye, and said, I know the Voynichs were sent forward through time by the global caliphate to kill Jews. But why did you posts store the 9,114 of them and beam them into space? Why not just take them up to the rings with you or some other safe place? I mean, you'd already found the other dimensional Mars and terraformed it. Why turn those people into neutrinos? 9,113, corrected Moira. Savi was left behind. Harmon waited for an answer to his question. Moira set down her coffee cup. Her eyes, just like Savi's, showed every rush of anger she felt. We told Savi's people that they were being stored in the neutrino loop for a few thousand years while we cleaned up the untidiness on Earth, she said softly. They interpreted that to mean the RNA constructs everywhere left over from dementia times, dinosaurs and terror birds and cycad forests, but we also meant such little things as the Voynix, Satabas, the witch in her city up in orbit. But you didn't clean up the Voynix, interrupted Harmon. The things were activated and built their third temple on the Mosque of the Dome. We could not eliminate them, said Moira, but we reprogrammed them. Your people knew them as servants for fourteen hundred years. Until they started slaughtering us, said Harmon. He turned his gaze on Prospero which started after you directed Demon and me on how to destroy your orbital city where you and Caliban were imprisoned. All that to reclaim just one hologram of yourself, Prospero? More the equivalent of a frontal lobe, said the Magus, and the Voynix would have been activated even if you had not destroyed the controlling elements in my city on the E-ring. Why? Set a bus, said Prospero. His millennium and a half of being denied, of being kept and fed on alternate Earths and the terraformed Mars, had come to an end, when the many-handed opened the first brain hole to sniff the air of this Earth. The Voynix reacted as programmed. Programmed three thousand years ago, said Harmon. The old styles of my people aren't all from Jewish descent like Savi's folk. Prospero shrugged. The Voynichs do not know that. All humans in Savi's time were Jews, ergo. To the weak mind of all Voynichs, all humans are Jews. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. If Crete is an island and England is an island, then Crete is England, finished Harmon. But the Rubicon virus did not come from a lab in Israel. That's just another blood libel. 
No, you are perfectly correct, said Prospero. The Rubicon was indeed the one great contribution to science that the Islamic world gave the rest of the world in a two thousand year stretch of darkness. Eleven billion dead, said Harmon, his voice shaking. Ninety-seven percent of Earth's population wiped out. Prospero shrugged again. It was a long war. Harmon laughed again, and the virus got almost everyone but the group it was built to kill. Israeli scientists had a long history of nanotech genetic manipulation by then, said the Magus. They knew that if they did not inoculate their population's DNA quickly, they could not do it at all. They might have shared it, said Harmon. They tried. There was no time. But the DNA for your stock was stored. But the global caliphate didn't invent time travel, said Harmon, not 100% sure if this was a question or a statement. No, agreed Prospero. A French scientist developed the first working time bubble. Henri Ries de la Court, muttered Harmon, remembering to travel back to 1478 A.D. to investigate an odd and interesting manuscript purchased by Rudolf II, the Holy Roman Emperor, in 1586, continued Prospero without a pause. It seemed a simple enough little trip, but we know now that the manuscript itself, filled with a strange coded language and featuring wonderful drawings of non-terrestrial plants, star systems, and naked people, was a hoax, and Dr. Delacourt and his home city paid a price for the voyage when the black hole his team was using as a power source escaped its restraining force field. But the French and the new European Union gave the designs to the caliphate, said Harmon. Why? Prospero held up his old, vein-mottled hands almost as if he were giving a benediction. The Palestinian scientists were their friends. I wonder if that rare book dealer from the early twentieth century, Wilfred Voynich, could have dreamt that he'd have a race of self-replicating monsters named after him, said Harmon. Few of us can dream of what our true legacy will be, said Prospero, his hands still raised as if in blessing. Moira sighed. Are you too finished with your little trip down memory lane? Harmon looked at her. And you, my would-be Prometheus, your dingle is dangling. If this is a one-eyed stare-down contest, you win. I blinked first. Harmon looked down. His robe had come open during all the talking. He quickly sashed it shut. We'll be crossing the Pyrenees in the next hour, said Moira. Now that Harmon has something in his skull other than a pleasure thermometer, we have things to discuss, things to decide. I suggest that Prometheus go up and shower and get dressed. Grandfather here can take a nap. I'll clear the breakfast dishes. 65. Achilles is considering the possibility that he made a mistake in maneuvering Zeus into banishing him to the deepest, darkest pit in the hell world of Tartarus, even though it had seemed like a good idea at the time. First of all, Achilles can't quite breathe the air here. While the quantum singularity of his fate to die by Paris's hand theoretically protects him from death, it doesn't protect him from rasping, wheezing, and collapsing on the lava-hot black stone as the methane-tainted air fouls and scours his lungs. It's as if he's trying to breathe acid. Secondly, this Tartarus is a nasty place. A terrible air pressure equivalent to 200 feet beneath the surface of Earth's sea presses in on every square inch of Achilles' aching body. The heat is terrible. It would have long since killed any merely mortal man, even a hero such as Diomedes or Odysseus. But even demigod Achilles is suffering, his skin blotched red and white, boils and blisters appearing everywhere on his exposed flesh. Finally, he is blind and almost deaf. There is a vague reddish glow, but not enough to see by. The pressure here is so great, the atmosphere and cloud cover so thick, that even the small illumination from the pervasive volcanic red gloom is defeated by the rippling atmosphere, by fumes from live volcanic vents, 
and by the constant curtain fall of acid rain. The thick, superheated atmosphere presses in on the fleet-footed man-killer's eardrums until the sounds he can make out all seem like great, muted drumbeats and massive footsteps, heavy throbs to match the throbbing of his pressure-squeezed skull. Achilles reaches under his leather armor and touches the small mechanical beacon that Hephaestus had given him. He can feel it pulse. At least it hasn't imploded from the terrible pressure that presses in on Achilles' eardrums and eyes. Sometimes, in the terrible gloom, Achilles can sense movement of large shapes. But even when the volcanic glow is at its reddest, he can't make out who or what is passing near him in the terrible night. He senses that the shapes are far too big and too oddly shaped to be human. Whatever they are, the things have ignored him so far. Fleet-footed Achilles, son of Peleus, leader of the Myrmidons and noblest hero of the Trojan War, demigod in his terrible wrath, lies spread-eagled flat on a pulsing hot volcanic boulder, blinded and deafened, and uses all of his energy just to keep breathing. Perhaps he thinks I should have come up with a different plan for defeating Zeus and bringing my beloved Penthesilea back to life. Even the briefest thought of Penthesilea makes him want to weep like a child, but not an Achilles child, for the young Achilles had never wept. Not once. The centaur Chiron had taught him how to avoid responding to his emotions, other than anger, rage, jealousy, hunger, thirst, and sex, of course, for those were important in a warrior's life. But weep for love? The idea would have made the noble Chiron bark his harsh centaur's laugh and then hit young Achilles hard with his massive teaching stick. Love is nothing but lust misspelled, Chiron would have said, and struck seven-year-old Achilles again, hard on the temple. What makes Achilles want to weep all the more here in this unbreathable hell is that he knows somewhere deep behind his surging emotions that he doesn't give a damn about the dead Amazon twat. She'd come at him with a fucking poisoned spear for the gods' sake. And normally his only regret would be that it took so long for the bitch and her horse to die. But here he is, suffering this hell and taking on Father Zeus himself just to get the woman reborn. All because of some chemicals that gash goddess Aphrodite had poured on the smelly Amazon. Three huge forms loom out of the fog. They are close enough that Achilles' straining, tear-filled eyes can make out that they are women. If women grew thirty feet tall, each with tits bigger than his torso. They are naked but painted in many bright colors, visible even through the red filter of this volcanic gloom. Their faces are long and unbelievably ugly. Their hair is either writhing like snakes in the superheated air or is a tangle of serpents. Their voices are distinct, only because the booming syllables are unbearably louder than the booming background noise. Sister Ione, booms the first shape, looming over him in the gloom. Canst thou tell what form this is spread eagled across this rock like a starfish? Sister Asia answers the second huge form. I wouldst say it were a mortal man if mortals could come to this place or survive here, which they cannot. And if I could see it were a man, which I cannot, since it lieth upon its belly, it does have pretty hair. Sister Oceanit, says the third form, let us see the gender of this starfish. A huge hand roughly grips Achilles and rolls him over. Fingers the size of his thighs pluck away his armor, rip off his belt, and roll down his loincloth. Is it male? asks the first shape, the one her sister had called Asia. If you wouldst call it so, for so little to show, says the third shape. Whatever it is, it lies fallen and vanquished, says the female giant called Ione. Suddenly large shapes in the gloom that Achilles had assumed were looming crags stir, sway and echo in non-human voices lies fallen and vanquished. And invisible voices farther away in the reddish night echo again, lies fallen and vanquished. The names finally click. 
Chiron had taught young Achilles his mythology as well as his theology to honor the living and present gods. Asia and Ione had been Oceanids, daughters of Okinos, along with their third sister, Panthea, the second generation of Titans born after the original mating of Earth and Gaia. Titans who had ruled the heavens and the earth along with Gaia in the ancient times before their third generation offspring, Zeus, defeated them and cast them all down into Tartarus. Only Okinos of all the Titans had been allowed exile in a kinder, gentler place, locked away in a dimension lair under the quantum sheath of Ilium Earth. Okinos could be visited by the gods, but his offspring had been banished to stinking Tartarus. Asia, Ione, Panthea, and all the other Titans, including Okinos' brother, Cronos, who became Zeus's father, Okinos' sister, Rhea, who became Zeus's mother, and Okinos' three daughters. All the other male offspring from the mating of Earth and Gaia, Koyas, Cryos, Hyperion, and Iapetus, as well as the other daughters, Thea, Themis, Mnemosyne, golden-wreathed Phoebe and sweet Tethys, had also been banished here to Tartarus after Zeus's victory on Olympus thousands of years earlier. All this Achilles remembers from his lessons at the hoof of Chiron. A fucking lot of good it does me, he thinks. Does it speak? booms Panthea, sounding startled. It squeaks, says Ione. All three of the giant Oceanids lean closer to listen to Achilles' attempts at communication. Every attempt is terribly painful for the man-killer, since it means breathing in and trying to use the noxious atmosphere. An observer would have guessed from the resulting sounds, and guessed correctly, that there is an unusual amount of helium remaining in the carbon dioxide, methane, ammonia mix of Tartarus soup-thick atmosphere. It soundeth like a mouse that hath been squashed flat, laughs Asia. But the squeaks sound vaguely like a squashed mouse's attempt at civilized language, booms Ione. With a terrible dialect, agrees Panthea. We need to take him to the Demogorgon, says Asia, looming closer. Two huge hands roughly lift Achilles, the giant fingers squeezing most of the ammonia, methane, carbon dioxide, and helium out of his aching lungs. Now the hero of the Argives is gaping and gasping like a fish out of water. The Demogorgon will want to see this strange creature, agrees Ione. Carry him, sister. Carry him to the Demogorgon. Carry him to the Demogorgon, echoed the giant insectoid shapes following the three giant women. Carry him to the Demogorgon, echo larger, less familiar shapes following farther behind. Sixty-six. The Eiffelbahn ended along the fortieth parallel on the coast where the nation of Portugal had once existed, just south of Figueira da Forge. Harmon knew that less than a couple of hundred miles southeast, the modulated force field templates called the Hands of Hercules held the Atlantic Ocean out of the dry Mediterranean basin. And he knew exactly why the post-humans had drained the basin and to what purpose they'd used it for almost two millennia. He knew that less than a couple of hundred miles northeast of where the Eiffelbahn ended here, there was a sixty-mile-wide circle of the terrain fused into glass, where thirty-two hundred years ago the global caliphate had fought its determining battle with the NEU. More than three million protovoinics pouring over and past two hundred thousand doomed human mechanized infantry knights. Armin knew that. All in all, he knew, he knew too much. And understood too little. The three of them, Moira, the solidified Prospero hologram, and Harmon, still with the headache of a lifetime, were standing on the top platform of the final Eiffelbahn Tower. Harmon was finished with his cable car ride, perhaps forever. Behind them were the green hills of former Portugal. Ahead of them was the Atlantic Ocean, with the breach continuing due west from the line of the Eiffelbahn route. 
The day was perfect, temperature perfect, mild breezes, not a cloud in the sky, and sunlight reflected off green at the top of the cliffs, white sand, and broad expanses of blue on either side of the slash of the Atlantic breach. Harmon knew that even from the top of the Eiffelbahn Tower he could see only sixty miles or so to the west, but the view seemed to go on for a thousand miles. The breach, starting as a hundred-meter-wide avenue, with low blue-green berms on either side, but continuing on until it was only a black line intersecting with the distant horizon. You can't seriously expect me to walk to North America, said Harmon. We seriously expect you to try, said Prospero. Why? Neither the post-human nor the never-human answered him. Myra led the way down the steps to the lower elevator platform, she was carrying a rucksack and some other gear for Harmon's hike. The elevator doors opened, and they stepped into the cage-like structure and began humming lower past iron trellises. I'll walk with you for a day or two, said Moira. Harmon was surprised. You will? Why? I thought you might enjoy the company. Harmon had no response to this. As they stepped out onto the grassy shelf under the Eiffelbahn Tower, he said, you know, just a few hundred miles southeast of us here, in the Med Basin, there are a dozen post-human storage facilities that Savi never knew anything about. She knew about Atlantis and the three chairs' way of riding lightning to the rings, but that was more or less a cruel post-human joke. She didn't know about the Sonys and actual cargo spacecraft stored at the other stasis bubbles. Or at least these stasis bubbles used to be there. They still are, said Prospero. Harmon turned to Moira. Well, walk with me a few days to the basin rather than send me on a three-month hike across the ocean floor, a hike I'll probably never complete. We'll fly a Sony to Ardis or one of the shuttles up the rings to have them turn the power and fax node links back on. Moira shook her head. I assure you, my young Prometheus, you do not want to walk toward the Mediterranean basin. Almost one million Calabani are loose there, said Prospero. They used to be contained to the basin, but Setabas has released them. They've slaughtered the Voiniks that once guarded Jerusalem, have swarmed across North Africa and the Middle East, and would have covered much of Europe now if Ariel weren't holding them back. Ariel, cried Harmon, the thought of the tiny little sprite single-handedly holding back a million rampaging Calabani, or even one, was totally absurd. Ariel can call upon more resources than are dreamt of in your philosophy, Harmon, friend of no man, said Prospero. Hmm, said Harmon, unconvinced. The three walked to the edge of the grassy cliff. A narrow path switchbacked down to the beach. From this close, the Atlantic breach looked much more real and strangely terrifying. Waves lapped up on either side of the impossible segment cut out of the ocean. Prospero, said Harmon, you created the Calabani to counter the Voynich's threat. Why do you allow them to rampage? I no longer control them, said the old Magus. Since Setabas arrived? The Magus smiled. I lost control of the Calabani and of Caliban himself many centuries before Setabas. Why did you create the damned things in the first place? Security, said Prospero and he smiled again at the irony of the word. We, the post-humans, said Moira, asked Prospero and his companion to create a race of creatures ferocious enough to stop the replicating Voiniks from flooding into the Mediterranean basin and compromising our operations there. You see, we used the basin for growing food, cotton, tea, and other materials you needed in the orbital islands, finished Harmon, I know. He paused, thinking about what the post had just said. Companion? Do you mean Ariel? No, not Ariel, said Moira. You see, fifteen hundred years ago, the creature we call Sycorax was not yet the— That will do, interrupted Prospero. The hologram actually sounded embarrassed. Harmon didn't want to let it go. But what you told us a year ago is true, isn't it? He asked the Magus. Caliban's mother was Sycorax, and its father was Setabas. Or was that a lie as well? 
No, no, said Prospero. Caliban is a creature out of the witch by a monster. I've been curious how a giant brain the size of a warehouse with dozens of hands bigger than me manages to mate with a human-sized witch, said Harmon. Very carefully, said Moira, rather predictably, Harmon thought. The woman who looked like young Savi pointed to the breach. Are we ready to start? Just another question for Prospero, said Harmon, but when he turned around to speak to the Magus, he was gone. Damn it! I hate it when he does that. He has business to attend to elsewhere, yes, I'm sure, but I wanted to ask him one last time why he's sending me across the Atlantic breach. It doesn't make any sense. I'm going to die out there. I mean, there's no food. I've packed a dozen food bars for you, said Moira. Harmon had to laugh. All right, after a dozen days, then there's no food and no water. Moira pulled a soft, curved, almost flat shape from the rucksack. The thing looked almost like one of the wineskins from the Turin drama, but one that was all but empty. A thin tube ran from it. She handed it to Harmon, and he noticed how cool to the touch it was. A hydrator, said Moira. If there's any humidity in the air at all, this collects it and filters it. If you're in your therm skin, it collects your sweat and exhalations, scrubs them, and provides drinking water that way. You will not die of thirst out there. I didn't bring my therm skin, said Harmon. I packed it for you. You will need it for hunting. Hunting. Fishing might be a better term, said Moira. You can press through the restraining force fields any time and kill fish underwater. You've been underwater in your therm skin before, up on Prospero's Isle ten months ago, so you know that the skin protects you from pressure and the osmosis mask allows you to breathe. What am I supposed to use for bait to get these fish? Moira flashed Savi's quick smile. For sharks, killer whales, and many other denizens of the deep out there, your own body will do quite nicely, my Prometheus. Harmon was not amused. And what do I use to kill the sharks, killer whales, and other denizens of the deep that I might want to eat, harsh language? Moira pulled a handgun from the rucksack and handed it to him. It was black, darker and stubbier, and much less graceful in design than the flechette weapons he was used to, and heavier. But the hand grip, barrel, and trigger were similar enough. This fires bullets, not crystal darts, said Moira. It's an explosive device rather than gas-charged, as with the weapons you've used before. But the principle is obviously the same. There are three boxes of ammunition in your rucksack. Six hundred rounds of self-cavitating ammunition. That means that each bullet creates its own vacuum ahead of itself underwater. Water does not slow it down. This is the safety. It's on now. Press down on the red dot with your thumb to release the safety. It has more recoil than flechette weapons and is much louder, but you'll grow used to that. Harmon hefted the killing device a few times, pointed it at the distant sea, made sure the safety was still on, and set it back in his pack. He'd test it later, once he was out in the breach. I wish we could get a few dozen of these weapons to Artis, he said softly. You can deliver this one to them, said Moira. Harmon balled his right hand into a fist. He wheeled on Moira. More than two thousand miles across here, he said fiercely. I don't know how many miles I can hike a day, even if I do catch these goddamned fish and if your hydrator thing keeps working. Twenty miles a day, thirty? That could be two hundred days of hiking just to get to the east coast of North America. But that kind of progress is only if the land in the breach is flat. And I'm looking at Proxnet and Farnet mapping right now. There are fucking mountain ranges out there, and canyons deeper than the Grand Canyon. Boulders, rock crevasses, great furrows where continental drift dragged entire land masses over the ocean floor. Larger gaps where tectonic plate activity opened up the bottom of the ocean and spewed forth lava. This ocean floor is always recreating itself. It's bigger, rougher, and rockier than it used to be. It'll take me a year to get across, and once I get there, I'll have almost another thousand miles to cover to get back to Ardis, and that's through forests and mountains infested with dinosaurs, saber-toothed cats, and voinix. You and that mutant cyberspace personality can quantum teleport anywhere you want to go and take me with you.
Or you could command a Sony to fly here from any of your post-human hidey holes where you've stashed your toys, and I could be home at Artis helping Ada in a few hours, less. Instead, you're sending me to my death out there, and even if I survive, it'll be many months before I can get back to Artis, and odds are that Ada and everyone I know will be dead, from that Setabas spawn or the Voynix or the winter or starvation. Why are you doing this to me? Moira did not flinch from his fierce gaze. Has Prospero ever spoken to you of the Logosphere's predicators? She asked softly. Predicators? Harmon repeated stupidly. He could feel the adrenaline filling his system beginning to drain away toward despair. In a minute, his hands would be shaking. You mean predictors? No. Predicators, said Moira. They are as unique and often as dangerous as Prospero himself. Sometimes he trusts them. Sometimes he does not. In this case, he has entrusted your life and perhaps the future of your race to them. Moira pulled her hydrator from the rucksack and slung it over her back, shifting the flexible drinking tube so it lay along the side of her cheek. She started down the steep path toward the beach. Harmon remained at the top of the cliff for a minute. Shouldering the rucksack, he shielded his eyes and stared back through the morning glare at the black Eiffelbahn Tower, rising high against the blue sky. The cable car cables ran off to the east. He could not see the next tower from this vantage point. Swiveling, he looked out to the west. Large white birds and smaller white birds, gulls and terns, his protein DNA memory storage told him, wheeled and screeched over the lazy blue sea. The Atlantic breach remained a startling impossibility, its eighty-foot-wide cleft taking on scale now that Moiro was halfway down the cliff face. Harmon sighed, tugged the rucksack straps tighter, already feeling the sweat soaking through his tunic where it met the cotton of the small backpack and began following Moira down the trail toward the beach and the sea. 67. A lot was happening at once. The Queen Mab, all 1,118 feet of her, began her close-encounter arrow-breaking maneuver. The ship's curved pusher plate draped across its derriere, both ship and saucer surrounded by flame and streaking plasma. At the height of the ion storm around the arrow-breaking spaceship, Suma-4 cut loose the dropship. Just as with the spacecraft that had first brought Manmut and Orfu to Mars, no one had gotten around to naming this dropship. It remained just the dropship in their maser and tight-beam conversations. But the Dark Lady was secure in the dropship's hold, and in his environmental control cubby, Monmut kept up a running description of video feeds, both from the dropship's camera and from the Queen Mab, as the stealth-shielded ovoid of the dropship thrust away from the flame-wreathed larger ship, spun through the upper atmosphere at five times the speed of sound, and finally deployed its stubby, high-speed wings when their velocity dropped to a mere Mach 3. Originally, General Bay Binardi had planned to drop earthward with the reconnaissance dropship, but the more imminent threat of the Voices asteroid rendezvous made all the prime integrators vote that the general remain aboard the MAB. Centurion leader Mapahu was in the jump seat of the passenger cargo compartment behind the main control blister on the upper part of the ship, and behind him, strapped into their web seating, Heavy energy weapons locked upright between their black barbed knees rode his command. Twenty five Rockvec belt troopers recently defrosted and briefed on the Queen Mab. Suma Four was an excellent pilot. Monmouth had to admire the way the Ganymedean guided the dropship down through the upper atmosphere, using thrusters so briefly that the ship seemed to be flying itself, and he had to smile when he remembered his own disastrous plunge with Orfu through Mars' atmosphere. Of course, his ship had been charred and broken then, but he could still give credit to a real pilot when he flew with one. The data and radar profile are impressive, tight-beamed Orfu of Io from the hold. What's the visual look like? Blue and white, sent Monmouth. 
all blue and white, more beautiful even than the photographs. The entire earth is ocean below us. All of it, said Orfu, and Monmouth thought it was one of the few times he'd heard his friend sound surprised. All of it, a water world, blue ocean, a million ripples of reflected sunlight, white clouds, cirrus, high ripples, a mass of stratocumulus coming over the horizon above us. No, wait, it's a hurricane, a thousand kilometers across at least. I can see the eye, white, spinning, powerful, amazing. Our track is nominal, said Orfu, coming right up from Antarctica, crossing the South Atlantic toward the northeast. The map's out of atmosphere and on the other side of the earth now, sent Monmouth. The communication sats we needed are working fine. Mab's velocity is down to fifteen kilometers per second and falling. She's climbing back to the polar ring coordinates and decelerating on ion drive. Trajectory is good. She's headed for the rendezvous point the voice gave us. No one's fired on her yet. Even better, sent Orfu, no one's fired on us yet either. Semaphore allowed atmospheric drag to slow them to less than the speed of sound, just as they crossed the bulge of Africa. Their flight plan had called for them to fly over the dried Mediterranean Sea, shooting video and recording data about the odd constructs there. But instruments now told them that there was some sort of energy-damping field extending in a dome up to 40,000 meters above that dried sea. The dropship might fly into that and cease flying altogether. In fact, according to Summa Four, if they flew into that, all the Moravex on board might cease functioning. The Ganymede banked the dropship east across the Sahara Desert, flying in a wide curve around to the south and east of the waterless Mediterranean. The feed continued to flow in from the Queen Mab, carried around the blocking mass of the planet by a score of snowflake-sized repeater satellites. The large spacecraft had reached the coordinates beamed to it by the voice, a small volume of empty space just outside the edge of the orbital ring, some two thousand kilometers from the asteroid city from which the voice had broadcast its, her, messages. Obviously, the voice did not want a spaceship that was propelled by atomic bombs to come within shockwave proximity of her, its orbital home. Beside real-time data the dropship was uplinking, it was getting twenty broadband tight beams of information flowing in, feeds from the Queen Mab's many cameras and external sensors, comm bands from the Mab's bridge, ground data from the various satellites they'd seeded, and multiple feeds from Odysseus. The Moravex had not only rigged the human's clothing with nanocameras and molecular transmitters, they'd mildly sedated Odysseus during his last sleep period and had started to paint cell-sized imagers on the skin of his forehead and hands, but had discovered to their shock that Odysseus already had nanocameras in the skin there. His ear canals also had been modified long before he came aboard the Queen Mab, they realized, with nanosite receivers. The Moravex modified all these so they would send every sight and sound back to the ship's recorders. Other sensors had been installed around his body so that even if Odysseus were to die during the coming rendezvous, data about his surroundings would continue flowing back to the Moravex. At that moment, Odysseus was standing on the bridge with Prime Integrator Astig Chai, Retrograde Sinopesson, Navigator Cho Li, General Bay Binadi, and the other Command Moravex there. Suddenly, Orfu and Monmut perked up as the Queen Mab relayed real-time radio data from the ship's comm. Incoming Mazer message, said Cho Li. Send Odysseus across alone came the sultry female voice from the asteroid city. Use a shuttle which is not armed. If I detect weapons aboard his ship, or if anyone organic or robotic accompanies Odysseus, I will destroy your spacecraft. The plot thickens, said Orfu of Io on the common dropship band. The Moravex in the dropship watched with only a second's delay, as retrograde Sinopesson escorted Odysseus down to the number eight launch bay. Since all of the Hornets were armed, 
Only one of the three Phobos construction shuttles still aboard the Queen Mab would satisfy the voice's requirements. The construction shuttle was tiny, a remote handling ovoid with barely room inside to squeeze in one adult human being, and no life support beyond air and temperature. And as retrograde Cinepesson helped the Achaean fighters squirm into the cable and circuit board cluttered space, the Moravec said, Are you sure you want to do this? Odysseus stared at the spidery Moravec from Amalthea for a long moment. Finally, he said in Greek, I cannot rest from travel. I will drink life to the bees. All times have I enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly, both with those that loved me and alone, on shore and when through the scudding drifts the rainy Hyades vexed the dim sea. I am become a name. Much have I seen and known, cities of men and manners, climates, councils, governments, and myself not least, but honored them all, and drunk delight of battle with my peers far on the ringing plains of windy Troy. How dull it is to pause to make an end, to rust unburnished, not to shine in use. As though to breathe were life, life piled on life were all too little, and of one to me little remains. But every hour is saved from that eternal silence, something more, a bringer of new things, and vile it were for some three sons to store and hoard myself. Close the goddamn door, spider thing. But that's, began Orfu of Io. He's been in the map's library, began Monmouth. Hush, commanded Summa Four. They watched as the shuttle was sealed. Retrograde Cinepesson stayed in the shuttle bay, clinging to a strut, so as not to be swept out in space as the bay dumped all its atmosphere. And then the ovoid shuttle moved out into space on silent peroxide thrusters. The egg-shaped thing tumbled, stabilized, aimed its nose at the orbital asteroid city, only a glowing spark among thousands of other P-ring sparks at this distance, and thrusted away toward the voice. We're coming up on Jerusalem, said Summa Four on the intercom. Monmouth returned his attention to the dropship's various video monitors and sensors. Tell me what you see, old friend, tight beamed Orfu. All right. We're still more than twenty kilometers high. On the unmagnified view, I see the dry Mediterranean Sea about sixty or eighty kilometers to the west. It's a patchwork of red rock, dark soil, and what looks to be green fields. Then along the coast, there's the huge crater that used to be the Gaza Strip, a sort of impact crater, half-moon-shaped inlet to the dry sea, and then the land rises into mountains and Jerusalem is there in the heights on a hill of its own. What does it look like? Let me zoom a bit. Yes. Summa Four is doing an overlay with historical satellite photos, and it's obvious that the suburbs and newer parts of the city are gone. But the old city, the walled city, is still there. I can see the Damascus Gate, the Western Wall, Temple Mount, and the Dome of the Rock. And there's a new structure there, one not in the old satellite photos, something tall and made out of multifaceted glass and polished stone. The blue beam is coming up from it. I'm reviewing the data on the blue beam, sent Orfu. Definitely a neutrino beam sheathed in tachyons. I don't have a clue as to what function that might have, and I bet our best scientists don't either. Oh, wait a minute, said Monmouth. I've zoomed on the old city, and it's crawling with life. People? Humans? No. Those headless, humpy, organic, robotic things? No, tight-beamed Monmouth. Would you just let me describe these things at my own speed? Sorry. There are thousands, more than thousands, of the clawed, fin-footed amphibian things that you suggested look like Caliban from the Tempest. What are they doing? asked Orfu. Just milling around, essentially, sent Monmouth. No, wait. There are bodies on David Street near the Jaffa Gate. More bodies on the Tariq el Wad in the old Jewish section near the Western Wall Plaza. Human bodies? said Orfu. No. 
Those headless, humpy, organic, robotic things. They're pretty torn up. A lot of them look eviscerated. Food for the Caliban monsters? asked Orfu. I have no idea. We're going to overfly the blue beam, Suma 4 broadcast on the intercom. Everyone stay strapped in tight. I need to get some of our boom sensors into the beam itself. Is this wise? Monmouth asked Orfu. Nothing about this expedition to Earth is wise, old friend. We don't have a Margit aboard. A what? Tight beamed Monmouth. Margit sent Orfu of Io. In olden days, the old Jews, long before the Caliphate Wars and the Rubicon, I mean, Back when humans wore bearskins and T-shirts, the old Jews said that a wise person had a Magid, a sort of spiritual counselor from a different world. Maybe we're the Magids, sent Monmouth. We're all from another world. True, sent Orfu, but we're not very wise. Monmouth, did I ever tell you that I'm a Gnostic? Spell that, sent Monmouth. Orfu of Io did so. What the hell is a Gnostic? asked Monmouth. He'd had several revelations about his old friend recently, including the fact that Orfu was an expert on James Joyce and lost-era writers other than Proust, and he wasn't sure he was ready for more. It doesn't matter what a Gnostic is, sent Orfu, but a hundred years before the Christians burned Giordano Bruno at the stake in Venice, they burned a Gnostic a Sufi magus named Solomon Molko in Mantua. Solomon Molko taught that when the change occurred, the dragon would be destroyed without weapons, and everything on earth and in the heavens would be changed. Dragons? Magus? Monmouth said aloud. What? said Suma Four from the cockpit bubble. Say again, calmed centurion leader Mapahu from his jump seat in the troop transport module. Please say that again, came Prime Integrator Astig Che's British-accented voice from the Queen Mab, telling Monmouth that the mothership was monitoring their intercom chatter as well as their official transmissions, but not, he fervently hoped, tapping into their tight-beam conversations. Never mind, sent Monmouth. I'll ask about the dragon and the maguses and such another time. On the intercom, Monmouth said, Sorry, nothing, just thinking out loud. Let's maintain radio discipline, snapped Suma Four. Yes, uh, sir, said Monmouth. Down in the hold, Orfu of Io rumbled in the subsonic. Odysseus' construction shuttle slowly approached the brightly lit glass city girdling the asteroid. Sensors from the shuttle confirmed that the underlying asteroid was roughly potato-shaped, and about twenty kilometers long by almost eleven kilometers in diameter. Every square meter of the asteroid's nickel-iron surface was covered by the crystal city, with the steel, glass, and bucky-carbon towers and bubbles rising to a maximum height of half a kilometer. Sensors showed that the entire structure was pressurized at sea-level Earth normal, that the molecules of air inevitably leaking out through the glass suggested earth norm oxygen nitrogen carbon dioxide mix atmosphere and that the internal temperatures would be comfortable for a human who had lived around the mediterranean sea before the late lost era climate changes someone from odysseus era for instance on the bridge of the queen map a thousand kilometers away and holding all of the command vex monitored their sensors and screens more intently as an invisible tentacle of force-field energy reached out from the crystal asteroid city, grabbed the construction shuttle, and pulled it in toward an airlock-like opening high on the tallest glass tower. Shut down the shuttle's thrusters and autopilot, commanded Cho Lee. Retrograde Sinopesson monitored Odysseus' biotelemetry and said, our human friend is fine, excited, heart rate up a bit, and adrenaline levels rising. He can see out that little window, but otherwise healthy. Holographic images flickered above consoles and the chart table as the shuttle was drawn closer and then pulled into the dark rectangle of the airlock. A glass door slid shut. Sensors on the shuttle registered a force field differential, pushing it down 
substituting for gravity to within 0.68 Earth standard. And then the sensors recorded atmosphere rushing into the large airlock chamber. It was as breathable as the air at Ilium. Radio, maser, and quantum telemetric data is quite clear, reported Choli. The glass of the city wall does not block it. He's not in the city yet, grumbled General Bebinanti. He's just in the airlock. Don't be surprised if the voice cuts off transmissions as soon as Odysseus is inside. They watched on the subjective skin cameras, and so did everyone aboard the dropship some 50,000 kilometers away. As Odysseus uncoiled from the small space, stretched, and began walking toward an interior door. Although wearing soft shipsuit clothing, the human had insisted over all the Moravec's protests on bringing his round shield and short sword. The shield was raised now, and the sword was ready as the bearded man approached the brightly illuminated door. Unless anyone has any further need to study Jerusalem or the neutrino beam, I'll set course for Europe now, Sumafor said over the intercom. No one protested, although Monmouth was busy describing the colors of the old city of Jerusalem to Orfu. The reds of the late afternoon sun on the ancient buildings, the gold gleaming of the mosque, the clay-colored streets and dark gray shadows of the alleys, the shocking, sudden green of olive groves here and there, and everywhere the slick, wet, slimy green of the amphibian creatures. The dropship accelerated to Mach 3 and headed northeast toward the old capital of Dimashk, in what had once been called Syria, or the Kanhotep province of Nian Chen Tangla Shan West. Summa 4, keeping a distance between the aircraft and the dome of nullifying energy over the dried-up Mediterranean. As they covered the length of old Syria and banked sharply left to head west along the Anatolian peninsula, over the bones of old Turkey, the ship fully stealthed, and doing a silent Mach 2.8 at an altitude of 34,000 meters, Monmouth suddenly said, Can we slow down an orbit near the Aegean coast, south of the Hellespont? We can, replied Summa 4 over the intercom, but we're behind schedule for our survey of the Blue Ice City in France. Is there something along the coast up here that's worth our detour and time? The site of Troy, said Monmouth, Ilium. The dropship began decelerating and losing altitude. When it reached the crawling pace of three hundred kilometers per hour, and with the brown and green of the emptied Mediterranean approaching fast, and the water of the Hellespont to the north, Summa Four retracted the stubby delta wings and unfolded the hundred-meter-long multi-planed gossamer wings with their slowly turning propellers. Monmouth softly sang on the intercom, They say that Achilles in the darkness stirred, and Priam and his fifty sons wake all amazed and hear the guns, and shake for Troy again. Who's that? said Orfu. I don't recognize that verse. Rupert Brooke, Monmouth replied on the tight beam. World War I era British poet. He wrote that on his way to Gallipoli, but he never got to Gallipoli, died of disease along the way. I say, boomed General Bay bin Adi on the common band, I can't say much for your radio-disciplined little European, but that's a cracking good poem. On the crystal city in polar orbit, the airlock door slid up and Odysseus entered into the city proper. It was filled with sunlight, trees, vines, tropical birds, streams, a waterfall tumbling from a tall outcropping of lichen-covered stone, old ruins and small wildlife. Odysseus saw a red deer quit munching grass, raise its head, look at the human approaching behind his shield with sword raised, and then walk calmly away. Sensors indicate a humanoid form is approaching, not yet visible through the foliage. Choli radioed to the dropship. Odysseus heard the footsteps before he saw her. Bare feet on packed soil and smooth rock, he lowered his shield and slid his sword into the loop on his broad belt as she came into sight. The woman was beautiful beyond words. 
Even the inhuman Moravex in their steel and plastic shells with organic hearts thumping next to their hydraulic hearts, organic brains and glands nestling next to plastic pumps and nanocyte servo mechanisms. Even the Moravex, 1,000 kilometers away, staring at their holograms, recognized how incredibly beautiful the woman was. Her skin was a tanned brown, her hair long and dark but streaked with blonde, the curls flowing down over her bare shoulders. She wore only the slightest two-piece outfit of glittering but flimsy silk that emphasized her full, heavy breasts and broad hips. Her feet were bare, but there were gold bracelets around her slim ankles and a riot of bracelets on each wrist, silver and gold clasps on her smooth upper arms. As she came closer, Odysseus and the staring Moravex in space and the staring Moravex circling above ancient Troy saw that the woman's eyebrows arched in a sensuous curve over her amazingly green eyes, that her lashes were long and dark, and that what had looked like makeup around those amazing eyes from three meters away resolved into normal shadows and skin tones as she approached to within a meter of the stunned Odysseus. Her lips were soft, full, and very red. In perfect Greek of Odysseus' era, in a voice as soft as a breeze through palms or the rustle of perfectly tuned wind chimes, the beautiful woman said, Welcome, Odysseus. I have been waiting for you for many years. My name is Sycorax. 68. On the second evening of his hike through the Atlantic breach with Moira, Harmon found himself thinking of many things. Something about walking between the two high walls of water. The Atlantic was more than five hundred feet deep here on their second day of walking, now almost seventy miles out from the coast. Was absolutely mesmerizing. A bundle of protein memory stored in modified DNA helixes somewhere near his spine pedantically tugged at Harmon's consciousness and wanted to fill in the details. The word mesmerizing is based upon Franz Anton Mesmer, born May 23, 1734, in Itznang, Swabia, died March 5, 1815, in Meersburg, Swabia, German physician whose system of therapeutics known as mesmerism in which he affected sympathetic control of his patient's consciousness, was the forerunner of the later practice of hypnotism. But Harmon's mind, lost in labyrinths of thought, batted away the interruption. He was getting better at shutting down the non-essential voices roaring in and around his mind, but his head still hurt like a son of a bitch. The five hundred foot high walls of water on each side of the eighty-yard dry path were also frightening, and even two days in the breach hadn't fully acclimated Harmon to the sense of claustrophobia and fear of imminent collapse. He'd actually been in the Atlantic breach once before, two years earlier, when he was celebrating his 98th birthday. Leaving from Faxnode 124, near the Loman Estate on what had once been the New Jersey coast of North America, and walking two days out, two days back, but not covering nearly so much ground as he was with Moira. And the walls of water and deep gloom of the trench had not bothered him so much then. Of course, Harmon thought, I was younger then, and believed in magic. He and Moira had not spoken in several hours, but their strides easily matched each other, and they walked well together in silence. Harmon was analyzing some of the information that now filled his universe, but mostly he was thinking about what he could and should do if he ever did manage to get back to Ardis. The first thing he should do, he realized, is apologize to Ada from the bottom of his heart for having left on that idiotic voyage to the Golden Gate at Machu Picchu. His pregnant wife and unborn child should have come first. Consciously he'd known that then, but he knew it now. Next, Harmon was trying to stitch together a plan for saving his beloved, his unborn child, his friends, and his species. This was not so easy. What was easier, with the million volumes of information that had been literally poured into him, was seeing some options. 
First of all, there were the reawakened functions his mind and body kept exploring, almost one hundred of them. The most important of these, at least in the short term, was the free fax function. Rather than find nodes and activate machinery, the nano-machinery present in every old-style human, and now understood by Harmon, could fax from anywhere to anywhere on the planet Earth, and even, should the interdictions be dropped, from the surface of the planet to selected points in the 1,108,303 objects, machines, and cities in orbit around the Earth. Free faxing could save them all from the Voynix, and from Setabas and his loosened Kalabani, even from Caliban himself. But only if the fax machines and storage modules in orbit were turned back on for humans. Second, Harmon now knew several ways he could get back up to the rings, and even had a vague understanding of the alien witch thing named Sycorax, who now ruled the former post-human orbital universe up there. But he had no clue as to how he and others could overpower Sycorax and Caliban. For Harmon was certain that Setabas had sent his only begotten son up to the rings to interdict the fax function. But if they did prevail, Harmon knew that he would have to drown in more crystal cabinets before he'd have all the technical information he needed to reactivate the complicated fax and sensor satellites. Third, as Harmon studied the many functions now available to him, many of which dealt with monitoring his own body and mind and finding data stored there, he knew that it would not be a problem sharing his newfound information. One of the lost functions was a simple sharing function, a sort of reverse signaling, wherein Harmon could touch another old-style human, select the RNA-DNA caged protein memory packets he wanted to download, and the information would flow through his flesh and skin to the other person. It had been perfected for the little green men prototypes almost two thousand years earlier, and quickly been adapted to human nanocyte function. All old styles had this nano-induced DNA-bound memory capability, and all old styles had the hundred latent functions in their bodies and minds, but it took one informed person to start the rekindling of human abilities. Harmon had to smile. Moira could be, no, was, annoying with her many little in-jokes and obscure references, but he understood now why she kept calling him my young Prometheus. Prometheus, according to Hesiod, meant foresighted or prophetic, and the character Prometheus in Aeschylus and in the works of Shelley, Wu, and other great poets was the titan revolutionary who stole essential knowledge, fire, from the gods and brought it down to the groveling human race, elevating them into something almost like gods. Almost. That's why you disconnected us from our functions, Harmon said not even realizing that he was speaking aloud. What? He looked at the post-human woman walking next to him in the gathering gloom. You didn't want us to become gods. That's why you never activated our functions. Of course. Yet all of the posts except you chose to go off to another world or dimension and play at being gods. Of course. Harmon understood. The first necessity and prerogative for a god, small g or capital G, was to have no other gods before him or her. He concentrated on his thoughts again. Harmon's thinking had changed since the crystal cabinet. Where it once centered on things, places, people, and emotions, it now was mostly figurative. A complicated dance of metaphors, metonymies, ironies, and synecdoches with billions of facts, things, places, and people set into his very cells, the focus of his thoughts had shifted to the connections and shades and nuances and recognition side of things. Emotions were still there, stronger, if anything, but where his feelings had once surged like some big, booming bass overpowering the rest of the orchestra, they now danced like a delicate but powerful violin solo. Much, too much, murky metaphor for a mere measly man, thought Harmon, looking with irony at the presumption of his own thoughts. And an awful lot of alliteration from an anxious asshole. 
Despite his self-mockery, he knew that he now owned the gift of being able to look at things, people, places, things, feelings himself, with the kind of recognition that can only come from maturing into nuance, growing into oneself, and in the learning how to accept ironies and metaphors and synecdoches and metonymies, not only in language, but in the hardwiring of the universe. If he could reconnect with his own kind, get back to any old-style human enclave, not just back to artists, his new functions would change humankind forever. He would not force them on anyone, but since this iteration of Homo sapiens was very close to being eradicated from this post-postmodern world, he doubted if anyone under attack by Voynich, Kalabani, and a giant soul-sucking brain skittering around on multiple hands would object too strenuously to gaining new gifts, powers, and a survival advantage. Are these functions in the long run a survival advantage for my species? Harmon asked himself. The answer, which came in his own mental voice, was the clear cry of a Zen master hearing a stupid question from one of his acolytes. Moo, meaning roughly, unask the question, stupid. This syllable was often followed by the equally monosyllabic quats which was the Zen master's cry, simultaneous with leaping and striking the stupid student about the head and shoulders with the heavy, weighted teacher's staff. Moo. There is no long run here. That will be for my sons and daughters and their children to decide. Right now everything, everything, exists in the short run. And the threat of being disemboweled by a hump-backed Voynix tends to focus the mind wonderfully well. If the functions were turned back on, Harmon knew why the old functions, including the finder function, all net, proxnet, far net, as well as sigling, were not working. Someone up there in the rings had turned off the transmissions as surely as they'd switched off the fax machines. If the functions were turned back on, but how could they be turned back on? Once again, Harmon studied the problem of getting back up to the rings and switching everything back on. Power, servitors, fax, all of the functions. He needed to know if there were others besides Sycorax up there waiting and what their defenses were. The million books he'd ingested in the crystal cabinet had no opinion on this crucial question. Why won't you or Prospero QT me up to the rings, asked Harmon. He turned to look at Myra and realized that he could just barely see her in the failing light. Her face was illuminated mostly by ring light. We choose not to, she said in her most maddening Bartleby fashion. Harmon thought of the slug-throwing gun in his pack on the back. Would brandishing a weapon in her direction and allowing her to read the sincerity in his face since the post-humans had their own functions for reading and understanding human reactions. Would that combination convince her to quantum teleport him to Ardis or the rings? He knew it wouldn't. She would never have given him the gun if it were a threat to her. She had some countermeasure built into the weapon. Perhaps she could keep it from firing just by the force of her post-human thoughts. Some simple brainwave circuitry built into the firing mechanism, or something equally as foolproof and bulletproof built into her. You and the Magus went to all that trouble to kidnap me, ship me across India to the Himalayas, just to stick me in the crystal cabinet, drown me, and educate me, said Harmon. These were the most words he'd strung together since they'd begun hiking the breach, and he realized how banal and redundant they were. Why did you do that if you don't want me to prevail against Setabos and the other bad guys? Moira did not smile again. If you're meant to get to the rings, you'll find a way up there. Meant to sounds like some sort of Calvinist predestination, said Harmon, stepping over a low lump of desiccated coral. The breach so far had been surprisingly easy iron bridges over the few ocean-bottom abysses they'd encountered, paths blasted or lasered into rocky or coral ridges, gentle inclines for the most part, 
and metal cables to help them descend or ascend where the going was steep. So Harmon had not had to spend much time watching his feet, but it was hard to see detail in this falling light. Moira had not responded or visibly reacted to his feeble witticism, so he said, There are other firmaries. Prospero told you that before. Yeah, but it's just sunk in. We old styles don't have to die or rebuild medicine from scratch. There are more rejuvenation tanks up there. Yes, of course. The post-humans prepared to serve an old-style population of one million. There are other firmaries and blue worm tanks on other orbital isles in both the equatorial and polar rings. Surely this is obvious. Yes, obvious, said Harmon. But you have to remember that I have all the savvy of a newborn babe. I have not forgotten that, said Moira. I don't have specific data on where the other firmaries are, said Harmon. Can you pinpoint them for me? I'll point them out for you after we douse the campfire tonight, Moira said dryly. No, I mean on a chart of the rings. Do you have a chart of the rings, my young Prometheus? Is that part of what you ate and drank back at the Taj? No, said Harmon. But you can draw one for us. Orbital coordinates, everything. Are you pondering immortality so soon after birth, then, Prometheus? Am I? wondered Harmon. Then he remembered his last thought before the realization that other firmaries were in mothballs up there in the post-human rings. It had been of Ada, pregnant and injured. Why were all the operative fax-in, fax-out healing tanks on Prospero's Isle, he asked. Even as he asked the question, he'd seen the answer like a memory of a forgotten nightmare. Prospero arranged that to keep his captive Caliban fed, said Mora. Harmon felt his stomach lurch. Part of that was his reaction to having ever felt any friendly or forgiving thoughts toward the Logosphere Avatar Magus. But most of the sudden surge of nausea came from the fact that he'd not eaten anything since two bites of that day's food bar before dawn that morning, and he'd forgotten even to drink from his hydrator tube in the past few hours. Why are you stopping? he asked Moira. It's too dark to walk, said the posthuman. Let's build our fire and cook our weenies and roast some marshmallows and sing camp songs. Then you can get a few hours sleep and dream of living forever in the bright future of the blue worm tanks. You know, said Harmon, you can really be a sarcastic pain in the ass sometimes. Moira smiled now. Her smile was Cheshire cat-like almost the only detail he could see of her in the breech-trench darkness. When my many sisters were here, she said, before they all flew off to become gods, many of them male gods, which I thought was a demotion, they used to tell me the same thing. Now pull that dried wood and seaweed that we've been picking up all day out of your pack and start us a nice fire. That's a good little old style. 69. Mommy, Mommy, I'm so scared. It's so cold and dark down here. Mommy, come help me get out. Mommy, please. Ada awoke just half an hour after falling asleep in the cold early hours of the dark winter morning. The child voice in her mind felt like a small, cold and unwelcome hand inside her clothes. Mommy, please, I don't like it here. It's cold and dark, and I can't get out. The rock is too hard. I'm hungry. Mommy, please help me get out of here. Mommy! As exhausted as she was, Ada forced herself out of her bedroll and into the cold air. The survivors, there were forty-eight now, one week and five days after their return to the ruins of Artis, had made tents out of salvaged canvas, and Ada now slept with four other women. The cluster of tents in the original lean-to next to the well formed the center of a new palisade, with the sharpened stakes set only a hundred feet out from the center of the tent city and the tumbled ruins of the original artist's hall. Mommy, please, Mommy. The voice was there much of the time now, 
and although Ada had learned to ignore it during most of her waking day, it kept her from sleeping. Tonight, this dark pre-dawn morning, it was much worse than usual. Ada pulled on her trousers, boots, and heavy sweater, and stepped out of the tent, moving as quietly as she could, so as not to awaken Ella and her other tentmates. There were a few people awake by the center campfire. There always were, all through the night, and sentries out on the new walls, but the area between Ada and the pit was empty and dark. It was very dark. Thick clouds had blocked the starlight and ring light, and it smelled like snow was on the way. Ada stepped carefully as she made her way to the pit. Some people still preferred sleeping outdoors now that they'd stitched together and lined better bedrolls and sleeping bags. She didn't want to step on anyone. Just in her fifth month of pregnancy, Ada already felt fat and clumsy. Mommy! She hated that damned voice. With a real child growing inside her, she couldn't tolerate the pleading, whining, ersatz child voice coming from that thing in the pit, even if it was just a mental echo. She wondered if her own baby's developing neural system could pick up this telepathic invasion. She hoped not. Mommy, please let me out. It's dark down here. They'd decided to have one person standing guard at the pit at all times, and tonight it was Demon. She knew the thin, muscular silhouette with its flechette rifle slung over his shoulder even before she could make out his face. He turned to her as she came up to the edge of the pit. Can't sleep, he whispered. It won't let me, she whispered back. I know, said Demon. I can always hear it when it targets you with its pleading faint but audible, a sort of tickling at the back of the brain. I hear the thing calling Mommy, and just want to unload this magazine of flechettes into it. That's probably a good idea, said Ada, staring down at the metal grill welded and bolted into rock above the pit. The grill was large, heavy, and fine-meshed. They'd taken it from the old cistern near the ruins of Ardis Hall and the Satabas baby had already grown to the point where it couldn't get its stalk-wandering hands through the mesh. The pit itself was only fourteen feet deep, but they'd hacked it and blasted it out of solid rock, and strong as the monstrous thing down there was, the many-eyed, many-handed brain part of it was now more than four feet long, and its hands were stronger every day. It wasn't strong enough to tear the grill's bolts and welded sunken rods out of the rock. Not yet. A good idea, except for the fact that we'd have twenty thousand Voynichs on us in five minutes if we kill the thing, whispered Demon. Ada didn't have to be reminded of this, but hearing it said aloud made the coldness and chill of nausea creep deeper into her. The Sony was up now in the cloudy dark, doing its slow reconnaissance orbits. The news was the same every day. The Voynichs stayed away, in an almost perfect circle with a radius of just under two miles from what could be this last human encampment on Earth. Yet the numbers kept growing. Grayogi had estimated at least 20,000 to 25,000 of the dull, silvery things out there in the treeless forests yesterday afternoon. There would be more at first light this morning. There were more each day. It was as certain as the weak, wintry sunrises. It was as certain as the fact that the pleading, whining, insinuating mental voice coming up from the pit would never stop until it got free. And then what, wondered Ada. She could imagine. Just the presence of the thing had cast a pall over the artist's survivors. It was hard enough just to get through the days building and expanding their little tents and shacks salvaging what they could from the ruins, improving their hopeless little log fort, not to mention getting enough to eat, without the Setabas baby's evil whining in their minds. Food was a serious issue. All the cattle had been driven away during the massacre, and Sony outings had found only their rotting carcasses in distant fields and on the winter forest floor. The Voynichs had slaughtered them as well, and with the soil frozen and even the hope of gardens or crops or planting months away, and with the canned and preserved goods that had been in the basement of Artist Manor, now merely melted blobs under charred rubble, 
The 48 artist survivors depended on the hunters who went out in the Sony every day. There was no game within the four-mile circle of the Voynich's army, so every day two men or women with flechette guns risked a trip beyond the Voynich's. A longer trip every day as the deer and larger game fled the area. And every evening, if they were lucky, a mule deer or wild pig would turn on the spit above the central cooking fire. But they hadn't been that lucky recently. They didn't have fresh meat every day, and fewer hunts provided them an animal to kill within the increasing radius of their flights. So they preserved what they could with smoking and with the remaining precious salt salvaged from the storehouses, and they munched on their monotonously bad-tasting jerky, and they watched the Voynichs continue massing, and each day and night their moods grew darker with the Setabas baby constantly sending its white, clammy hands and tendrils of telepathy into their brains. Even while they slept, and like the game they hunted from the Sony, sleep grew increasingly harder to find. Another few days, Stephen said softly, and I think it will be able to tear its way out of this cage. He took the burning torch from its niche several feet away and held it out over the pit. The size of a small calf, its brain surface gleaming with moist gray mucus, Setabas baby was hanging from the grill. Half a dozen of its tendrilled hands gripped the dark iron mesh. Eight or ten yellow eyes squinted, blinked, and closed at the sudden flare of light. Two of its feeding mouths pulsed open, and Ada stared in fascination at the rows of small, white teeth in each. Mommy, it squeaked. It had been speaking for the last week, but its actual voice was nowhere near as human-sounding or childlike as its telepathic voice. Yes, whispered Ada, we'll call a general meeting today, let everyone vote on the time, but we have to make final preparations for departure soon. The plan pleased almost none of them, but it was the best they had come up with. While Demon and a few others stood guard on the baby, they would begin evacuating materials and people to an island they'd scouted about thirty-five miles downriver from Ardis. It was not the Paradise Isle Demon had wanted to fax to somewhere on the far side of the world, but this small rocky islet was in the center of the river. The currents ran fast there, and most important, the ground was defensible. They all assumed that the Voynichs were faxing in somehow, from somewhere, although daily checks of the artist's fax note showed that it was still inoperable. That meant that the Voynichs could easily follow them, perhaps even fax to the island. But the forty-eight survivors could cluster and set their camp on a grassy depression on the center knob of the isle, hunt and bring in their food via Sony, the way they were doing now, and the island was so small that the Voynichs would have trouble faxing in more than a few hundred at a time. They might be able to kill or drive off that many. The last men and women to leave Ardis, and Ada fully intended to be the last woman, would kill the Setabos spawn. And then the Voynichs would flood over this hallowed place like frenzied grasshoppers. But the rest of the survivors would be on the island and safe. Safe for a few hours, Ada guessed. Could Voynich swim? Ada and the others had searched their memories for any instance of seeing one of their slave Voynichs swimming way back in the ancient history, before the sky fell ten months earlier. Before Harmon and dead Savi and Demon had destroyed the firmary along with Prospero's Isle. Before the end of their foolish world of parties and endless faxing and safety. No one could be sure if they had ever seen a Voynich swim. But Ada was sure in her own heart the Voynichs could swim. They could walk along the bed of the river under all that water and in all that swift current if they had to. They would get to the humans on their little island once the Setabos baby was dead. And then the survivors, if there were any, would have to flee again. But to where? Ada's vote was for the Golden Gate at Machu Picchu, since she remembered well Pater's description of the Voynich's mast there being unable to get into the green environmental bubbles clustered on the bridge towers and suspension cables. But the majority of the others had not wanted to go to the bridge they'd never seen. 
It was too far away. It would take too long to get there. They'd be caught inside the glass structures, high above nothing, with Voynix all around them. Ada had told them how Harmon, Pater, Hannah, and no man Odysseus had reached the bridge in less than an hour, hurtling up into the fringes of space and then tearing back down into the atmosphere above the southern continent. She explained how the Sony still had that flight plan in its memory, how a trip to the Golden Gate at Machu Picchu would take only a few minutes longer than the ferry down the river to the rocky island. But they still did not want to try that, not yet. But Ada and Demon continued to make their plans for that long evacuation. Suddenly there came a sound from above the dark line of trees to the southwest, a sort of rattling, hissing noise. Demon unslung his flechette rifle and held it ready, clicking off the safety. Voynix, he shouted. Ada bit her lip, the setabas thing at her feet forgotten for a moment, its mental urgings drowned out by real noise. Someone by the central fire was ringing the main alarm bell. People were stumbling out of the big lean-to and the other tents and yelling to wake others. I don't think so, said Ada, almost shouting so Demon could hear her over the din. It didn't sound right. When the bell quit clanging and the shouts died down, she could hear it more clearly now, a metallic, rasping, mechanical noise, not like the sibilant leap and rustle of a thousand Voynichs attacking. Then a light became visible, a searchlight stabbing down from the sky only a few hundred feet up, the shaft and circle of light illuminating bare branches, frozen and fire-blackened grass, the palisade walls and the shocked sentries on the crude ramparts there. The Sony did not have a spotlight. Get the rifles, Ada shouted at the group milling near the central fire. Some people had weapons, others grabbed them and readied them. Spread out, shouted Demon, running toward the clustered crowd and waving his arms. Take cover, Ada agreed. Whatever this thing was, if it had hostile intentions, there was no need to help it by clustering up like fat and happy targets. The humming and rasping grew so loud that it drowned out even the warning bell that someone had redundantly and wildly begun ringing again. Ada could see it now, something mechanical flying, something much bigger than their Sony, but also much slower and more awkward. Something not the sleek oval of their Sony, but like two lumpy circles with the skittering searchlight stabbing out from the front circle. The thing bobbed and wavered as if it were ready to crash, but it cleared the low palisade walls. A sentry throwing himself to the ground to avoid protuberances on the flying machine and then skidded roughly across the frozen grass not that far from the pit, rose into the air again, and then settled heavily. Demon and Ada ran toward it, Ada running as well as her five months of pregnancy would allow her to, and carrying a torch, and Demon with the automatic flechette rifle raised and aimed at the dark shapes, now clambering out of the landed machine. The dark shapes were people, eight of them by Ada's quick count. She saw faces she did not recognize, but the last two out of the machine, the two who had been at the controls near the front of the forward metal circle, were Hannah and Odysseus, or no man, as he'd asked to be called the last few months before he was injured and taken to the bridge. And then Ada and Hannah were hugging, both of them weeping, but Hannah sobbing almost hysterically. When they paused to look at each other, Hannah gasped, Artis Hall, where is it? Where is everyone? What's happened? Is Pater all right? Pater is dead, said Ada, feeling the flatness of her own emotional reaction to the words. Too much horror had happened in too short a period of time. She felt that her soul had been bruised. The Voynichs attacked in force shortly after you left. They overran the walls, used rocks as missiles. The house burned. M.A. is dead. Riemann is dead. Pain is dead. She went down the list of those old friends who had died in the attack and after. Hannah! who had always been thin but who looked much thinner in the torchlight, covered her mouth in horror. Come, said Ada, touching no man's wrist and putting her arm around Hannah again. You all look starved. Come to the fire. It will be dawn soon. You can introduce your friends and we'll get you some food. I want to hear all about everything. They sat by the fire until the winter sun rose exchanging information as unemotionally as they could under the circumstances. 
Layman cooked a rich morning stew, and they had that and tin cups of almost the last of the thick, rich coffee they'd found in one of the only partially burned storehouses. The five new people, three men and two women, were named Beeman, Elian, Stefe, Iyai, and Susan. Elian was the leader, a completely bald man who carried the authority of age and who might have been almost as old as Harmon. All were bandaged or had been slightly wounded, and as the others talked, Tom and Ceres tended to their injuries with what medical supplies were left. Ada very quickly filled in her young friend Hannah, who somehow did not seem so young anymore, and the silent no man on the saga of the Ardis massacre, the days and nights on Starved Rock, the non-functioning fax node, the massing of the Voiniks, and the hatching and containment of the Setabos baby. I felt the thing in my mind even before we landed, no man said softly. While Hannah began her tale, the barrel-chested and grey-bearded Greek, clad only in his rough tunic even in the freezing weather, walked over to the pit and stared down at its captive. Odysseus came out of his recovery crash three days after Ariel took Harmon away, said the dark-haired young woman with the lustrous eyes. The Voinix continued to try to get in, but Odysseus reassured me that they couldn't as long as the zero friction field was on. We ate, slapped, Hannah lowered her eyes here for a minute, and Ada knew that the two had done more than sleep. We expected Pater to return for us as he'd promised, but after a week Odysseus began work, trying to assemble the fragments of Sony's and other flying machines we'd seen in the garage, hangar, whatever one should call it. I did most of the welding, Odysseus did the circuit board and propulsion system work, when we ran out of parts we needed, I scavenged through the rest of the Golden Gate bubbles and secret rooms. He got the thing to hover and fly a little bit within the hangar. It's made up mostly of two servitor-type flying machines called sky rafts, not made for long-distance travel. But we had trouble with the guidance and control systems. Finally, Odysseus had to dismantle part of a lesser AI that operated some of the bridge kitchen leaving the cooking and recipe parts, but lobotomizing it to handle navigation and attitude for the raft. It's not happy flying that clumsy machine. It keeps wanting to cook us breakfast and suggest recipes. Ada and some of the others laughed at this. There were more than a dozen people listening, including Grayogi, one-handed layman, Ella, Adide, Bowman, and the two medics. The five injured newcomers were now eating their hot stew and listening in silence. The snow that Ada had smelled hours earlier now came down lightly, but did not stick to the ground. Sunlight actually peeked through the scudding clouds. Finally, when we felt sure that Ariel wasn't bringing Harmon back and that Pater or none of the rest of you were returning for us, we filled the raft with supplies. We brought more weapons that I found in another secret room opened the hangar doors and headed north, hoping that the repellers would keep us airborne and the crude navigation system would get us to the general vicinity of Ardis. Was this yesterday? asked Ada. It was nine days ago, said Hannah. Seeing Ada's shocked reaction, the younger woman went on, This thing flies slowly, Ada, fifty or sixty miles per hour at top speed. And it had problems. We lost most of the food supplies when we actually went down in the sea where Odysseus says the Isthmus of Panama used to be. Lucky for us, he'd added the flotation bags to the raft so that it could act like a real raft for a few hours while we jettisoned weight and Odysseus hammered the flight systems into working again. Did you have Elion and the others with you then? asked Bowman. Hannah shook her head, sipped more coffee and huddled over the warm tin cup as if it was giving her necessary heat. We had to stop along the coast once we crossed the Isthmus Sea, she said. There was a fax node community there. You've been to it, I think, Ada. Hughestown. There was that tall, plascrete skyscraper there with all the ivy. I went to a 320 party there once, said Ada, remembering the view of the sea from a terrace high atop that tower. She'd been young, not quite fifteen. It had been around the time she'd first met her pudgy cousin, Demon, 
and she remembered an awakening sense of sensuality from those days. Elian cleared his throat. The man had livid scars on his face, forearms, and hands, and his clothing was more a mass of torn rags than anything else, but he carried himself with strong authority. There were more than two hundred of us in the Node community when the Voynix attacked a month ago, he said in a soft but deep voice. We had no weapons, but the primary Hughes Town Tower was too tall for them to leap onto easily. Something about the outside surface of the tower made it hard for them to cling and climb there. And the overhanging terraces made defense easier than any other place else we could retreat to. We barricaded the stairways. The power for the elevators had gone off back during the fall of the skies, of course, and used whatever we could find for weapons. Servitor tools, iron bars, crude bows and arrows made of metal cables, and leaf springs from barouches and droshkis. Anything. The Voynix got most of us. Half a dozen or so of us made it to the fax pavilion and faxed away for help before the fax quit working. And the five others and I were on the penthouse of the Hughes Town Tower, with five hundred Voynix occupying everything. We'd been out of food for five days and out of water for two, when we saw No Man's and Hannah's sky raft lumbering in over the gulf. We had to jettison more of the food and medical supplies and even most of the guns and flechette ammunition to make up for the extra weight, Anna said sheepishly. And we had to land three more times to work on it. But it finally got us here. How did its navigation system know how to find Artis? asked Kasman. The thin-bearded Artis survivor had always been interested in machinery. Hannah laughed. It didn't. It could barely find what Odysseus calls North America. He guided us here, Odysseus, following first one big river he calls the Mississippi, and then our own artist river, which he called the Leonica or Ohio. And then we saw your fire. You flew on at night? asked Ada. We had to. There were too many dinosaurs and saber-tooths down in the forests south of here to risk landing for very long. We all took turns helping fly the thing while Odysseus caught naps, but he's been awake for most of seventy-two hours. He looks well again, said Ada. Hannah nodded. The recovery crash healed most of the wounds the Voynix inflicted on him. We were right to bring him back to the bridge. He would have died otherwise. Ada was silent a minute, thinking of how that decision had taken Harmon from her. As if reading her friend's mind, Hannah said, we looked for Harmon, Ada, even though Odysseus was sure that Ariel had quantum teleported him somewhere. That's like faxing, only more powerful somehow. It's what the gods did in the Turin drama. Even though Odysseus was sure that the Ariel thing had QT'd him far away, we flew down and searched the old Machu Picchu ruins below the Golden Gate, and even looked along the nearby rivers and waterfalls and valleys. There was no sign of Harmon. He's still alive. Ada said simply. She touched her swollen belly as she said this. She always did. It was not only a part of her connection to Harmon, but it seemed to confirm that her intuitive feeling was accurate. It was almost as if Ada's unborn child knew that Harmon still lived somewhere. Yes, said Hannah. Did you see any other fax node communities? asked Lois. Any other survivors? Hannah shook her head. Ada noticed that her young friend's always short hair had grown out some. We stopped at two other nodes between Hughestown and Artis, said Hannah, small population nodes, Live Oak and Holmanica. They'd both been sacked by Voynix. There were Voynix carcasses and human bones left. Nothing more. How many people do you think died there? Ada asked softly. Hannah shrugged and sipped the last of her coffee. No more than forty or fifty total, she said, with the unemotional lack of affect common to all the artist survivors. Nothing like the disaster here, Hannah looked around. I can feel something scrabbling at my mind like a bad memory. That's the little setaboss, said Ada. It wants to get in our minds and out of its pit. She always thought of the thing's whole as the pit with a capital P. 
Aren't you afraid that its mother, father, whatever that thing in Paris Crater was the demon saw will come for it? Ada looked over to where Demon was standing by the pit, speaking earnestly to no man. The big set of boss hasn't showed up yet, she said. We're more worried about what the little one will do. She described to them all how the many-handed things seemed to suck energy out of the earth where someone had died horribly. Hannah shivered, even though the sunlight was stronger now. We saw the Voinics in the woods with our searchlight, she said softly, countless numbers of them. Row upon row of them, just standing there under the trees and along the ridge lines, the closest about two miles out, I think. What are you going to do? Ada told her about the plan for the island. Elian cleared his throat again. Excuse me, he said. It's not my business, and I know I don't get a vote here, but it seems to me that a rocky island like that would put you in our position in the tower. The Voiniks would keep coming and you have so many more around you here, and you'd die off one by one. Some place like the bridge that Hannah told us about seems to make more sense. Ada nodded. She didn't want to argue strategies quite yet. Too many of the listening artist survivors sitting around this circle would vote for the island. You do get a vote here, Elian, she said instead. Every one of you does. You're part of our community now. Any refugee we find will be. And you get as much of a vote as I do. Thank you for your opinion. We're all going to discuss this at the noon meal, and even the sentries will vote by proxy. I think you should get some sleep before then. Elian, Beeman, the blonde Iyai, who somehow had remained beautiful despite her scratches and rags, and the short, silent woman named Susan, and the big, bearded man named Stefe, nodded and moved off with Tom and Ceres, to find empty bedrolls under canvas somewhere. You should sleep too, Ada said, touching Hannah's forearm. What happened to your wrist, Ada? Ada looked down at the rough plaster cast and grubby bandage. I broke it during the fight here. It's nothing. I'm interested that the Voinix disappeared from the Golden Gate at Machu Picchu. It makes me think we're fighting a finite number of the things, if they have to redeploy, I mean. A finite number, agreed Hannah, but Odysseus thinks there are more than a million Voinix and fewer than a hundred thousand of us humans. She thought a second and added, a hundred thousand of us before the slaughters began. Does no man have any idea why the Voinix are killing us? asked Ada, holding Hannah's strong hand now. I think he does, but he hasn't told me, said Hannah. There's a lot he keeps to himself. That's the understatement of the twenty, thought Ada. Aloud, she said, you look exhausted, my dear. You really should get some sleep. One Odysseus does, said Hannah, meeting Ada's gaze with something like the bashfulness, defiance, and pride of a young lover. Ada nodded again. Demon stepped up to the fire. Ada, could we see you a minute? Touching Hannah's shoulder, Ada rose awkwardly and followed Demon back to the pit where no man stood. The man they'd once called Odysseus was not much taller than Ada, but he was so solid and muscular that he emanated power. Ada could see the curly gray hairs on his chest through the open tunic. Admiring our pet? asked Ada. No man did not smile. He scratched his beard, looked down into the pit at the strangely quiescent baby, and then returned his dark-eyed gaze to Ada. You'll have to kill it, he said. We plan to. I mean quickly, said no man Odysseus. These things aren't so much babies of the real Cetabas as lice. Lice, Ada said, I can hear its thoughts. And you'll hear them more and more loudly until the thing comes up out of there. It probably could already if it wanted to, and sucks the energy and souls right out of your bodies. Ada blinked and looked down into the pit. The baby's two-hemisphered brain back was just a gray glow down there. It was on the floor of the pit now, tendrils and hands reeled in, its motile hands tucked under its mucousy body, its many eyes closed. The eggs hatch, and these things swarm out, continued no man. They're like scouts for the real set of us. These things only grow to be about twenty feet long. They find food in the soil and then return to the original set of us. I don't know quite how they travel so far. Brain holes, probably. 
This one's not quite old enough to summon a hole. And when they report back, the big Cetabas thanks them for the information and eats them, absorbing all the evil and terror these babies have sucked up from the world. How do you know so much about Cetabas and his lice? asked Ada. No man shook his head as if that were too unimportant to deal with now. And when are you going to start treating that sweet Hannah with the love and attention she deserves, you male pig, thought Ada. No man had something important to tell us, ask us, said Demon. Ada's friend looked worried. I need to take the Sony, said No man. Ada blinked again. Take it where? Up to the rings, said No man. For how long? asked Ada. She was thinking, you can't take the Sony, and she knew the demon was thinking the same thing. I don't know, said Odysseus in that strange accent of his. Well, began Ada, it's out of the question that you take the Sony. We need it to escape this place. We need it for hunting. We'll need it for... I have to take the Sony, repeated No Man. It's the only machine on this continent that can get me up there, and I don't have time to fly to China or somewhere to find another and the Calabani will have made the Mediterranean basin unapproachable by now. Well, said Ada again, hearing the edge of rock-hard stubbornness that only rarely powered her voice, you can't just take the Sony. We'll all die. That's not so important right now, said the gray-bearded warrior. Ada started to laugh, but ended up only staring, her mouth partially open in amazement. It's important to us, no man. We want to live. He shook his head, as if Ada had not understood. No one on this planet is going to live unless I can get up to the rings, and today, he said. I need the Sony. If I can, I'll bring it back, or send it back to you. If I can't, well, it won't matter. Ada wished she had a flechette rifle with her. She glanced at the one the demon carried, still unslung. He carried it casually. No man seemed to have no weapon on him, but Ada had seen how strong this man was. I need the Sony, no man said again, today. Now. No, said Ada. Down in the pit, the many-handed orphan suddenly began a wailing, snorting, coughing sound that ended in a noise that sounded very much like a human laugh. Seventy. A storm was raging far above them. The rings and stars had long since disappeared, and lightning illuminated the vertical walls of water on either side, and the obscenely pale slash of the breach stretching away so far to the east and west that the lightning did not last long enough to show its immensity. Now, however, the lightning flashes overlapped, thunder exploding and echoing down the hallway of energy-bound water, and, lying on his back snug in his silk-thin sleeping bag and thermskin, Harmon could see the waves fifty stories above, rising and thrashing another hundred or so feet as the Atlantic Ocean threw itself into the frenzy of the storm. The whipping, writhing clouds were only a few hundred feet above the towering waves. And while the dark depths on either side stayed calm here, more than five hundred feet below the surface, Harmon could see the layers of agitation far above him. Also agitated were the funnel bridges, they didn't have a good name for the transparent tubes and cones and energy-bound tunnels of water that connected the Atlantic south of the breach to the Atlantic north of it, and Moira simply called them conduits. There was such a funnel bridge visible two hundred feet above the dry bottom of the breach, visible when the lightning flashed at least, less than a half mile to the west of where they had camped, and another a mile or so behind them to the east. Both water tunnels were broiling with activity, huge quantities of white water surging from one side of the breach to the other. Harmon wondered if more water was forced to cross the breach during storms. Certainly there was more water falling on them now. The shifting energy walls kept the high waves from pouring over and drowning them, but the spray drifted down as a constant mist. Harmon's outer clothes were tucked away in his rucksack, which was completely waterproof, he'd discovered as was the thin-skinned sleeping bag, but he'd left the osmosis mask open on his thermskin cowl, and his face was damp. Whenever he licked his lips, he tasted salt. Lightning struck the floor of the breach less than a hundred yards from them, 
The percussion from the thunder shook Harmon's molars. Should we move? He shouted at Moira, who was in her own thermskin. She stripped naked and pulled on the thermskin right in front of him with no sign of embarrassment, almost as if they were lovers, which he realized with a blush they had been. What? shouted Moira. His voice had been lost in the crash of wave and roars of thunder. Should we move? She slid her sleeping skin closer and leaned over to speak close to his ear. She'd left her face exposed as well and was just lying on the sleeping bag, and the mist had soaked the outer layer of the skin-tight therm skin, showing every rib and rise of hip bone. The only place we can move to be safe, she said loudly next to his ear, is underwater. We'd be safe from the lightning there at the bottom of the ocean. Want to adjourn? Harmon didn't. The thought of stepping through the force field barrier into that almost absolute dark and terrible pressure, even if the magical therm skin would keep him from drowning or being crushed, was more than he wanted to deal with this night. Besides, the storm seemed to be letting up a bit. The waves up there only looked to be sixty or eighty feet tall now. No thanks, he shouted back to Moira. I'll risk it here. He rubbed his face dry and pulled the film-thin osmosis mask in place. Without the salt sting in his eyes and mouth, it was easier to concentrate. And Harmon had a lot to concentrate on. He was still trying to sort out his new human functions. Many of these newly acquired, although identified, would be a better word, functions, had been interdicted along with his free fax abilities. For instance, Harmon clearly saw how he could trigger access to the logosphere to acquire information or to communicate with anyone anywhere. But those functions had been interrupted by whoever or whatever was running the rings these days. Other functions worked just fine, but did not necessarily add to Harmon's peace of mind. There was a medical monitor function that, when queried, told and showed Harmon that his diet of food bars and water would lead to certain vitamin deficiencies if he continued it for more than three months. It also informed him that calcium was building up in his left kidney, resulting in a kidney stone in a year or less, that there were two polyps in his colon since his last firmary visit, that his muscles were deteriorating because of age, it had after all been ten years since his last firmary tune-up, that a strep virus was failing to set up a colony in his throat because of his genetic cued defenses, that his blood pressure was too high, and that there was the slightest of shadows on his left lung that should demand immediate attention by firmary sensors. Great, thought Harmon, rubbing his therm-skinned chest as if the slight shadow that he was sure was lung cancer was already beginning to ache. What do I do with this information? The firmaries are a little out of bounds to me right now. Other functions served more immediate purposes. In the last few days he'd discovered that he had a replay function through which he could relive with amazing clarity, much more like experiencing something in reality than through memory, any point or event in his life, pinpointing the memory in a protein memory bundle rather than in his brain, uploading it and timing the replay to the second. He'd already replayed a few minutes of his first meeting with Ada nine times. His memory couldn't have told him that she'd been wearing that light blue gown on the evening he met her at a fax-in party, and had replayed moments from the last time they'd made love more than thirty times. Moira had even commented on his fixed stare and robotic walk when he'd been replaying. She knew what he was up to, especially since neither his therm skin nor outer clothes had hidden his reaction. Harmon had enough sense to know that this function was addictive and that he must use it very, very carefully, especially while hiking across the bottom of the ocean. But he'd flashed back to certain dialogues he'd had with Savi to mine more data out of things she'd said about the past, or about the rings, or about the world, things that had seemed nonsensical or mysterious then, but made more sense now after the Crystal Cabinet. He also realized with a great sadness that Savi had been working from very incomplete information in her centuries of attempts to get up to the rings to negotiate with the post-humans, including her lack of knowledge of real spaceships stored in the Mediterranean basin, 
or the proper way to contact Ariel via Prospero's private logosphere connections. Seeing Savi so clearly through replay vision also made Harmon realize how much younger this Moira iteration of Savi's face and body were, but also how much alike the women were. Harmon trolled through the other functions, Proxnet, Farnet, and Allnet were all down with the fax and logosphere functions. Evidently everything internal worked. Anything demanding use of the planetary system of satellites, orbital mass accumulators, fax and data transmitters, and so forth did not work. But why did his internal indicators tell him that the SIGL function was not working? Harmon would have thought that SIGLing was as body-dependent as his medical monitoring which worked all too well. Did the SIGL function depend upon relay satellites in some way? His crystal cabinet data did not explain this. Moira, he shouted. Only after he'd shouted did he realize that the storm had all but passed over and that except for the slide crash of waves far above, the sound had abated. Also, he was wearing his osmosis mask with its inset microphones, so poor Moira had heard his shout in her cowl earphones. He pulled the osmosis mask free and breathed in the rich scent of the ocean again. What, O oh mighty lunged one, replied Mora in soft tones. Her sleeping skin bag was about four feet away. If I use the touch-sharing function with my wife, with Ada, when I get home, will my unborn child receive the information as well? Counting your fetus chickens before they're hatched, my young Prometheus? Just answer the damned question, would you? You'll have to try it, said Moira. I don't recall the design parameters right now, and I haven't ever touch-shared with pregos, and we godlike post-humans can't get pregnant. Nor did it help in that department that we were all female. So give it a try if and when you get home. I do remember, though, that there were safety nets installed in the genetic touch-share function. You can't pour harmful information to a fetus or a young child replaying her own moment of conception, for instance. We don't want the little tyke in therapy for thirty years, now do we? Harmon ignored the sarcasm. He rubbed his stubbled cheeks. He'd shaved before starting on this trip. The thermskin cowl was less than comfortable over a beard he'd learned on Prospero's Isle more than ten months earlier, but two days of stubble rasped under his palm. You have all the functions you gave us, he said to Moira, adding the rising inflection of the question mark at only the last instant. My dear, purred Moira, do you think we're fools? Are we going to give mere old-style humans some ability we lack? So you have more than we do, said Harmon, more than this hundred you built into us. Moira did not answer. Harmon had discovered complex nanocameras and audio receivers built into his skin cells. Some DNA-bound protein bundles could store this visual and auditory data. Other cells had been altered into bioelectronic transmitters, good for only short range because they were powered just by his own cellular energy, but easily strong enough to be picked up and boosted and retransmitted. The Terran drama, he said aloud. What's that? Moira said sleepily. The post-human woman had been dozing. I realize how you transmitted the images from Ilium, or your transvestite god-sisters did, and how we were able to receive them through the Turin cloths. Well, duh, said Moira, and went back to sleep. Harmon saw how he would no longer need a Turin cloth to receive such transmissions. Between logosphere voiceover protocols and this multimedia connection, he could share both voice and full sensory data with any other human being who volunteered to uplink the input stream. What would that be like, linked to Ada while we made love, wondered Harmon, and then chided himself for being a dirty old man. A horny, dirty old man, he corrected himself. Besides the logosphere function, there was another function he could trigger that offered a complicated sensory interface with the biosphere. Since it was satellite-dependent and interdicted at the moment, he could only guess how it worked and what it felt like. 
Was it like a chat with Ariel, or did a person suddenly become one with the dandelions and hummingbirds? Could he communicate directly and at a distance with the little green men that way? Feeling serious again, Harmon remembered Prospero saying that Ariel was using the LGM to hold off the thousands upon thousands of attacking Calabani along the southern fringes of old Europe, and he immediately saw how he could use such a connection to ask the Zex for help fighting the Voynix. All this function searching was giving Harmon a worse headache. Almost by accident, he checked his medical monitor function and saw that, indeed, his adrenaline levels and blood pressure combined was high enough to give him the headache he'd suffered with for two weeks now. He activated another medical function, this one more active than mere monitoring, and tentatively allowed some chemicals to be released into his system. Blood vessels in his neck dilated and relaxed. Warmth flowed back into his icy fingertips. The headache receded. A teenaged boy could really use this function to chase away unwanted erections, thought Harmon. He realized that he really was a horny, dirty old man. Not so old, really, thought Harmon. The medical monitor had told him that he had the physical body of an average, slightly out-of-shape thirty-one-year-old man. Other functions floated onto his mental checklist— Figure ground enhancement, enhanced empathy, another that he thought of as the berserker function, a temporary spiking of adrenaline, and all other physical and strength-multiplying abilities, probably to be used as a last resort in a fight, or if one had to lift a ton or two off one's child. Besides the already used and misused memory replay function, Harmon saw that replay data inputted through someone else's sharing function. There was a function that would allow him to put his body into a sort of hibernation, a temporary slowing of everything to the point of stasis. He realized that this wasn't a quick way to catch a nap, but designed to be used with something like the crystal coffin in the Taj Moira, if one needed to remain alive but inert for long periods of time. In Moira's case, very long periods of time, without suffering bed sores, muscle atrophy, morning breath, and the other side effects of normal human unconsciousness. Harmon saw at once that the real Savi had used this function many times in her time crash on the Golden Gate at Machu Picchu, and elsewhere to survive and thrive over the fourteen centuries of her hiding from the Voynix and the post-humans. There were many more functions, some of them intriguing beyond words, but the concentration necessary to explore them was bringing back Harmon's headache. He shut down that part of his brain for the night. Immediately more powerful sensory information flowed in, the surge of waves far above, a photoluminescent phytoplanktonish glow in the upper strata of the Atlantic that looked like an underwater aurora borealis to his tired eyes. The sky over the ocean was also alive with light. Not air to sea lightning this time, but internal cloud lightning, silent explosions showing the fractal complexity of the churning clouds as lit from within. These pulses and explosions of light were silent, not the slightest hint of thunder reaching his little sleeping bag on the bottom of the Atlantic breach. So Harmon crossed his arms behind his head and just enjoyed the light show. Also appreciating the effect of the cloud lightning on the still churning surface of the ocean. Patterns. Patterns everywhere. All of nature and the universe dancing at the edge of chaos. Reprieved by fractal boundaries and a billion hidden algorithmic protocols hardwired into everything and every interaction. But beautiful nonetheless. Oh, so beautiful. He realized that there was at least one function he hadn't really explored that could sort out most of these patterns for him far better than mere evolved human senses and sensibilities could. But it would probably be an interdicted function, requiring ring connections, and besides, 
Harmon didn't need a genetically enhanced function to appreciate the pure beauty of this silent, mid-Atlantic show that was being put on just for him. He lay on the floor of the breach, hands behind his head, and said a prayer for Ada and his possible son or daughter. Her functions, when activated, would tell her which it was. He wished he could be with her now. He prayed to the god he'd never really thought about, to the quiet god whom Setabas and his lackey Caliban feared above all else, according to what the monster had blurted out on Prospero's Isle, and he prayed only that his beloved Ada would remain well and alive and as happy as the terrible circumstances of these times and their separation across space would allow. As he fell asleep, Harmon heard the rasp and sawing of Moira's snoring. He smiled as he drifted off. A thousand years of post-human nanocyte and DNA rearranging cleverness hadn't cured them from snoring. But, of course, it was Savi's human body that... Harmon fell asleep in mid-thought. Seventy-one. Achilles wishes he was dead. The air is so foul and thick here in Tartarus, his lungs burn so fiercely, his eyes are watering and hurting so much, his skin and guts feel like they are ready simultaneously to implode and explode from the pressure. The Oceanids' monster woman is carrying him so rib-shattering tightly in her thigh-fingered fist, and his outlook for the future is so fucking dim that he wishes that he could just die and get it over with. But the quantum fates will not allow him this option. That bitch of a goddess mother of his, that tart Thetis, who'd professed love to his father, the man whom he'd always honored as his father, Peleus, and then lain with Zeus like the aquatic round heels she was, had held him in the celestial fire and created a quantum singularity point for his death, to be reached only through the actions of the now dead and cremated Paris of Ilium. And that, as they say, is that. So he suffers and tries to focus on what is going on outside his tight, rapidly imploding sphere of pain and discomfort. The three titan giant daughters of Okeanos, Asia, Panthea, and Ione, are striding quickly through the poisonous gloom toward a brighter glow that might be a volcanic eruption. Achilles held tight in Asia's huge sweaty fist. When Achilles is able to open his burning eyes and catch glimpses of the landscape through his tears, tears from toxic chemicals in the air, not from emotion, he gets blurry views of high, rocky ridges such as the one the three Oceanids are now striding along, thundering volcanoes, deep chasms filled with lava and oddly shaped monsters, an escort of the giant centipede things that must be related to the healer on Olympus, Occasional glimpses of silhouettes that must be other titans crashing and bellowing through the gloom, and a sky filled with orange-limbed clouds, wild lightning, and other electrical displays. Suddenly the giantess titan named Panthea speaks. Is that the veiled form we seek who sits on that ebony throne? Asia, bitch voice booming like boulders crashing down a rocky slope. Achilles has not the strength to cover his aching ears with his acid-scalded hands. It is. The veil has fallen. Panthea, I see a mighty darkness filling the seat of power, and rays of gloom dart round as light from the meridian sun. But the Demogorgon itself remains ungazed upon and shapeless, neither limb nor form nor outline. Yet we all three feel it is a living spirit. The Demogorgon speaks then, and Achilles buries his face in Asia's huge, rough palm in a vain effort to muffle the subsonic pain of that all-encroaching voice. Ask what thou wouldst know, O Cynids. Asia offers up her palm with the writhing Achilles on it. Canst thou tell us what shape and manner of thing this is we have caught? It seems more starfish than man, and it writhes and squeaks as such. The Demogorgon roars again. It is only a mortal man. 
Although made immortal by the celestial fire's mistake, it is named Achilles, and it is very far from home. No mortal has ever come to Tartarus before this day. Ah, says Asia, seeming to lose interest in her toy and roughly setting Achilles down on a burning hot boulder. Achilles feels the heat all around, and when he opens his eyes he can see farther because of the glow of lava and eruption, but he's horrified to see that lava flowing past on both sides of his steaming boulder. When he looks up toward the Demogorgon on its throne, the throne a mountain taller than the erupting volcanoes, and the hooded and veiled non-shape on that throne seeming to rise up for miles and miles, the shapelessness of the Demogorgon makes him want to vomit. So he does. None of the Oceanics seems to notice his retching. Asia asks the huge form, What else canst thou tell? All things thou darest demand. Who made the living world? asks Asia. Achilles has already decided that she is the most talkative, if not the most intelligent of the three idiot Oceanids. God! Who made all that it contains, persists Asia. Thought, passion, reason, will, imagination. God! Almighty God! Achilles decides that this demogorgon is a spirit thing of few words and fewer thoughts in its head, if it has a head. He would give anything if he could rise and pull his sword from his belt, unsling his shield from his back. First he would kill the demogorgon and then the three titan sisters, slowly. Who made that sense which, when the winds of spring in rarest visitation or the voice of one beloved heard in youth alone, asks Asia in her crackly, booming voice, fills the faint eyes with falling tears, which dim the radiant looks of unbewailing flowers, and leaves the peopled world a solitude when it returns no more? Achilles throws up again. This time it is, as an aesthetic statement, more than a reaction to optical vertigo. He decides that he will kill the Oceanids first, after all. He would like to kill this Asia bitch several times over. He visualizes hollowing out her skull and using it for a house, her eye sockets as round windows. Merciful God, intones the Demogorgon. There is no Greek word for ditto, but Achilles thinks that the Demogorgon should coin one. It does not surprise the Achaean in the least that Oceanids and the formless spirit in the murk down here in Tartarus speak his form of Greek to one another. They're strange creatures, monsters really, but even monsters in Achilles' experience speak Greek. They're not barbarians after all. And who made terror, madness, crime, remorse, continues Asia, her voice as relentless as the babble of a two-year-old who's just learned how to keep a conversation going with an adult by asking why a hundred times over. Which from the links of the great chain of things to every thought within the mind of man sway and drag heavily, and each one reels under the load toward the pit of death. Abandoned hope and love that turns to hate, and self-contempt bitterer to drink than blood. Pain, whose unheeded and familiar speech is howling and keen shrieks day after day. And she breaks off. Achilles hopes that it is some Tartarusian cataclysm that will end their world and swallow up Asia and her two sisters, screaming like honey-covered appetizers at a Myrmidon feast. But when he forces his eyes open, he sees that it is only a circle of bright light opening, pouring white brilliance into the red gloom a brain hole. Something far from human is silhouetted against the light of that hole. It's shaped roughly like a man, but it is made up of metallic spheres, not only a sphere where the head should be, but spheres for the torso, spheres for the outflung arms, spheres for the staggering legs. Only the feet and hands wrapped in some lighter-than-bronze metal look even vaguely manlike. The thing comes closer, and two brilliant lights stab out from the smaller spheres that are its shoulders. 
A red light, thin as a javelin, leaps from its right hand and plays across the Oceanid sisters, making their flesh sizzle and pop. The Titanesses stagger backward, wading through lava, evidently unharmed by the red beam, but shielding their faces and eyes from the painful white light flowing out of the brain hole. God damn it, Achilles, are you just going to lie there? It's Hephaestus. Achilles now sees the iron sphere bubbles as some sort of protective suit, with iron-shod feet and heavily gauntleted hands emerging from the chain of globes. There is some sort of steaming, burping, breathing pack on the back, and the top bubble is clear as glass. Achilles can now make out the dwarf god's ugly, bearded face in the reflected light from his shoulder searchlights and handheld laser. Achilles manages a weak squeak. Hephaestus laughs, the ugly noise amplified by the speakers in his pressure suit. Don't like the air and gravity here, eh? All right. Get into this. It's called a therm skin, and it'll help you breathe. The god of fire and artifice throws down some impossibly thin garment onto the boulder next to Achilles. The hero tries to stir, but the air weakens and burns him. All he can do is wiggle and cough and retch. Oh, fuck me, says the crippled god. I guess I'll have to dress you like an infant. I was afraid of this. Lie still. Quit squirming. Don't shit on me or puke on me while I'm undressing you and tucking you into this thing. Ten minutes later, with a tapestry of Hephaestus' curses now hanging in the air like glowing smoke from the volcanoes, Achilles is upright on solid rock next to Hephaestus. Dressed in a gold therm skin under his armor, breathing easily through the therm skin cowl's clear membrane, the dwarf god had called it an osmosis mask, brandishing his acid-etched shield and still bright sword, staring up at the looming but still indistinct mass called the Demogorgon, and feeling invulnerable again and not a little pissed off. Achilles only hopes that the Oceanid named Asia will start asking one of her endless questions again, so he will have an excuse to gutter like a fish. Demogorgon, calls Hephaestus, using the amplifier built into his fishbowl helmet. We have met once before, more than nineteen hundred years ago, during the Olympians' war with the giants. I am called Hephaestus. Thou art the crippled one, booms Demogorgon. Yes. How nice of you to remember. Achilles and I have come to Tartarus to seek out you and the Titans, Cronos, Rhea, all of the old ones, and to ask for your help. Demogorgon does not help mere gods and mortals. No, of course not, says Hephaestus, his rasping voice amplified a hundred times by the speakers in his suit. Shit! Achilles, do you want to take over? Talking to this thing is like talking to your own ass. Can that big mass of nothing hear me? Achilles asks the little god. I hear you. Achilles stares skyward, focusing on the roiling red clouds a little to the side of the featureless, veiled non-face of the non-thing looming above him. When you say God, Demogorgon, do you mean Zeus? When I say God, I mean God. You must mean Zeus, then, for right now the son of Cronos and Rhea is calling all the surviving gods together on Olympus and is announcing that he, Zeus, is the god of gods, the lord of all creation, the god of this and all universes. Then either he lieth, or you do, son of man. God reigns, but not on Olympus. Then Zeus has enslaved all other gods and mortals, says Achilles, his thermskin speaker voice and radio broadcast echoing from the volcano's slopes and cinder ridges. All spirits are enslaved, which serve things evil. Thou knowest if Zeus be such or not. I do know, says Achilles. Zeus is a greedy, immortal son of a bitch, no offense to Rhea, if she's out there in the shadows somewhere listening. I think he's a coward and a bully, but if you consider him God, then he will reign on Olympus and in the universe forever and forever. I spoke but as ye speak, for Zeus is the supreme of all living things. Who is the master of the slave? asks Achilles. Oh, that's good, whisper hisses Hephaestus. That's very good. Shut up, says Achilles. 
the Demogorgon rumbles. It is so loud that at first Achilles thinks the nearest volcano is in full eruption. Then the rumble modulates itself into words. If the abysm could vomit forth its secrets, but a voice is wanting, the deep truth is imageless. For what would it avail to bid thee gaze on the revolving world? What to bid speak on fate, time, occasion, chance, and change? To these all things are subject but eternal love and the perfection of the quiet. Whatever you say, says Achilles. But as we speak, Zeus is proclaiming himself lord of all creation, and soon he will demand that all of that creation, not just his little world at the base of Mount Olympus, pay homage to him and him alone. Goodbye, Demogorgon. Achilles turns to leave, grabbing the sputtering god of artifice by his metal bubble arm and pulling him around away from the unformed mass looming above them. Halt! Achilles, false son of Peleus, true son of Zeus, would-be author of deicide and patricide, wait! Achilles stops, turns back, and waits with Hephaestus. The Oceanids are cowering, covering their heads as if from hot ashfall. I shall summon the Titans from their crevices and caves, bring them forth from their cowering corners. I shall command the immortal hours to bring them forth. With a sound that makes all the other unbearable sounds seem small, the rocks around Demogorgon's throne cleave in the purple night, the lava glow grows deeper and broader, a rainbow of impossible colors arches through Tartarus gloom, and chariots the size of mountains appear from nowhere, drawn by gigantic steeds that are not horses. Nothing like horses, not even remotely like horses, some being whipped on by wild-eyed charioteers that are not men or gods, other steeds staring behind them with burning eyes filled with fear. The charioteers themselves are almost impossible for mortal eyes to look upon, so Achilles averts his gaze. He thinks that it would be unwise to vomit again while sealed behind his thermskin face mask. These are the immortal hours which thou didst demand hear thy case, booms the Demogorgon. They shall bring Kronos and his ilk here to this place. The air implodes with a series of sonic booms, the Oceanids scream in fright, and the huge chariots disappear in circles of flame. Wow, says Hephaestus over the suit radio, and does not go on. Now we wait, says Achilles, setting his sword in his belt and slinging his shield. Not for long, says Hephaestus. The air is filling with circles of fire again. The giant chariots are returning by the hundreds, no, by the thousands, each one filled with a giant form, some human-looking, many not. Behold, says the Demogorgon. It's hard not to, says Achilles. He braces himself and slides his great and beautiful shield across his forearm. The titan's chariots come on. 72. Moira was gone when Harmon awoke. The day was gray and cold, and it was raining hard. The sea far above was churning and white-capped, but not the violent surge of liquid mountain ranges he'd watched by lightning flash the night before. Harmon hadn't slept well. His dreams had been urgent and ominous. He rolled up the silk-thin sleeping bag. It would dry by itself, he knew and set it into his rucksack, leaving his clothes in the waterproof bag, taking out only his socks and boots to wear over his therm skin. They'd had a campfire the last night before the storm began. No weenies and marshmallows, of course. Harmon only knew what those were through the books he'd absorbed at the Taj. But he'd eaten the second half of his tasteless food bar and sipped water while they sat by the flickering flames. Now the ashes were drenched and gray. The breach floor between the rocks and coral had turned to mud, and Harmon realized that he was walking in circles around their campsite, looking for some last sign of Moira. A note, perhaps. There was nothing. 
He hitched the rucksack higher, pulled the thermskin cowl lower so that the goggles were properly lined up, wiped the rain from them, and began hiking west. Instead of growing lighter as the day progressed, the skies grew darker. The rain came down more heavily, and the walls of water on either side grew taller and more oppressive. He'd gotten used to the trick of perspective where it was never the ocean bottom going down, but always the vertical walls of water on either side growing taller. Harmon trudged on. The breach descended through path-blasted ridges of black rock, passed over deep crevasses on narrow, slippery, black iron bridges with no railings, and climbed steeply up more rock ridges. Even though high ridges made the walls of water on each side lower, the ocean was no more than two hundred feet deep here, Harmon guessed. The climbing was exhausting and even more claustrophobic than before, with the rock walls on either side of the narrow path making him feel as if there were walls within walls closing in on him. By midday, which only his internal time function announced since the sun was completely absent and the rain was falling so fiercely that he considered pulling down his osmosis mask over his nose and mouth. The breach path had come out of the underwater mountainous country and stretched flat and straight ahead. That was something, and it helped improve Harmon's dark mood, but only a little. He welcomed the rocky or coral sections of path now, since the ocean floor bottom, which had a nice consistency of packed soil on the dry days, was becoming a squelching avenue of mud. Eventually he grew tired of walking. It was afternoon at whatever local time it was there south of England, so he sat on a low boulder emerging from the force field contained northern ocean and took out his daily food bar to munch on while sipping cool water from the hydrator tube. The food bars, one a day, left him hungry, and they tasted like he imagined sawdust must taste. And there were only four left. What Prospero and Myra expected him to do when the food bars ran out, assuming he had another seventy or eighty days of hiking ahead of him, he had no idea. Would the gun really work underwater? If it did, would it kill a big fish, and could he haul it through the force field wall into the breach? The dried seaweed and driftwood thrown down here from the sea above was already getting scarcer. How was he supposed to cook this theoretical fish? The lighter was in his pack, part of the sharp flip knife, spoon, fork, multi thingy, and he had a metal bowl he could morph into a pan by touching it in the right places. But was he really supposed to spend hours of his time each day fishing for— Harmon noticed another rock half a mile or so to the west. The thing was huge, the size of some of the more jagged ridges he'd passed through. And it protruded from the north wall of the Atlantic just before the dry bottom of the breach dipped into another deep trench. But this rock or coral reef was strangely shaped. Instead of crossing the breach with a path cut through it, this rock appeared to slant down from the water, disappearing in the sand and loam of the breach itself. More than that, it looked strangely rounded, smoother than the volcanic basalt he'd been hiking through the last three days. He'd learned how to activate the telescopic and magnification controls of his thermskin goggles, and he did so now. It was no rock, some sort of gigantic, man-made device was protruding from the north wall of the breach. Its snout sunk into the dirt. The thing was huge, widening back from a bottle-nosed dolphin bow, crumpled metal exposed girders, to sinuous curves that widened like a woman's thigh and disappeared through the force field. Harmon put away the last of his food bar, pulled out the gun, and attached it to the stick-tight patch on the belt of his thermskin, and began walking toward the sunken ship. Harmon stood under the mass of the thing much larger than he imagined from almost a mile away, and guessed it had been some sort of submarine. The bow was shattered, exposed girders looked to be rusted by rainfall rather than the sea, but the bulk of the smooth, almost rubbery-looking hull appeared more or less intact as it angled back up through the force field 
and into the ocean's midday darkness. He could make out the silhouette of the thing for another ten yards or so in the ocean, but nothing more. Harmon stared at the large breach in the hull near the bow. A breach within a breach, he thought stupidly, rain pounding down on his cowl and goggles, and was sure he could get into the submarine through that opening. He was equally sure that it would be pure idiocy to do so. His job was not to explore two thousand year old sunken wrecks, but to get his ass back to Ardis, or at least to another old style community as quickly as he could. Seventy-five days, a hundred days, three hundred days, it didn't matter. His only job was to continue walking west. He didn't know what was in this damned lost era machine, but something in there could kill him, and he didn't see how anything in there could enlighten him any further than he'd been enlightened by his drowning in the crystal cabinet. But still, it hadn't taken his enlightenment through drowning for Harmon to know that However genetically modified and nanocytically reinforced, his species evolved from chimps and hominids. Curiosity had killed countless of those noble knuckled ancestors, but it had also gotten them up off their knuckles. Harmon stowed the pack some yards from the bow. The thing was waterproof, but he didn't know if it was pressure-proof. Pulled the ancient pistol from its stick-tight grip and held it in his right hand, activated the two bright searchlight patches on his upper chest, and squeezed his way past rended metal into the dark, forward corridors of the dead machine. 73. The Greeks aren't going to make it to nightfall. They aren't even going to make it to launch at this rate, and neither am I. The Achaeans are falling back into a tighter and tighter half-circle, fighting like fiends, the sea at their backs and the surf running red, but Hector's attack is relentless. At least five thousand Achaeans have fallen since the attack began just after dawn, among them noble Nestor. Alive but carried unconscious to his tent, struck from his chariot by a lance that pierced his shoulder and shattered bone. The old hero who tried to step in to fill in for the absent or dead giants, Achilles, Agamemnon, Menelaus, big Ajax, crafty Odysseus, has done his best, but the spear point found him. Nestor's son, Antilochus, the bravest of the Achaeans these past few days, is dead, pierced through the bowels by a well-placed Trojan bowman's shot. Nestor's other captain's son, Thrasymedes, is missing in action, pulled down into the Trojan-filled trench early on, and not seen in the three hours since then. The trench and revetments are now in Hector's bloody hands. Little Ajax is wounded, a nasty sword cut to both shins, just aside the greaves, and was carried from the field to the non-safety of the burned boats just minutes ago. Podolarius, fighting captain and skilled healer, son of the legendary Asclepius, is dead cut down by a circle of killers from Deiphobus attacking legions. They hacked the brilliant physician's body to pieces and hauled his bloodied armor back to Troy. Alastor, Teucer's friend and chieftain, who took over Thrasymedes' command during the terrible battle of the bulge behind the abandoned trenches, fell in front of his men, still cursing and writhing for minutes with a dozen arrows in him. Five Argives fought their way forward to retrieve his body, but they were all cut down by Hector's advance guard. Teucer himself was sobbing as he killed the last door's killers, firing arrow after arrow into their eyes and guts as he fell back with the slowly retreating Greeks. There is nowhere left to retreat. We're crammed here onto the beach, the rising tide lapping at our sandaled feet, and the rain of arrows is constant. All of the Greek horses have died loudly except for those few whose owners, weeping, set them free and whipped them toward the advancing enemy lines. More trophies for the Trojans. I'm going to be killed if I stay here. When I was a Skolik, especially when I was Aphrodite's secret agent Skolik, all decked out in levitation harness, impact armor, morphing bracelet, stun baton, the Hades invisibility helmet, and whatever else I hauled around then, I felt pretty invulnerable, even when moderately close to the fighting. 
Except for the arrows, which are deadly enough at astounding distances, there isn't much killing from afar in this war. Men smell their enemy's sweat and breath and are splattered with his blood, brains, and saliva when they shove steel, or in most cases bronze, into the man's guts. But I've almost been skewered three times in the last two hours, once by a cast spear that came over the lines of defenders and almost took my balls off. I leaped in the air to avoid it, and when it buried itself in the wet sand here, and I came down straddling it, the vibrating shaft smacked me in the gonads. Then an arrow parted my hair, and a minute later another arrow, one of thousands darkening the sky and rising like a miniature forest out of the sand everywhere here, would have taken me square in the throat if an argive I don't even know hadn't raised his round shield, leaned over and deflected the barbed and poisonous shaft. I have to get out of here. My hand has touched the QT medallion a hundred times in the hours since dawn, but I haven't quantum teleported away. I'm not sure why. Yes, I am. I don't want to desert these men. I don't want to be safe in Helen's bath chamber or atop some nearby hill, knowing that these Achaeans I've spent ten years watching and talking to and breaking bread with and drinking wine with are being slaughtered like proverbial cattle on this blood-dimmed bit of beach. But I can't save them. Or can I? I grab the medallion, concentrate on a place I've been, twist the gold circle half a turn, and open my eyes to find myself falling down a long, long elevator shaft. No, I'm not falling, I realize. Realize too late since I've already screamed twice. I'm in free fall in the main corridor on the deck of the Queen Mab, or at least in the main corridor on the deck where I'd had my private quarters. But there had been gravity then. Now there is only this falling and falling, tumbling in space but not really falling, flailing to get to the cubby door or to the astrogation bubble twenty yards down or up the corridor. Two black and chitinous belt Moravex, the soldiers with the built-in black armor, barbs, and mask-like heads, kick out of a nearby elevator shaft. There is no elevator car in it, and grab me by the arms. They shoot back toward the shaft, and I realize that the Rockvex can move in this zero-G, not just because they're used to it. It must be close to their native level of gravity in the asteroid belt but because their carapaces have built-in and nearly silent thrusters that pulse expanding jets of what may just be water. Whatever it is, it allows them to move fluidly and quickly in this zero-gravity world. Without a word, they pull me into the shaft that runs the length of the Queen Mab. Imagine jumping into an empty elevator shaft the height of the Empire State Building. So I do the only thing a sane man would do. I scream again. The two soldiers jet me hundreds of feet up or down this echoing shaft, echoing to just my screams, and then pull me through some sort of force-field membrane into a busy room. Even upside down as I am, I can recognize it as the bridge of the ship. I'd been on the bridge only once during my stay, but there was no mistaking this room's function. More of X I'd never seen before are busy monitoring three-dimensional virtual control boards. More Rockvex soldiers are standing by holographic projections. And I recognize General Bey bin Adi, the skittery spider vac, I can't think of his name right now, as well as the strange-looking navigator Cho Li and the prime integrator Astig Che. It's the prime integrator who effortlessly kicks through the zero-g bridge space to me as the two soldiers firmly set me into a mesh chair and tie me down so that I can't escape. No, I realize they're not tying me down like a captive, merely attaching mesh web belts to hold me in place. It helps. Just being stationary gives me a sense of up and down. Dr. Hockenberry, we didn't expect you back, says the little Moravec, who's roughly the same shape and size as Monmouth, but made of different colored plastics, metals, and polymers. I apologize for the lack of gravity. We're not under thrust. I could arrange for the internal force fields to exhibit a pressure differential that could simulate gravity for you after a fashion. 
But the truth is, we're station-keeping near Earth's polar ring, and we do not want to exhibit a major change in internal energy uses unless we have to. I'm all right, I say, hoping that they haven't heard my screams in the elevator shaft. I need to talk to Odysseus. Odysseus is, ah, uh, indisposed right now, says Astig Che. I need to speak with him. I am afraid that this will not be possible, says the Moravec, who is about the same size as my friend Monmut, but who looks and speaks so differently. His voice actually has a soothing quality to it. But it's imperative that I... I stop in mid-sentence. They've killed Odysseus. It's obvious that these half-robot things have done something terrible to the only other human being on their ship. I don't know why they would have killed the Achaean, but then I've never understood two-thirds of the things these Moravex do or don't do. Where is he, I asked, trying to sound in control and authoritarian even while web-strapped into my little chair. What have you done to him? We've done nothing to the son of Laertes, says Astig Chai. Why would we harm our guest? asks the box-like spider-legged Vec, whose name I can't remember. Now, I do recall it now, retrograde Jogensen or Gunderson or something Scandinavian. Then bring Odysseus here, I say. We cannot, repeats Prime Integrator Astig Chai. He is not on the ship. Not on the ship, I say. But then I look at one of the holographic displays set into a niche in the hall where a window should be. Hell, for all I know, it is a window. The full blue and white is turning below, filling the view screen. Odysseus went down to this earth, I say, to my earth? Is it my earth? I lived and died there, yes, but thousands of years ago, if the gods and Moravex are to be believed. No, Odysseus has not gone down to the surface again, says Astig Chai. He has gone to visit the voice that contacted the ship during our transit the voice which asked for him by name. Show Dr. Hockenberry, says General Bay Binanti. He'll understand why he can't talk to Odysseus right now. Astig Chai appears to ponder this suggestion. Then the European Moravec turns to look at the navigator Cho Lee. I suspect some sort of radio transmission has taken place between them, and Cho Lee moves a tentacle arm. A six-foot-wide, three-dimensional holographic window opens not two feet in front of me. Odysseus is making love to the most sensuous woman I've ever seen in my life, except perhaps for Helen of Troy, of course. My male ego had thought that my love-making, well, sexual intercourse, with Helen had been energetic and imaginative. But thirty seconds of staring slack-jawed at the coupling going on between the naked Odysseus, his body battle-scarred, tanned, barrel-chested but short, and the pale, exotic, pneumatic, sensuous, and slightly hirsute woman with the incredible eye makeup, lets me know that my exertions with Helen had been tame, unimaginative, and in slow motion compared to what these erotic athletes are involved in. Enough, I say, mouth dry. Turn it off. The pornographic window winks out of existence. Who is that? Lady, I managed to say. She says her name is Sycorax, answers retrograde somebody's son. It's always odd to hear that solid voice coming out of that tiny metal box atop those long, skinny legs. Let me talk to Monmut and Orfu of Io, I say. I've known those two Vex the longest, and Monmut is the most human of all these machine people. If I can convince anyone here on the Queen Mab, it will be Monmut. I'm afraid that won't be possible either, says Astig Che. Why? Are they having sex with some female Moravec babes or something? I hear how stupid my attempted witticism is as it mentally echoes in the long seconds of censuring silence that follow. Monmut and Orfu have entered the Earth's atmosphere in a dropship carrying Monmut's submersible says Astig J. Can't you link up to them by radio or something, I ask. I mean, they could patch together radio calls like that way back in my twentieth and early twenty-first centuries. 
Yes, we are in contact, says Retrograde, whoever. But at the moment their ship is being attacked, and we do not want to distract them with unnecessary communications. Their survival is problematic at best. I consider asking more questions. Who on earth is attacking my friends? Why? How? But realize that such a dialogue would only distract me from my real reason for being here. You need to create a brain hole back to the beach near Ilium, I say. General Bey bin Adi moves his black-thorned arms in a way that might suggest a question. Why? he says. Because the Greeks are being slaughtered to a man by the Trojans, and they don't deserve to be wiped out that way. I want to help them escape. No, says the general. I meant, why do you think we have the ability to create brain holes at will? Because I saw you do it once. You created all those holes that you jumped through from the asteroid belt to Mars, then accidentally to Ilium Earth, more than ten months ago. I was there, remember? Our technology is not adequate to the effort of creating brain holes to different universes, says Cho Lee. But you did it, God damn it! I can hear the whine in my voice. No, we did not, says Astig Chai. What we actually did at the time was... It is hard to describe, and I am not a scientist or engineer, although we have many. What we did at the time was interdict the so-called God's brainhole connections and tunnel some of our own into the quantum matrix they had created. Well, I say, do it again. Tens of thousands of human lives depend on it. And while you're at it, you can bring back the few million Greeks and others in the Europe of Ilium Earth who were disappeared, shot into space in a blue beam. We don't know how to do that either, says Astig Chai. Well, then what the fuck good are you, I'm tempted to ask. I don't. But you're safe here, Dr. Hockenberry, continues the Prime Integrator. Again, I want to shout at these plastic metal things, but I realize that he, it, is correct. I am safe here on the Queen Mab, safe from the Trojans at least, and perhaps the luscious babe boinking Odysseus has a sister. I need to go back, I hear myself saying. Go back where, you idiot? To the Greek's last stand? Sounds like a baklava shop in L.A. You'll be killed, says General Bey bin Adi. The large, dark, humanoid soldier thing doesn't sound the least bit upset at the prospect. Not if you can help me. The Moraveks seem to be communicating silently with one another again. I can see one of the holographic window monitors far across the bridge is tuned to Odysseus and the exotic woman still going at it like rabbits. The woman is on top now, and I can see that she's even more beautiful and desirable than my first glimpse had suggested. I concentrate on not getting an erection in front of these Moravex. If they notice, and they tend to notice a lot about us humans, they might take it wrong. We will help you if we can, Astig Chai says at last. What do you desire? I need to go somewhere without being seen, I say, and begin describing the lost Hades helmet and my old morphing bracelet to them. The morphing technology, at least as it applies to living organisms, is beyond our technological capabilities, says retrograde Sinopessin, I remember now. It manipulates reality on a quantum level we do not yet fully understand. We are far away from being able to create machines to alter that form of probability collapse. And we have no clue as to how this Hades helmet proffered true invisibility adds Choli, although if it is consistent with the Olympians or those powers behind the Olympians, other technologies, it probably involves a minor quantum shift through time rather than space. Can you whomp up something like that for me? I ask. I realize that there's no compelling reason for these busy Moraveks to do anything for me. Now, says Astig Chai, we could adapt some chameleon cloth for him, says General Bey bin Adi. Great, I say. What's chameleon cloth? An active stealth camouflage polymer, says the general. Primitive, but effective if one does not move too quickly between widely varying backgrounds. Roughly the same material that your Mars ship was coated in, 
only more breathable and invisible to the infrared. The eyepieces are nanocytic, so there would be no interruption of the chameleon adaptation. The gods saw us and shot our Mars ship out of orbit, I say. Well, yes, says General Bey Binadi. There is that to consider. This chameleon cloth is the best you can do? On short notice, says Astig Jai. Then I'll take it. How long will it take your people, I mean your Moravex, to fit me out in this chameleon suit and show me how to use it? I ordered the Environmental Engineering Department to begin work on such a suit the second we began discussing it, says the Prime Integrator. We had your vital measurements on record. They should bring the finished product within three minutes. Wonderful, I say, wondering if it is. Where exactly am I going? How can I convince those where I'm going to help the Greeks escape? Where could the Greeks escape to? Their families and servants and friends and slaves have all been sucked up into the blue beam rising from Delphi. As if in anticipation of getting out of here, I begin playing with the gold medallion hanging around my neck, fingering the sliding circle that activates it. By the way, says Cho Lee, your quantum teleportation medallion does not work. What? I rip myself out of the straps and float in place. What the hell are you talking about? Our inspection when you were on the ship earlier has shown the disk to be effectively functionless, says the navigator. You're full of shit. You guys told me earlier that it just couldn't be replicated for your use, that it was keyed to my DNA or something. Prime Integrator Astig Che makes a self-conscious noise that sounds amazingly like a human male, clearing his throat in embarrassment. It is true that there is some communication between the medallion around your neck and your cells and DNA, Dr. Hockenberry. But the medallion itself has no quantum function. It does not QT you through Kalabi Yao space. That's nuts, I say again, trying to curb my language. I still need these Moravex help and lizard suit to get out of here. I got here, didn't I? all the way from the universe to the Ilium Earth. Yes, says Choli, you did. With no help whatsoever from that hollow gold medallion hanging around your neck. It is a mystery. A soldier Moravac with the chameleon outfit appears from the open elevator shaft doorway. The garment looks like nothing special. Actually, it reminds me of an oversized version of a so-called leisure suit I was foolish enough to own in the 1970s. It even had the same stupid pointy collars and monkey-puke green sheen to it. The collars extend into a full cowl, says Astig Chai, as if reading my mind. The suit itself has no color. This green is merely a default setting so we can find the material. I take the suit from the Vex soldier and make the mistake of trying to pull it on. Within seconds... I'm tumbling out of control, spinning around my own axis in zero-g, hanging on to the useless garment as if I'm waving a flag but achieving nothing else. General Bey Bin Adi and his trooper grab me, secure me. They seem to know just where to lodge their feet on the consoles to keep themselves from acting with an equal and opposite reaction. And then they unceremoniously stuff me into the chameleon outfit. Then they attach one of the chair straps to my suit, velcroing me to some patch I can't see. It keeps me in place. I pull the collars up into a cowl and pull the cowl completely over my head. It's not nearly as comfortable as just putting on the Hades helmet and disappearing. For one thing, it is tremendously hot in this lizard suit. For a second thing, the nano-what's-its that allow me to see through the material in front of my eyes don't quite achieve critical focus. An hour peering out of this thing, and I'll have the worst headache of my life. How is it? asks Prime Integrator Astig Chai. Great, I lie. Can you see me? Yes, says Astig Chai. But only via gravitational radar and other bands of the non-visible light spectrum. To all visual intents and purposes, you are blended in with the background. With General Bin Adi, actually. 
Will the personages where you are traveling be using gravitational radar, enhanced negative thermal imaging, or other such techniques? Would they? I have no clue. Aloud, I say. There's one problem. Yes? Perhaps we can fix it. The prime integrator sounds solicitous, even actively concerned. My wife used to love James Mason. I have to twist the QT medallion to QT, I say, wondering how muffled my voice sounds to them. Sweat is rolling down my temple, cheeks and rib cage by now. I can't twist it without opening the suit, and... The chameleon cloth is tailored to be very loose, interrupts Bey Binadi. The military vec always sounds slightly disgusted with me. You can pull your arm inside the suit to touch the medallion, both arms if you need to. Oh, yeah, I say, pulling my right arm out of the suit arm and into the suit. And with that as my final contribution to our conversation, I twist the medallion and quantum teleport away from the Queen Mab. Does too work, I'm tempted to shout as I flick into solidity at the place in space-time that I'd envisioned. But then I remember that I forgot to ask the Moravex for a weapon, and some food and water, and maybe some impact armor. But it wouldn't be a good time for me to shout anything. I've appeared in the great hall of the gods on Mount Olympus, and all the gods seem to be here, all except Hera, whose smaller throne is wreathed in black funereal ribbon. Zeus looks to be fifty feet tall where he sits on his own gold throne. All of the other gods seem to be here, more even than I'd seen at their last large conclave, which I'd crashed in my infinitely more comfortable Hades helmet. I don't even know many of these gods, can't identify them even after ten years of reporting to Olympus Daily with my voice stones and action reports. There are hundreds upon hundreds of gods here, easily more than a thousand, and all of them are silent, waiting for Zeus to address them. Trying not to breathe loudly or faint from the stifling heat in this goddamned lizard suit, hoping that none of these Olympian immortals is using deep gravitational radar or enhanced negative thermal imaging, I stand perfectly still, almost cheek to jowl with the mob of gods and goddesses, nymphs, furies, arenieses, and demigods, and wait to hear what Zeus is going to say. 74. Even before Harmon stepped through the gash in the howl into the bow of the derelict ship, he had a pretty good idea what the thing was. The DNA-bound protein data packets in his body had a thousand references of thousands of types of seagoing craft across ten thousand years of human history. Harmon couldn't make a perfect match based only upon the damaged bow, the debris field around the bow, and by looking at the breached sheaths of elastic sonar stealth material encasing the morphable smart steel of the hull itself. But it was fairly obvious that he was stepping into a submarine from some century late in the Lost Era, possibly something from after the Rubicon release, but before the first post-humans had been genetically brought into being. Dementia Times once inside, making his way down an only slightly canted corridor, and breathing through his osmosis mask even though this part of the sunken ship was dry, he was sure it was a submarine. Harmon was standing in a room that was listing only about ten degrees from vertical, but the ancient impact with the ocean bottom here only two hundred feet beneath the surface of the sea, long before there was an Atlantic breach had crumpled metal and tumbled half a dozen long canisters off their racks. Harmon wouldn't need the pistol he was carrying. Nothing lived in this hulk. He pressed the pistol against the stick-tight patch on his right hip and extended a bit of thermskin elastic over it, securing it as surely as if he were wearing one of the holsters he'd seen in books via the crystal cabinet. He cupped his right palm against the rounded edge of one of these tumbled canisters, curious to find if his data-seeking function would work through the molecule-thin thermskin gloves. It did. Harmon was standing in the torpedo room of a Muhammad-class warship submarine. The AI in the guidance system of this particular torpedo, 
torpedo being neither a word nor concept he had ever encountered until that millisecond, had gone dead more than two thousand years earlier. But there was enough residual memory in the dead microcircuits for Harmon to understand that his palm was inches above a nuclear warhead tucked into the end of a thirty-four thousand pound high-speed, self-cavitating, hot-until-it-kills-something torpedo. This particular torpedo warhead, warhead being another term he had never encountered until that instant, was a simple fusion weapon packing only 475 kilotons, the equivalent of 950 million pounds of TNT detonating. The blast from the pearl-sized sphere a few inches beneath his palm would reach tens of millions of degrees within a millionth of a second. Harmon could almost feel the lethal neutron and gamma rays crouching there, invisible dragon eels of death, ready to leap in all directions at the speed of light to kill and infect every bit of human nerve or tissue they would encounter, tearing through them like bullets through butter. He snatched his hand away and rubbed it against his thigh as if cleaning something filthy from his palm. This entire submarine was a single instrument designed for killing human beings. His briefest encounter with the warhead's dead guidance AI had told him that the torpedo warheads were all but irrelevant to the machine and crew's real mission. But to understand what that mission was, he would have to pass out of the torpedo room, up the canted deck through the wardroom and mess room, up a ladder and down a corridor past the sonar shack and integrated comm room and then up another ladder into the command and control center. But everything beyond the near half of the torpedo room was underwater. The beams of light from his chest lamps showed him where the north wall of the breach began, not fifteen feet ahead. The submarine had been lying here along this ocean ridge two hundred feet beneath the surface and fully filled with water for many centuries before whatever created the breach had sucked the ocean out of these forward compartments. But nothing lived here any more, not so much as a dried barnacle remained from the myriad of undersea life forms that must have thrived here for centuries. And there were no signs of human bones or other remnants of the crew. The force field that held back the Atlantic Ocean did not physically slice through the morphable metal of the submarine's hull or metal structure. Harmon's lamps picked up the solid, uninterrupted line of deck overhead, but he could visualize the complete oval slice of ocean inside the hull of the ship. The north wall of the breach force field held back the sea in every open space, but a step beyond that. Harmon could imagine the pressure down here at two hundred feet, and see the wall of darkness ahead, his lamp lights reflecting off it as if from a dark, burnished, but still mirrored surface. Suddenly Harmon was filled with a sick and terrible terror. He had to clutch at the despised torpedo to keep himself from reeling, from falling onto the corroded plates of the deck. He wanted to run from this ancient warship out into the air and sunlight, to rip off his osmosis mask, and to be sick, if he had to, in order to get rid of this poison that had suddenly filled his body and mind. It was a mere torpedo he was leaning against, designed for destroying other ships, a harbor at most, yet its thermonuclear yield was three times the full explosive power dropped on Hiroshima. Another word and image that had just entered Harmon's reeling mind, capable of destroying everything in a hundred square mile area. Harmon, always fair at judging distances and sizes, even in his era that demanded no such skills, saw in his mind's eye a ten-by-ten-mile area in the heart of Paris Crater, or with Ardis Hall at the center of its bull's-eye. At Ardis, such a blast would not only vaporize the manor house and the new outbuildings in a microsecond, but blast away the hard-built palisades and roll its fireball to carry away the fax node pavilion a mile and a quarter down the road, less than a second later turning the river at the base of the hills into steam and the forest into ash and fireball in an expanding circle of instant destruction, ranging farther north than the starved rock he'd seen in his turin-cloth glimpse of Ada and the others. 
Harmon activated dormant biofeedback functions, too late, and received the message he dreaded. The torpedo room was filled with latent radiation. The damaged torpedo fusion warheads should have dropped beneath lethal leakage levels long ago, but in the process of doing so, they must have irradiated everything in the forward part of the submarine. No, the sensors told him that the radiation was worse straight ahead, after the torpedo room. The direction in which he would have to go if he wanted to learn more about this instrument of death. Perhaps the fusion reactor that had driven this obscene boat had been slowly leaking all these centuries. It was a radioactive hell ahead of him. Harmon knew just enough about his new biometric functions to realize that he could query the data monitors. He did so now, but only with the simplest question possible. Will the therm skin adequately shield me from this radioactivity? The answer came back in his mind's own voice and was unequivocal. No. It was insane to go forward. He also didn't have the courage to go forward through that black wall of water into the maelstrom of radiation through the rest of the submerged torpedo room up through the dark and cold of the wardroom and mess room where ancient Geiger counters would have gone wild, needles pinned off their own dials, and then up again and down a corridor past the sonar and comm rooms, and then up another ladder that impossible, terrifying, bone-chilling, cell-killing distance into the submerged command and control center. It was literally insane to stay in this malevolent hulk, much less to go deeper into it, it was death, death to himself, to the hopes of his species, to Ada's trust in his return, to his unborn child's need for a father in these most terrible and dangerous of times. Death to all futures. But he had to know. The quantum remains of the torpedo warhead AI had told him just enough that he had to know the answer to a single terrible question. So go forward is exactly what Harmon did one terrified step at a time. After three days and nights in the breach, this was the first time he had pressed through the force field wall. It was a semi-permeable force field, just like the ones he'd passed through before on Prospero's orbital isle. And now Harmon knew that the semi-permeable meant that it was designed to allow old-style human beings or post-humans to pass through an otherwise impervious shield. But this time, he was stepping through from air and warmth to cold, pressure and darkness. Harmon trusted the thermskin to keep him alive from the effects of the deep, if not from the radiation, and this it did. He refused even to call up data he knew he had on how the thermskin was designed, on what made it work. He didn't care how it worked to keep the ocean pressure away, only that it did. His chest lamps automatically increased their brightness to deal with the reflections and dense, particle-filled water. The submerged parts of the submarine were as thick with living organisms as the dry parts of the torpedo room had been sterile. Whatever lived here now not only survived in heavy radiation, but feasted on it, thrived on it. Every metal surface had been hidden beneath layers of mutated, coraled fungus and masses of green, pink and gray-bluish glowing living matter, their frills and tendrils waving slightly in unfelt currents. Crab-like things scuttled from his lights. A blood-red eel lunged from a hole in what had been the aft torpedo room hatchway, and then pulled its head back, leaving only its rows of teeth glinting in the light. Harmon gave it room as he edged through that encrusted hatch. The dead warhead A.I. had given him a rough schematic of the ship, at least enough to lead him to the command and control center, but the ladder he had to take up to the wardroom and eating area was gone. Most of this submarine had been built from super-alloys that would last another two thousand years, even here beneath the sea, but the ladder, gangway, his protein bundles told him it had been called, had long since corroded away. Sinking his fingers into the silt and waving fans on either side of the slanted stairwell, hoping that he wasn't putting his fingers into another eel's mouth, Harmon laboriously pulled himself up through the green soup of the sea. 
Particles and bundles of radioactive living particles clung to his therm skin and had to be wiped from his goggles and osmosis mask. He was close to hyperventilating by the time he reached the wardroom level. He knew from experience that the osmosis mask would keep feeding him fine, fresh oxygen, but this sense of pressure against every square inch of his body made him squirm. He didn't have to access memory modules to know that the therm skin would also protect him from the cold and pressure. The same type of suit had kept him alive in the zero pressure of space, but outer space had felt cleaner. I wonder if this slime coating my eyepieces was once part of the men and women who ran this boat. He banished thoughts like that. They were not only ghoulish, they were absurd. If the crew had gone down with this boat, the ever-hungry denizens of the ocean had cleaned their bones in just a few years, and then eaten and decomposed the bones themselves in not many more years. But still... Harmon concentrated on making his way aft through the litter of overgrown and collapsed bunks. He could only know this had been a sleeping area for human beings through the schematic in the warhead's decaying memory molecules. Now it looked like an overgrown crypt, its fungus-thick gray shelves harboring mutated crab things and light-fearing eel things rather than the rotting bodies of Montagues or Capulets. I have to actually read more of this Shakespeare person. So many things in the data packets connect to his thoughts and writings, thought Harmon, as he passed through an open hatchway, brushing aside stalagmites of slime floating into what had been an eating area. What had once been a long dining table for some reason reminded him of Caliban's cannibal table up on Prospero's Isle so many months earlier. Perhaps it was because the fungus and mollusks here had mutated to a bloody pink color. At the far end of the pink dining cavern, Harmon knew he had to go up a vertical ladder, a real ladder this time, no slanted gangway, to the integrated comm room before he could go aft through the sonar shack to the command and control center. There was no ladder, and this time the narrow tube of a uh, vertical corridor was clogged with green and blue marine growth, reminding Harmon of Demon's description of Paris Crater turned into a blue ice nest. But this was Earth ocean life that had woven this web, however mutated, and Harmon began ripping it apart, pulling out centuries of life's slow encroachment and advancement in great, grunting handfuls, wishing all the time he had an axe. The water around him became so filled with glop that he couldn't even see his hands. Something long and slippery, another eel, some sort of sea snake, slid along the length of his body and was gone below. He kept pulling away clumps and globs of thick, sludgy, radioactive stuff, fighting his way up through the blinding murk. He felt as if he was being born again, but this time into a much more terrible world. It was such a struggle that for several moments after he'd clawed his way up and into the calm room level, he didn't know he'd arrived. Tendrils of green hung everywhere. The water was so filled with floating particles that his own searchlight beams blinded him, and he lay in the primordial ooze too exhausted to move. Then, remembering that every moment he spent in this death hulk meant a greater chance of death to him, Harmon got to his knees pulled vines and tentacles of old plant growth away from his shoulders and back, and began to shuffle aft. The calm room was still alive. Harmon froze with the knowledge of it. Functions in his body that he hadn't even catalogued yet picked up the pulsing readiness of machines hidden under the living gray-green carpet of this room to reach and communicate. Not with him, these calm A.I.s did not acknowledge his presence. Their ability to interact with human beings had long since died away with the shifting quantum core of their computers. But they wanted to communicate with somebody. Most of all, to receive orders from somebody, something. Knowing that he would not find what he needed to know here in the integrated calm room, Harmon half walked, half swam aft past the encrusted sonar and GPS shack. He didn't know why his bundle memories wanted to call the little space a shack, 
and he didn't want to know. Had he ever thought about submarines, which he never had, Harmon would have probably guessed that such boats were built for traveling underwater. He knew that the A.I. warhead had preferred a translation of the word boat to that of ship, that such underwater boats would have been made up of many small compartments, each one shut off with a door, a hatch, watertight, separate. This sub was not. The spaces were large in comparison to the volume of the ship itself, not overly capsulized or compartmentalized. If the ocean found a way in, as it obviously had, the deaths of the men and women in this machine would not have been by slow drowning, gasping for air near the ceilings, but in a massive, implosive pressure wave, killing all in seconds. It was almost as if the humans who had worked here had preferred the choice of instant death in larger spaces to slow drowning in smaller ones. Harmon quit swimming and let his feet sink to the deck plates when he realized he was in the middle of the command and control center. There was less marine growth here, more bare metal. From just the Warhead AI's cartoon schematic, he could make out the torpedo launch and weapons control centers. Vertical metal columns that would have projected a myriad of holographic virtual controls when the ship was in combat. Harmon moved around the space, touching metal and plastic with his therm-skinned palm, allowing the dead quantum brains embedded in the material to speak to him. There was no chair, seat, or throne for the captain. That man had stood here near the central holographic chart table, directly in front of a display console. Virtual under the proper conditions, projected from within LCD plastic panels if the virtual system were damaged, into which every one of the ship's many systems and functions were channeled and shown. Harmon moved his gloved hand through the green murk and imagined sonar displays appearing here. Tactical displays to his left, there. Several yards back, the way from which he'd come, Gray glob mushrooms were the stools where the crewmen had crouched in front of constantly changing virtual displays, controlling and reporting on ballast and trim, radar, sonar, GPS relay, drone controls, torpedo readiness and launch controls, physical wheels for controlling the diving planes. He jerked his hand away. Harmon didn't need to know any of this crap. He needed only to know... There. It was a black metal monolith just aft of the captain's station. No barnacles, mollusks, coral, or slime had attached themselves to it. The thing was so black that Harmon's lamps had not reflected back from it on his first several passes through that part of the command center. This was the boat's central AI, built to interface in a hundred ways with the submarine's captain and crew. Harmon knew that a quantum computer, even from this lost age, even one dead for more than two millennia, would be more alive at one percent capacity than most living things on the planet. Quantum artificial minds died hard and died slowly. Harmon knew that he would not have the codes to access the central AI's banks, perhaps not even the language to understand the codes he did not know. But he also knew that it didn't matter. His functions were developed and nanogenetically programmed into his DNA long after this machine had died. It would have no secrets from him. The thought terrified him. Harmon wanted out of this flooded crypt. He wanted to get away from the radiation that must be pinging through his skin, brain, balls, guts, and eyes, even as he stood here, frozen in indecision. But he had to know. Harmon set his palm atop the black metal monolith. The submarine was named the Sword of Allah. It had left its port on... Harmon skipped the log entries, dates, reasons for the ancient war. He lingered only long enough to confirm it was after the Rubicon release during the dementia years when the global caliphate was near its end. The democracies of the West and Europe were already dead, the new European Union, a fiction of gasping vassal states under the rising Khanate. None of that mattered. What was in the belly of this submarine, as real as the fetus growing in the womb of his wife Ada, was what mattered. 
Harmon did pause long enough to listen to a fast forward of the last testament of the Sword of Allah's twenty-six crew members. The Mohammed-class ballistic missile submarine was so automated that it required a crew of only eight, but there had been so many volunteers that twenty-six of the chosen had been allowed to go on its last mission. They were all men. They were all devout. They all surrendered their souls to Allah as their doom approached. A cordon of Kane to tax submarines, aircraft, spacecraft, and surface ships, as far as Harmon could tell. The men knew that they had only minutes to live, that the Earth had only minutes before its destruction. The captain had given the launch command, the primary AI had seconded it and relayed it. Why hadn't the missiles launched? Harmon searched the AI to its quantum guts and could find no reason why the missiles had not launched. The human command had been given, the four sets of physical keys had been turned, the AI target package coordinates and individual launch commands had been confirmed and relayed, the missiles had been denoted in the proper launch sequence, the switches, both virtual and literal, had closed. All of the massive metal missile hatches had been successively opened by redundant hydraulics. Only a thin blue fiberglass dome had separated the missile tubes from the ocean, and each of these launch tubes had been filled with nitrogen to equalize the pressure to keep that ocean from rushing in until the actual instant of launch. The forty-eight missiles should have been propelled out of their creches by the nitrogen gas generators, a 2,500-volt charge igniting the nitrogen discharge. The gas itself would have produced more than 86,000 pounds per square inch of pressure in less than a second, sending the missiles hurtling upward within their own rising bubbles of nitrogen until they popped out of the sea like rising corks. And then the solid rocket propellant in each missile would have been ignited the second the missiles hit open air above. There were redundant and double-redundant launch and ignition initiators. The missiles should have roared and flown to their targets. The AI's launch indicators were all red. In each of the forty-eight missile silos back in the pregnant belly of the Sword of Allah, the sequence had proceeded properly from hold to denote to launch to successfully launched. But the missiles were all still sitting in their tubes, the dead and decaying A.I. knew that and communicated something like shame and chagrin through Harmon's tingling palm. Harmon's heart was pounding so fiercely and he was breathing so raggedly that the osmosis mask had to lower the oxygen input so he wouldn't hyperventilate. Forty-eight missiles, forty-eight warhead platforms. Each warhead was MRV'd and carried sixteen separate re-entry vehicles. Seven hundred sixty-eight actual warheads, all armed, primed, safeties off, set to go. They had been targeted at seven hundred and sixty-eight of the world's remaining cities, ancient monuments and dwindling Rubicon survivors' population centers. But these were no mere thermonuclear warheads such as carried in the Sword of Allah's torpedoes. Each of the 768 actual warheads still aboard this sub carried a tenuously contained black hole. The human races and the global caliphate's ultimate weapon at that point in time, its ultimate detergent, thought Harmon with a noise that was part sob, part giggle. The black holes in themselves were small, each not much larger than what one of the dead crewmen had described in his urgent and religious farewell speech as the soccer ball I grew up kicking around the ruins of Karachi. But when they escaped their containment spheres and dropped on their targets, the result would be much more dramatic than a mere thermonuclear weapon. The black hole would plunge into the earth, creating a soccer ball-sized hole in the center of whatever target city it arrived at. But the second it was exposed, there would be a plasma implosion a thousand times worse than a thermonuclear explosion. The descending black hole turning all earth, rock, water, and magma ahead of it into a rising cloud of steam and plasma would also suck in behind it the people, buildings, vehicles, trees, and actual molecular structure of its target city, 
and hundreds of square miles around it. The black hole that had created the kilometer-wide hole in the center of Paris Crater had been less than a millimeter wide and unstable. It had eaten itself before reaching the Earth's core. Harmon knew now that eleven million people had died because of that ancient experiment gone wrong. These black holes were not meant to eat themselves. They were meant to ping-pong back and forth through the Earth, re-emerging into atmosphere, plunging back through the planet. 768 plasma and ionizing radiation surrounded spheres of ultimate destruction, coring and recoring the Earth's crust, mantle, magma, and core again and again and again for months or years until they all came to rest at the center of this dear, good Earth and began eating the fabric of the planet itself. The twenty-six crewmen's voices Harmon had listened to had all celebrated this outcome to their mission. They would all be reunited in paradise, praise God. Wanting only to be sick within his constraining osmosis mask, Harmon forced himself to keep his hand on the black monolith AI for another full, endless, eternal minute. There had to be some instructions here for finding some way to disarm these activated black holes. Their warhead containment fields had been very powerful, designed to last for centuries if they had to. They had lasted for more than two and one-half millennia, but they were very unstable. Once one of the black holes escaped, they all would. It did not matter one iota whether they began their voyage to the Earth's core and beyond from their targets, or from this place along the north wall of the Atlantic breach. The outcome would be the same. There were no procedures in the A.I. or anywhere in the Sword of Allah for disarming them. The singularities existed had for almost 250 of Harmon's standard 520s. And in a world where old-style humans' highest technology consisted of crossbows, there was no way to reset their containment fields. Harmon pulled his hand away. Later he had no memory of finding his way out of the submerged parts of the submarine or of staggering out through the dry, forward torpedo room, through the rent in the hull, out onto the sunny strip of muddy dirt that was the Atlantic breach. He did remember peeling off his cowl and osmosis mask, dropping to his hands and knees and vomiting for long minutes. Long after he'd gotten rid of the little substance in his belly, the food bars were nutritious but left little residue, he continued dry retching. Then he was too weak even to stay on his hands and knees, so he crawled away from his own vomitus, collapsed, and rolled onto his back, looking up at the long, thin blue strip of sky. The rings were faint but clear, revolving, crossing, moving like the pale hands of some obscene clock mechanism, counting down the hours or days or months or years until the warhead containment spheres just yards from Harmon decayed to collapse. He knew that he should get away from the radioactive wreck, crawl west if he had to, but his heart had no will to do so. Finally, after what must have been hours, the strip of sky was darkening toward evening. Harmon activated the function to query his own biomonitors. As he'd suspected, the dosage he'd received had been lethal. The dizziness he felt now would only grow worse. The vomiting and dry retching would soon return. Blood was already pooling under his skin. Within hours, the process had already begun. The cells in his bowels and guts would begin sloughing off by the billion. And then would come the bloody diarrhea, intermittent at first, but then constant as his body began literally to shit his dissolved guts out into the world. Then the bleeding would become primarily internal, cell walls breaking down completely, entire systems collapsing. He'd live long enough to see and feel all this, he knew. Within a day, he'd be too weak even to stagger along between the episodes of diarrhea and vomiting. He'd be prostrate in the breach, his stillness broken only by involuntary seizures. Harmon knew that he wouldn't even be able to look at the blue sky or stars as he died. The biomonitors already reported the radiation-induced cataracts building on the surface of both his eyes. 
Harmon had to grin. No wonder Prospero and Moira had given him only a few days' worth of food bars. They must have known he wouldn't need even that many. Why? Why make me Prometheus for the human race with all these functions, all this knowledge, all this promise to give Ada and my species, only to let me die alone here, like this? Harmon was still sane and conscious enough to know that billions of human beings no more elect than himself had hurled similar final thoughts toward the unanswering skies in the hours and minutes before their death. He was also wise enough now to be able to answer his own question. Prometheus stole fire from the gods. Adam and Eve tasted of the fruit of knowledge in the garden. All the old creation myths told versions of the same tale, exposed the same terrible truth. Steal fire and knowledge from the gods, and you become something more than the animals you evolved from, but still something far, far below any real god. Harmon at that second would give anything to rid himself of the twenty-six last personal and religious testaments by the madman who crewed the sword of Allah. In those impassioned farewells, he felt the full weight of the burden he had been about to bring back to Ada, to Demon, to Hannah, to his friends, to his species. He realized that all of the last year the turncloth story of Troy that had been Prospero's little joke gift to the old humans passed on through Odysseus and Savi, their various mad quests, the deadly mask on Prospero's isle up in the E-ring, his escape, the artist manner people's discovery of how to build weapons, fashion some crude beginnings to society, discover politics, even grope toward some religion. It had all made them human again. The human race had returned to Earth after more than fourteen hundred years of coma and indifference. Armin realized that his and Ada's child would have been fully human, perhaps the first real human being to be born after all those comfortable, inhuman, watched over by false post-human gods, centuries of stasis. Confronted by danger and mortality at every turn, forced to invent, pressured to create bonds with other human beings just to survive the Voynix and the Calabani and Caliban himself and the Setabos thing. It would have been exciting, it would have been terrifying, it would have been real. And it all would have led, could have led, might have led, back to the Sword of Allah. Harmon rolled to one side and vomited again. This time the vomitus consisted mostly of blood and mucus. More rapid than I thought. Eyes closed against the pain, all the varieties of pain, but most especially against the pain of this new knowledge. Harmon felt on his right hip. The pistol was still secure there. He undid the strap, pulled the weapon free of the stick-tight pad, used his other hand to rack the chamber the way Moira had shown him, chambering one of the shells, clicked off the safety, and held the muzzle to his temple. 75. The Demogorgon fills half of the flame-filled sky. Asia, Panthea, and the silent sister Ione continue to cower. The rocks and ridges and volcanic summits nearby are filling with gigantic, looming shapes, titans, hours, monster steeds, monster monsters, healer-type giant centipedes, inhuman charioteers, more titans all coming to their positions like jurors showing up for a trial on the steps of a Greek temple. The thermskin goggles allow Achilles to see everything, and he almost wishes they didn't. The monsters of Tartarus are too monstrous, the titans too shaggy and titanic. The charioteers and the things the Demogorgon had called the hours aren't really possible to bring into full focus at all. They make Achilles think of the time he cleaved a Trojan's belly and chest open with a sword stroke and found a small human homunculus staring out at him, blue eyes seeming to blink at him through the shattered ribs and spilled entrails. It had been the only time he'd ever vomited on the battlefield. These hour and charioteer things were equally as difficult to look at. As the Demogorgon waits for the monstrous jurors to sort themselves out and gather, 
Hephaestus pulls a slim cord from the helmet bubble of his absurd suit and clips the end of the line into the cowl of Achilles' thermskin. Can you hear me now? asked the crippled dwarf god. We have a few minutes to talk. Yes, I hear you, but can't the Demogorgon also? He did before. No, this is a hard line. That Demogorgon is a lot of things, but not J. Edgar Hoover. Who? Never mind. Listen, son of Peleus, we have to coordinate what we're going to say to this giant rabble and the Demogorgon. A lot depends on it. Don't call me that, growls Achilles with a glare that has frozen battlefield enemies in their tracks. The god Hephaestus actually takes an alarmed step back, accidentally pulling tight the communications cord between them. Call you what? Son of Peleus. I never want to hear that phrase again. The god of artifice holds up his heavily gauntleted hands, palms outward. Fine! But we still have to talk. We only have a minute or two before this kangaroo court commences. What is a kangaroo? Achilles is growing tired of this mini-god's double talk. The fleet-footed man-killer's sword is in his hand. He has a strong suspicion that all he has to do to kill this so-called immortal is slash a gash in the bearded fool's metal suit and then step back to watch the god of fire choke to death on the acid air. Then again, Hephaestus is an Olympian immortal, even without the big bug's healing tanks back on Olympus. So perhaps, as Achilles had, the impudent bearded cripple exposed to Tartarus acid air would just cough, gag, wretch, and sprawl around in pain for an eternity until one of the Oceanids ate him. It is a powerful impulse in Achilles to find out. He resists the urge. Never mind, says Hephaestus. What are you going to say to the Demogorgon? Shall I do all the talking for us? No. Well, we need to get our stories straight. What are you going to ask the Demogorgon and the Titans to do other than kill Zeus? I am not going to ask this Demogorgon thing to kill Zeus, Achilles says firmly. The bearded dwarf god looks surprised behind the glass of his head bubble. You're not? That's why I thought we were here. I am going to kill Zeus myself, says Achilles, and feed his liver to Argus, Odysseus' dog. Hephaestus sighs. All right, but for me to sit on the throne of Olympus, the deal you offered me and which Nix agreed to, we still need to convince the Demogorgon to intercede, and the Demogorgon is insane. Insane? says Achilles. Most of the monstrous shapes seem to be in position now among the ridge lines, cinder cones, and lava flows. You've heard the thing going on about the God Supreme, didn't you? says Hephaestus. I don't know which god Demogorgon speaks of, if not Zeus. Demogorgon is speaking of some single supreme god of the entire universe, says Hephaestus his already raspy voice rasping even more over the communications line. One God with a capital G and no others at all. That's absurd, says Achilles. Yes, agrees the God of Fire. That's why the Demogorgon's race exiled him to this prison world of Tartarus. Race, says Achilles incredulously. You mean there's more than one of these Demogorgons? Of course. Nothing living comes in complete sets of one, Achilles. Even you must have learned that. This Demogorgon is as crazy as a Trojan shithouse rat. He worships some single all-powerful capital G god and sometimes refers to him as the Quiet. The Quiet? Achilles tries to imagine any god being a silent god. The concept is certainly something out of his experience. Yes, growls Hephaestus over the cowl earphones. Only this, the quiet isn't all of the single all-powerful capital G God, but is just one of many manifestations of him. Capital H there. Enough with the capitals, says Achilles. So the Demogorgon does believe in more than one God. No, insists the God of fire and artifice. This big god just has many faces or avatars or forms, sort of like Zeus when he wants to screw a mortal woman. You remember once Zeus turned into a swan to... 
What the fuck does all this have to do with the hearing that's going to start in about 30 fucking seconds? Shouts Achilles over his thermskin microphones. Hephaestus claps his hands over his glass bubble, where his ears should be. Hush! hisses the dwarf god over the intercom. Listen, this has everything to do with our argument to convince the Demogorgon to release the Titans and the others here to attack Zeus, wipe out the current Olympians, and install me as the new king on Olympus. But you just said the Demogorgon is a prisoner here. I did, but Nix, Knight, opened the brain hole from Olympus to here. We can go back that way unless it closes before this goddamned hearing, trial, town meeting, whatever it is, gets underway. Besides, I think the Demogorgon can leave whenever it wants to. What kind of prison is it that allows you to leave whenever you want to, asks Achilles. He's beginning to think that it's the bearded dwarf god who's the lunatic here. You have to know a little about the Demogorgon's race, says the bubble head on top of the iron bubbled body which is all anyone knows about them, very little. This Demogorgon is imprisoning himself here because he was told to. He can quantum teleport anywhere, anytime, if he thinks it's important enough to. We just have to convince him it's important enough to. But we have the brain hole, says Achilles. And what is Nyx getting out of this? You told me at Odysseus' home before I woke Zeus that night would open the hole, and I believed you, but why? What's in it for her? Survival, says Hephaestus, and looks around. All the monstrous shapes seem to be in position. The court is in session. Everyone is waiting for the Demogorgon to speak. Achilles can see this as well. What do you mean survival, he hisses over the interphone. You told me yourself that Nyx is the one goddess whom Zeus fears, her and her goddamned fates. He can't hurt her. The glass bubble moves back and forth as Hephaestus shakes his head. Not Zeus! Prospero and Sycorax and the people, the beings who helped create Zeus, me, the other gods, even the Titans. And I don't mean Uranus, god of the sky mating with Gaia, Mother Earth. Before them. Achilles tries to wrap his mind around this concept of someone other than Earth and Night creating the Titans and the gods. He can't. They trapped a creature named Setabas on Mars and your Ilium Earth for ten years, continues Hephaestus. Who did? says Achilles. He is totally confused by now. What is a Setabas? And what relevance can this have to what we have to say to the Demogorgon in one minute? Achilles, you must know enough of our history to know how Zeus and the other young Olympians defeated his father Cronos and the other Titans, even though the Titans were more powerful. I do, says Achilles, feeling like a child again, being tutored by Chiron, the centaur who raised him. Zeus won the war between the gods and the titans by enlisting the aid of terrible creatures against whom the titans were powerless. And which was the most terrible of these terrible creatures? asked the bearded dwarf god through the intercom. His teacherly tone makes Achilles want to gut him on the spot. The hundred-armed, he answers, exerting the last of his patience. The Demogorgon will be speaking any second, and none of this gibberish has helped Achilles know what to say. The monstrous, many-handed thing which you gods called Briareus, he adds, but which early men called Igion. The thing called Briareus and Igion is really named Setabas, hisses Hephaestus. For ten years this creature has been distracted from its hungry intentions, left to feed on your puny human war between Trojans and Achaeans. But now it is loose again, and the quantum underpinnings of the entire solar system are coming unhinged. Nix is worried that they'll destroy not only their Earth, but the new Mars and her entire dark dimension. Brain holes connect everything. They're being too reckless, this Sycorax and Setabas, Prospero and their ilk. The fates predict total quantum destruction if someone or something does not intercede. Nix would prefer me, the crippled dwarf, on the throne of Olympus rather than risk such total quantum meltdown. Since Achilles has not the least fucking clue as to what the dwarf god is babbling about, he remains silent. The Demogorgon 
seems to be clearing his non-throat to silence the last of the murmurs and movements in the crowd of titans, ours, charioteers, healers, and other malformed shapes. The best news, hisses Hephaestus over his intercom, whispering now as if the huge shapeless and veiled mass above them can hear them despite the concord, is that the Demogorgon and his god, the quiet, eat setabosses for snacks. The Demogorgon is not the insane one here, Achilles whispers back. It's you who's crazy as a Trojan shithouse rat. Nonetheless, will you let me speak for us? Hephaestus whispers, urgency in every syllable. Yes, says Achilles, but if you say something I don't agree with, I'm going to hack your cute little suit into separate iron balls, and then cut your real balls off, and feed them to you through that glass bowl. Fair enough, says Hephaestus, and jerks the calm line free. You may begin your appeal, booms the Demogorgon. 76. They decided to vote on whether no man could borrow the Sony. The meeting was scheduled for noon when the minimum number of sentries were posted and the bulk of the day's necessary chores were done, so that most of the artist's survivors, including the six newcomers and Hannah, bringing their number up to fifty-five, could attend. But already the nature of Odysseus No Man's request had got out to even the farthest posted sentry, and already the consensus was dead set against it. Hannah and Ada spent the rest of the morning catching up with events. The younger woman was all but inconsolable over the loss of their friends and artist hall itself, but Ada reminded her that the hall could be rebuilt, at least some crude version of it. Do you think we'll live to see that? asked Hannah. Ada had no answer. She squeezed Hannah's hand. They talked about Harmon, about the details of his odd disappearance from the Golden Gate with the thing called Ariel, and about Ada's sense that Harmon was still alive somewhere. They talked about small things, how food was being prepared these days, and Ada's hopes to enlarge the camp before the Voynix began massing as they had. Do you know why this Setabas baby keeps them away? asked Hannah. None of us have a real clue, said Ada. She led the young sculptor to the pit. The Setabas thing, no man had called it a form of louse, was at the bottom, hands and tendrils curled under it, but its yellow eyes stared up with an inhuman indifference much worse than mere malevolence. Hannah grabbed her temples. Oh, my! Oh, God, it's clawing at my mind, wanting to get in. It does that, Ada said softly. She had carried a flechette rifle to the pit, and now she aimed it casually at the mass of blue-gray tissue and pink hands a few yards below. What if it takes over? asked Hannah. Begins to control us, you mean? said Ada. Turns us against one another? Yes. Ada shrugged. We half expect that to begin every day, every night. We've discussed it. So far, we all can vaguely hear this set of us baby calling to us like a bad smell in the background. But when it comes strongly, as it just did with you, it's just one person at a time. If the rest of us hear it and feel it, it's like an, I don't know, an echo. So you think that if it takes control, said Hannah, you think it'll be one of you at a time? Ada shrugged again, something like that. Hannah looked at the heavy flechette rifle in Ada's hand. But if the thing starts controlling you right now, you could kill me, kill a lot of us before— Yes, said Ada. We've discussed that as well. Did you come up with some plan? Yes, Ada said again, very quietly, as she stood above the pit. We're going to kill this abomination before it comes to that. Hannah nodded. But you'll have to get all your people out of here before you can do that. I see why you don't want to loan Odysseus the Sony. Ada had to sigh. Do you know why he wants it, Hannah? No, he won't tell me. There's so much he won't tell me. Yet you love him. Since that first day we saw him at the bridge. You were under the turn cloth back when it worked, Hannah. You know that that Odysseus was married. We heard him speak to the other Achaeans about his wife, Penelope, his teenage son, Telemachus. The language they spoke was strange, but somehow 
We always understood it under the turret. Yes, Anna looked down. Down in the pit, the Cetabas baby began to scurry back and forth on its many pink hands. Five tendrils snaked up the side of the pit, and other hands wrapped around the grill, pulling the metal until it seemed to bend. The thing's many yellow eyes were very bright. Demon was on his way back from the forest and headed toward the noon gathering when he saw the ghost. He was carrying a heavy canvas bag filled with firewood on his back and wishing that he'd been on sentry duty or hunting detail that day, instead of having to chop and haul wood, when a woman stepped out of the forest only a dozen yards from him. At first he saw her only in his peripheral vision, enough to know that it was a human being, female, and therefore part of the artist community rather than a Voynix. And for a few seconds he kept walking, flechette rifle in his right hand, but pointed downward, eyes lowered as he hitched up the heavy pack on his back. But when he turned her way to call a greeting, he froze. It was Savi. He straightened up, and the huge load of wood in his makeshift canvas rucksack almost toppled him over backward. It would not have been an overreaction. He could only stare. It was Savi but not the gray-haired, older Savi he'd watched being murdered and dragged off by Caliban in the caverns under Prospero's hellhole of an orbital isle almost a year earlier. This was a younger, paler, more beautiful Savi. A resurrected Savi? No. A ghost was Demon's dual stab of thought and fear. His era of old-style humans did not even believe in ghosts, did not truly have the concept of ghosts. He'd never heard of ghosts outside mentions in the Turin drama, or heard a ghost story until he started sigling the ancient books in Artist Manor the previous autumn. But this had to be a ghost. The young Savi did not seem completely substantial. There was something shimmery about her as she saw him, turned, and began walking straight toward him. Demon realized that he could see through her more even than he'd been able to see through the hologram of Prospero up on the orbital isle. Yet somehow he knew that this was no hologram. This was something real, real and alive, even as he noticed the soft, pale glow her entire body gave off and the fact that her feet did not seem to be touching the ground with any weight as she strode through the high, brown grass toward him. She was wearing a thermskin and nothing else. Demon knew from experience that thermskins, not as thick as a coat of paint, made one feel more naked than naked. And that's how she looked now as she began walking in his direction. Naked. The thermskin was a pale blue but showed every muscle working as she walked, emphasized rather than hid the slight bobble to her breasts. Demon had grown used to Savi and thermskins, but where there had been slightly sagging breasts, slack buttocks, and floppy thigh muscles with the older Savi, this apparition showed high breasts, a flat stomach, and powerful young muscles. He freed his arms from the straps, dropped the load of firewood, and gripped his flechette rifle with both hands. Demon could see the new inner palisade more than two hundred yards away, and even a dark head moving above the line of logs, but no one else was in sight. He and the ghost were alone in this wintry field at the edge of the forest. Hello, Demon. It was Savi's voice, younger, even more vibrant with life than the mesmerizing voice he remembered, but definitely Savi's. Demon said nothing until she stopped within arm's reach. Her very solidity seemed to flicker, one second complete, the next transparent and insubstantial. When she was substantial, he could see even the aureole around her slightly raised nipples. The young Savi, he realized, had been very beautiful. She looked him up and down with those familiar dark eyes he remembered so well. You look well, demon. You've lost a lot of weight, gained muscle. Still, he did not speak. Everyone who went out into the forest carried one of the high decibel whistles they'd dug from the ruins. His was on a lanyard around his neck. He had only to raise it and blow it, and a dozen armed men or women would be running his way in less than a minute. Savi smiled. 
You're right, I'm not Savi. We've never met. I know you only from Prospero's descriptions and video recordings. Who are you? he asked. His voice sounded hoarse, tight, tense, even to himself. The apparition shrugged as if her identity were of little importance. My name is Moira. The name meant nothing to Demon. Savi had never mentioned anyone named Moira, neither had Prospero. For a wild second, he wondered if Caliban could be a shapeshifter. What are you? he said at last. Ah, the syllable was launched in Savi's husky laugh. A wonderfully intelligent question, not why do you look like my dead friend Savi, but what are you? Prospero was correct. You were never as stupid as you seemed even a year ago. Demon touched the whistle on his chest and waited. I'm a post-human, said the Savi apparition. There are no more post-humans, Demon said. With his left hand, he raised the whistle slightly. There were no more post-humans, said the shimmering woman. Now there are. One. Me. What do you want here? She slowly extended her hand and touched his right forearm. Demon expected her hand to pass through him, but her touch was as solid and real as that of any of the artist's survivors. He could feel the pressure of her long fingers through his jacket. He could also feel an almost electrical tingle there. I want to come with you to watch the discussion, and then the vote on whether no man can borrow your Sony, she said softly. How in the hell does she know about that, he wondered. Aloud, he said, if you show up, there probably won't be a discussion and vote. Even Odys... No man will want to know who you are, where you're from, what you want. She shrugged again. Perhaps, but none of the others will see me. I will be visible only to you. This is a little trick Prospero built into my sisters when they went off to become gods, and I decided to keep it for myself. It comes in handy from time to time. He fingered the whistle with his left hand, slipped the index finger of his right hand into the trigger guard of the flechette rifle, and looked at her as she shifted slightly from full focus to transparency back to full focus again. There was too much in what she just said to allow him even to frame the proper questions right now. His intuition was that the best thing he could do was keep her around. He couldn't explain even to himself why that made sense. Why would you want to come to the discussion? he asked. I am interested in the outcome. Why? She smiled. Demon, if I can be invisible to the other fifty-five people there, including no man, I could certainly have remained unseen by you, but I want you to know I'm there. We will talk about things after the discussion and after the vote. Talk about what things? Demon had seen the dead brown mummified corpses of what Savi, Harmon, and he had thought were the last of the post-humans up in the thin, stale air of Prospero's dying realm. All female, most of them chewed on by Caliban centuries ago. Demon had no clue if this apparition was what she claimed to be. To him, she more resembled the goddesses from the Turin drama he had watched only on occasion. Athena, perhaps, or a much younger hero. Not as beautiful as the glimpses he'd had of Aphrodite. Suddenly he remembered that almost a year ago in Paris Crater there had been word of street altars being set up to the gods from the Trojan War Turin drama. But everyone in Paris Crater now was dead, including his mother, murdered and eaten by Caliban, the city buried in that blue ice gunk by Setebos. If the people of his home city had ever prayed to the Turin gods and goddesses, it had done them no good. If this was a goddess from the drama, he was sure that she would do him no good. We can talk about where your friend Harmon is, said the spectral figure who called herself Moira. Where is he? How is he? Demon realized that he'd shouted. She smiled. We can talk after the vote. At least tell me why this vote is so important that you've come from... Wherever you've come from to watch it, demanded Demon, his voice sounding as hard as he'd become inside over the past year. Moira nodded. I came to hear it because it is important. Why? To whom? How? She said nothing. Her smile had disappeared. Demon released the whistle. Is it important that we give no man the Sony, or important that we don't loan it to him? I just want to watch, said the Savi ghost, who called herself Moira, not vote. I didn't ask that, I know, 
said the thing with Savi's voice. The bell for the conclave rang. People were gathering around the central lean-to, tent, and cooking area. Demon was in no hurry to rush to it. He knew it might be less of a threat to lead alive Voynix into their camp. He also knew he had a very short time in which to make his decision. If you can view the meeting without being seen by anyone, why did you reveal yourself to me? He asked, his voice low. I told you, said the young woman. This was my choice. Or perhaps I'm like a vampire. I can only enter a place the first time if I am invited in. Demon didn't know what a vampire was, but he didn't think that was important right now. No, he said, I'm not going to invite you into our safe area unless you give me a compelling reason to do so. Morris sighed, Prospero and Harmon also said you were stubborn, but I couldn't imagine they meant this stubborn. You talk as if you've seen Harmon, said Demon. Tell me something about him, how he is, where he is, something that will make me believe you've met him. Moira continued to gaze at him, and Demon felt that the air around their locked gazes should be sizzling. The bell quit ringing. The meeting had begun. Demon stood motionless, silent. All right, said Moira, smiling slightly again. Your friend Harmon has a scar through his pubic hair just above his penis. I didn't ask him how he received it, but it must have been since his last twenty. The healing tanks on Prospero's Isle would never have left it there. Beeman did not blink. I've never seen Harmon naked, he said. You'll have to tell me something else. Moira laughed easily. You lie. When Prospero and I gave Harmon the therm skin he is wearing now, he said that he knew exactly how to get into one. They're tricky to pull on, you know. And that you and he had worn them for weeks up on the aisle. He said that once you had to strip in front of Savi to pull your therm skins on. You've seen him naked, and it's a noticeable scar. Why is Harmon wearing a therm skin now? asked Demon. Where is he? Take me to the meeting, said Moira. I promise I will tell you about Harmon afterward. You should talk to Ada about him, said Demon. They're married. The strange word did not come easily to Demon. Moira smiled. I will tell you, and you can tell Ada if you think it is appropriate. Shall we go? She held out her left arm, crooked, as if he were going to take it to escort her into a formal dining room. He took her arm. So that's the beginning and end of my request, no man Odysseus was saying as he saw Demon enter the circle of fifty-four people. Most were sitting on sleeping pads or blankets. Some were standing. Demon stood apart behind the standing survivors. You want to borrow our Sony, the one thing offering us a chance of survival here, said Bowman, and you won't tell us why you want it or how long you might keep it. That is correct, said Noman. I might need it for only a few hours. I could program it to return on its own. It's possible that the Sony might not return at all. We'd all die, said one of the Hughes Town survivors, a woman named Steffe. Noman did not reply. Tell us why you need it, said Ceres. No, that's a private matter, said no man. Some of the sitting, kneeling, and standing people chuckled as if the bearded Greek had made a joke, but no man did not smile. He was as serious as his demeanor. Go find another Sony, cried Common, their would-be military expert. He'd told others that he had never trusted the real Odysseus in the Turin drama he'd watched every day for ten years before the fall, and was prepared to trust this older version even less. I would find another if I could, said No Man, his voice level, unagitated, but the nearest ones I know about are thousands of miles from here. It would take too long for the cobbled-together sky raft I built to get there, if the thing could get there at all. I need to use the Sony today, now. Why? asked Lehman, absently rubbing his still-bandaged right hand with its missing fingers. No man remained silent. Ada, who had remained standing near the barrel-chested Greek after her opening of the meeting and her introduction, said softly, No man, can you tell us how it might benefit us if we let you borrow the Sony? If I succeed in what I want to do, it's possible that the fax nodes will begin working again, he said. In just a few hours, a few days at most. There was an audible intake of breath among the crowd. It's more possible, he continued, that they won't. 
So that's your reason for using our Sony? asked Grayogi. To get the fax pavilions working again? No, said no man. It's just a possible side effect of my trip, not even a probable one. Would your borrowing of the Sony help us in some other way? asked Ada. It was clear that she was more sympathetic to no man's request than the majority of those frowning among the ragged clump of listeners. No man shrugged. Everyone was so silent for the next moment that Demon could hear two sentries calling to each other more than a quarter of a mile away, to the south. He turned. The spectral Moira was still standing near him, her arms crossed across her therm-skinned breasts. Incredible as it was, no one who had looked up to watch the two of them approach the group, including Ada, No Man, and Bowman, who had been staring at him since he passed through the Palisade Gate, evidently had been able to see her. No Man held out his blunt, powerful hands, fingers splayed as if reaching for them all, or perhaps pushing them all away. You want to hear that I will perform some miracle for you all, he said, his tone low, but his powerful, rhetoric-trained voice still echoing off the palisade. There is no such miracle. If you stay here with the Sony, you'll be killed sooner or later. Even if you evacuate to this island downriver you're thinking of fleeing to, the Voiniks will follow you there. They can still fax, and not just through the fax nodes you know about. There are tens of thousands of Voiniks surrounding you now, massed within two miles of here, while all over the earth the last few thousand human survivors are either fleeing or holed up in caves or towers or the ruins of their old communities. The Voiniks are killing them. You have the advantage that the Voiniks won't attack while this Setabas thing in the pit is your captive. But within days, if not hours, that Setabas Laos will be strong enough to rip its way out of the pit and into your minds. Trust me, you don't want to experience that. And in the end, the Voiniks will come anyway. All the more reason to keep the Sony to ourselves, shouted the man named Cole. No man turned his hands, palms up. Perhaps, but soon there will be no place on this earth for you to flee. Do you think you're the only ones with a finder function? Your functions have ceased to work. The Voinixes and the Calabani's finder functions haven't. They'll find you. Even Setabas will find you when he's finished gorging himself on your planet's history. You don't seem to offer us any chance, said Tom, the quiet medic. I am not, said No Man, his voice rising now. It is not for me to offer you a chance. "'although my trip may accidentally afford you one if I am successful. "'But the odds of my success are low, I won't lie to you. "'You deserve the truth. "'But if something important does not change, "'Sony or no Sony, the odds of your success, of your survival, are zero. "'Demon, who had sworn he would stay quiet during the discussion, "'heard himself shouting, "'Can we go to the rings, no man? "'The Sony would take us there, six at a time, it brought me home from Prospero's Isle on the E-ring. Would we be safe in the orbital rings? All faces turned toward him. Not a single gaze moved to where the shimmering Moira stood not six feet to his right. No, said No Man, you would not be safe in the rings. The dark-haired woman named Edide stood suddenly. She seemed to be sobbing and laughing at the same time. You're not giving us a fucking chance! For the first time, maddeningly, infuriatingly, Odysseus No Man smiled, his teeth white against his mostly gray beard. It's not for me to give you a chance, he said harshly. The fates will either choose to do that or decline to do that. It is up to you today to give me a chance or not. Ada stepped forward. Let's vote. I think that no one should abstain in this vote since everything may depend on it. Those in favor of allowing Odysseus, I'm sorry, I mean no man, to borrow our Sony, please hold up your right hand. Those opposed, keep your hands down. Seventy-seven. The city and battlefield of Troy, ancient Ilium, wasn't much to look at from five thousand meters up. That's it? asked Centurion leader Mapahu from the troop carrier deck. That's where we were with the Greeks and Trojans fighting? 
that shrubby hill and bit of land? Six thousand years ago, said Monmouth from his control room of the Dark Lady in the dropship's cargo bay. And in another universe, said Orfu from his corner of the Dark Lady's own cargo bay. It doesn't look like much, said Summa Four from the controls of the dropship. Can we move on? One more circle, please, said Monmouth. Can we go lower? Fly over the plain between the ridge and the sea or the beach? No, said Summa Four. Use your optics to magnify. I don't choose to run that close to the interdiction field dome over the dried-up Mediterranean Sea or get that low. I was thinking of getting a little closer to allow Orfu's radar and thermal imaging to get better signals, said Monmut. I'm fine, rumbled the intercom voice from the hold. The dropship orbited again at 5,000 meters, the westernmost part of its circle above the ruins on the hilltop, and still more than a kilometer from where the Mediterranean basin began. Monmut zoomed his image from the primary camera feed, shut off other inputs, and looked down with a strange sense of sadness. The rubble of the ruins of the ancient stones where Ilium had once stood lay on a ridge running westward toward the curve of Aegean shore. It was never really a bay, just a bend where ancient ships had tied up to stakes and stone anchors, and where Agamemnon and all the Greek heroes had beached their hundreds of black ships. To the west, then, the Aegean and Mediterranean had stretched forever, the wine-dark sea, but now, through the slight shimmer of the post-human-created interdiction field that would cut all the dropship's power in a millisecond if they flew into it, there stretched away only more dirt, more rock, distant green fields, the dry Mediterranean basin. Also easily visible to the west were ancient islands that once rose from the sea, islands that Achilles had conquered before assaulting Troy. Imbrus, Lemnos, and Tenedos, visible now only as steep forest-covered hills with rocky bases meeting the sandy bottom of the basin. Between the now dry Aegean and the ridge holding the ruins of Troy, Monmouth could see a kilometer and a half or so of alluvial plain. It was a forest of scrub trees now, but the little Moravec could easily see this plain as it was when he had been there with Odysseus, Achilles, Hector, and all the other warriors. About three curving miles of shallow sea fringed with marshes and sandy alluvial flats, the man-crowded beach the sand dunes that had soaked up so much blood in the years of fighting there, the thousands of bright tents above the beach, then the wide plain between the beach and the city, wooded now but stripped bare of all trees then after a decade of foraging for firewood for cooking fires and corpse fires. To the north there was water still visible, the strait once called the Dardanelles, the Hellespont, dammed up by glowing force-field hands of the same sort as between Gibraltar and Africa on the west end of the drained Mediterranean. As if he were studying the same area with his radar and other instruments, Orfu said over their private circuit, The post-humans must have built some huge drainage system underground or this entire area would be flooded now. Yes, sent Monmouth, not really interested in the engineering or physics of the thing. He was thinking of Lord Byron, and of Alexander the Great, and of all the others who had made their pilgrimage to Ilium, Troy, this strangely sacred site. No stone there is without a name. The words seemed just to appear in Monmouth's mind. Who had written that? Lucan? Perhaps. Probably. On the hilltop now, only a few grey-white scars of disturbed rock showed, a tumble of stones all without a name. Monmouth realized that he was looking at the ruins of ruins. Some of those scrapes and scars probably dated back to the Troy fanatic and amateur archaeologist Schliemann's careless digs and brutal excavations from when he first started digging in 1870, more than 3,000 years ago on this true earth. It was no place special now. The last name it had held on any human map was Hisserlich. Rocks, scrub trees, an alluvial plain, a high ridge looking north to the Dardanelles and west to the Aegean. 
but in Monmouth's mind's eye he could see precisely where the armies had clashed on the plains of Scamander and the plain of Simois. He could see where the walls and topless towers of Ilium had held their high place there, where the long ridge dropped down toward the sea. He could still make out a thicketed ridge in between the city and the sea. The Greeks had called it Thicket Ridge even then, but the priests and priestesses in the temples of Troy often referred to it as Marina's mounded tomb. And he remembered how he had watched Zeus's face rise in the south as an atomic mushroom cloud not so many months ago. Six thousand years ago. As the dropship completed its last high circling, Monmouth could make out where the great sea and gate had held back the screaming Greeks. There had been no large wooden horse in the Iliad Monmouth had seen firsthand, and the great main lane inside past the marketplace and central fountains all leading to Priam's palace, destroyed in the bombing more than ten months ago in Monmouth's time, and just northeast of the palace the great temple to Athena, where only rocks waited now and scrub trees grew. Monmouth from Europa could see where the busy Dardanian gate had been, and the main watchtower and well just north of it where once Helen had "'There's nothing here,' said their pilot, Summa Four, over the intercom. "'I'm leaving now.' "'Yes,' said Monmouth. "'Yes,' rumbled Orfu over the same calm line. They flew north, retracting the slow flight wings and breaking the sound barrier again. The echo of the sonic boom went unheard on both sides of the empty Dardanelles. "'Are you excited?' Monmouth asked his friend over their private line. "'We'll be seeing Paris in a few minutes.' A crater where the center of Paris used to be, answered Orfu. I think that black hole millennia ago took out Proust's apartment. Still in all, said Monmouth, it's where he wrote. And for a while a fellow named James Joyce as well, if I remember correctly, Orfu rumbled. Why didn't you ever tell me that you were obsessed with Joyce as well as Proust, persisted Monmouth. It never came up. But why those two as your primary focus, Orfu? Why Shakespeare, Monmouth? Why his sonnets rather than his plays? Why the dark lady and the young man rather than, say, Hamlet? No, answer my question, said Monmouth, please. There was a silence. Monmouth listened to the ramjet engines behind and above them, the hiss of the oxygen flowing through umbilicals and ventilators, the static emptiness of the main comm lines. Finally, Orfu said, Remember my spiel up in the Mab about how great human artists, singularities of genius, could bring new realities into existence, or at least allow us to cross universal brains to them? How could I forget? None of us knew if you were serious. I was serious, rumbled Orfu. My interest in human beings focused on their twentieth through twenty-second centuries, counting from Christ— I decided long ago that Proust and Joyce had been the consciousnesses that had helped midwife those centuries into being. Not a positive recommendation, if I remember history correctly, Monmouth said softly. No. I mean, yes. They flew in silence for a few more minutes. Would you like to hear a poem I ran across when I was a little pup of a Moravec, fresh from the growth bins and factory lettuces? Monmouth tried to imagine a newborn Orfu of Io. He gave up the effort. Yes, he said, tell me. Monmouth had never heard his friend rumble poetry before. It was an oddly pleasant sound. Stillborn. One. Little Rudy Bloom, ruddy-cheeked in his mother's womb, red light permeating his sleepy, unfocused watchings. Molly, clicking long, knitting needles as she weaves red wool for him, feeling his small feet move against the inside of her. Tiny fetus dreams consume him, preparing him for the smell of blankets. 2. A man gently pats his lips with a red napkin, eyes focused on a sea of clouds drifting behind high brick chimneys, Submerged in the sudden memory of hawthorn stalks rubbing together in a storm, reaching small hands out towards fluttering pink petals, 
the scent of days long past curl into the low wings of his nostrils. Three. Eleven days. Eleven times the lifespan of a tiny creature emerging from a cocoon. Eleven hush-stained mornings of warmth and shadow creeping across floorboards. Eleven thousand heartbeats before night fell, and the ducks abandoned the far pond. Eleven indicated by the long and short hands when she held him to her breast. Eleven days they watched his pink body sleeping in ruddy wool. Four. Fragments of the novel were bound in his imagination, but loose pages drifted through the dark channels of his mind. Some were blank, others contained nothing but footnotes. Tediously he had suffered the contractions of his imagination, but once in ink, the memories never survived the night. When the Ionian rumble died away on the intercom, Mummet was silent for a short while, trying to assess the quality of the thing. He had trouble doing so, but he knew it meant a lot to Orfu of Io. The giant Moravec's voice had almost trembled near the end. Who is it by? asked Monmut. I don't know, said Orfu. Some twenty-first-century female poet whose name was lost with the rest of the lost era. Remember, I encountered this when I was young, before I'd really read Proust or Joyce or any other serious human writer. But this bit of verse cemented Joyce and Proust together for me as two facets of a single consciousness. A singularity of human genius and insight. I never quite got over that perception. It's rather like the first time I encountered Shakespeare's sonnets, began Monmouth. Turn on your video feed relayed from the Queen Mab, Soma Four ordered all hands aboard. Monmouth activated the feed. Two human beings were copulating wildly on a broad bed of silk sheets and bright woolen tapestries. Their energy and earnestness was astounding to Monmouth, who had read enough about human sexual intercourse but who had never thought to look up a video recording of it from the archives. "'What is it?' asked Orfu over the private com. "'I'm getting wild telemetric data. Blood pressure levels soaring, dopamine flowing, adrenaline, heartbeat pounding, some fight to the death somewhere?' "'Ah,' said Monmouth. Then the figures rolled over, still joined and moving rhythmically, almost frenetically, and the Moravec saw the man's face clearly for the first time. Odysseus. The woman appeared to be the Sycorax person who had greeted their Achaean passenger on the orbital asteroid city. Her breasts and buttocks seemed even larger now, unfettered as they were, although at this particular instant the woman's breasts were flattened against Odysseus' chest. Um, began Monmouth again. Summa Four saved him. That input isn't important. Switch to the forward dropship cameras. Monmouth did so. He knew that Orfu was turning to the thermal, radar, and other imaging data he was still capable of receiving. They were approaching the black hole cratered Paris, but just as in the images taken from the Queen Mab, there was no crater visible, only a domed cathedral seemingly spun of webbed blue ice. Summa Four radioed the Mab. Where is our many-handed friend who built this thing? No brain howls visible anywhere we can see from orbit, replied Astig Chai at once. Neither our ship viewers nor the cameras on the satellites we seeded can find it. The thing seems to have finished feasting on Auschwitz, Hiroshima, and the other sites for the time being. Perhaps it's returned home to Paris. It has, said Orfu on the shared calm. Check the thermal imaging. Something very big and very ugly is nested right in the center of that blue spider web, just beneath the highest part of that dome. There are a lot of thermal vents there. It seems to be heating its nest with warmth from the crater. But it's there, all right. You can almost see the hundreds of oversized fingers under the warm areas of the glowing brain in the deep thermal imaging. Well, said Monmouth over his private line, at least it's your Paris— Proust's City of... 
Afterward, Monmouth would never understand how Suma 4 reacted so quickly, even while jacked into the dropship's controls and central computer. The six bolts of lightning leaped upward from different points around the giant blue dome. Only the dropship's altitude and its pilot's instantaneous reflexes saved them. The dropship shifted from ramjets to scramjets, hurtled sideways in a 75G bank, dove, rolled, and then climbed toward the north, but the six streaks of billion-volt lightning still missed them only by a few hundred meters. The implosion of air and shockwave of thunder flipped the dropship over twice, but Suma 4 never lost control. The wings retracted to fins, and the dropship ran for it. Suma 4 banked again, rolled deliberately, triggered full active stealth, popped flares and blanketed the air above the Paris Blue Ice Cathedral Dome with electronic interference. A dozen fireballs rose from the ice-buried city, hurtling skyward at Mach 3, seeking them, seeking them, accelerating, seeking them. Monmouth watched the radar track with something more than casual interest and knew that Orfu, with his direct sensory radar feed, must be feeling the plasma missiles closing on him. They did not find the dropship. Suma 4 already had them scramjetting at Mach 5 and rising above 32,000 meters and climbing into the fringes of space. The fireball meteors exploded at different altitudes below them, their shock waves overlapping like a dozen violent ripples on pond. Why, that fucker began Orfu. Silence, snapped Suma 4. The dropship rolled, dove, turned south, expanded its sphere of radar and electronic interference, and climbed again toward space. No fireballs or lightning came up from the city that was falling behind so quickly, six hundred kilometers below and behind already and getting smaller by the second. I guess our many-handed brain friend has weapons, said Monmouth. So do we, came Mapahu's voice on the comm. I think we should nuke him, warm up his nest for him a little bit. Ten million degrees Fahrenheit would do for a start. Quiet, snapped Suma 4 from the cockpit. Prime Integrator Astig Che's voice came over the common band. My friends, we... You have a problem down there. Tell us about it, rumbled Orfu of Io, still forgetting that he was still on the common radio link. No, said the Prime Integrator. I am not speaking of the many-handed creature's attack on you. I am talking about a more serious problem. And just beneath your current trajectory track. Our sensors might not have picked it up if they had not been following you. More serious, said Monmouth. Much more serious, said Prime Integrator Astig Che. And not just one serious problem, I'm afraid, but 768 of them. 78. Proceed with your appeal, booms the Demogorgon. Hephaestus nodges Achilles to signify that he will do the speaking, makes an awkward bow, a series of iron spheres and one glass bubble bobbling, and says, Your Demogorgonness, Lord Kronos, and other respected Titanisms, immortal hours, and honorable other things. My friend Achilles and I come here today not to appeal, not to ask you for a boon, but to share essential information with all of you. Information you need to know, and will want to know. Information which— Speak up, crippled god. Hephaestus forces a smile through his beard, grits his teeth hard, and repeats his preamble. Speak, then. Achilles wonders if Kronos and the other titans, not to mention the huge, indescribable entities surrounding them, things with odd names like the Immortal Hours and Charioteers, are going to take an active part in this meeting, or if the Demogorgon has the floor until it, he, she, it, formally recognizes someone or something else to speak. Hephaestus then surprises him. From his bulky backpack, a clumsy iron and canvas frame holding what Achilles imagined must be tanks of air, the god of artifice pulls a brass ovoid studded with glass lenses. He carefully sets the device on the top of a boulder between him and the looming Demogorgon and fusses with various switches and settings. Then the dwarf god says, shouting and amplifying his helmet speakers to the maximum, Your Demogorgonoidness! 
most noble and frightening hours, your most majestic titans and titanesses, Kronos, Rhea, Krios, Koyas, Hyperion, Iapetus, Thea, Helios, Selene, Eos, and all others of titan persuasion assembled here, your many-armed healernesses, rudely shaped charioteers, all honored beings out there in the fog and ash, rather than make my own case today, the case for removing the pretender Zeus from the throne for attempting to usurp all divinity unto himself, asking you to depose him, or at least oppose him, for presumptuously claiming all worlds and universes his own from this day forth to the end of time, I shall allow you to see an actual event. For even as we huddle here on this lava-riddled shit-heap of a world, Zeus has called all the Olympian immortals into the great hall of the gods. I left my camera concealed there, but broadcasting live to a repeater station in Hellas Basin. The immortal Nix's brain hull allows us to receive this broadcast with less than a second of delay time. Behold! Hephaestus fiddles with more switches, throws a toggle. Nothing happens. The god of fire bites his lip, curses into his microphone, and fiddles with the brass device some more. It blinks, whirs, flickers, and falls silent again. Achilles begins to slide his god-killing blade from its place in his belt. Behold! cries Hephaestus, again using full amplification. This time the brass device projects a rectangle almost a hundred yards wide into the air above them all, in front of the Demogorgon and the hundreds of hulking forms in the red lava light and smoke around them. The rectangle shows nothing but static and snow. Oh, fuck me, growls Hephaestus, each word quite audible over his helmet speakers. He hurries to the device and wiggles some metal rods which remind Achilles of the ears of a rabbit. The huge image above them leaps into clarity. It is a holographic projection, very deep, fully three-dimensional, in living color, striking the eye like a wide window into the actual hall of the gods itself. The visuals are accompanied by surround sound. Achilles can hear the nearby whisper of the hundreds upon hundreds of the waiting gods' sandals scuffing softly on marble. When Hermes softly breaks wind, it is audible to everyone here. The titans, titanesses, ours, charioteers, insectoid healers, unnamed monstrous shapes, everyone except the Demogorgon, gasp each in its own inhuman way. Not at Hermes' indiscretion, but at the immediacy and impact of the still widening and encircling holographic projection. By the time the band of light and motion closes around them here, the illusion of being among the immortals in the great hall of the gods is very powerful. Achilles actually pulls his blade further free, thinking that Zeus on his golden throne and the thousand Olympian gods standing around them must certainly hear the noise in their midst and turn to see them all huddled here in the reek and gloom of Tartarus. The Olympian gods do not turn. It's a one-way broadcast. Zeus, at least fifty feet tall on his throne, leans forward, scowls out at the ranks upon ranks of assembled gods, goddesses, furies, and Erinaeses, and begins to speak. Achilles can clearly hear the gods' newfound ultimate self-importance in the archaic cadence of each slow syllable. You congregated powers of this Olympus, you who share the glory and the strength of him ye serve, rejoice. Henceforth I am omnipotent. All else has been subdued to me. Alone the souls of man, like unextinguished fire, yet burns toward heaven with fierce reproach and doubt. And lamentation and reluctant prayer, hurling up insurrection which might make our antique empire insecure, though built on eldest faith, and hell's coeval fear. And though my curses through the pendulous air, like snow on herbless peaks, fall flake by flake, and cling to it, though under my wrath's night it climbs the crags of life, step after step, 
which wound it as ice wounds unsandaled feet. It yet remains supreme or misery, aspiring, unrepressed, yet soon to fall. Zeus stands suddenly, and the radiance flowing from him is so brilliant that a thousand immortal gods and one very mortal man in a sweaty chameleon suit, the stealth-suited man is quite visible to Hephaestus' camera, and thus to everyone here in Tartarus, take a hesitant step backward as Zeus continues. Pour forth heaven's wine, Idean Ganymede, and let it fill the Daedal cups like fire. And from the flower inwoven soul divine ye all triumphant harmonies arise, as dew from earth under the twilight stars. Drink, be the nectar circling through your veins, the soul of joy, ye ever-living gods, till exaltation bursts in one wide voice, like music from Elysian winds. And thou, now attend beside me, veiled in the light of the desire which makes thee one with me, as I become God-ascendant, the single God to thee, the one and true omnipotent God, almighty God, true Lord of all eternity. Hephaestus shuts off the brass and glass projector. The huge circular window binding Tartarus to the hall of the gods on Olympus flicks out of existence, and everything returns to cinder, soot, stink, and red gloom. Achilles shifts his feet farther apart, hefts his shield, and holds his god-killing knife out of sight behind that shield. He has no idea what will happen next. For the longest moments, nothing does happen. Achilles expects shouts, cries, demands that Hephaestus prove that the images and voices had been real. Titans bellowing, the big healer bugs scuttling around on rocks, but there is no movement, no sound from the hundreds of gigantic figures still gathered around. The air is so thick with smoke, the red lava glare so filtered by the ash in the air, that Achilles silently thanks the gods or someone for the thermskin goggles he's wearing that allow him to see what's going on. He sneaks a glance at the brain hole that Hephaestus had said Nyx, goddess of night herself, had opened for him. The hole's still there, about two hundred yards away, perhaps fifty feet high. If fighting starts, if the Demogorgon decides to eat both dwarf god and Achaean hero as a snack, Achilles plans to make a run for that brain hole, even though he knows he'll have to hack his way through giants and beasties every foot of the way. He's prepared to do so. The silence stretches. Dark winds howl over misshapen boulders and more misshapen sentient forms. The volcano burbles and belches, but the demogorgon does not make a noise. Finally it speaks. All spirits are enslaved which serve things evil. Now thou knowest whether Zeus be such or no. Evil? roars Kronos the Titan. My son is mad. He is the usurper of all usurpers. Rhea, Zeus's mother, has an even louder voice. Zeus rides the wreckage of his own will. He is the scorn of the earth and the bane of Olympus. He needs to suffer the outcast of his own abandonment. He must wither in destined pain and be hanged from hell in his own adamantine chains. The healer monster speaks, and Achilles is shocked to hear that his voice is very feminine. Zeus reaches too far. He has first mimicked and now mocked the very fates. One of the immortal hours booms down from its rocky precipice. Downfall demands no direr name than this. Zeus, usurper. Achilles grabs the nearest shaking boulder, thinking that the volcano behind the Demogorgon is erupting. But it is only the muted rumble from the assembled beings. Kronos' brother, the shaggy titan Cryos, speaks from where he stands amidst a lava flow. This pretender must sink beneath the wide waves of his own ruin. I myself will ascend to Olympus where once we ruled and drag this empty thing down to hell, even as a vulture and a snake outspent drop twisted in inexplicable fight. Awful shape, cries a many-armed charioteer to the Demogorgon. Speak. 
Merciful God reigns, echoes the shapeless Demogorgon giant's voice amid the Tartarus peaks and valleys. Zeus is not Almighty God. Zeus must no longer reign on Olympus. Achilles had been sure that the veiled Demogorgon was limbless, but somehow the limbless giant raises a robed arm that was not visible a second earlier, extends something like terrible fingers. The brain hole two hundred yards behind Hephaestus rises as if on command, hovers above the mole, widens and begins to drop. Words are quick and words are vain, booms the Demogorgon, as the burning red and still widening circle of flame drops down around the mole. The single, sure and final answer must be pain. Hephaestus grabs Achilles' arm. The dwarf god is grinning wildly, insanely through his beard. Hang on, kid, he says. 79. It was a desperate, almost insane turn of events, but Monmouth couldn't have been happier. The dropship had hovered very low and dropped Monmouth's The Dark Lady Submersible into the ocean about fifteen kilometers north of the troublesome, critical singularity coordinates. Summa Four explained that he didn't want the splash setting off the 768 detected black holes, presumably on warheads in the ancient sunken sub also detected, and no one gave him an argument. If Monmouth had owned a human mouth, he would have been grinning like an idiot. The Dark Lady was designed and built for beneath the ice, black as inside God's belly, horrific pressure exploration and salvage work on Jupiter's moon Europa. But it worked just fine in Earth's Atlantic Ocean. Better than fine. I wish you could see this, Monmouth said over their private com. He and Orfu of Io were on their own again. None of the other Moravecs had shown any great interest in approaching the 768 nascent but close to critical black holes, and the dropship had already flown away on Summa IV's continued reconnaissance of the eastern seaboard of North America this time. I can see the radar, sonar, thermal, and other data, said Orfu. Yes, but it's not the same. There's so much light here in Earth's ocean, even here below twenty meters depth. Even full Jupiter glow never illuminated my oceans. If there was a lead, a bare patch above, deeper than a few meters. I'm sure it's beautiful, said Orfu. It really is, burbled Monmouth, not noticing or caring if his big friend had been speaking ironically. The sunlight shafts down, illuminating everything in a dappled green glowing way. The lady isn't sure of what to make of it. She notices the light? Of course, said Monmouth. Her job is to report everything to me, to choose the right data and sensory feeds at the right time. And she's self-aware enough to note all this difference in light, gravity, and beauty here. She likes it, too. Good, rumbled Orfu of Io. You'd better not ruin it by telling her why we're here and what we're swimming toward. She knows, said Monmouth, not letting the big Moravec ruin his buoyant mood. He watched as the sonar reported a ridgeline ahead the ridge the wreck was on, rising to a silty bottom less than eighty meters below the surface. He still couldn't get over how shallow this part of Earth's ocean was. There was no spot in the European seas less than a thousand meters deep, and here a ridgeline brought the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean up to not much more than sixty meters beneath the surface. I've run the full program of the disarmament protocol Summa Four and Cho Li downloaded to us, continued Orfu. Have you had time yet to study the details? Not really. Monmouth had the long protocol in his active memory, but he'd been busy overseeing the Dark Lady's exit from the dropship and the submersible's adaptation to that beautiful, wonderful environment. His beloved sub was as good as new, better than new. The Phobos, Vec, Mechanics had done a wonderful job on his boat, and every system that had worked well on Europa before their devastating crash landing on Mars, Tethys Sea, the previous year, now worked better than well here in Earth's gentle sea. The good news about the disarming of each black hole warhead is that it's theoretically doable, said Orfu of Isle. We have the tools aboard, including the 10,000-degree cutting torch 
and the focused force field generators. And in many of the necessary steps, I can be your arms while you're my visible light spectrum eyes. We'll have to work together on every warhead, but they're theoretically disarmable. That is good news, said Monmouth. The bad news is that if we work straight through without coffee breaks or restroom stops, it's going to take us a little over nine hours per black hole. Not per MRV warhead, mind you, but for each near-critical black hole. With 768 black holes, began Monmouth, 6,912 hours, said Orfu. And since we're on Earth and more of X standard time is real planetary time here, it's 247 days, 12 hours, if everything goes according to plan and we don't run into any real problems. Well, began Monmouth, I guess we deal with this factor when we find the wreck and see if we can get to the warheads at all. It's odd getting direct sonar input, said Orfu. It's not so much like better hearing, it's more as if my skin had suddenly enlarged to— There it is, interrupted Monmouth. I see it, the rack. Perspectives and visual horizons were different there, of course, on the so much larger Earth than the Mars he'd almost gotten used to, even more out of proportion to perceived distances on the tiny Europa where he had spent all the other standard years of his existence. But sonar readings, deep radar mass detection devices, and his own eyes told Monmouth that the stern of this wreck was about five hundred meters dead ahead, lying on the silty bottom just a little below the Dark Lady's depth of seventy meters, and that the crumpled boat itself was around fifty-five meters long. "'Good God!' whispered Monmouth. "'Can you see this on radar and sonar?' "'Yes.' The wreck lay on its belly bow down, but the bow itself was invisible beyond the shimmering force field that held back the Atlantic Ocean from the dry strip of land that ran from Europe to North America. What made Monmouth stare in amazement was the wall of light from the breach wall itself. Here, at more than seventy meters' depth, where even in Earth's sunlit oceans the bottom should be inky black, dappled sunlight illuminated the terminus of water and dappled the moss-green hull of the sunken sub itself. "'I can see what killed it,' said Monmouth. "'Does your radar and sonar pick up that blasted bit of hull above what should be the engine room, just behind where the hull humps up to the long missile compartment?' "'Yes.' "'I think some sort of depth charge or torpedo or missile exploded there,' said Monmouth. "'See how the hull plates are all bent inward there?' It cracked the base of the sail and bent it forward as well. What sail? asked Orfu. You mean a sail like the triangular one on the felucca we took west up the Valles Marineris? No, I mean that part that sticks up way forward, almost to the force field wall there. In the early submarine days they called it a conning tower. After they began building nuclear subs like this boomer in the twentieth century, they started calling the conning tower a sail. Why? asked Orfu of Isle. I don't know why, said Monmouth. Or rather, I have it in my memory banks somewhere, but it's not important. I don't want to take the time to do a search. What's a boomer? A boomer is the early lost-era human's pet name for a ballistic missile submarine like this, said Monmouth. They gave pet names to machines built for the sole purpose of destroying cities, human lives, and the planet? Yes, said Monmouth. This boomer was probably built a century or two before it was sunk here. Perhaps built by one of the major powers then, and sold to a smaller group. Something sank it here long before this groove in the Atlantic Ocean was created. Can we get to the black hole warheads? asked Orfu. Hang on, let's find out. Monmouth inched the dark lady forward. He wanted nothing to do with the force field wall and the empty air beyond it, so he never moved closer to that force field than the missile compartment of the wreck itself. He had the dark lady play powerful searchlights all over the wreck, even as his instruments probed the interior of the ancient sub. This isn't right, he murmured aloud on their private line. What's not right? asked Orfu. The sub is overgrown with anemones and other sea life. The interior is rich with life. But it's as if the sub sank here a century or so ago. 
Not the two and a half millennia or so it would have to have gone down. Could someone have been sailing it just a century or so ago? asked Orfu. No. Not unless all our observation data has been wrong. The old-style humans have been almost without technology the last two thousand years down here. Even if someone had found this sub and managed to launch it, who would have sunk it? The post-humans? I don't think so, said Monmouth. The posts wouldn't have used something so crude as a torpedo or depth charge on this thing, and they wouldn't have left the black hole warheads here ticking away. But the warheads are here, said Orfu. I can see the tops of them on the deep radar return with the critical one black hole containment fields inside. We'd better get to work. Wait, said Monmouth. He had sent remote vehicles no larger than his hand into the wreck, and now the data was flowing back through micro-thin umbilicals. One of the remotes had tapped into the command and control center's AI. Manmut and Orfu listened to the last words of the twenty-six crew members as they prepared to launch the ballistic missiles that would destroy their planet. When the testimonials and data flow were finished, the two Moravex were silent for a long minute. Oh, what a world, whispered Orfu at last, that hath such people in it. I'm going to come down and get you ready to go EVA, said Monmut, his voice a dull monotone. We'll look at this problem from close up. Can we look into the dry area? asked Orfu the Gap. I'm not going near it, said Monmut. The force field might destroy us. The ladies' instruments can't even decide what the field is made of, and I promise you that this submersible of ours is no good in air and on dry land. We're not going near the breach. Did you look at the dropship's aerial photos of the bow of this wreck? asked Orfu. Sure. I've got them on the screen in front of me, said Monmouth. Some serious damage to the bow, but that doesn't concern us. We can get at the missiles back here. No. I meant the other things lying around on the dry ground out there, said Orfu. My radar data might not be as good as your optic images, but it almost looks like one of those lumps lying there is a human being. Monmouth peered at his screen. The dropship had shot an extensive series of images before it had flown off, and he flicked through all of them. If it was a human being, he said, it's been dead a long time. It's flattened, limbs splayed wrong, desiccated. I don't think it was. I think our minds are just trying to see that shape amidst random stuff. There's quite a debris field out there. All right, said Orfu, obviously aware of their priorities. What do I have to do to get ready here? Just stay where you are, said Monmut. I'm coming down to get you. We'll go out together. The dark lady sat on its stubby legs not ten meters west of the stern of the wreck. Orfu had wondered how they would exit through the cargo bay doors set in the belly of the rope and submersible, with the ship sitting on the bottom of the ocean. But that question had been settled when Monmut had extended the landing legs. Monmut had entered the cargo bay through the interior airlock and tapped into direct calm contact with the big Ionian, while the submersible pilot carefully flooded the hold with earth-ocean water, equalized pressures, and then opened the cargo bay door. They disconnected Orfu from his various umbilicals, and the two had gently dropped to the bottom of the ocean. As cracked and ancient as Orfu's carapace was, he didn't leak. When he showed curiosity at the pressure readings his shell and other body parts were reading, Monmut explained. The atmospheric pressure up above, on a theoretical beach or just above the surface of the ocean here, held relatively steady at 14.7 pounds per square inch. About every 10 meters, actually every 33 feet, Monmut said, using the old lost era measurements with which Orfu was equally comfortable, that pressure increased by one atmosphere. Thus, at thirty-three feet of depth, every square inch of the Moravex outer integument would feel twenty-nine point four pounds of pressure. At sixty-six feet, they would be under three atmospheres, and so forth. At the depth of this rack, more than two hundred thirty feet, the sea pressure was exerting eight atmospheres on every square inch of the Dark Lady's hull and the Moravex bodies. 
They were built to withstand far greater pressures, although Orfu was used to negative pressure differentials as he worked in the radiation and sulfur-filled space around the moon Io. And speaking of radiation, there was a lot of it around. They both registered it, and the lady monitored it and relayed her readings. It was not dangerous to Moravex of their design, but the feeling of the neutron and gamma rays pouring through them caught their attention. Monmouth explained that under this pressure, if they had been human beings and if they had been breathing tanked standard earth air, a mixture of 21% oxygen with 79% nitrogen, the multiplying and expanding nitrogen bubbles under eight atmospheres would be playing havoc with them, giving them nitrogen narcosis, distorting their judgment and emotions, and not allowing them to surface without hours of slow decompression at different depths. But the Moravex were breathing pure O2, with their rebreathing systems compensating for the added pressure. Shall we look at our adversaries? asked Orfu of Io. Monmouth led the way. As careful as he was climbing the curved hull of the wreck, silt rose around them like a terrestrial dust storm. Can you still see by fine radar? asked Monmouth. This crap is blinding me on visual frequencies. I've read about this in all the old Earth-based diving stories. The first diver at a wreck site on the bottom or inside the wreck would get a view. All the others would have zero viz, at least until the silt and crud settles. Zero viz, huh? said Orfu. Well, welcome to the club, amigo. The detailed radar I use in the sulfur mass vacuum near Io serves to probe through these little silt clouds just fine. I see the hull, the hump of the missile compartment, the whatchamacallit, the broken sail, thirty meters forward. If you need help, just ask, and I'll lead you by the hand. Monmouth grunted and switched his primary vision to thermal and radar frequencies. They drifted over the missile compartment, five meters above the warheads themselves, both Moravex using their built-in thrusters to maneuver, each being careful not to squirt any thrust in the direction of the tumbled warheads. And tumbled they were. There were forty-eight missile tubes and forty-eight missile tube hatches wide open. These hatches look heavy, said Monmouth over their tight beam. Everything they said and saw, of course, including tight beam, was being relayed up to the Queen Mab and the dropship via a relay radio buoy Monmouth had deployed from the Dark Lady. Orfu had been gripping one of the huge hatches, its diameter as large as the Ionian, and now he said, Seven tons. Even after the crew had ordered the sub's AI to open the 48 missile tube hatches, the missiles themselves still had been covered by blue fiberglass domes that held out the sea. Monmouth saw at a glance how the missiles, propelled to the surface by huge charges of nitrogen gas, their engines to ignite only after each missile reached air, would easily burst through those fiberglass covers. But the missiles had not exploded from their tubes in rising bubbles of nitrogen, nor had their engines ignited. The fiberglass dome covers had long since worn away. Only brittle blue fragments remained. What a mess, said Orfu. Monmouth nodded. Whatever had hit the stern of the Sword of Allah, breaking its back just above the engine room, severing its propulsion jets, and sending the ocean rushing in through the length of the boomer as a wall of shock wave and seawater, had breached the various missile compartments and tumbled the missiles themselves. It looked like a heap of ancient straw. In some cases the warheads were still pointing vaguely upward, but in others the ancient corroded rocket engines and their solid fuel were at the top and the warheads buried in silt. Forget that easy 6,912 hours of work, tight-beamed Orfu. It'll take that long just to get to some of those warheads. And odds are overwhelming that any serious torch-cutting or twisting on one will detonate another. Yeah, said Monmouth. There was no silt obscuring his view now, and he looked at the tangled mess primarily on his optical frequencies. Do either of you have a suggestion? asked Prime Integrator Astig Che. Monmouth almost jumped. He'd known they were being monitored by everyone on the map, 
but he had been so absorbed with studying the wreckage that the connection had almost slipped his mind. Yes, said Orfu of Io, switching to the common band. Here's what we're going to do. He described the procedure as succinctly and non-technically as he could. Rather than try to disarm each warhead through the long protocol the prime integrators had downloaded, the Ionian now planned for Monmut and him to do it the quick and messy way. Monmut would bring the Dark Lady right above the wreck, extending her landing legs to full length until she was squatting over the boomer. Like a mother hen on her nest. They'd use all the ship's belly searchlights to illuminate their work, then Orfu and Monmut would separately use the torches to cut each warhead away from its missile, using a simple chain and pulley system to haul the nose cones directly up into the Dark Lady's cargo hold, and setting them in place in cargo baffles there like eggs in a carton. Isn't there a great chance of the black holes going critical during this rough-and-tumble process? asked Cho Lee from the bridge of the Queen Mab. Yeah, rumbled Orfu over the calm. But the odds are one hundred percent that one of the black holes will activate if we spend a year or more futzing around with them. We're doing it this way. Monmouth touched one of the Ionian's manipulators and nodded agreement, sure that his nod would be picked up by Orfu's close radar. Suma Four's stern voice broke in over the comm link. And what do you propose to do with the forty-eight warheads with their seven hundred sixty-eight black holes once you get them loaded in your submersible? You're going to pick us up, said Monmut. The drop ship will haul the Dark Lady and its belly full of death into outer space, and we'll send the holes on their way. The drop ship isn't configured to fly out beyond the rings, snapped Suma Four. And the Lucasite robotic attack drones in the E and P rings will certainly mob us on the way up. That's your problem, rumbled Orfu. We're going to get to work now. It should take us ten to twelve hours to hack and cut these warheads free and load them into the Dark Lady. When we break surface, you'd better have a plan. We know you have other spacecraft than the Mab up there on this mission, stealthed, out beyond the rings, whatever. You'd better have one ready to meet the dropship in low Earth orbit and take this mess off our hands. We don't want to have come all this way to Earth just to destroy it. Acknowledge your transmission, said Astig Chai. Please be advised that we have a visitor up here. A small spacecraft, a Sony, I believe, is rendezvousing with Sycorax's orbital isle as I speak. Eighty. There was no ceremony surrounding no man's departure. One minute he was in the hovering Sony and chatting with Demon, Hannah, and Tom, who were standing beside it, and the next second the Sony had tilted almost vertically, its force field pressing no man into the mat, and then it shot skyward like a flechette, disappearing into the low gray clouds in seconds. Ada felt cheated. She'd wanted her last words with the friend she'd once known as Odysseus. The vote to allow no man to borrow the Sony had been decided by one vote. The last vote, the deciding vote, had been cast by a man named Elion, the bald leader of the six Hughestown refugees who had come in with Hannah and no man on the sky raft, not even one of the artist survivors. The artist people who had voted against losing the Sony were furious. There were demands for a recount. Flechette rifles actually had been raised in anger along with shouting voices. Ada had stepped into the middle of the melee and announced in a loud, calm voice that the issue had been decided. No man was to be allowed to borrow the Sony, but would return it as soon as possible. In the meantime, they would have the sky raft that No Man and Hannah had cobbled together in the Golden Gate at Machu Picchu. The Sony could carry only six. The sky raft could haul up to fourteen people at a time if they had to make a run for the island. This matter was settled. The Flechette rifles had been lowered, but the grumbling continued. Old friends of Ada's refused to meet her gaze in the hours afterward, and she knew that she'd used up the last of her capital as leader of the artist's survivors. Now No Man and the Sony were gone, and Ada had never felt lonelier. She touched her slightly bulging belly and thought, Little person, 
son or daughter of Harmon, if this was a mistake that endangers you, I shall be sorry to the last second of my life. Ada, said Demon, can I have a word in private with you? They walked out beyond the North Palisade to where Hannah had once kept her scaffolded hearth working. Demon told her about his meeting with the post-human who called herself Moira. He described how she looked exactly like a young Savi, and how she was invisible to the rest of them as she stood near him during the meeting and the vote. Ada shook her head slowly. None of that makes any sense, Demon. Why would a post-human appear in Savi's body, stay invisible to the rest of us? How could she? Why would she? I don't know, said Demon. Did she have anything else to say? She promised before the meeting to tell me something about Harmon after the meeting if she could attend. And, said Ada, she felt her heart pounding so wildly that it might have been the child stirring within her, as eager as she to hear the news. All the Moira ghost said afterward was, Remember that no man's coffin was no man's coffin, said Demon. Ada made him repeat that twice and said, That makes no sense either. I know, said Demon. He looked crestfallen, shoulders slumped. I tried to make her explain, but then she was gone, just disappeared. She stared hard at him. Are you sure this happened, Demon? We've all been working too hard, sleeping too little, worrying too much. Are you sure this Moira ghost was real? Beeman stared hard back at her, his gaze as angrily defensive as hers was angrily doubtful, but he said nothing else. Remember that no man's coffin was no man's coffin, muttered Ada. She looked around. People were going about their early afternoon chores, but the work groups had now broken themselves into clusters of those who had voted the same. Neither side was speaking to the bald man Elian. Ada fought off the urge to sob. Neither no man nor the Sony returned that day, nor the next, nor the next. On the third day, Ada went up in the wobbly sky raft with Hannah at the controls, accompanying Demon's hunting party out beyond the circle of Voynix, and trying to get an estimate of how many of the headless, carapaced killers were out there. It was a beautiful morning, no clouds at all, a blue sky, and warmer winds promising spring, and she could easily see that the number of Voynix pressing into their two-mile radius from the pit had grown. It's hard for me to guess, Ada whispered to Demon. Although they were a thousand feet above the monsters, there must be three or four hundred just visible in that meadow. We never had to count large numbers of things growing up. What do you think? Fifteen thousand in the whole encircling mass? More? More, I think, Demon said calmly. I think there are thirty to forty thousand of the things surrounding us now. Don't they ever get tired of standing there? asked Ada. Don't they have to eat, drink? Evidently not, said Demon. Back when we thought they were servant machines, I never saw one eat or drink or get tired, did you? Ada said nothing. Those times seemed too remote to think about, even though they had ended less than a year earlier. Fifty thousand, muttered Demon. Perhaps there are fifty thousand here now, and more faxing in every day. Hannah flew them farther west to find game and fresh meat. On the fourth day, the Setabus baby in the pit had grown to the size of a yearling calf. One of their yearling calves, now all slaughtered by Voynix, of course, but a calf that was only a pulsating gray brain with a score of pink hands on its belly, yellow eyes, pulsating orifices, and more three-fingered hands leaping out on gray stalks. Mommy, mommy, whispered the thing in Ada's mind, in all their minds. It's time for me to come out now. This pit is too small, and I am too hungry to stay here any longer. It was early evening. Less than an hour from twilight and another long, dark winter night. The group gathered near the pit. Men and women still tended to stand near only those who had voted as they had on the loan of the Sony. Everyone now carried a flechette weapon, although crossbows were kept close to hand in reserve. Kasman, Carmen, Greogi, and Edide stood over the pit with their rifles aimed at the large thing in the hole. Others gathered close. Hannah, said Ada, is the sky raft fully provisioned? Yes, said the younger woman. 
All of the first trip crates are aboard and still room for ten people on the first trip. We can get fourteen people aboard on every trip after that. And what time are you down to in rehearsing the trip to the island and the unpacking of the crates? asked Ada. Forty-two minutes, said Lehman, rubbing the stumps of his missing fingers on his right hand. Thirty-five minutes with just people. It takes a few minutes to get people aboard or off. That's not good enough, said Ada. Hannah stepped closer to the fire. They kept burning near the pit. Ada, the trip to the island takes fifteen minutes each way. The machine can't fly any faster. The Sony would have been there in less than a minute, said Lois, one of the angriest of the artist's survivors. We could all have been delivered there in less than ten minutes. We don't have the Sony now, Ada said. She heard the lack of affect in her own voice. Without meaning to, she glanced to the southwest down toward the river and the island, but also toward the woods where fifty to sixty thousand Voynichs waited. No man had been right. Even if the entire colony of humans here escaped to the island, the Voynichs would be on them there in hours, perhaps minutes. Even though the artist's fax node was still non-functioning, they kept two people there at the pavilion day and night to keep testing it. The Voynichs were faxing. Somehow they were faxing. There was nowhere on earth they to realize that they would be free of the killers. Let's get back to making dinner, she called above the murmuring. Everyone could feel the Sadabas spawn's clammy voice in his or her mind. Mommy, Daddy, it's time for me to come out now. Open the grill, Daddy. Mommy, or I will. I'm stronger now. I'm hungry now. I want to come meet you now. Grayogi, Demon, Hannah, Elian, Bowman, Adide, and Ada sat talking late into the night. Above them, the equatorial and polar rings whirled silently, turning as they always had. The Big Dipper was low in the north. There was a crescent moon. I think tomorrow, first light, we abandon the idea of the island and begin evacuating as many people as possible to the Golden Gate at Machu Picchu, said Ada. We should have done it weeks ago. It would take weeks for this stupid sky raft to get to the Golden Gate at Machu Picchu, said Hannah and it may break down again and never get there. Without no man to fix it, the people on the sky raft will be stranded. We're dead if it breaks down here as well, said Demon. He touched Hannah's shoulder as the young woman seemed to slump. You've done an amazing job keeping it working, Hannah, but this is a technology we just don't understand. What technology do we understand, muttered Bowman. Crossbows, said Adide. We were getting damn good at building crossbows. No one laughed. After a few minutes, a lion said, Tell me again why the Voynichs can't get into the habitation part of this bridge at Machu Picchu. The habitation bubbles are like grapes on a vine, said Hannah, who had spent more time there than any of them, but linked together. Clear plastic or something. It's late, lost-era technology, maybe even post-human technology. Some sort of force field just above the surface of the glass. Voynichs just slide off. We had something similar on the windows of the crawler Savi drove us in from Jerusalem into the Mediterranean basin, said Demon. She said it was a frictionless field to keep the rain off, but it worked for Voynichs and Kalabani, too. I'd enjoy seeing one of these Kalabani, said Elian, and also the Caliban thing you described. The bald man's mouth and other facial features seemed always set to a show of strength and curiosity. No, Demon said softly, you wouldn't enjoy seeing either one, especially the real Caliban, trust me on this. In the silence that followed, Graogi said what they had all been thinking. We're going to have to draw straws something. Fourteen get to go to the bridge. They can carry weapons, water, and minimum rations. Hunt along the way, perhaps, so a full sky raft load of fourteen can go. The rest of us stay. Fourteen out of fifty-four get to live, said Adide. Doesn't seem right. Hannah will be one of those who goes, said Graogi. She flies the sky raft back if the fourteen get to the bridge on the first trip. Hannah shook her head. You can fly the thing as well as I can, Graogi. We can teach anyone here how to fly it as well as I can. I'm not automatically on the first trip, and you know, you know, there won't be a second trip. Not with the shape the sky raft is in. 
Not with the Voiniks continuing to mass out there in the dark, not with the Setabas thing getting stronger every hour. Those fourteen short straws, long straws, whichever, will have a chance to live. The rest will die here. Then we'll decide as soon as it's light, said Ada. There may be fighting, said Elion. People are angry, hungry, resentful. They may not want to draw straws to see who lives and who dies. They may rush the raft right away or after they don't get a seat. Ada nodded. Demon, take ten of your best people and have them surround the sky raft, protected, even before I call the council together. Adide, you and your friends quietly try to collect as many of the loose weapons as possible. Most people sleep with their flechette rifles now, said the blonde woman. They don't let them out of their hands. Ada nodded again. Do what you can. I'll talk to everyone. Explain why this is the only hope. The losers will want to be ferried to the island, said Greogi, at the very least. Bowman nodded. I would. I will, if I don't get the right size straw. Ada sighed. It won't do any good. I'm convinced that the island is just another place to die. The Voiniks will be there minutes after we are, if the Setabus thing isn't there to protect us. But we can do that. Ferry those who want to go, then let the Fourteen head for the bridge. It will waste time, said Hannah. Put more stress on the sky raft. Ada held her hands out, palms upward. It may keep our people from killing each other, Hannah. It gives fourteen people a chance, and the rest get to choose where they stand and die. That's something. An illusion of choice, if nothing else. No one had anything else to say. They broke up to head toward their own sleeping tents and lean-tos. Hannah followed Ada and touched her arm in the dark before they reached Ada's sleeping tent. Ada, whispered the younger woman, I have this feeling that Harmon is still alive. I hope you're one of the fourteen. Ada smiled, her white teeth visible in the ring light. I have this feeling that Harmon is alive too, my dear, but I'm not going to be one of the fourteen. I've already decided that I'm not going to take part in the drawing of straws. My baby and I are staying at Artis. In the end, none of their planning mattered. Just after sunrise, Ada jerked awake to cold hands in her mind and within her womb. Mommy, I have your little boy here. He's going to stay inside for a few months while I teach him things. Wonderful things. But I'm coming out to play. Ada screamed as she felt the mind in the pit touching the developing mind of the fetus inside her. She was on her feet and running, carrying two flechette rifles before anyone else could fully awaken. The Setabas baby had bent the bars of the grill back and was squeezing its gray brain girth through the bent mesh and bars. Already the thing had tentacles flung out fifteen feet to a side, three-fingered hands sunk deep in the dirt. Three of its feeding orifices were open, and the long, fleshy, trunk-like appendages there were already drinking grief and terror and history from the soil of Ardis. Its many yellow eyes were very bright, and as it rose out of the pit, the many fingers on its large pink hands were waving like sea anemones in a strong current. Mommy, it's all right, hissed thought the thing as it pulled itself free of the pit. All I'm going to do is... Ada heard demon and others running behind her, but she did not look over her shoulder as she stopped, jerked down the flechette rifle from her shoulder, and fired a full clip into the Setabos thing. It spun as thousands of crystal darts shredded part of its left lobe. Tentacles lashed toward her. Ada dodged, slapped in a second magazine, emptied it into the writhing brain. Mommy! Ada dropped the first flechette rifle when the second magazine was empty, raised the second rifle, clicked it to full automatic, stepped three paces closer between the clawing tentacles, and fired the full magazine of flechettes between the yellow eyes at the front of the brain. The Setabos spawn screamed, screamed with its real many mouths, and fell backward into the pit. Ada strode to the edge of the pit, slammed in a new magazine, and fired, ignoring the shouts and screams behind her. When that fleshette magazine was empty, she slapped in another, aimed at the bleeding gray mass in the pit, and fired again. 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 The brain split along its hemispheres, and she blasted each pulped hemisphere as if smashing a pumpkin. The pink hands and long stalks spasmed. 
but the Setabar's spawn was dead. Ada felt it die. Everyone did. Its last metal scream in no language except pain hissed away to silence in their minds like filthy water going down a drain. Everyone except sentinels came out from their shelters and stood grouped around the pit, staring down, feeling the absence but not yet believing. Well, I guess I don't have to go gather straws after all, said Grayogi to Ada, leaning close and almost whispering into her ear amidst the stunned silence. Suddenly there came a noise from all around them, a whirring, whistling, humming, terrifying noise, distant yet growing louder. The whir and scrabbling noise echoing through the forest and from the surrounding hills. What in the hell? began Kasman. The Voynich, said Demon. He took Ada's rifle from her, slapped in a fresh magazine of flechettes, and handed it back to her. They're all coming at once. 81. Here I am, watching and listening as a god goes mad. I don't know what help I thought I could get up here on Olympus for my besieged and dying Achaeans. But now I've trapped myself just as surely as the Greeks on their beach with the Trojans closing in are trapped to the death. Me standing here in my sweaty chameleon suit, cheek by jowl with a thousand immortals, trying to hold my breath to keep from giving myself away, while watching and listening as Zeus, already king of the gods, declares himself the one and only eternal God Almighty. I shouldn't worry about being noticed. The gods around me are staring with their immortal jaws hanging slack, their godlike mouths hanging open, and their divine Olympian eyes bugging out. Zeus has gone mad, and his dark eyes seem to be boring into me as he spittles on about his new ascendance to ultimate godhood. I'm sure he can see me. His eyes have the self-pleasuring patience of a cat with a mouse between its paws. I put my thick-suited hand on the QT medallion against my chest under the sticky chameleon suit. But where to go? Back to the beach with the Achaeans means certain death. Back to Ilium to see Helen means pleasure and survival, but I will have betrayed... Betrayed who? The Greeks haven't even noticed when I've walked among them, at least not since Achilles and Odysseus both disappeared on the wrong side of the closing brain hole. Why should I feel loyalty to them when they don't but I do. Speaking of Odysseus, and X-rated images pop into my mind when I do think of him, I know that I can QT back to the Queen Mab. That might be the safest place for me, although I really have no place there among the more of X. Nothing feels right. No move feels better than a cowardly betrayal. Betrayal of whom, for God's sake, I ask myself. Taking the Lord's name in vain, even as the universe's new Lord and only Almighty God stares me in the eye and finishes his fist-pounding, spittle-flying rant. Lord God Zeus did not end his speech with, Are there any questions? But he might as well have, based on the thickness of silence that now falls over the great hall of the gods. Then, suddenly, inexplicably, given the real-time terror of the situation, the undying pedant in me, the would-be scholar rather than the has-been scholic, is struck by a Miltonic line by Lucifer. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Something rips the roof and upper floors of the great hall of the gods clean away, revealing naked sky and a shapeless form. Wind and voices roar. The wall crashes inward. Huge shapes, some vaguely human, smash in masonry, tumble pillars, flow down from the sky and attack the assembled gods. Every immortal with any sense QTs away or takes off running. I am frozen in place. Zeus leaps to his feet. His golden armor and weapons are stacked not twenty feet from where he stands, but that is too far away. Too many forms are closing too quickly for the father of the gods to arm himself. He raises and pulls back his muscled arm to fling lightning to guide the thunder. Nothing happens. Ay, ay, cries Zeus, staring at his empty right hand as if it has disobeyed him. The elements obey me not. No refuge, no appeal, 
booms a voice from the shifting thundercloud mass looming over the disassembled building and the warring gods and shapes. Come down with me now, usurper! Those who remain love not thrones, altars, judgment seats, and prisons, all those foul shapes abhorred by true god and man. Come, usurper, tyrant of the world, come to your new home, strange, savage, ghastly, dark, and execrable. For all its booming volume, the terrible voice is more terrible because of its calmness. No, cries Zeus, and Quantum teleports away. I hear the immortals fighting near me shout, Titans and Kronos, and then I run, praying that I remain invisible in my Moravec chameleon suit running out through the tumbling pillars past the fighting forms, through literal lightning, out under the fire-rent blue skies of the Olympus summit. Already some of the Olympian gods have taken to their flying chariots, and already they have been met and joined in battle by larger, stranger chariots and their indescribable drivers. All around the shores of the Caldera Lake gods are fighting titans. I see a form that can only be Kronos, taking on both Apollo and Ares, while monsters are fighting gods and gods are fleeing. Suddenly I'm seized. A powerful hand jerks me to a stop, pins my right arm before I can reach for my QT medallion, and strips the chameleon suit off me like someone ripping Christmas wrap from a poorly wrapped package. I see that it is Hephaestus, the bearded dwarf god of fire, chief artificer to Zeus and the gods. Behind him, on the grass are what looks to be a series of iron cannonballs and a goldfish bowl. "'What are you doing here, Hockenberry?' snarls the unkempt god. Dwarfish as he is to other Olympians, he's still taller than me. "'How did you see me?' is all that I can manage. Fifty yards away it appears as if Kronos has killed Apollo with a huge cudgel. The storm-cloud being hovering above the roofless great hall of the gods seems to be dissipating on the high winds that blow around the summit of Olympus. Hephaestus laughs and taps a glass and bronze lens thing dangling from his vest amidst a hundred other tiny gizmos. Of course I could see you, so could Zeus. That's why he had me build you, Hockenberry. It was all supposed to lead to his ascension to the Godhead today being observed. Observed by someone who could fucking well write it down. We're all post-literate here, you know. Before I can move or speak, Hephaestus grabs the heavy QT medallion, rips it off me, breaking the chain, and crushes it in his massive, blunt-fingered, filthy hand. Oh, Jesus, God Almighty, no! I manage to think, as the god of fire opens his fist, just enough to drop the crumbs of gold into a vest pocket he pulls out wide. Don't shit your pants, Hockenberry, laughs the god. This thing never worked. See... There's no fucking mechanism, just the dial you could ratchet around. This has always been your Dumbo feather. It worked. It's always... I came from... I used it to... No, you didn't, says Hephaestus. I built you with the nanogenes necessary to quantum teleport, just like the big boys. Just like us gods. You just weren't supposed to know about it until the proper time came. Aphrodite jumped the gun, gave you the fake medallion to use you in her plot to kill Athena. I look around wildly. The great hall of the gods has collapsed. Flames lick up through the tumbled pillars. Fighting is spreading everywhere, but the summit is emptying out as more and more gods are flicking away to hide on Ilium Earth. Brain holes are opening here and there, and the titans and monstrous entities are following the fleeing gods. The thundercloud being that had ripped the roof and top three floors off the great hall is gone. You need to help me save the Greeks, I say, my teeth actually chattering. Hephaestus laughs again, rubs the back of his sooty hand across his greasy mouth. I've already vacuumed up all the other humans on that fucking Ilium history earth, he says. Why should I save the Greeks, or even the Trojans for that matter? What have they done for me recently? Plus... I'll need some humans down there to worship me when I take this throne of Olympus in a few days. I can only stare at him. You vacuumed up the people? You put the population of Ilium Earth in the blue beam rising from Delphi? Who the hell do you think did it, Zeus? With all his technical prowess? Hephaestus shakes his head. 
The Titan brothers, Cronos, Iapetus, Hyperion, Cryos, Koyos, and Okeanos are walking this way. They are covered with the golden ichor blood of gods. Suddenly Achilles appears from the burning ruins. He is fully clad in his gold armor, his beautiful shield also besmirched by immortal blood, his long sword out, his eyes staring almost madly from the slits of his streaked and sooted golden helmet. The apparition ignores me and shouts at Hephaestus, Zeus has fled. Of course, replies the god of fire. Did you expect him to wait around for the Demogorgon to drag him down to Tartarus? I can't find Zeus's location anywhere on the holographic pool locator, shouts Achilles. I forced Aphrodite's mother, Dione, to help me with the locator. She said it would find him anywhere in the universe. When she failed, I cut her to ribbons. Where is he? Hephaestus smiles. You remember Fleet-Footed Man-Killer, the one place Zeus had hidden from all eyes when Hera wanted to fuck him into an eternity of sleep? Achilles grabs the fire god's shoulder and almost lifts him off the ground. Odysseus, hum, take me there at once. Hephaestus' eyes crinkle into unamused slits. You do not command the future lord of Olympus, such mortal. Singularity that you are, you must treat your betters with more respect. Achilles releases his grip on Hephaestus' leather vest. Please, now, please. Hephaestus nods and then looks at me. You come too, Skolik Harkenberry. Zeus wanted you here for this day, wanted you as witness. Witness ye shall be. 82. The Moravex aboard the Queen Mab received all the following live in real time. Odysseus' nano-imagers and transmitters were working well, but Astigche decided not to relay it down to Monmut and Orfu of Io, where they were working there beneath the ocean of Earth. The two Vex were six hours into their twelve-hour job of cutting free and loading the 768 critical black hole warheads, and no one on the Mab wanted to distract them. And what was occurring now could qualify as distracting. The lovemaking, if that was what the near-violent copulation between Odysseus and the woman who had identified herself as Sycorax, was in one of its temporary states of pause. The two were sprawled naked on the tousled cushions, drinking wine from large, two-handled mugs, and eating some fruit, when a monstrous creature, amphibian gills, fangs, claws, webbed feet, pushed aside curtains and flip-flop walked its way into Sycorax's chambers. Damn, uh, thinketh he, yes, that he must announce that as he was readying to melt a gourd fruit into mash, when so Caliban did hear the airlock cycling. Something there is which has come to see you, mother, saith it has all flesh meat on its nose and fingers like blunt stones, saith, mother, and in his name I shall rend this work's tasty flesh from its soft chalk bones. No, thank you, Caliban, my darling, said the naked woman with the purple-colored eyebrows. Show our visitor in. The amphibian thing called Caliban stepped aside. An older version of Odysseus entered. All of the Moravax, even those who sometimes had trouble telling one human being from another, could see the resemblance. The young Odysseus, sprawled naked on the silk cushions, stared dumbly at the older Odysseus. This older version had the same short stature and broad chest, but more scars, gray hair and gray in his thicker beard, and bore himself with much more gravity than their passenger on the Mab's voyage had. Odysseus, said Sycorax. As well as the Moravex human emotion auditory analysis circuits could deduce, she sounded truly surprised. He shook his head. My name is No Man now. I'm pleased to see you again, Circe. The woman smiled. We are both changed, then. I am Sycorax to the world, and myself now, my much-scarred Odysseus. The younger Odysseus started to rise, his hands bunched into fists. But Sycorax made a motion with her left hand, and the young Odysseus collapsed back onto the cushions. You are Circe, said the man who called himself no man. You were always Circe. You will always be Circe. 
Sycorax shrugged very slightly, her full breasts jiggling. Young Odysseus was sprawled to her left. She patted the empty cushions on her right. Come, sit next to me, then. No, man. No, thank you, Circe, said the man dressed in tunic, shorts, and sandals. I will stand. You will come and sit next to me, said Sycorax, her voice intense. She made a complicated motion with her right hand, her different fingers moving not at random. No, thank you, I will stand. Again the woman blinked in surprise. Deeper surprise this time, the more of facial emotion analysts thought. Molly, said Noman, I think you know of it, a substance made from a rare black root which bears a milk-white bloom out of the earth once each autumn. Sycorax nodded slowly. My, you have traveled far. But haven't you heard Hermes is dead? That doesn't matter, said no man. No, I suppose it doesn't. How did you get here, Odysseus? No man. How did you get here, no man? I used Savi's old Sony. It took me almost four full days, creeping from one orbital lump to the next, always hiding from these robotic intruder destroyers of yours or outrunning them in stealth mode. You need to get rid of those things, Circe. Our Sonys need to include toilet facilities. Sycorax laughed softly. And why on earth would I get rid of the interceptors? Because I ask you to. And why on earth would I do anything you ask, or just... No, man. I'll tell you when I finish with my requests. Behind No Man, Caliban snarled. The human ignored the noise and the creature. By all means, said Sycorax, continue with your requests. Her smile showed how very little attention she was prepared to pay to these requests. First, as I say, eliminate the orbital interceptors, or at least reprogram them so that spacecraft can move safely within and between the rings again. Sycorax's smile did not waver, nor did her violet-eyed, purple-painted gaze warm. Secondly, continued no man, I would like you to remove the interdiction field above the Mediterranean basin and to drop the hands of Hercules fields. The witch laughed softly. What an odd request. The resulting tsunami would be devastating. You can do it gradually, Circe. I know you can. Refill the basin. Before you go on, she said coldly, give me one reason I should do this thing. There are things in the Mediterranean basin which the old-style humans should not have soon. The depots, you mean, said Sycorax. The spacecraft, weapons, many things, said no man. Let the wine-dark sea refill the Mediterranean basin. Perhaps you haven't noticed since you've been traveling, said Sycorax, but the old-style humans are on the verge of extinction. I've noticed. I still ask you to refill the Mediterranean basin carefully, slowly, and while you're at it, eliminate that folly that is the Atlantic breach. Sycorax shook her head and lifted the two-handled cup to sip wine. She did not offer no man any. The young Odysseus lay back glazed on the cushions, apparently unable to move. Is that all? she said. No, said no man. I'll also ask you to reactivate all fax nodes for the old-style humans, all function links and the rejuvenation tanks remaining on both the polar and equatorial rings. Sycorax said nothing. Finally, said no man, I want you to send down your tame monster here to tell Setabos that the quiet is coming to this earth. Caliban hissed and snarled. Thinketh time has come to pluck the mankin's sound legs off and leaveth stumps for him to ponder. Thinketh he is strong and lord, and this bruised fellow shall receive a worm, nay, two worms for using his name in vain. Silence, snapped Sycorax. She stood looking more regal in her nakedness than other queens could in full regalia. No man, is the quiet coming to this earth? I believe so, yes. She seemed to relax. Lifting a clump of grapes from the bowl on the cushions, she carried them to no man, offered them. He shook his head. You ask much of me for an old, a non-Odysseus, she said softly, pacing the space between the cushioned bed and the man. 
What would you give me in return? Tales of my travels. Sycorax laughed again. I know your travels. Not this time you don't. This has been twenty years, not ten. The witch's beautiful face twisted in something the Moravex interpreted as a sneer. Always seeking the same thing, your Penelope. No, said no man, not this time. This time, when you sent the young me through the Kalabi Yao doorway, my travels in space and time, twenty years for me, were all in search of you. Sycorax stopped her pacing and stared at him. You, repeated no man, my Circe. We loved each other well and have made love well many times these twenty years. I've found you in your iterations as Circe, Sycorax, Alice, and Calypso. Alice, said the witch. No man only nodded. Did I have a slight gap between my front teeth then? You did. Sycorax shakes her head. You lie. In all lines of reality it is the same, Odysseus, no man. I save you, pull you from the sea, succor you, feed you honeyed wine and fine food, tend your wounds, bathe you, show you physical love of a sort you have only dreamed of, offer you immortality and eternal youth, and always you leave. Always you leave me for that weaving bitch Penelope and your son. I've seen my son this twenty years past, said no man. He has grown into a fine man. I do not need to see him again. I wish to stay with you. Sycorax returns to her cushions and drinks two-handed from the large goblet. I am thinking of turning all your Moravec mariners into swine, she said at last. No man shrugged. Why not? You did that to all my other men in all these other worlds. What kind of swine do you think Moravecs will make? asked the witch, her tone merely conversational. Will they resemble a row of plastic piggy banks? No man said, Moira is awake again. The witch blinked, Moira? Why would she choose to waken now? I don't know, said no man, but she's in Savi's young body. I saw her on the day I left Earth, but we didn't speak. Savi's body, repeated Sycorax. What is Moira up to? And why now? Thinketh, said Caliban behind no man, he made the old Savi out of sweet clay for his son to bite and eat. Add honeycomb and pods, chewing her neck until froth rises bladdery, quick, quick, till maggots scamper through my brain. Sycorax rose and paced again, coming close to no man and raising one hand as if to touch his bare chest. Then veering away, Caliban hissed and crouched, his palms on granite, his back hunched, his arms straight down between his crouched and powerful legs, his yellow eyes baleful. But he remained where she had told him to stay. You know I can't send my son down to tell his father Sedabas about the quiet, she said softly. I know this thing is not your son, said no man. You built him out of shit and defective DNA in a tank of green slime. Caliban hissed and began to speak again in his terrible lisping rat. Sycorax waved him silent. Do you know your Moravec friends are lifting more than seven hundred black holes into orbit even as we speak? she asked. No man shrugged. I didn't know that, but I hoped they would be. Where did they get them? You know where they must have come from, seven hundred sixty-eight black hole warheads? There is only one place. Impossible, said Sycorax. I sealed that wreck off inside a stasis egg almost two millennia ago. And Savi and I unsealed it more than a century ago, said no man. Yes, I watched as you and that bitch hurried around with your hopeless little schemes, said Sycorax. What in the hell did you hope to accomplish with those Turin cloth connections to Ilium? Preparation, said no man. For what? laughed Sycorax. You don't believe those two races of the human species will ever meet, do you? You can't be serious. The Greeks and Trojans and their ilk would eat your naive little old-style humans here for breakfast. No man shrugged. Call off this war with Prospero and let's see what happens. Sycorax slammed down the wine goblet onto a nearby table. 
Leave the field while that bastard Prospero remains on it? She snapped, you can't be serious. I am, said no man. The old entity called Prospero is quite mad. His days are over. But you can leave before the same madness claims you. Let's leave this place, Circe, you and I. Leave? The witch's voice was very low, incredulous. I know this rock has fusion drive engines and brain hole generators that could send us to the stars beyond the stars. If we get bored, we step through the Kalabi Yao door and make love across the whole rich universe of history. We could meet at different ages, wear our different bodies at different ages, as easily as changing clothes. Travel in time to join ourselves making love. Freeze time itself so that we can take part in our own love making. You have enough food and air here to keep us comfortable for a thousand years. Ten thousand, if you please. You forget, said Sycorax, rising and pacing again. You're a mortal man. In twenty years I'll be changing your soiled underwear and feeding you by hand. In forty years you'll be dead. You offered me immortality once. The rejuvenation tanks are still here on your isle. You rejected immortality, screamed Sycorax. She picked up the heavy mug and threw it at him. No man ducked, but did not move his feet from where they were planted. You rejected it again and again, she screamed, tearing at her hair and cheeks with her nails. You threw it in my face to return to your precious Penelope. Over and over again, you actually laughed at me. I'm not laughing now. Come away with me. Her expression was wild with fury. I should have Caliban kill you and eat you right here in front of me. I'll laugh while he sucks the marrow from your cracked bones. Come away with me, Circe, said no man. Reactivate the faxes and functions. Drop the old hands of Hercules and other useless toys, and come away with me. Be my lover again. You're old, she sneered. Old and scarred and gray-haired. Why should I choose an old man over a vital younger one? She stroked the thigh and flaccid penis of the seemingly hypnotized and motionless younger Odysseus. Because... This Odysseus will not be leaving through the Kalabi Yao door in a week or month or eight years as that young one will, said no man, and because this Odysseus loves you. Sycorax made a choked noise that sounded like a snarl. Caliban echoed her snarl. No man reached under his tunic and took a heavy pistol from where he had hidden it under his broad belt in the back. The witch stopped pacing and stared. You can't possibly think that thing can hurt me. I didn't bring it to hurt you, said no man. She flicked her violet gaze to the frozen younger Odysseus. Are you mad? Do you know what mischief that would do on the quantum level of things? You're courting chaos by even contemplating such a thing. It would destroy a cycle that has been going on in a thousand strands for a thousand... Going on for too long, said no man. He fired six times each explosion seemingly louder than the last. The six heavy bullets tore into the naked Odysseus, tearing his ribcage apart, pulping his heart, striking him in the middle of the forehead. The younger man's body jerked to the impacts and slid to the floor, leaving red streaks on the silk cushions and a growing pool of blood on the marble tiles. Decide, said no man. 83. I don't know if I teleported here via my own medallionless ability or just came along with Hephaestus because I was touching his sleeve when he QT'd. It doesn't matter, I'm here. Here is Odysseus home. A dog barks madly at us as Hephaestus, Achilles, and I pop into existence, but one glance from bloody-helmeted Achilles sends the mutt whining back out to the courtyard with its tail between its legs. We're in an ante room looking into the great dining hall of Odysseus' hum on the Isle of Ithaca. Some sort of force field hums over the house and courtyard. There are no impudent suitors lounging in the long room at the long table. No Penelope dithering, no impotent young Telemachus plotting. No servants hustling to and fro, dispensing the absent Odysseus' food and wine to indolent ne'er-do-wells. But the room looks as if the slaughter of the suitors has already taken place. 
Chairs are overturned, a huge tapestry has been ripped off the wall and now lies thrown over table and floor, soaking up spilled wine and even Odysseus' greatest bow, the one that only he alone could pull, according to legend, a bow so wonderful and rare that he decided not to take it to Troy with him, now lies on the stone floor amidst a clutter of Odysseus' famous barbed and poisoned hunting arrows. Zeus whirls. The giant wears the same soft garments he had been wearing on the throne of Olympus, but he is not so gigantic now, yet even shrunken to fit this space, he is still twice as tall as Achilles. Beckoning us to stand back, the fleet-footed man-killer raises his shield, readies his sword, and steps into the dining hall. My son, booms the god of thunder, spare me your childlike anger. Would you commit deicide, tyrannicide, and patricide in one terrible stroke? Achilles advances until he is across the span of the broad table from Zeus. Fight, old man. Zeus continues smiling, apparently not the least bit alarmed. Think, fleet-footed Achilles, use your brain for once rather than your muscles or your dick. Would you have that useless cripple sit on the golden throne of Olympus? He nods toward where Hephaestus stands silent in the doorway next to me. Achilles does not turn his head. Just think for once, repeats Zeus, his deep voice causing crockery to vibrate in the nearby kitchen. Join with me, Achilles, my son. Become one with the penetrating presence that is Zeus, father of all gods. Thus joined, father and son, immortal and immortal. Two mighty spirits, mingling, shall make a third mightier than either alone. Triune together, father and son and holy will. We shall reign over heaven and Troy and send the Titans back down to their pit forever. Fight, said Achilles, you old pig fucker. Zeus's broad face turned several shades of red. Detested prodigy, even thus deprived of my control of all elements, I trample thee. Zeus grabs the long table by its edge and flips it into the air. Fifty feet of heavy wood planks and posts flies tumbling through the air toward Achilles' head. The human ducks low, and the table smashes into the wall behind him, destroying a fresco and sending splinters flying everywhere. Achilles takes two steps closer. Zeus opens his arms, opens his hands to show his palms. Would you kill me as I am, O oh man, unarmed? Or shall we grapple barehanded like heroes in the arena, until one fails to rise and the other takes the prize? Achilles hesitates only a second, then he pulls off his golden helmet and sets it aside. He removes the circular shield from his forearm, lays the sword in its cusp, adds his bronze chest armor and greaves, and kicks all that to our doorway. Now he is clad only in his shirt, short skirt, sandals, and broad leather belt. Eight feet from Zeus, Achilles opens his arms in a wrestler's opening stance and crouches. Zeus smiles then, and, in a motion almost too fast for me to perceive, crouches, and comes up with Odysseus' bow and a poisoned black-feathered arrow. Get away, I have time mentally to shout at Achilles, but the blond and muscled hero does not budge. Zeus goes to full pull, easily bending the bow that no one on earth except Odysseus was supposed to be able to bend, aims the broad-bladed poison arrow right at Achilles' heart, eight feet away, and lets fly. The arrow misses. It cannot miss, not at that distance. The shaft appears straight and true, the black feathers full, but it misses by a full foot or more and buries itself deep in the smashed table angled against the wall. I can almost feel the terrible venom rumored to be originally gathered from the most deadly of serpents by Hercules as it drains into the wood of the table. Zeus stares. Achilles does not move. Zeus crouches with lightning speed, comes up with another arrow, steps closer, notches, pulls, releases. It misses. From five feet away, the poisoned arrow misses. Achilles does not stir. He stares hate into the now panicked gaze of the father of all gods. Zeus crouches again, sets the arrow to the cord with careful precision, goes to full pull again, his mighty muscles now sheened in sweat, visibly straining, 
the powerful bow almost humming with its coiled power. The king of the gods steps forward until the point of the arrow is not much more than a foot away from Achilles' broad chest. Zeus fires. The arrow misses. This is not possible, but I see the arrow embed itself in the wall behind Achilles. It has not passed through Achilles, nor curved around, but somehow, impossibly, absolutely, it has missed. Achilles leaps then, slapping the bow aside and seizing the twice-tall god by the throat. Zeus staggers around the room, trying to remove Achilles' powerful hands from around his neck pounding Achilles with a god fist half as wide as Achilles' broad back. The fleet-footed man-killer hangs on as Zeus thrashes, smashing timbers, the table, the doorway arch, the wall itself. It looks like a man with a child hanging from him, but Achilles hangs on. Then the much larger god gets his own powerful fingers under Achilles' much smaller fingers and peels back first the mortal's left hand, then his right. Now Zeus crashes against, bangs onto, and smashes into things with a deadly purpose. Holding Achilles' forearms in his own massive hands, the mortal man dangling as Zeus headbutts Achilles. The sound echoing like two great boulders colliding. Then rams his god chest against mortal ribs, finally crashing both of them against the unyielding wall and into the doorway opposite us arching Achilles back against the unyielding stone of the doorframe. Five seconds of this, and he will snap Achilles back like a bow made out of cheap balsa. Achilles does not wait five seconds or three. Somehow the fleet-footed man-killer has got his right hand free for an instant as Zeus bends him backward, backward spine grinding against vertical stone. I see what happens next in retinal echo. It occurs so quickly. Achilles' hand comes up from his own belly and belt with a short blade in his fist. He rams the blade in under Zeus's bearded chin, twists the knife, rams it deeper, rotates it with a cry louder even than Zeus's scream of horror and pain. Zeus stumbles backward into the hallway, crashing into the next room. Hephaestus and I run to follow. They are in Odysseus and Penelope's private bedchamber now. Achilles pulls the knife blade free, and the father of all gods raises both his massive hands to his own throat, his own face. Golden ichor and red blood both are pulsing into the air, flowing from Zeus's nostrils and open, gaping mouth, filling his white beard with gold and red. Zeus falls backward onto the bed. Achilles swings the knife far back, plunges it deep into the god's belly and then drags it up and to the right until the magical blade rasps on ribcage. Zeus screams again, but before he can clutch himself lower, Achilles has pulled out yards of grey gut, gleaming god intestine, and wrapped it several times around one of the four posts of Odysseus' great bed, tying it off in a mariner's swift and sure knot. That post— is the living olive tree Odysseus fashioned this room and bed around, I think, in a daze. The lines from the Odyssey come back to me from the Fitzgerald translation I first read as a boy, Odysseus speaking to his doubting Penelope. An old trunk of olive grew like a pillar on our building plot, and I laid out our bedroom round that tree, lined up the stone walls, built the walls and roof, gave it a doorway and smooth-fitting doors. Then I lopped off the silvery leaves and branches into a bedpost, drilled it, let it serve as a model for the rest. I planned them all, inlaid them all with silver, gold, and ivory, and stretched a bed between a pliant web of oxide thongs dyed crimson. Now more than the oxide thongs are dyed crimson, as Zeus struggles to free himself from the restraining tether of his own tied-off intestines. Golden ichor and all too human red blood flowing from his throat, face, and belly. Blinded by his own pain and gore, mighty Zeus feels for his tormentor by swinging his arms. Every step and tug in search of Achilles pulls more of his gleaming gray insides out. His screaming, makes even the unflinching Hephaestus cover his ears. 
Achilles prances lightly out of reach, dancing in closer, only to slash and hack at the blind god's arms, legs, thighs, penis, and hamstrings. Zeus crashes down on his back, still connected to the living olive tree bedpost by thirty feet or more of knotted gray gut. But the immortal being still thrashes and howls, spewing ichor across the ceiling in complicated Rorschachs of divine arterial spray. Achilles leaves the room and returns with his battle sword. He pins Zeus's thrashing left arm with one battle-sandaled foot, raises the sword high, and brings it down so hard it strikes sparks on the floor after passing through Zeus's neck. The head of the father of all gods tumbles free, rolling under the bed. Achilles goes to one gory knee and seems to be burying his face in the giant open wound that had been Zeus's bronzed and muscled belly. For one perfectly horrible second, I am sure that Achilles is eating the guts out of his fallen foe. His face, largely hidden in the abdominal cavity, a man turned pure predator, a ravaging wolf. But he was only hunting. Aha! cries the fleet-footed man-killer, and pulls a huge, still pulsating purplish mass from the tumble of glistening gray. Zeus's liver. Where is that goddamned dog of Odysseus, Achilles asks himself, his eyes gleaming. He leaves us to carry the liver out to the dog Argus, cowering somewhere in the courtyard. Hephaestus and I stand aside quickly to give Achilles room as he passes. As the sound of the man-killer's, god-killer's footsteps recede, both the god of fire and I look around the room. Not a square inch of bed, floor, ceiling, or wall appears to have remained unsplattered. The huge, headless corpse on the stone floor, still tethered to the olive tree post, continues to twitch and writhe, its bloodied fingers flexing. Holy fuck, breathes Hephaestus. I want to tear my gaze away, but cannot. I want to leave the room to go vomit quietly somewhere, but cannot. What, how, it's still partially alive, I gasp. Hephaestus grins his most insane grin. Zeus is an immortal, remember, Hockenberry? He's in agony even now. I'll burn the bits in the celestial fire. He stoops to retrieve the short knife Achilles had used. I'll burn this god-killing Aphrodite blade as well, melt it down and pour it into something new, a plaque commemorating Zeus, maybe. I never should have made this blade for the bloodthirsty bitch. I blink and shake my head, then grab the hulking fire god by his heavy leather vest. What will happen now, I ask. Hephaestus shrugs. Just what we agreed on, Hockenberry, Nix and the fates, who have always ruled the universe. This universe, at least, will allow me to sit on the gold throne of Olympus after this mad second war with the Titans is over. How do you know who will win? He shows me his uneven white teeth against his black beard. From the courtyard comes a commanding voice. Here, dog. Here, Argus. Here, boy. That's a nice pup. I have something for you. Good dog. They don't call them the fates for nothing, Hockenberry, says Hephaestus. It will be a long and nasty war fought more on Ilium Earth than on Olympus, but the few surviving Olympians will win again. But the thing, the cloud thing, the voice thing... Demogorgon has gone home to Tartarus, rumbles Hephaestus. It cares not the least fucking fig what happens now on Earth, Mars, or Olympus. My people. Your pretty Greek friends are fucked up the ass, says Hephaestus, and then he smiles at his own wit. But if it makes you feel any better, so are the Trojans. Anyone who stays on Ilium Earth will be in the crossfire for the next fifty to a hundred years while this war goes on. I grab his vest harder. You have to help us. He removes my hand as easily as an adult male would remove the clinging hand of a two-year-old child. I don't have to do a goddamn thing, Hockenberry. He wipes his mouth with the back of his hand, looks at the twitching thing on the floor behind, and says, But in this case I will. QT back to your pitiful Achaeans and your woman Helen in the city, and tell them to get their asses out of all high towers, off the walls, out of the buildings, there's going to be a nine-point quake in old Ilium Town in a very few minutes. I need to burn this thing, 
and get our hero back to Olympus so he can try to talk the healer into waking his dead bimbo. Achilles is coming back. He is whistling, and I can hear Argus's nails scrabbling on stone as the dog eagerly follows. Go, says Hephaestus, god of fire and artifice. I reach for my medallion, realize it's not there, realize I don't need it, and QT well away from there. Eighty four. Their estimated twelve hours of continuous work took a little more than eighteen hours. The forty-eight tumbled missiles and missile tubes were more trouble to sort out, separate, and cut up than either Orfu or Monmut could have guessed. Some of the metal warhead casings had cracked completely away, leaving only the plastoid alloy MRV cradles and the containment fields themselves, each glowing blue from its own Cherenkov radiation. The sight would have been interesting if anyone other than the silent Moravex on the Queen Mab had been watching. The submersible, the Dark Lady, crouching over the hull of the sunken death sub, its belly searchlights illuminating, mostly a world filled with silt, fanning anemones, torn cables, twisted wiring, and lethal green-grown missiles and warheads. Brighter than the dappled daylight coming in through the breach wall, brighter than the super-halogen bright searchlights aimed on the work area, brighter than the sun itself were the fires of the 10,000-degree Fahrenheit cutting torches that both the blind Orfu and the silt-blinded Monmut were wielding as delicately as scalpels. Girders, winches, pulleys, and chains were all in place, and now in heavy use as the two Moravex and the Dark Lady herself supervised the winching up of each MRV'd warhead as it was cut away from the missile itself. The cargo hold of Monmouth's European submersible was never really empty. It was honeycombed with a programmable flow foam that formed itself into fluted cathedral buttressings of internal bracing against terrible pressures when the hold was empty of cargo, but that could and did flow tight around any cargo, including Orfu of Io when he rode in the corner of the cargo bay. Now the flow foam was adapting itself to cushion and support each ungainly lump of warhead as Monmut and Orfu ratcheted and cursed it into place. At one point, a little beyond halfway through the exhausting work, Monmut pretended to pat the containment field glowing warhead itself as the flow foam closed around it, as he said, What is your substance? Whereof are you made? That millions of strange shadows on you tend. Your old friend Will? asked Orfu, as both Moravex dropped back into the confusion of agitated silt below to begin cutting away the next warhead. Yes, said Monmouth, Sonnet 53. About two hours later, just after they had secured another blue-glowing warhead in the now crowded hold, they were spacing the black holes as far apart as they could. Orfu said, This answer to our problem is costing you your ship. I'm sorry, Monmouth. The Europa nodded, trusting his huge friend's deep radar to pick up the motion. As soon as Orfu had suggested this approach, Monmouth had realized that it meant losing his beloved Dark Lady forever. There was no way they could take the chance of removing the warheads from the lady's flow-foam cushioned hull and putting them into a different cargo bay. The very best-case scenario now was that the Moravex would have another spacecraft up there in low Earth orbit that could boost the Dark Lady and her planet-lethal cargo out and away from Earth into deep space as gently but quickly as possible. I feel that I just got her back, said Monmouth, hearing the pathetic tone in his own radio voice. They'll build you another some day, said Orfu. It wouldn't be the same, said Monmouth. He had spent more than a century and a half in this little sub. No, agreed Orfu. Nothing will ever be the same after all this. At the end of the eighteen hours, after the last Cherenkov glowing cluster of nascent black holes was loaded away, flow foamed into place, and the Dark Lady's cargo bay doors were shut. Both Moravex were in a state of near-total physical and nervous exhaustion as they hovered together above the wreck of the boomer. "'Is there anything we need to investigate or bring back from the Sword of Allah?' asked Orfu. 
Not at this time, sent Prime Integrator Astig Che from the Queen Mab. The ship had been conspicuously quiet during the last eighteen hours. I never want to see the goddamn thing again, said Monmouth, too exhausted to care that he was speaking on the common channel. It's an obscenity. Amen, said Centurion Leader Mapahu from the dropship circling above. Is there anything you guys want to tell us about what's been going on up there with Odysseus and his girlfriend over the last eighteen hours or so? asked Orfu. Not at this time, said Prime Integrator Astig Cha again. Bring the warheads up. Be careful. Amen, said Mapahu again, and there seemed to be no irony in the soldier of X voice. Suma Four was a damned good pilot, and one had to grant him that. And Orfu and Monmut did. Suma Four actually hovered the dropship so that the Dark Lady remained fully submerged as the aircraft spaceship's much larger bay doors closed under it. Then Suma Four slowly drained out the seawater, but only as the dropship's own flow foam took the water's place, insisting the submersible and its blue glowing cargo in another layer of wrapping. Orfu of Io had already used drop cables to scramble and scrabble to the roof of the dropship before the Dark Lady was ingested, but Monmut left his enviro crash only at the last moment, allowing the Lady to steady and monitor herself during the delicate lifting and placement. Monmut felt that he should have some last words as he stepped off his ship forevermore, but other than a tight-beamed and unacknowledged goodbye, Lady, to the submersible's A.I., he said nothing. The dropship lifted out of the water, ocean streaming from its cargo venting tubes, and Monmut used the last of his strength, mechanical and organic, to haul himself up to the top of the dropship and then down through the smaller of two access hatches into the troop carrier hold. In any other circumstances, the confusion in the troop carrier section would have been comic but not that many things seemed humorous to Monmut at that moment. By retracting all of his manipulators and antennae, Orfu had just been able to squeeze through the larger of the two dropship hatches, but now the Ionian's bulk filled most of the space where the twenty Rockvec soldiers had been perched on their web seating. The soldiers now spilled over into the narrow access corridor going forward to the cockpit itself. Black-barbed Rockvex and their weapons sprawled everywhere, and Monmut had to crawl over their chitinous forms to join Mapahu and Suma Four in the cramped cockpit. Suma Four was flying the hovering dropship manually, using the Omni controller constantly to balance the ship and its shifting contents, playing the thruster tabs the way human pianists must have once played their instrument of choice. No more tie-down straps, Suma Four said to Monmut without turning his head. We used the last to harness your big friend into the troop carrier space. Extend that last jump seat and mag-tight yourself to the hull, please, Monmut. Monmut did as he was told. He realized that he was too tired to stand again. Earth's gravity was terrible, after all, and felt like weeping from the release of chemicals after the last eighteen hours of total effort and tension. Hang on, said Suma Four. The dropship engines roared and they rose slowly, vertically, meter by meter, no shocks, no surprises, until Monmouth saw out the main cockpit window that they had reached an altitude of around two kilometers. And then they began to pitch forward slightly, the engines moving from the vertical to forward thrust. He could never have imagined that a machine could be handled so delicately. Still, there were bumps, and at each bump Monmut found himself holding his breath, feeling his organic heart pound as he waited for the black holes in the belly of the hold of the dropship to go critical. It would only take one, and all the others would collapse into themselves a millionth of a second later. Monmut tried to imagine the immediate aftermath, the mini black holes immediately merging and plunging through the hull of the Dark Lady and the dropship, the mass accelerating toward the center of the earth at thirty-two feet per second, sucking in all the mass of the two Moravec ships with it, and then the air molecules, then the sea, then the sea bottom, then the rock, then the crust of the earth itself, 
as the black holes plummeted centerward. How many days or months would the large mini black hole comprised of all 768 warhead black holes ping-pong back and forth through the planet, arcing up into space for how far on each ping or pong? The electronic computing part of Monmouth's mind gave him the answer, even though he didn't want it, even though the physical part of his brain was too weary to absorb it. Far enough for the black holes to suck in all of the million-plus objects on the orbital rings in the first hundred ping-pongs through the planet, but not so far that it would eat the moon. It would make no difference to Monmouth, Orfu, and the other Moravex, even those on the Queen Mab. The dropship Moravex would be spaghettified almost instantaneously. Their molecules stretched toward the center of the Earth with the mini-hole as it fell, then farther, elasticating. Was that a word? Monmouth tiredly wondered. Back through themselves as the black hole cut another swatch back up through the molten spinning core of the planet. Monmouth closed his virtual eyes and concentrated on breathing, on feeling the dropship accelerate smoothly but constantly as it climbed. It was as if they were on a smooth glass ramp rising to the heavens. Summa Four was good. The sky changed from afternoon blue to vacuum black. The horizon bent like an archer's bow. The stars seemed to explode into sight. Monmouth activated his vision and watched out the cockpit window as well as via the dropship's imager feed via the umbilical connection at his jump seat station. They weren't climbing to the Queen Mab, that was obvious. Summa Four leveled out the dropship at an altitude of not more than three hundred kilometers, barely above the atmosphere, and tapped thrusters to roll the earth into the overhead cockpit windows so that full sunlight fell on the ship's cargo bay doors. The rings and the map were more than 30,000 kilometers higher, and the Moravec atomic spacecraft was on the opposite side of the Earth at the moment. Monmouth shut off the virtual feed for a second, feeling the zero-G as a physical release from the gravity of their work the last eighteen hours, and looked up through the clear overheads at the Terminator moving across what had once been Europe, at the blue waters and white cloud masses of the Atlantic Ocean, the breach gap wasn't even a thin line from this altitude or angle. And not for the first time in the last eighteen hours, Monmouth de Moravec wondered how a living species, gifted with such a beautiful home world, could arm a submarine, themselves any machine, with such weapons of total mindless destruction. What in any mental universe could seem worth the murder of millions, much less the destruction of an entire planet? Monmouth knew that they were not out of harm's way yet. For all technical purposes, they might as well still be at the bottom of the ocean, for all the good these few hundred kilometers did them. If any one of the black holes activated now, tripping the others into singularity, the ping-pong ripping through the heart of Earth end of things would be just as certain, just as sure. Being in freefall was not the same as being out of the Earth's gravitational field. The warheads would have to be far away, far beyond the moon's orbit, certainly, since it was obvious the Earth's gravity still reigned there. Millions of kilometers away before the threat to Earth was over. The only difference in outcome at this measly altitude, Monmouth knew, would be that the Moravec's spaghettification ratio might grow a few percent in the initial minutes. A matte black spacecraft uncloaked, unstealthed, D-force fielded, came out of hiding. Damn, Monmouth had no word for it. Appeared, less than five kilometers from them on the sunward side. The ship was obviously of Moravec design, but of a more advanced design than any spacecraft Monmouth had ever seen. If the Queen Mab had seemed like some artifact from the Earth's lost era twentieth century, this just-appeared spacecraft seemed centuries ahead of everything the Moravecs had now. Somehow the black shape succeeded in seeming both stubby and deadly sleek, both simple and impossibly complicated in its fractal bat-wing geometries. And there was no doubt whatsoever in Monmouth's mind that the ship carried awesome weapons. He wondered for a few seconds if the prime integrators were actually going to risk the loss of one of their stealthed warships, but no, 
Even as he wondered, Monmouth saw an opening morph into being in the warship's curved belly, and a long witch's broom of a device peroxided itself out into space, rotated along its own axis, lined up with the dropship, and used secondary thrusters on either side of an absurdly oversized engine bell to shove itself silently in their direction. Orfu tight-beamed him. Why are we surprised? The prime integrators have had more than eighteen hours to come up with something, and we Moravex have always bred good engineers. Monmouth had to agree. As the broomstick thrusted closer, slowing and rotating again as it came, putting on the brakes now, keeping the thrust bursts far away from the dropship's belly, Monmouth could see that the thing was probably about sixty meters long along its axis, with a small AI brain node hitched in the center of mass, like a saddle on a skinny nag. Lots of silver manipulators and heavy metal clamps, and one whomping big high-thrust engine just forward of that huge engine bell, along with scores of tiny thruster quads. I'm releasing the submersible now, said Suma Four on the common band. Monmouth watched from the dropship hull cameras as the long cargo bays opened and the dark lady was floated gently out, propelled by the tiniest puff of gas. His beloved submersible began to rotate very slowly, and since its own stabilization system had been shut off, she didn't even try to stabilize herself. Monmouth thought that he had never seen anything so out of her element, again, as the lady was here in space, three hundred kilometers above the bright blue evening ocean of Earth. The broomstick robot ship didn't allow the submersible to tumble for long. The thing thrusted carefully, matched velocities perfectly, pulled the dark lady close to it with manipulator arms moving as gently as a lover after a long and tentative absence from his beloved, and then latched solid clamps in place, clamps built to lock into the submersible's docking receptacles and various vents. Again, with a sort of loving care, the broomstick AI, or the Moravec on the warship currently controlling it, extruded a bright gold foil molecular blanket and carefully, carefully folded the crinkling thing around the entire sub. The engineers didn't want changes in temperature to trigger the black holes. Quad thrusters fired, and the praying mantis form of the robot ship and the foil-blanketed bulk of the Dark Lady moved away from the dropship, the robot aligning along its axis so that its engine bell was aimed down, toward the blue sea and white clouds and visibly moving Terminator crossing Europe. What are they going to do about the little laser leukocytes, Orfu of Io asked on the common band? Monmouth had wondered that himself. How were they going to keep the clean-up robotic laser attackers from triggering the warheads? But it hadn't been his problem, so he hadn't tried to work it out in the past eighteen hours. The Valkyrie, the Indomitable, and the Nimitz are going to accompany the robot ship and destroy any approaching leukocytes, said Suma Four while our warships remain stealthed, of course. Orfu actually laughed aloud on the common band. Valkyrie, indomitable, and Nimitz, he rumbled. My, we peace-loving Moravex are getting scarier by the minute, aren't we? No one answered. To break the silence, Monmouth said, Which one is that? No, wait, it's gone. The matte-black fractal bat had re-stealthed, its presence not even suggested by a blotted-out patch of starfield or ringfield. That was the Valkyrie, said Suma Four. Ten seconds. No one counted down aloud. Everyone, Monmouth was sure, was counting silently. At zero, the high-thrust engine bell was illuminated by the slightest blue glow, reminiscent to Monmouth of the Cherenkov radiation glow of the warhead nacelles. The broomstick mantis began to move, began to climb with agonizing slowness. But Monmouth knew that anything under constant thrust long enough would achieve a horrific velocity soon enough, even while climbing up out of Earth's gravity well. And he also knew that the robot ship would be increasing that thrust as it climbed. Probably by the time the ship and the dead thermal blanket-wrapped hulk of the Dark Lady reached the empty orbit of Earth's moon, the package would have achieved escape velocity. 
Even if the black holes activated after that point, the singularities would be a hazard in space, no longer the death of Earth. The robot ship soon disappeared against the moving ring field. Monmouth saw not the slightest hint of fusion or ion exhausts from the three stealth Moravec spacecraft that were presumably escorting the robot. Suma 4 closed the cargo bay doors. All right, everyone, please listen up, said the pilot. Some strange things have been going on while our two friends have been busy under the surface of the water ocean down there. We need to get back to the Queen Mab. What happened to our reconnaissance mission, began Monmouth. You can download the recorded feed as we climb, interrupted Suma 4. But right now, the prime integrators want us back aboard. The Mab is leaving for a while, pulling back to lunar orbit at least. No, said Orfu of Io. The syllables seemed to echo on the calm line like the single tolling of some huge bell. No, said Suma Four. Those are our orders. We need to go back down to that Atlantic Gap breach, whatever we call it, said Orfu. We need to go back down now. You need to shut up and hang on, said the big Ganymedon at the controls. I'm taking the dropship back to the Mab as ordered. Look at the images you shot from ten thousand meters, said Orfu, and fed the image to everyone aboard via their umbilical internet. Monmouth looked. It was the same picture he'd looked at before they began work on cutting the warheads free. The startling gap in the ocean, the crumbled bow of the submarine emerging from the north wall of that gap, a small debris field. I'm blind on optic frequencies, said Orfu, but I kept manipulating the accompanying radar imagery, and something's odd there. Here's the best magnification and clarification I could get on the visual photograph. You tell me if there's something there that deserves closer examination. I'll tell you right now that nothing we see there will make me fly the dropship back there, Suma Four said flatly. You two haven't got the word yet, but the asteroid isle, that huge asteroid where we dropped Odysseus off, is leaving. It's already changed its axis and aligned itself, and fusion thrusters are igniting as we speak. And your friend Odysseus is dead, and more than a million satellites in the polar and equatorial rings, mass accumulators, the fax teleport devices, other things, are all coming alive again. We're leaving." Look at the goddamned photographs, bellowed Orfu of Io. All the Moravex on board, even those without ears, tried to put their hands over their ears. Monmouth looked at the next photograph in the digital series. It had not only been magnified far beyond their original view, but the pixels cleared up. That's some sort of backpack sitting there on the dry floor of the breach, said Monmouth, and next to it, a pistol said Centurion Leader Mapahu, a gunpowder slug-thrower, if my guess is correct. And that looks like a human body lying next to the pack, said one of the black chitinous troopers, something that's been dead a long time, all mummified and flattened. No, said Orfu, I checked the best radar imagery. That's not a human body, just a human therm skin. So, said Suma Four from his command chair at the controls. The submarine wreck expelled one of its passengers or some of a human's belongings. They're part of the debris field. Orfu snorted loudly. And it's all still there after twenty-five hundred standard years? I doubt it, Suma. Look at the pistol. No rust. Look at the rucksack. No rot. That part of the breach gap is open to the elements, including sunlight and wind. But this stuff hasn't degraded. It proves nothing, said Suma Four, as he tapped in the rendezvous coordinates for the Queen Mab. Thrusters kicked the dropship into proper alignment for the burn and climb. Sometime in the past few years, some old-style human wandered out there to die. We have more important things to deal with right now. Look in the sand, said Orfu. What? said their pilot. Look at the fifth image I blew up in the sand. I can't see it but the radar was good down to three millimeters. What do you see there with your eyes? A footprint, said Monmouth. A footprint of a bare human foot. Several footprints, all distinct in the muddy soil and soft sand, all leading west. Rain would wipe away those prints in a few days. 
Some human has been there in the last 48 hours or less, perhaps even while we were working on recovering the warheads. It doesn't matter, said Sumafor. Our orders are to return to the Queen Mab, and we're going to take the dropship back down to the Atlantic Breach, commanded Prime Integrator Astigchai, from 30,000 kilometers higher on the opposite side of the Earth. Our review of imagery we took hastily on the last orbit shows what may be the body of a human being in the breach, approximately 23 kilometers to the west of the submarine wreckage. Go and recover it at once. Eighty-five. I flick into solidity and realize that I've QT'd myself into Helen of Troy's private bathing chambers, deep within the palace she used to share with her dead husband Paris, and which she now shares with her former father-in-law, King Priam. I know I have only a few minutes in which to act, but I don't know what to do. Slave girls and serving women shriek as I stride from room to room calling Helen's name. I hear the servants calling for the guards and realize that I may have to QT away quickly if I don't want to end up on the end of a Trojan spear. Then I see a familiar face in the next chamber. It's Hypsipyle, the slave woman from Lesbos, whom Andromache had used as a personal minder for crazy Cassandra. This Hypsipyle might know where Helen is, since Helen and Andromache were very close the last time I saw them, and at least this slave isn't running away or calling for the guards. Do you know where Helen is? I ask as I approach the heavyset woman. Her blunt face is as expressionless as a gourd. As if in answer, Hypsipyle rears back and kicks me in the gonads. I levitate, grab myself, fall to the tiled floor, roll around in agony, and squeak. She aims another kick that would take my head off if I don't dodge it, so I try to dodge, take the kick on the shoulder, and end up rolling into the corner, not even able to squeak now, my left shoulder and arm numb all the way down to the fingertips. I struggle to my feet, hunched over as the huge woman approaches with her eye full of business. QT somewhere, idiot, I advise myself. Where? Anywhere but here. Ipsipoli grabs me by my tunic front, tears the tunic, and aims a ham-fisted blow at my face. I raise my forearms to block the blow, and the impact of her big-knuckled fist almost breaks the radius and ulna in both arms. I bounce off the wall, and she grabs me by the shirt again and punches me in the belly. Suddenly I'm on my knees again, retching, trying to clutch both belly and balls, no longer having enough wind in me even to manage a squeak. Hypsipyle kicks me in the ribs, breaking at least one, and I roll to my side. I can hear the slap of the guard's sandals as they rush up the main staircase. Now I remember the last time I saw Hypsipyle she was protecting Helen, and I sucker-punched her to drag Helen away with me. The slave woman lifts me like a rag doll and slaps me, first forehand, then backhand, then forehand again. I feel teeth loosen and find myself feeling glad that I'm not wearing the reading glasses I used to have to wear. Jesus Christ, Hockenberry, rages part of my mind. You just watched Achilles kill Zeus who drives the storm clouds in single combat, and here you are getting the shit kicked out of you by one lousy lesbian. The guards burst into the room, spear points raised toward me. Hypsipyle turns toward them, still holding my bunched tunic in one of her huge hands, the tops of my feet scraping the floor, and holds me out, offering me to their spears. I QT the two of us to the top of the Great Wall. A blast of sunlight around us, Trojan warriors yards away exclaiming and leaping back. Hypsipyle is so astonished at this instantaneous change of place that she drops me. I use the few seconds of her confusion I have left to kick her heavy legs out from under her. She scrambles to all fours, but still on my back I pull back my legs, coil them, and kick her clean off the open rampart into the city below. That'll teach you, you great muscled cow. Teach you not to mess with Dr. Thomas Hockenberry, Ph.D. in classical literature. I get to my feet, dust myself off, and look down from the rampart. The great muscled cow has landed on the canvas roof of a marketplace stall back to the wall, has torn through the canvas, landed again in a heap of what looked to be potatoes, 
and is currently running toward the stairs near the Sean Gate to scramble back up to where I wait. Shit. I run along the rampart toward where I now see Helen standing with the other members of the royal family on the broad reviewing area of the wall near Athena's temple. Everyone's attention is firmly fixed on the battle on the beach. My Achaean's doomed last stand, obviously in its last stages now, so no one interdicts me before I'm grabbing Helen by her beautiful white arm. Hakenberry, she says, marveling. What is it? Why do you... We've got to get everyone out of the city, I gasp. Now, right now. Helen shakes her head. Guards have whirled and gone for their spears or swords, but Helen waves them away. Hakenberry, it is wonderful. We are winning. The Argives fall like wheat before our scythe. Any minute now, noble Hector will... We have to get everyone out of the buildings, off the wall, out of the city, I shout. It's no good. The guards are all around us now, ready to protect Helen, King Priam, and the other royal family members here by killing me or dragging me off in an instant. I'll never convince Helen or Priam to warm the city in time. Panting, aware of Hypsipyle's heavy running footsteps coming down the rampart toward us, I gasp. The sirens! Where did the Moravex put the air raid sirens? Sirens, says Helen. She looks alarmed now, as if my madness must be dealt with quickly. The air raid sirens, the ones that used to wail months ago when the gods attacked the city by air. Where did the Moravex, the machine toy people, put the equipment for the air raid sirens? Oh, in the ante-room of the Temple of Apollo, but Hockenberry, why do you... Keeping my grip firm on her upper arm, I visualize the steps of Apollo's temple here in Ilium, and Cuteus there an instant before the guards, and one big angry woman from Lesbos can grab me. Helen gasps as we pop into solidity on the white steps, but I drag her up into the anteroom. There are no guards here. Everyone in the city seems to be on the walls or in a high place to watch the end of the war play out on the beach to the west. The equipment is here, in the small acolyte's changing room, next to the main temple anteroom. The air raid siren warning had been automatic, triggered by the Moravex anti-aircraft missile and radar sites now gone that had been stationed outside the city. But just as I remembered, the Moravec engineers had put a microphone with the other electronic gear here, just in case King Priam or Hector had wanted to address the entire Trojan population through the thirty huge air raid siren loudspeakers set around the walled city. I study the equipment for just a few seconds. It had been made simple enough for a child to use so that the Trojans could manage it themselves, and child-simple technology is exactly the kind Dr. Thomas Hockenberry can manage. Hockenberry! I flip the switch that says PA system on, throw the toggle that reads loudspeaker announcement, lift the archaic-looking microphone, and begin babbling, hearing my own words echoing back from a hundred buildings and the great walls themselves. Attention! Attention, all people of Ilium! King Priam is issuing an earthquake warning. Effective immediately. Leave all buildings. Now! Get off the walls. Now! Run from the city into open country if you can. If you are in a tower, evacuate it. Now! An earthquake will hit Ilium at any second. Again, King Priam is issuing an earthquake evacuation order effective immediately. Leave all buildings and seek open space now. I echo on for another blaring minute, then switch off, grab the staring, open-mouthed Helen, and drag her out of the Temple of Apollo into the central marketplace. People are milling and talking, staring at the various speaker locations from where my blaring announcement had come, but no one seems to be evacuating. A few people wander out of the large buildings that adjoin this central open plaza, but almost no one is running for the open sea and gate in the countryside as my announcement had commanded them to. Shit, I say. Hockenberry, you are very worked up. Come to my chambers and we shall have some honeyed wine, and I tug her along behind me. Even if no one else is headed through the open gate and out away from the buildings, I sure as hell am and I'm going to save Helen whether she wants me to or not. I slide to a stop just before entering the narrowing avenue at the west end of the huge plaza. 
What am I doing? I don't have to run like an idiot. I just have to visualize Thicket Ridge way out beyond the walls and QT us there. Oh, shit, I say again. Above us, horizontal, seemingly miles wide, descending rapidly is the kind of brain hole I'd seen above Olympus earlier. A flat circle rimmed by flames. Through the hole I can see dark sky and stars. Damn. I decided the last second not to quantum teleport. The chances of us getting caught in quantum space just as the brain hole hits us is too great. I tug the staring, horrified Helen a dozen yards back toward the center of the huge plaza. With any luck, we'll be out of the range of the falling walls and buildings. The hoop of fire falls around us past Ilium, falls past the surrounding hills, plains, marshes, and beaches for a circle of at least two miles, and the instant after it falls, we fall. There is a sensation of the entire city of ancient Troy being on an elevator suddenly cut free of its cables, and two seconds later all hell breaks loose. Much later, the Moravec engineers would tell me that the entire city of Ilium fell a literal five feet and two inches before landing on the soil of the present-day Earth. All of those fighting on the beach, more than 150,000 struggling, screaming, sweating men, also suddenly dropped five feet two inches, and not onto soft beach sand, but onto the rock and tangled scrub brush that had taken the sand's place after the coastline had retreated almost 300 yards to the west. For Helen and me in Ilium's great city square, those last minutes of Ilium were almost our last minutes as well. It was the topless tower near the wall beyond the southeast corner of that square, the same damaged topless tower where Helen had stabbed me in the heart in what seemed like ages ago, that came falling over lower buildings, toppling and collapsing like some giant factory smokestack, crashing directly at us as we cowered in the open square near the fountain. It was the fountain itself that saved our lives. The multi-stepped structure with its pool and central obelisk, no more than twelve feet tall, was just large enough to part the path of the tower's tumbling debris, leaving us coughing in a cloud of dust and smaller pieces, but sending the larger stone blocks careering elsewhere across the marketplace. We were stunned. The huge paving stones of the plaza itself had been shattered by the five-foot fall. The fountain obelisk was tilting at a thirty-degree angle, and the fountain itself had stopped forever. The entire city was lost in a cloud of dust that did not fully clear away for more than six hours. By the time Helen and I picked ourselves up and started dusting ourselves off, coughing and trying to clear our nose and throats of all the terrible white powder, other people were already running, most randomly in pure panic now that it was too late to run, while a few had even begun digging in the ruins and rubble trying to find and help others. More than five thousand people died in the fall of the city. Most had been trapped in the larger buildings. Both the Temple of Athena and the Temple of Apollo had collapsed, their many pillars cracking and flying apart like broken sticks. Paris's palace, now the home of Priam, was rubble. No one on the terrace of Athena's temple survived except for Hypsipyle, who was still hunting for me when her part of the wall collapsed. Many of the people had been on the main west and southwest ramparts, which did not collapse in their entirety, but which tumbled outward or inward in many places, sending bodies flying out and down to the rocks on the plain of Scamander, or into the city and down onto the rubble. King Priam was one of those who died that way, along with several other members of the royal family, including the ill-fated Cassandra. Andromache, Hector's wife, and a survivor, if ever there was one, survived without a scratch. The city of Troy was as much in an earthquake zone in the ancient days as that part of Turkey is now. People knew how to react to quakes then, much as they do now, and my announcement probably saved many. Many people did run to solid doorways or escape to open spaces to avoid the collapsing buildings. It was later estimated that several thousand ran out onto the plain itself before the city fell. The towers tumbled and the walls came down. For my part, I stared around in stunned disbelief. The noblest of cities, this survivor of ten years of siege by the Achaeans and months more war with the gods themselves, was now mostly rubble. Fires burned here and there. 
not the omnipresent flames of a modern city of my era after an earthquake, for there were no ruptured gas lines here, but fires enough from braziers and hearths and cooking kitchens and simple torches in windowless halls that were now open to the sky. Fires enough. The smoke mixed with the roiling dust to keep the many hundreds of us milling in the plaza coughing and dabbing at our eyes. I have to find Priam, Andromache, said Helen, between coughs. I have to find Hector. You go look after your people here, Helen, I said between coughs. I'll go down to the beach in search of Hector. I turned to go, but Helen grabbed my arm to stop me. Hockenberry, what did this? Who did this? I told her the truth. The gods. It had long been prophesied that Troy could not fall until the stone above the huge Sian gate was dislodged, and as I pushed my way out with fleeing crowds, I noticed that the wooden gates had splintered and that the great lintel had fallen. Nothing was as it had been ten minutes earlier. Not only had the city been destroyed in an instant of encircling fire, but the surrounding area had changed, the sky had changed, the weather had changed. We weren't in Kansas anymore, Toto. I had taught the Iliad for more than twenty years at Indiana University and elsewhere, but I had never thought to go to Troy, to the ruins of Troy along the coast of Turkey. But I'd seen photos enough of the place at the end of the twentieth century and beginning of the twenty-first century. This place where Ilium had crash-landed like Dorothy's house looked more like the ruins of Troy in the twenty-first century, a small area named Hisarlik than like the busy center of empire that had been Ilium. As I looked at the changed scenery and changed sky, since it had been early afternoon when the Greeks were fighting their last stand and it was now twilight, I remembered a canto of Don Juan by Byron, written when the poet had visited this place in 1810 and had felt both the connection here to heroic history and the distance from it. High barrows without marble or a name, a vast, untilled, and mountain-skirted plain, and Ida in the distance, still the same. And old Scamander, if tis he, remain. The situation seems still formed for fame. A hundred thousand men might fight again with ease, but where I sought for Ilion's walls, the quiet sheep feeds and the tortoise crawls. I saw no sheep. But when I looked back at the toppled city, the ridge line was much the same, although obviously five feet two inches lower, where the city had just fallen onto the rubble of amateur archaeologist Schliemann's ruins. A memory struck me that the ancient Romans had sheared off yards of the top of that ridge line to build their own city of Ilion more than a millennium after the original Ilium disappeared. And I realized that we'd all been lucky to fall just five feet two inches. If it hadn't been for Roman rubble on top of Greek ruins, the fall would have been much worse. To the north, where the plains of Simois had stretched for many miles, a low grassland perfect for pasturing and running the famous Trojan horses, there now grew a forest. The smooth plain of Scamander, the area between the city and the shoreline to the west, the plain where I'd watched most of the fighting take place during the last eleven years, was now a gully-riddled riot of scrub oak, pine, and swampy marsh. I headed for that beach, climbing what the Trojans had called Thicket Ridge without even recognizing where I was. But as soon as I reached the low ridge line, I stopped in amazement. The sea was gone. It's not just the mile or so of receded shoreline that I knew about from the memories of my twenty-first century previous life, the entire fucking Aegean Sea was gone. I sat down on the highest boulder I could find on Thicket Ridge and thought about this. I wondered not only where Nix and Hephaestus had sent us, but when. All I could tell right now in the falling twilight was that there were no electric lights visible anywhere inland or along the coast, and that the bottom of what should be the Aegean here was overgrown with mature trees and shrubs. Toto, we're not only not in Kansas anymore, we're not even in Oz anymore. The evening sky was completely covered over by clouds, but it was still light enough that I could see the thousands upon thousands of men packed together in a half-mile arc along what had been the beach just fifteen minutes earlier. 
At first I was sure that they were still fighting. I could see thousands more fallen on each side. But then I realized that they were just milling around. All lines of combat, trenches, defenses, communication, and discipline lost. Later I'd discover that almost a third of the men down there, Trojans and Achaeans alike, had broken bones, mostly leg bones, from the five-foot fall onto rock and into gullies that hadn't been there a second earlier. In places, I'd soon learn, men who had been trying to slash each other's guts and skulls to bits a few minutes earlier were now lying moaning together or trying to help each other up. I hurried to get down the hill and to cross the mile of alluvial plain that had been so much easier to cross when it had been so worn down and bare from battle. By the time I reached the rear of the Trojan lines, such as they were, it was almost dark. I started asking for Hector immediately, but it was another half hour before I found him, and by then everything was being done by torchlight. Hector and his wounded brother Deiphobus were conferring with the temporary commander of the Argives, Idomeneus, son of Deucalion and commander of the Crete heroes, and little Ajax of Locris, son of Oilus. Little Ajax had been carried to the conference on a litter since he'd been slashed to the bone on both shins earlier in the day. Also there, conferring with Hector, was Thrasymedes, Nestor's brave son whom I'd thought had been killed earlier in the day. He'd gone missing in the battle for the last trench and had been presumed dead down among the corpses there. But as I'd discover in a minute, he had only been wounded a third time, but it had taken him hours to dig his way out of the corpse-filled trench then only to find himself among the Trojans. They'd taken him prisoner, one of the few acts of mercy this day or any day of the almost eleven years of war between the two groups, and now he was using a broken lance as a crutch as he negotiated with Hector. Hockenberry, said Hector, apparently and oddly happy to see me. Son of Duane, I am glad you survived this madness. What caused this? Who caused this? What has happened? The gods caused this, I said truthfully. To be specific, the fire god Hephaestus and night Nyx, the mysterious goddess who lives and works with the fates. I know you were close to the gods, Hockenberry, son of Duane. Why have they done this thing? What do they want us to do? I shook my head. The torches were ripping and tearing at the night in the strong breeze coming in from the west, coming from the direction of what had once been the Mediterranean, but which now bore smells of vegetation on the wind. It doesn't matter what the gods want, I said. You'll never see the gods again. They're gone forever. The hundred or two hundred packed men around us said nothing, and for a minute there came only the sound of the torches and the moans of the many injured in the dark. How do you know this? asked little Ajax. I just came from Olympus, I said. Your Achilles killed Zeus in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The murmurs would have grown to a roar if Hector had not silenced everyone. Continue, son of Duane. Achilles killed Zeus, and the Titans returned to Olympus. Hephaestus will rule eventually. Night and the fates have decided this already, but for the next year or so your earth would have been a battlefield on which no mere mortal could have survived. So Hephaestus sent you, the city, its survivors, you Achaeans, you Trojans, here. Where is here? asked Idomeneus. I have no idea. When will we be allowed to return? asked Hector. Never, I said. I was sure of this, and my voice reflected that certainty. I'm not sure I ever spoke two syllables with such certainty before or since. At that moment, the second of the three impossible things of the day occurred, the first being, by my count, the falling of Ilium into a different universe. It had been cloudy since the city landed on the ridge line. Solid clouds spread from east to west, and the twilight darkness had come more quickly because of the cloud cover. But now the wind that had borne the smell of vegetation was moving the entire cloud mass from west to east, clearing the early night sky above us. We heard the men, Achaeans and Trojans both, exclaiming for long seconds before we realized that they were looking and pointing skyward. I became aware of the strange light even before I looked up at the skies. It was brighter than any night under a full moon that I'd ever experienced, and it was a richer, milkier, and strangely more fluid sort of light. 
I found myself looking down at our multiple moving shadows on the rock beneath us, shadows no longer thrown by torchlight, when Hector himself prodded my arm to make me look up. The clouds had all but passed. The night sky was still Earth's night sky. I could see Orion's belt, the Pleiades, Polaris, and the Big Dipper low in the north, all more or less in their proper places, but that familiar late winter sky and the crescent moon rising above tumbled Troy to the east were paled to insignificance by this new source of light. Two broad and moving bands of stars were moving and crossing above us, one band in our south and obviously moving quickly west to east, the other ring directly above us and moving north to south. The rings were bright and milky, but not indistinct. I could make out thousands upon thousands of bright individual stars in each ring, even as some long-lost memory from a science column in some newspaper reminded me that, on the clearest night from most places on Earth, only about three thousand separate stars were visible up there. Now there were tens, perhaps hundreds of thousands of individual stars visible, all moving together and crossing in two bright rings above us, easily illuminating everything around us and giving us a sort of half-evening light, the kind of half-light I'd always imagined they played softball by at midnight in Anchorage, Alaska. This may have been the most beautiful thing I'd seen in two lifetimes. Son of Duane, said Hector, what are these stars? Are they gods? New stars? What are they? I don't know, I said. At that moment, with more than a hundred and fifty thousand men in armor rubbernecking, staring open-mouthed and fearful at the amazing new night sky of this other earth, men closest to the beach started shouting about something else. It took several minutes for us to realize that something was happening at the westernmost reaches of the mob of men, and then it took those of us at Hector's conference more minutes to make our way west to a rocky rise, perhaps the edge of the original beach here thousands of years ago in Ilium's day, to see what the Achaeans were still shouting about. For the first time I noticed that the hundreds of burned black ships were still here. They had passed through the brain hole with us, the scorched wrecks near no water now, beached forever on the scrubby ridges here, high above the alluvial marsh to the west. And then I noticed what the hundreds of men were yelling about, Something black and inky, but which reflected the turning starlight above us, was creeping across the floor of the missing sea from the west. Something moving silently toward us along the bottom of the dry basin. Something flowing and sliding eastward with the subtle, slow but sure certainty of death. It filled up the lowest points as we watched, then encircled the wooded hilltops in the distance near the horizon, quite easily visible in the light from the new rings above us. And within minutes, those hilltops had been surrounded by the dark motion until they ceased being hilltops and became the islands of Lemnos and Tenedos and Imbrus once again. This was the third strange miracle of this seemingly endless day. The wine-dark sea was returning to the shores of Ilium. 86 Harmon held the pistol to his forehead for only a few seconds. Even as his finger touched the weapon's trigger, he knew that he wasn't going to end things that way. It was a coward's way out, and however terrified he felt right then at the imminence of his own death, he did not want to exit as a coward. He pivoted, aimed the weapon at the hulking bow of the ancient submarine where it emerged through the north wall of the breach, and squeezed the trigger until the weapon stopped firing nine shots later. His hand was shaking so badly he didn't even know if he'd hit the huge target, but the act of shooting at it both focused and exorcised some of his rage and revulsion at the folly of his own species. The soiled thermskin came off slowly. Harmon did not even consider trying to wash the thing, but simply cast it aside. He was shaking from the aftermaths of the vomiting and diarrhea, but he didn't even consider putting on his outer clothes or boots as he rose, found his balance, and started walking west. Harmon didn't have to query his new biometric functions to know that he was dying quickly. He could feel the radiation in his guts and bowels and testicles and bones. 
A final weakness was growing in him like some foul homunculus stirring. So he walked west toward Ada and Ardis. For several hours Harmon's mind was wonderfully quiescent, becoming aware only to help him avoid stepping on something sharp or to lead him to the correct path through ridges of coral or rock. He was vaguely aware that the walls of the breach on both sides were growing much higher. The ocean was deeper here, and that the air around him was much cooler, but the midday sun still struck him. Once in mid-afternoon Harmon looked down and saw that his legs and thighs were still soiled, mostly with blood, and he staggered to the south wall of the breach, reached his bare hand through the force field, his fingers feeling the terrible pressure and cold, and scooped enough salt water out of the sea to clean himself. He staggered on toward the west. When he did begin thinking again, he was pleased to note that it was not just about the obscenity of the machine and its cargo of planetary death that were now out of sight behind him. He began to think about his own life, one hundred years of it. At first, Harmon's thoughts were bitter, scolding himself for wasting all those decades on parties and play and an aimless series of faxing to this social event or that. But he soon forgave himself. There had been good times there, real moments even amidst that false existence, and the last year of true friendships, real love, and honest commitment had made up at least in part for all the years of shallowness. He thought of his own role in the last year's events and found the capacity to forgive himself there as well. The post-human who called herself Moira teased him about being Prometheus, but Harmon saw himself more as a sort of combined Adam and Eve who, by seeking out the one forbidden fruit in the perfect garden of indolence, had banished his species from that mindless, healthy place forever. What had he given Ada, his friends, his race, in return? Reading? As central as reading and knowledge had been to Harmon, he wondered if that one ability, so much more potentially powerful than the hundred functions now stirred to wakefulness in his body, could compensate for all the terror, pain, uncertainty, and death ahead. Perhaps, he realized, it did not have to. As evening darkened the long slot of sky far above, Harmon stumbled westward and began thinking about death. His own, he knew, was only hours away, perhaps less. But what of the concept of death that he and his people had never had to face until recent months? He allowed himself to search all the data stored in him after the crystal cabinet and found that death, the fear of death, the hope for surviving death, curiosity about death, had been the central spur for almost all literature and religion for the nine millennia of information he had stored. The religion parts Harmon could not quite comprehend. He had little context except for his current terror at the presence of death. He saw the hunger there in a thousand cultures over thousands of years to have assurance, any assurance, that one's life continued even after life so obviously had fled. He blinked as his mind sorted through concepts of afterlife. Valhalla, heaven, hell, the Islamic paradise that the crew of the submarine behind him had been so eager to enter. A sense of having lived a righteous life so as to live on in the minds and memories of others. And then he looked at all the myriad versions of the theme of being reborn into an earthly life. The mandala, reincarnation, the Wu Nine Path to Center. To Harmon's mind and heart, it was all beautiful and as airy and empty as an abandoned spider web. As he stumbled westward into the cold gathering shadows, Harmon realized that if he responded to human views of death now stored in his dying cells and very DNA, it was to the literary and artistic attempts to express the human side of the encounter, a sort of defiance of genius. Harmon looked at stored images of the last self-portraits of Rembrandt and wept at the terrible wisdom in that visage. He listened to his own mind read every word of the full version of Hamlet and realized, as so many generations before had realized, that this aging prince in black might have been the only true envoy from the undiscovered country. Harmon realized that he was weeping and that it was not for himself or his imminent demise— 
nor even for the loss of Ada and his unborn child, who were never truly out of his mind. But it was simply because he had never had the chance to watch a Shakespearean play performed. He realized that if he were returning home to Ardis all hale and hearty, rather than as this bleeding, dying skeleton, he would have insisted that the community perform one of Shakespeare's plays if they managed to survive the Voynichs. Which one? Trying to decide this interesting question kept Harmon distracted long enough that he did not notice the sky above fading to deep twilight hues. Nor did he notice when the slice of sky became only star fields and ring movement, and he did not immediately notice that the cold in the deep trench he was staggering westward in was seeping into his skin first, then flesh, then his very bones. Finally, he could go on no longer. He kept stumbling over rocks and other unseen things. He could not even see where the walls of the breach began. Everything was terribly cold and totally dark a pretaste of death. Harmon did not want to die. Not yet, not now. He curled into a fetal position on the sandy bottom of the breach, feeling the grit and sand rubbing his skin raw as the reality that he was alive. He hugged himself, teeth chattering, pulled his knees higher up and hugged them, body shaking, but reassured that he was alive. He even thought wistfully about the rucksack he had left so far behind, and of the thermal blanket sleeping bag in it, and of his clothes. His mind acknowledged the food bars left in it as well, but his stomach wanted no part of that. Several times during the night Harmon had to crawl away from the nest in the sand he had made with his curled body and shake on hands and knees as he retched again and again, but dry heaves only. Anything he'd had in his stomach yesterday was long gone. Then he would crawl back slowly, laboriously, to his little fetal-shaped gouge in the sand, anticipating the slight warmth he would find again when curled up there the way he once might have anticipated a fine meal. Which play? The first he had ever read had been Romeo and Juliet, and it held the affection of first encounter. Now he reviewed King Lear, never, 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 and thought it perfectly appropriate for a dying man such as himself, even one who had not lived long enough to see his son or daughter, but it might be too much for the artist's family in their first encounter with Shakespeare. Since they would have to be their own actors, he wondered who among them could even play old Lear. Odysseus No Man was the only face that seemed right. He wondered how No Man fared this day. Harmon turned his face upward and watched the rings turn in front of the stars, a beauty he had never appreciated as much as he did this terrible night. A bright streak brighter than the rest of the ring stars combined, a bold scratch against black onyx, moved across the pea ring and moved between the real stars before disappearing behind the breach wall on the south side. Harmon had no idea what it was. It lasted far too long to be a meteor, but he knew that it was so very, very far away that it could have nothing to do with him. Thinking of death and thinking of Shakespeare, not yet decided on which play to stage first, Harmon encountered these interesting lines stored deep in his DNA. It was Claudio speaking, Claudio from Measure for Measure, as the character confronted his own execution. Aye, but to die and go we know not where, to lie in cold obstruction and to rot. This sensible warm motion to become a kneaded clod, and the dilated spirit to bathe in fiery floods, or to reside in thrilling region of thick ribbed ice, to be imprisoned in the viewless winds, and blown with restless violence round about the pendant world, or to be worse than worst of those that lawless and in certain thought imagine howling. Tis too horrible. The weariest and most loathed worldly life that age, ache, penury, and imprisonment can lay on nature is a paradise to what we fear of death. Harmon realized that he was sobbing curled, cold, and sobbing, but not sobbing in fear of death or at the imminence of his own loss of everything and everyone, 
but weeping gratitude that he came from a race that could spawn a man who could write those words, think those thoughts. It almost, almost made up for the human thought that had conceived, designed, launched, and crewed the submarine behind him with its 768 black holes waiting to devour all futures for everyone. Suddenly Harmon laughed aloud. His mind had made its own leap to John Keats' Ode to a Nightingale, and he saw— he was not shown, but he saw on his own— the young Keats's nod in Shakespeare's direction, with the lines to the singing bird. Still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain, to thy high requiem become a sod. Three cheers for the alliance of Claudio's needed Claude and Johnny's earless sod, cried Harmon. A sudden attempt to speak made him cough again, and when he peered at his hand in ring light, he saw that he had coughed up red blood and three teeth. Harmon moaned, curled again in his womb of sand, shook, and had to smile again. His restless brain could no more quit poking at Shakespeare than his tongue could quit probing the three holes in his gums where his teeth had been. It was the couplet from Cymbeline that made Harmon smile. Golden lads and girls almost as chimney sweepers come to dust. He'd just gotten the pun. What kind of species of genius is it, wondered Harmon, that can put such a childish, playful pun in such a sad dirge? With that last thought, Harmon slipped sideways into a cold sleep, insensate to the cold rain that had begun to fall on him. He awoke. That was the first marvel. He opened his blood-caked eyes onto a gray, cold, gloomy pre-dawn morning with the still dark sea walls of the breach rising five hundred feet or more on either side. But he had slept, and now he waked. The second marvel was that he could move, eventually, and after a fashion. It took Harmon fifteen minutes to get to his hands and knees, but once there he crawled to the nearest boulder, rising out of the sand, and in another ten minutes managed to get to his feet and not quite fall again. Now he was ready to walk west again, but he did not know which way was west. He was completely turned around. The long breach stretched away from side to side, but there was no clue to which way was east and which was west. Shaking, shivering, aching in ways he could never have imagined he could ache, Harmon staggered in circles, hunting for his own footprints from the night before. But much of the seabed there was rock, and the rain that had almost frozen him to death had wiped away any traces of prints of his bare feet. Swaying, Harmon took four steps in one direction. Convinced he was heading back toward the submarine, he wheeled and took eight steps in the other direction. No use. Clouds hung low and solid above the breach opening. He had no sense of east or west. Harmon couldn't bear the thought of walking back toward the submarine with all that evil lying in its belly, of losing the distance he had made so laboriously yesterday toward Ada and Ardis. He staggered to the wall of the breach. He did not know now whether it was the north or south wall, and stared at his reflection in the slowly thickening pre-dawn glow. Some creature that was not Harmon stared back. His naked body already looked skeletal. There were patches of blood pooled under the skin everywhere, on his sunken cheeks, his chest, under the skin of his forearms, on his shaking legs, even a huge mottle on his lower belly. When he coughed again, two more teeth were expelled. It looked in the water's mirror as if he had been weeping tears of blood as if, in an attempt to tidy himself, he brushed his hair to one side. Harmon stared at his fist for a long, empty moment. A huge swatch of hair had come away in his hand. It was as if he were holding a small dead creature made up completely of hair. He dropped it, brushed at his head again, more hair came loose. Harmon looked at his reflection and saw the walking dead, already one-third bald. Warmth touched his back. Harmon whirled and almost fell. It was the sun rising directly in the aperture of the breach behind him. The sun rising perfectly in the keyhole of the breach. 
its golden rays bathing him in warmth in the few seconds before the clouds swallowed the orange sphere. What were the chances that the sun would rise directly down the breach on this particular morning, as if he were a druid waiting at Stonehenge for the equinox sunrise? Harmon felt so lightheaded that he knew he'd forget which direction the sun had risen from if he did not act immediately. Aiming in the opposite direction of the warmth on his back, he began staggering west again. By midday, the clouds parted between rain showers and gave hints of sunlight. Harmon's mind no longer felt connected to his staggering body. He was taking twice as many steps as he had to, staggering from the north wall of the breach to the south wall, having to set his hands lightly against the buzz jolt of the force field itself to set himself moving again down the endless trough. He was wondering as he walked at what the future might be, or might have been, for his people. Not just the survivors of Ardis, but for all the old-style humans who might have survived the vicious Voynix attacks. Now that the old world was gone forever, what form of government, of religion, of society, culture, politics might they have created? A protein memory module nestled deep in Harmon's encoded DNA. A memory that would not die until long after most of the other cells in Harmon's body had died and come apart offered him this fragment from Antonio Gramsci's prison notebooks. The crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum a great variety of morbid symptoms appears. Harmon laughed aloud, and the single bark of a laugh cost him another front tooth. Morbid symptoms indeed. The slightest scan of the context of that fragment told Harmon that this Gramsci had been an intellectual promoting revolution, socialism, and communism. The last two theories having died and rotted away less than halfway through the lost era, abandoned for the naive bullshit they were. But the problem of interregnums certainly had remained, and now here it was again. He realized that Ada had been leading her people towards some sort of crude Athenian democracy in the weeks and months before Harmon had stupidly left his expecting beloved. They had never discussed it, but he was aware of her recognition that the four hundred people in the artist community then—this was before the slaughter by Voynix he'd seen via the red turn cloth on the Eiffelbahn—turned to her for leadership, and she hated that role even as she fell into it naturally. By deferring things to constant votes, Ada was obviously trying to establish the basis for a future democracy should artists survive. But if the Red Terran had given him true images, and Harmon believed it had, artists as a real community had not survived. Four hundred people made up a community. Fifty-four ragged, starved survivors did not. The radiation seemed to have sheared off much of the lining of Harmon's throat, and every time he swallowed now he coughed up blood. This was a distraction. He tried to slow the pace of his swallowing to once every tenth step he took. His right hand, chin, and chest, he knew, were smeared with blood. It would have been interesting seeing what social and political structures his race would have evolved. Perhaps the population, even before the Voynix attacks, had— at a mere one hundred thousand men and women, never been sufficient to generate real dynamics, such as politics or religious ceremonies, or armies or social hierarchies. But Harmon didn't believe this. He saw in his many protein memory banks the examples of Athens, Sparta, and the Greek entities long before Athens and Sparta ascended. The Terran drama, what he now clearly saw as Homer's Iliad, had borrowed its heroes from kingdoms as small as Odysseus' Isle of Ithaca. Thinking of the Turin drama, he remembered the altar quickly glimpsed on their trip to Paris Crater a year ago just after Demon was eaten by a dinosaur. It had been dedicated to one of the Olympian gods, although he forgot right then which one. The posthumans had served, at least for the last millennium and a half, as his people's substitute for gods or a god, but what shapes and ceremonies would the future need for belief take? The future. Armand paused, panting, 
leaned against a shoulder-high black rock jutting out of the north wall of the breach and tried to think about the future. His legs were shaking violently. It was as if his leg muscles were dissolving as he watched. Panting, forcing breaths through his closing, bleeding throat, Harmon stared ahead and blinked. The sun was perched just above the cleft of the breach. For a terrible second, Harmon thought that it was still sunrise and that he had walked the wrong direction after all, but then he realized that he had been walking in a stupor all day. The sun had descended from the clouds and was preparing to set at the end of the long hallway of the breach. Harmon took two more steps forward and fell on his face. This time he could not rise. It took all of his energy to prop himself up on his right elbow to watch the sunset. His mind was very clear. He no longer thought about Shakespeare or Keats or religions or heaven or death or politics or democracy. Harmon thought about his friends. He saw Hannah laughing on the day of the metal pour by the river, remembered the specifics of her youthful energy and the glee of her friends as they poured the first bronze artifact created in how many thousand years. He saw Pater sparring with Odysseus during the days the bearded Greek warrior would hold forth with his long statements of philosophy and odd question-and-answer periods on the grassy hill behind Ardis. There had been much energy and joy in those sessions. Harmon remembered Savi's husky, cynical voice and her huskier laugh. He perfectly recalled their cheering and shouting when Savi had driven Demon and him out of Jerusalem in the crawler, with thousands of Voiniks chasing to no avail. And he saw his friend Demon's face as if through two lenses, the pudgy, self-absorbed boy-man from when Harmon first met him, and the lean, serious version, a man to be trusted with one's life, whom he'd last seen a few weeks ago on the day Harmon left Ardis in the Sony. And as the sun entered the breach so perfectly that its outer curves just touched the breach wall, Harmon smiled to think of a hissing steam sound rising and actually thought he heard one through his failing ears. Harmon thought of Ada. He thought of her eyes and smile and soft voice. He remembered her laugh and touch and the last time they had been together in bed. Harmon allowed himself to remember how, when they turned away from one another as sleep came on, they also soon would curve against the other for warmth, Ada against his back, her right arm around him, himself later in the night against Ada's back and perfect backside, a bit of excitement stirring in him even as he drifted off to sleep, his left arm around her, his left hand cupping her breast. Harmon realized that his eyelids were so caked with blood that he could not really blink, could not really shut his eyes. The setting sun, the bottom of it already below the breach horizon, was burning red and orange echoes into his retina. It didn't matter. He knew that after this sunset he would never need to use his eyes again. So he concentrated on holding his beloved Ada in his mind and heart, and on watching the last half of the sun's disk disappear directly to his west. Something moved and blocked the last of the sunset. For several seconds, Harmon's dying mind could not process that information. Something had moved into his field of vision and blocked his view of the last of the sunset. Still propped on his right elbow, he used the back of his left hand to rub some of the caked blood from his eyes. Something was standing in the breach not twenty feet west of Harmon. It must have come through the breach wall of water there on the north side. The thing was about the size of an eight- or nine-year-old child and was shaped more or less like a human child, but it wore a strange suit of metal and plastic. Harmon saw a black visor where the little boy's eyes should be. On the verge of death, as the brain shuts down from lack of oxygen, an unsummoned protein memory molecule prompted him, Hallucinations are not uncommon. Thus the frequent tales from resuscitated victims of a long tunnel ending in a bright light, and... Fuck that, thought Harmon. He was staring down a long tunnel toward a bright light, although only the top rim of the sun remained, and both walls of the breach were alive with light, silver, bright, mirrored surfaces with millions of facets of dancing light. 
but the boy in the plastic and metal red and black suit was real. And as Harmon stared, something larger and stranger forced itself out through the north wall of the breach. The force field is semi-permeable only to human beings and what they wear, thought Harmon. But this second apparition was nowhere near human. It was about twice the size of the largest droshki, but looked more like a giant robotic crab monster with its big pincer claws and many metal legs and its huge pitted carapace now pouring water off it in loud rivulets. No one told me that the last minutes before death would be so visually amusing, thought Harmon. The little boy figure stepped closer. It spoke in English, its voice soft and rather boylike, perhaps sounding much like Harmon's future son might sound. Sir, it said, can you use some assistance? 87. It was just after sunrise, and 50,000 Voiniks were attacking from all directions. Ada paused to look back at the pit where the shredded corpse of the Setabas spawn still lay. Demon touched her arm. Don't feel bad. We had to kill it sooner or later. She shook her head. I don't feel the least bit sorry, she said. The Grayogi and Hannah, she shouted, get the sky raft up. Too late. More than half the survivors had panicked at the scuttling roar of the Voynich's attack. The creatures were still invisible in the forest, but the two-mile radius must have been cut in half by now. They'd be at Ardis in less than a minute. No, no, shouted Ada, as thirty people in their panic tried to fit aboard the slowly lifting sky raft. Hannah was at the controls, trying to keep it at a steady three-foot hover, but more people were trying to clamber aboard. Take it up, shouted Demon. Hannah, take it up now. Too late, the heavy machine let out a mechanical whine, dipped to its right and crashed to the ground, sending people flying. Ada and Demon ran to the fallen machine. Hannah looked up with a stricken face. It won't start again. Something's broken. Never mind, Ada said, her voice calm. It would never have made even one trip to the island. She squeezed Hannah's shoulder and raised her voice. Everyone to the walls, now! Bring every weapon in the compound. Our best chance is to break their first charge. She turned and ran to the west wall, and a minute later the others began to do the same, choosing empty spots in the now circular palisade. Everyone followed Ada's example of carrying at least two flechette rifles and a crossbow, along with a heavy canvas bag of magazines and bolts. Ada settled herself into a firing niche and discovered the demon was still beside her. Good, he said. She nodded, although she had no idea what he was really saying to her. Working very carefully in no rush, Ada slapped in a fresh magazine, clicked off the safety, and aimed the rifle at the tree line no more than two hundred yards away. The rushing, hissing, clacking noise made by the approaching Voynix grew deafening, and Ada found she had to resist the urge to drop her rifle and cover her ears. Her heart was pounding, and she was feeling slightly nauseated, almost the way she'd felt earlier in her pregnancy. But she did not feel afraid, not yet. All those years of the Turin drama, she said, not realizing that she was speaking aloud. What? said Demon, leaning closer to hear. She shook her head. I was just thinking about the Turin drama. According to Harmon, Odysseus said that he and Savi started that distributing the Turin cloths ten years ago, I mean. Maybe the idea was to teach us how to die with courage. I'd rather they'd given us something to teach us how to win a fight against 50,000 fucking Voynichs, said Demon. He clicked back the activation bolt on his rifle. Ada laughed. The little noise was drowned out by the roar as the Voynichs broke free of the forest, some leaping from tree branches even as others scuttled beneath the leapers a gray wall of carapaces and claws rushing at them at fifty or sixty miles an hour. There were so many of them this time that Ada had trouble making out individual Voynich's bodies in the rising and falling mass. She looked over her shoulder and saw the same nightmare coming at them from all sides as the tens of thousands of Voynich's narrowed the radius at full speed. No one yelled fire, but suddenly everyone was shooting. Ada grinned in the grip of a sort of ferocious terror as the flechette rifle emptied its first magazine in a series of hard stutters against her shoulder. She let the ammunition clip drop free and slapped a fresh one in. 
the flechettes struck by the thousands, crystal facets gleaming in the rising sun, but the hits seemed to make no difference. Voinix must be dropping, but there were so many thousands still leaping, scuttling, jumping, running, scrambling, that Ada couldn't even see the wounded and dead ones fall. The gray-silver wall of death had covered half the distance from the woods in a few seconds, and the things would be over the low palisade walls in another few seconds. Demon may have been the first to go over the wall. Ada couldn't swear to it, since it seemed to be an almost simultaneous decision. Grabbing up one weapon and screaming, he jumped from the parapet, vaulted over the tops of the logs, landed, rolled, and began rushing toward the Voinix. Ada laughed and wept. Suddenly it was the most important thing in the world to her that she'd join in that charge. The most important thing in the world to die attacking this mindless, vicious, stupid, programmed-for-murder enemy, and not wait here behind wood walls to be killed cowering. Absurdly taking care because she was, after all, five months pregnant, Ada jumped, rolled, got to her feet, and rushed after Demon, firing as she ran. She heard a familiar voice screaming to her left, and she turned just long enough to see Hannah and Edide running not far behind, stopping to shoot, then running again. She could see the humps on the gray carapaced Voynich bodies now. They were covering twenty or twenty-five feet at a leap, their killing claws extended. Ada ran and fired. She no longer knew that she was screaming or what words she might be screaming. Briefly, very briefly, she summoned an image of Harmon and tried to send a message his direction. I'm sorry, my darling, sorry about the baby. But then she paid attention only to running and firing, and the gray forms were almost on them, rising above them like a silver-gray tidal wave. The explosions threw Ada ten feet back and burned off her eyebrows. Men and women were lying all around her, thrown backward with her, too stunned to speak or rise. Some were trying to put out flames on their clothing. Some were unconscious. The artist's compound was encircled by a wall of flame that rose fifty, eighty, a hundred feet into the air. A second wave of Voynichs appeared, running and leaping through the flames. More explosions erupted along this line of running gray-silver figures. Ada blinked as she watched carapaces and claws, legs and humps flying in every direction. Then Demon was pulling her to her feet. He was panting, his face blistered from flash burns. Ada, we have to get back to... Ada pulled her arm free and stared up at the sky. There were five flying machines in the air above the artist's clearing, and none of them were Sony's. Four smaller bat-winged devices were dropping canisters toward the tree line, while a much larger winged machine was descending toward the center of their palisaded compound. The palisade walls mostly tumbled inward now from the multiple explosions. Suddenly cables dropped from the bat-winged shapes, and black, humanoid but not human shapes whizzed down the lines, hitting the ground faster than a human could, and running to establish a perimeter. When some of these tall black forms ran past Ada, she saw that they were not humans, nor even humans in combat armor of some sort, but taller creatures, strangely jointed, covered with barbs, thorns, and a chitinous ebony armor. More Voinix came through the flames. The black figures between her and the Voinix had gone to one knee and raised weapons that looked too heavy for human beings to lift. The guns suddenly exploded into action. Chugga-chink, gugga-chugga-gink, sounding like some chain-driven cutting machine, while pulses of pure blue energy raked the oncoming ranks of Voinix. Wherever a blue pulse struck, the Voinix exploded. Demon was pulling her back toward the compound. What? she shouted over the din. What? He shook his head. Either he couldn't hear her or didn't know the answer himself. Another round of explosions knocked all the retreating humans down again. This time the mushrooms of flame rose two or three hundred feet into the cold morning air. All of the trees to the west and east of Ardis were burning. Voynix leaped through the flames. The chitinous black soldiers shot them down by the score, then by the hundreds. Then one of the black things was looming over her. It reached out a long barbed arm and extended a hand that seemed more black claws than hand. Ada Ohr, 
it said in a calm, deep voice. I am Centurion Leader Mapahu. Your husband needs you. My squad and I will accompany you back to the compound. The large ship had landed next to the pit. This flying machine was too large for the palisade and had knocked down most of the rest of the wooden wall on its landing. It stood on high, multiply jointed metal legs and some sort of bay doors had opened in its belly. Harmon was on a litter on the ground with several different creatures huddled around it. Ada ignored the creatures and ran to Harmon. Her beloved's head was on a pillow, and his body had been covered by a blanket, but Ada had to thrust her palm in her mouth to keep from screaming. His face was ravaged, cheeks hollow, gums all but empty of teeth. His eyes were bleeding, his lips had cracked until they looked as if something had chewed them to bits. His bare forearms were visible above the blanket, and Ada could see the pooled blood under the skin, red skin that was sloughing off as if he had received the world's worst sunburn. Demon, Hannah, Greogi, and others were huddled near her. She took Harmon's hand, felt the slightest pressure, and returned to her soft squeezing. The dying man on the litter tried to focus his cataract-covered eyes on her, tried to speak. He could only cough blood. A small humanoid figure, wrapped in red and black metal and plastic, spoke to her. You are Ada? Yes. She did not turn to look at the machine boy. Her gaze was just for Harmon. He managed to say your name and give us the coordinates for this place. We're sorry we didn't find him earlier. What, she began, and did not know what to ask. One of the machine things nearby was huge. It was delicately holding an intravenous bottle that fed something into Harmon's emaciated arm. He received a lethal dose of radiation, said the boy-sized figure in its soft voice, almost certainly from a submarine he encountered in the Atlantic breach. Submarine, thought Ada. The word meant nothing to her. We're sorry, but we simply don't have the medical facilities for human beings in this condition said the little person machine. We called the hornets down from the Queen Mab when we saw your problems here, and they brought painkillers, more intravenous bottles, but we can do nothing for the radiation damage itself. Ada didn't really understand anything the little person was saying. She held Harmon's hand with both of hers and felt him dying. Harmon coughed. Obviously he could not make the speech sounds he was trying to make. Coughed again and tried to pull his hand away. Ada clung, but the dying man was insistent, pulling. She realized that the pressure of her grip must be hurting him. She released his hand. I'm sorry, my darling. Behind them, more explosions, farther away now. The bat-shaped flying machines were firing into the surrounding forests with that constant chain-rattling noise. The tall, chitinous troopers ran back and forth through the camp, some administering aid to slightly injured human beings, mostly for flashburns. Harmon did not pull his right hand back, but held it up toward her face. Ada tried to hold his hand again, but he batted her hand away with his left hand. She kept her hand still and let him touch her neck, her cheek. He laid the palm flat against her forehead, then used all of his strength to mold his hand to her skull, clutching at her almost desperately. Before she could even think to pull away, it began. Nothing, not even the explosion that had just thrown her ten feet backward through the air, had ever struck Ada as this did. First, there was Harmon's clear voice. It's all right, my love, my darling, relax. It's all right. I must give you this gift while I can. And then everything around Ada disappeared, except for the pressure from her beloved's damaged hand and bleeding fingers, pouring images into her. Not just to her mind, but filling her with words— Memories, images, pictures, data, more memories, functions, quotes, books, entire volumes, more books, more memories. His love for her, his thoughts about her and their child. His love, more information, more voices and names and dates and thoughts and facts and ideas and... Ada, Ada? Tom was kneeling over her, splashing water on her face while he gently slapped her face. Hannah, Demon, and others knelt nearby. Harmon had dropped his arm. 
The little metal plastic person still fussed over Harmon, but her darling looked dead. Ada stood. Demon, Hannah, come here, lean close. What? asked Hannah. Ada shook her head, no time to explain, no time to do anything but share. Trust me, she said. She reached out her left and right hands, gripped Demon's forehead with her left hand, Hannah's with her right, and activated the sharing function. It took no more than thirty seconds, no more than the time it had taken for Harmon to share the functions and essential data with her, the data he'd spent the hours of his walk west in the breach compartmentalizing, preparing for transmission. But the thirty seconds seemed like thirty eternities to Ada. If she could have done the next part alone, she wouldn't have bothered, wouldn't have taken the time, not even if the future of the human race depended on it. But she couldn't do the next part alone. She needed one person to continue the sharing and one person to help her try to save Harmon. It was done. All three, Ada, Deem, and Hannah, fell to their knees, eyes closed. What is it? asked Ceres. Someone ran shouting into the compound. It was one of their volunteers at the pavilion a mile and a quarter away. The fax node was working. Just as the Voinics were closing in there, shouted the messenger, the fax node had come alive. There's no time for the fax pavilion, thought Ada, and nowhere to go among the numbered fax nodes either. Everywhere the humans were in retreat or under direct attack. There was no other place on a known node where her darling could be saved. The large creature that looked like some sort of giant metallic horseshoe crab was rumbling in English. There are human rejuvenation tanks in orbit, it was saying, but the only tanks we know about for certain are on Sycorax's orbital asteroid, and it just passed the moon under full thrust. We're sorry we don't know any other. It doesn't matter, said Ada, kneeling next to Harmon again. She touched his forearm. There was no reaction, but she could feel the last embers of life in him, his biomonitors speaking to her new biometric functions. She was madly sorting through all the thousands of Freefax nodes, the Freefax function procedures itself. There were the post-human storage depots in the Mediterranean basin. They had medicines even for such radiation death, but the depots were sealed in stasis, and Ada saw from the all-net monitors that the hands of Hercules had slowly disappeared, refilling the Mediterranean. She would need machines, submersibles, to get to the depots there. Too long. There were other post-storage areas on the steppes of China, near the dry valley in Antarctica, but all would take too long to reach, and the medical procedures were too complicated. Harmon wouldn't live long enough to— Ada grabbed Demon's arm, pulled him down next to her. The man seemed dazed, transfixed. All the new functions, he said. Ada shook him. Tell me again what the Moira ghost said. What? Even his stare was unfocused. Demon, tell me again what the Moira ghost said to you on the day that we voted on letting no man leave. Was it remember? Tell me. Ah, she said. Remember no man's coffin was no man's coffin, he said. How can that? No, cried Ada. The second no man was meant to be two words. No man's coffin was no man's coffin. Hannah, you waited while that sarcophagus at the Golden Gate at Machu Picchu cured Odysseus. You've been to the bridge more often than any of us. Will you go with me? Will you try? Hannah took only a second to understand what her friend was asking. Yes, she said. Demon, said Ada, rushing not only against time but against death, who was already among them, who already was holding Harmon in his dark claws. You need to do the sharing with everyone here, at once. Yes, said Demon moving away quickly, calling others to him. The Moravec troopers, Ada knew them all now by form, if not by name, were still firing around the perimeter, still killing the last of the attacking Voiniks. Not one Voinix had gotten through. Hannah said Ada, we'll need the litter, but if it doesn't free fax, put Harmon's blanket over your shoulder. We'll use that if we have to. Hey, cried the small European Moravac when Hannah roughly pulled the blanket off their dying human patient. He needs that. He was shivering. Ada touched the little Moravec's arm, felt the humanity and soul even through the metal and plastic. It's all right, she said at last. She pulled its name, his name, from his cybernetic memory. Friend Monmouth, 
It's all right, she said. We know what we're doing. After all this time, we finally know what we're doing. She gestured for the others to stand back. Hannah knelt on one side of the litter, one of her hands on Harmon's shoulder, the other on the metal handle of the litter itself. Ada did the same on her side. I think we just visualized that main room, the one where we met Odysseus and the coordinates come to us, said Ada. It's important that we've both been there. Yes, said Hannah. On the count of three, said Ada. One, two, three. Both women, the litter, and Harmon winked out of existence. Even though the dying Harmon looked as if he weighed nothing, it took all of their strength for the two women to carry him and the litter from the main museum area of the Golden Gate Bridge at Machu Picchu, down several flights of stairs, through the green bubble, into the sarcophagus area, past Savi's old-time sarcophagus, and down the final flight of curved stairs to Odysseus' no man's coffin. Ada's palm could find only the slightest flicker of living response when she set her hand against her beloved's ravaged chest, but she did not waste more time in searching for life. On the count of three again, she panted. Hannah nodded. One, two, three. They gently lifted the naked Harmon out of the litter and lowered his body into no man's coffin. Hannah pulled the lid down and snapped it shut. How do you— began Ada in a panic. She could interrogate all the various machinery here. Her new functions told her that, but it would take too long. Here, said Hannah. No man showed me after he revived. Her sculptor's fingers tapped a series of glowing virtual buttons. The old-style human functions interacted with the crash controls. The coffin sighed, then began to hum. A mist flowed into the sleeping chamber through unseen vents and hid most of Harmon's body from view. Ice crystals formed on the clear cover. Several new lights came on, one winked red. Oh, said Hannah. Her voice was very small. No, said Ada. Her tone was calm but firm. No, no, no. She set her palm across the plastic control nexus of the coffin as if she were reasoning with the machine. The red light winked, changed to amber, switched back to red. No, Ada said firmly. The red light wavered, dimmed, switched to amber, stayed amber. Hannah's and Ada's fingers met briefly above the coffin, and then Ada returned her palm to the glowing curve of the A.I. nexus. The amber light stayed on. Several hours later, as late afternoon clouds moved in to obscure first the ruins of Machu Picchu, and then the roadway of the suspension bridge six hundred feet below them, Ada said, Hannah, free fax back to Ardis, get some food, rest. Hannah shook her head. Ada smiled. Then at least head up to the dining area and get us some fruit or something, water. The amber light burned all that afternoon. Just after sundown, as the Andes valleys were bathed in Alpen glow, Demon, Tom, and Ceres free-faxed in, but they stayed only a few moments. We've already reached thirty of the other communities, Demon said to Ada. She nodded, but her gaze never left the amber light. The others eventually faxed away with promises to return in the morning. Hannah pulled the blanket around her and fell asleep there on the floor next to the coffin. Ada remained sometimes kneeling, sometimes sitting, but always thinking and always with her palm on the coffin control nexus, always sending word of her presence and her prayers through the circuits separating her and her harmon, and always with her eyes on the amber monitor light. Sometime after 3 a.m. local time, the amber light turned to green. Part 4 88 one week after the fall of Ilium, Achilles and Penthesilea appeared on the empty ridge line that rose between the plain of the Scamander and the plain of the Simois. As Hephaestus promised, there were two horses waiting, a powerful black stallion for the Achaean and a shorter but even more muscular white mare for the Amazon. The two mounted to inspect what was left. There was not much left. How can an entire city like Ilium disappear, said Penthesilea, her voice as contentious as always. 
All cities disappear, said Achilles. It is their fate. The Amazon snorted. Achilles had already noted that the blonde human female snort was similar to that of her white mares. They aren't supposed to disappear in a day, an hour. The comment sounded like a complaint, a lament. Only two days after Penthesilea's resurrection from the healer's tanks, Achilles was getting used to that constant tone of complaint. For half an hour they allowed their horses to pick their way through the jumble of rock that stretched for two miles along the ridge line that once had held mighty Troy. Not a single foundation stone was left. The divine magic that had taken Troy had sheared it off almost a foot beneath the earliest stones of the city. Not so much as a dropped spear or rotting carcass had been left behind. Zeus is powerful indeed, said Penthesilea. Achilles sighed and shook his head. The day was warm. Spring was coming. I've told you, Amazon, Zeus did not do this. Zeus is dead by my own hand. This is the work of Hephaestus. The woman snorted. I'll never believe that little bum-buggering bad-breathed cripple could do something like this. I don't even believe he's a real god. He did this, said Achilles. With Nix's help, he mentally added. So you say, son of Peleus. I told you not to call me that. I am no longer son of Peleus. I was Zeus's son. No credit to him or me. So you say, said Penthesilea, which would make you a father killer if your boasts are true. Yes, said Achilles. And I never boast. Both Amazon and her white mare snorted in unison. Achilles kicked the ribs of his black stallion and led them down off the ridge along the rutted south road that had led from the Sean Gate. The stump of the great oak tree that had always grown there since the creation of the city remained. But the great gates were gone, and then right again onto the plain of the Scamander that separated the city from the beach. If this sad Hephaestus is now king of the gods, said Penthesilea, her voice as loud and irritating as fingernails on a flat slate rock, why was he hiding in his cave the whole time we were on Olympus? I told you. He's waiting for the war between the gods and the titans to end. If he's the successor to Zeus, why in Hades doesn't he just end it himself by commanding the lightning and the thunder? Achilles said nothing. Sometimes he had discovered if he said nothing she would shut up. The Scamander plane, worn smooth over its eleven years as a battlefield, looked as if the ground had not been sheared. There were still the prints of thousands of sandaled men here, and blood dried on the rocks, but all living human beings, horses, chariots, weapons, corpses, and other artifacts, had disappeared, even as Hephaestus had described it to Achilles. Even the tents of the Achaeans and the burned hulks of their black ships were gone. Achilles allowed their horses to rest on the beach for a few minutes, and both man and Amazon watched the limpid waves of the Aegean roll up on the empty sand. Achilles would never tell the wolf bitch next to him this, but his heart ached at the thought that he would never see his comrades in arms again. Crafty Odysseus, booming big Ajax, the smiling archer Teucer, his faithful Myrmidons, even stupid red-headed Menelaus and his scheming brother, Achilles' nemesis, Agamemnon, it was strange, Achilles thought, how even one's enemies become so important when they are lost to you. With that, he thought of Hector and of the things Hephaestus had told him about the Iliad, about Achilles' own other future, and this caused the despair to rise in him like bile. He turned his horse's head south and drank from the goat skin of wine tied to the pommel. And don't think I will ever believe that the bearded crippled god actually had the ability to make us married, groused Penthesilea from behind him. That was a load of horse cobblers. He's king of all gods, Achilles said tiredly. Who better to sanctify our wedding vows? He can sanctify my ass, said Penthesilea. Are we leaving? Why are we heading southeast? What's this way? Why are we leaving the battlefield? Achilles said nothing until he reined his horse to a halt fifteen minutes later. Do you see this river, woman? Of course I see it. Do you think I'm blind? It's just the lousy scamander, too thick to drink, too thin to plow. Brother of the river's Simois, 
which it joins just a few miles upstream. Here, at this river we call the Scamander, and which the gods call the Holy Xanthes, said Achilles. Here, according to Hephaestus, who quotes my biographer Homer, I would have had my greatest Aristea. The combat that would have made me immortal even before I slew Hector. Here, woman, I would have fought the entire Trojan army single-handed, and the swollen, God-raised river itself, and cried to the heavens, Die, Trojans, die, till I butcher all the way to sacred Troy. Right there, woman. Do you see where those low rapids run? Right there I would have slain in a blur of kills Thersilicus, Mydon, Astyplus, Nisus, Thracius, Aeneas, and Ophelestes. And then the Peonians would have fallen on me from the rear, and I would have killed them all as well. And there, across the river on the Trojan side, I would have killed the ambidextrous Asteropaeus, my one Pelian ash spear cast to his two. We both miss, but I hack the hero down with my sword while he's trying to wrest my great spear from the river bank to cast again. Achilles stopped. Penthesilea had dismounted and gone behind a bush to urinate. The crude sound of her making water made him want to kill the Amazon then and there and leave her body to the carrion crows that roosted on the creosote bushes' branches near the river. The vulture's daily feed of dead flesh evidently had disappeared, and Achilles hated to leave them disappointed. But he could not hurt the Amazon. Aphrodite's love spell still worked on him, leaving his love for this bitch coiling in his gut, as nausea-making as a bronze-tipped spear through the bowels. Your only hope is that the pheromones may wear off in time, Hephaestus had said when they were both drunk on wine that last night in the cave, toasting each other and everyone they knew, raising the big two-handled cups and confiding in each other in the way only brothers or drunks can do. When the Amazon was remounted, Achilles led the way across the Scamander, the horses stepping carefully. The water was no more than knee-deep at its deepest. He turned south. Where are we going? demanded Penthesilea. Why are we leaving this place? What do you have in mind? Do I get a vote on this, or will it always be the mighty Achilles deciding every little thing? Don't think I'll follow you blindly, son of Peleus. I may not follow you at all. We're hunting for Patroclus. Achilles said without turning in his saddle. What? We're hunting for Patroclus. Your friend? That queer boy fruit friend of yours? Patroclus is dead. Athena killed him. You saw it and said so yourself. You started a war with the gods because of it. Hephaestus says that Patroclus is alive, said Achilles. His hand was on the hilt of his sword, his knuckles white, but he did not draw the weapon. Hephaestus says that he did not include Patroclus in the blue beam when he gathered up all the others on earth, nor when he sent Ilium away forever. Patroclus is alive and out there somewhere over the sea, and we shall find him. It shall be my quest. Oh, well, Hephaestus says, jeered the Amazon. Whatever Hephaestus says has to be true now, doesn't it? The ruddy, crippled bastard couldn't be lying to you now, could he? Achilles said nothing. He was following the old road south along the coast, this road that had been trod by so many Trojan-bred horses over the centuries, and followed north more recently by so many of the Trojan allies he'd helped to kill. And Patroclus out there alive somewhere over the sea, parodied Penthesilea. Just how in Hades' name are we supposed to get over the sea, son of Peleus? And which sea, anyway? We'll find a ship, said Achilles, without turning to look back at her, or build one. Someone snorted, either the Amazon or her mare. She'd obviously stopped following him. Achilles heard only his own horse's shoes on stone, and she raised her voice so that he could hear her. What are we now, bleeding shipbuilders? Do you know how to build a ship, oh fleet-footed man-killer? I doubt it. You're good at being fleet-footed and at killing men. And Amazons, who are twice your better, not at building anything. I bet you've never built anything in your useless life, have you? Have you? Those calluses I see are from holding spears and wine goblets, not from... 
son of Peleus, are you listening to me? Achilles had ridden fifty feet on. He did not look back. Penthesilea's huge white mare stood where she had reined her in, but it now pawed the ground in confusion, wanting to join the stallion ahead. Achilles, damn you, don't just assume that I'm going to follow you. You don't even know where you're going, do you? Admit it. Achilles rode on, his eyes fixed on the hazy line of hills on the horizon line near the sea far, far, far to the south. He was getting a terrible headache. Don't just take it for granted that God's damn you, shouted Penthesilea as Achilles and his stallion kept moving slowly away. A hundred yards now. The bastard son of Zeus did not look back. One of the vultures on the shrub tree by the holy Xanthes flapped its way into the sky, circling the now empty battlefield once, its kin of the eagle eye noting that not even the ashes of the corpse fires, usually a place to find a midday morsel, remained. The vulture flapped south. It circled three thousand feet over the two living horses and human beings, the only ground-living things visible as far as the far-seeing carrion bird could see, and, ever hopeful, it decided to follow them. Far below, the white horse and its human burden remained unmoving, while the black horse and its man clopped south. The vulture watched, hearing but ignoring the unpleasant noises the rearward human was making as the white horse was suddenly spurred into motion and galloped to catch up. Together, the white horse trailing only slightly, the two horses and two humans headed south along the curve of the Aegean and, lazing easily on the strong thermals of the warming afternoon, the vulture followed hopefully. 89. Nine days after the fall of Ilium, General Bey bin Adi personally led the attack on Paris Crater, using the dropship as his command center, while more than three hundred of his best Beltvec troopers roped and repellered down into the Blue Ice Hive City from six Hornet fighters. General Bin Adi had not been in favor of joining this fight on Earth. His advice had been to choose no one's side, but the Prime Integrators had decided and their decision was final. His job was to find and destroy the creature named Setabas, General Binondi's advice, then, had been to nuke the Blue Ice Cathedral above Paris Crater from orbit. It was the only way to be sure to get the Setabus thing, he'd explained, but the Prime Integrators had rejected his advice. Millennium leader Mapahu led the primary assault team. After the other ten teams had roped down and blasted through the outer surface of the Blue Iced City, establishing a perimeter and confirming it over tactical comm, the thing could not escape now. Mapahu and his twenty-five picked Rockvec troopers jumped from the primary Hornet hovering at three thousand meters, activated their repellers at just the last second, used shaped charges to blow a hole in the roof of the Blue Ice Cathedral Dome, and roped in. Their fast lines anchored from pitons driven into the Blue Ice itself. It's empty, radioed Millennium leader Mapahu. No set of boss. General Bin Adi could see that himself on the images sent back from the 26 troopers' nanotransmitters and suit cams. Grid and search, he commanded on the prime tactical band. Reports were coming in now from all perimeter teams. The blue ice itself was rotten. A fist could collapse an entire tunnel wall. The tunnels and corridors had already begun to collapse. Mapahu's team returned to repeller flight and flew their grid search in the cavernous central place over the ancient black hole crater itself. They started high, making sure that nothing was hiding in one of the blue ice balconies or high crevices, but soon were swooping low over the fumaroles and abandoned secondary nests. The main nest has collapsed, reported Mapahu on the common tactical channel. Fallen into the old black hole crater, I'm sending images. We see them, replied General Bey Bin Adi. Is there any chance the Setabus creature could be in the black hole vent itself? Negative, sir. We're deep radaring the crater now, and it goes all the way to magma. No side vents or caverns. I think it's gone, sir. Cho Li's voice came over the common band. It confirms our theory that the quantum event of four days ago was an opening of a final brain hole in the Blue Ice Cathedral itself. 
Let's be sure, said General Bey Binadi. On the tactical command tight beam, he sent to Mapahu. Check all nests. Affirmative. Six rock vex from Mapahu's primary assault force checked the collapsed ruins of Setabas's central nest, then fanned out, repellering above the collapsing cathedral floor to look at each decaying fumarole and sagging nest. Suddenly there was a cry from one of the perimeter teams that had just penetrated to the central dome. Something written here, sir! Half a dozen other troopers, including Millennium leader Mapahu, converged on the point high on the south wall of the dome. There was a terrace there, where the largest corridor entered the dome, and in the wall of the dome, where the corridor widened into the so-called cathedral, something or someone had written in the blue ice using what appeared to be fingernails or claws. Thinketh the quiet comes? His dam holds that the quiet made all things which set a bus vexes only, but he holds not so. Who made them weak meant weakness he might vex. But thinketh why then is Setebos here then vexed to flight? Thinketh can strength ever be vexed to flight by weakness? Thinketh is he the only one after all? The quiet comes. Caliban, said Prime Integrator Astig Che from the Queen Mab in its new geosynchronous orbit. Sir, Tunnels and caverns all checked and reported empty, came a centurion leader's report on the common tactical channel. Very good, said General Bey Binadi. Prepare to use the thermite charges to melt the whole blue ice complex down to the original Paris crater ruins. Make sure none of the original structures will be damaged. We'll search them next. Something here, said Mepahu on the tactical tight beam. The images flowing into the dropship monitors showed the troopers' chest searchlights falling on a tumbled fumarole nest. All of the eggs in that nest had burst open or collapsed inward, all except one. The millennium leader repellered down, crouched next to the egg, set his black-gloved hands on the thing, then set his head against it, actually listening. "'I think there's something still alive in here, sir,' reported Mapahu. "'Orders?' Stand by, barked General Bey Binanti. On his tight beam to the Queen Mab, he said, Orders? Stand by, said the bridge officer, speaking for the Prime Integrators. Finally, Prime Integrator Astig Che came on the line. What is your advice, General? Burn it. Burn everything there, twice. Thank you, General. One second, please. There was a silence broken only by slight static. Binadi could hear the breathing of his 310 troopers over their suit microphones. We would like the egg to be collected, Prime Integrator Astig Che said at last. Use one of the stasis cubes if feasible. Hornet 9 should shuttle it up. Have Millennium Leader Mapahu stay with the egg on Hornet 9. We shall use the Queen Mab itself as a quarantine laboratory. The Mab has divested itself of all weapons and fissionable material. The stealthed attack cruisers will monitor our study of the egg. General Bey Binadi was silent a few seconds and then said, Very well. He opened the tight beam to Millennium Leader Mapahu and relayed the orders. The team in the Blue Ice Cathedral already had a stasis cube ready. Mapahu said, are you sure about this, sir? We know from Ada and the artist survivors what their Setabas baby was capable of. Even the unhatched egg had some power. I doubt if Setabas left one viable egg behind by accident. Implement the orders, said General Bey Binadi on the common tactical band. Then he opened his private tight beam to Mapahu and sent, And good luck, son. Ninety. Six months after the fall of Ilium, on the ninth of Av. Demon was in charge of the raid on Jerusalem. It had been carefully planned. One hundred fully functioned old-style humans free-faxed in at the same second, arriving three minutes before four more of hornets, carrying a hundred more volunteers from Ardis and other survivor communities. The Moravec soldiers had offered their services for this raid months earlier, but Demon had vowed a year ago that he would free the old-style humans locked in Jerusalem's blue beam, all of Savi's ancient friends and Jewish relatives. And he still felt 
it was a human responsibility to do so. They had, however, accepted the long-term loan of combat suits, repeller backpacks, impact armor, and energy weapons. The hundred men and women in the Hornets, piloted by more of X who would not otherwise join the fight, were bringing in the weapons too heavy to carry in during Freefax. It had taken Demon and his team, humans and more of X alike, more than three weeks to check and double-check the specific GPS coordinates of the old city streets, avenues, plazas, and junctions, down to the inch, in order to plot the hundred Freefax arrival areas and designated landing sites for the Hornets. They waited until August, until the Jewish holiday of the Ninth of Av. Demon and his volunteers free-faxed in ten minutes after sunset, when the blue beam was at its brightest. As far as the Queen Mab's surveillance and aerial reconnaissance could tell them, Jerusalem was unique of all places on earth in that it was inhabited by both Voynix and Kalabani. In the old city, which was their target tonight, the Voynix occupied the streets north and northwest of the Temple Mount, in areas roughly equivalent to the ancient Muslim and Christian quarters, and the Kalabani filled the tight streets and buildings to the southwest of the Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa Mosque, in areas once called the Jewish Quarter and the Armenian Quarter. From the spy images, including deep radar, they estimated there were about 20,000 combined Voynix and Kalabani in Jerusalem. Hundred to one odds, Grayogi had said with a shrug. We've had worse. They faxed in almost silently, a mere disturbance in the air. Demon and his team appeared in the narrow plaza in front of the hotel, the western wall. It was still light enough to see, but Demon used his thermal imaging and deep radar in addition to his eyes to find targets. He estimated that there were around five hundred Kalabani lounging, sleeping, standing, and milling just in the space and on the walls and rooftops immediately west of the plaza. Within seconds, all of his ten squad commanders had checked in over the combat suit intercoms. Fire at will, he said. The energy weapons had been programmed to disrupt only living tissue, Kalabani or Voynix, but not to destroy real estate. As Demon targeted and fired, watching the running, leaping, long-clawed Kalabani go down or erupt into thousands of fleshy pieces, he was glad for that. They didn't want to destroy this particular village in order to save it. The old city of Jerusalem became a maelstrom of blue energy flashes, Kalabani screams, shouted radio calls, and exploding flesh. Demon and his squad had killed every target they could see when he saw by his visor chronometer that it was time for the hornets to arrive. He triggered his repeller pack and rose to the level of the Temple Mount. Demon was alone, this was no time to have the air full of people, and watched as the first two hornets swept in, landed, disgorged their people and cargoes, and then swooped out. Thirty seconds later, the last two hornets had arrived, and the combat-suited men and women were spilling across the stones of the mount, carrying their heavy weapons on tripods and repeller blocks. The two hornets swooped away. Temple Mount secured, Demon radioed to all his squad leaders. You may fly when ready. Stay out of the set lines of fire from the mount. Demon? sent a lion from his position above Bab al-Nazir in the old Muslim quarter. I can see masses of Voynix coming up the Via Dolorosa, and bunches of Calabani coming your way east on King David Street. Thanks, Elion. Deal with them as they arrive. The larger guns may engage as— Demon was deafened by heavy weapons fire from the mount just beneath his feet. The humans all along the walls and rooftops there were firing in all directions toward the advancing gray and green figures. Between the vertical blue beam and the thousands of blue flashes of energy weapon fire, all of old Jerusalem was bathed in an arc-welding blue glow. The filters on Demon's combat suit goggles actually dimmed a bit. All squads fire at will. Report any penetration in your sectors, said Demon. He tilted on the hovering backpack repellers and then slid through the air to the northeast to where the taller, more modern blue beam building rose just behind the dome of the rock. He was interested to find that his heart was pounding so wildly that he had to concentrate on not hyperventilating. 
They practiced this 500 times over the past two months, prefaxing into the mock-up of Jerusalem that the Moravecs had helped them build not far from Ardis. But nothing could have prepared Demon for a fight of this magnitude, with these weapons, in this city of all cities. Hannah and her squad of ten were waiting for him when he arrived at the beam building's sealed door. Demon landed, nodded at Lehman, Common, and Graogi, who were there in the soft twilight with Hannah, and said, Let's do it. Lehman, working quickly with his undamaged left hand, set the plastic explosive charge. The twelve humans stepped around the side of the metal alloy building while the explosion took the entire door off. The inside was not much larger than Demon's tiny bedroom back at Ardis, and the controls were, thank whatever god might be out there, almost as they'd surmised from reviewing all shared data available from the Taj Moira's crystal cabinet. Hannah did the actual work, her deft fingers flying over the virtual keyboard, tapping in the seven-digit codes whenever queried by the Blue Beam building's primitive AI. Suddenly a deep hum, mostly subsonic, rattled their teeth and bruised their bones. All of the displays on the AI wall flashed green and then died. Everyone out, said Demon. He was the last one to leave the beam building's anteroom, and not a second too soon. The anteroom, the metal wall and that entire side of the building folded into itself twice and disappeared, becoming a black rectangle. Demon, Hannah and the others had backed down onto the stones of the Temple Mount itself. And now they watched as the blue beam dropped from the sky, the hum growing deeper as it died, painfully so. Demon found himself shutting his eyes and gripping his hands into fists, feeling the dying subsonics through his gut and testicles as well as his bones and teeth. Then the low noise stopped. He pulled his combat suit cowl off, earphones and microphones still in place, and said to Hannah, Defensive perimeter here. As soon as the first person is out, call in the hornets. She nodded and joined the others where they were facing and firing outward from the high temple mount. At some time during the preparation for this night, someone, it might have been Ada, had joked that it would only be polite that Demon and the other raiders should memorize the faces and names of all of the 9,113 men and women captured in that blue beam 1,400 years ago. Everyone laughed, but Demon knew it would have been technically possible. The crystal cabinet in the Taj Moira had given Harmon much of that data. So over the past five months, since they'd decided how and when to do this, Demon had referred to those stored images and names. He hadn't memorized all 9,113 of them. He, like all the survivors, had been far too busy for that. But he was not surprised when he recognized the first man and woman to come stumbling out of that black rectangle door from the neutrino tachyon beam reassembler. Petra, said Demon, Pincus, welcome back. He grabbed the slim man and woman before they could fall, everyone emerging from the black door two by two like the animals from Noah's Ark Demon had time to notice, looked more stunned than sensible. The dark-haired woman named Petra, a friend of Savi's Demon knew, looked around in a drugged way and said, How long? Too long, said Demon, right this way, toward that ship, please. The first hornet had landed, carrying another thirty old styles whose job was just to accompany and help load the long lines of returning human beings. Demon watched as Steffe came up and led Petra and Pincus across the ancient stones toward the hornet ramp. Demon greeted everyone coming down the ramp from the beam building, recognizing many on sight. Third was the man named Graf, his partner who was also named Hannah, one of Savi's friends named Stephen, Abe, Kylie, Sarah, Caleb, William. Demon greeted them all by name and helped them the few steps to those others waiting to help them to the hornets. The Voynichs and Kalabani kept attacking. The humans kept killing them. In the rehearsals, it had taken them more than 45 minutes on a good evening to load 9,113 people onto hornets. Even given only seconds between one hornet being loaded and leaving and the next arriving. But this evening, while under attack, they did it in thirty-three minutes. 
All right, said Demon on all channels, everyone off the Temple Mount. The heavy weapons teams lugged their equipment into the last two hornets where they hovered near the east edge of the mount. Then those hornets were gone, following the dozens of others to the west, and it was just Demon and his original squads. Three or four thousand fresh Voinix coming from the direction of the Church of the Sepulchre, reported a lion. Demon pulled his cowl on and chewed his lip. It would be harder to kill the things with the heavy weapons gone. All right, he said over the command channel. This is Demon. Fax out now. Squad leaders, report when your squads have free faxed away. Grayogi reported his squad gone and faxed away. Adide reported and faxed away from her position on Bab al-Hadid Street. Bowman reported his squad gone from their position on Bab al-Gawanima, and then Bowman was gone. Lois reported from near the Lion's Gate and flicked out. Ele reported from the Garden Gate and was gone. Common reported his squad successfully faxed away. Common seemed to be enjoying this military stuff too much, Demon thought and then Common redundantly requested permission to free fax home. Get your ass out of here, Radio Demon. Oko reported her squad gone and followed them. Call reported in from below the Al-Aqsa Mosque and flicked out. Elian reported in, squad free faxed home and faxed himself away. Demon got his squad together, Hannah included, and watched as they flicked away one at a time from the growing shadows of the Western Wall Plaza. He knew that everyone was gone, that the beam building had been emptied, but he had to check. Tapping the repeller pack's controls on his palm with his middle finger, Demon flew up, circled the beam building, looked in the empty beam building's doorway to emptiness beyond, circled the empty dome of the rock and empty plaza, and then flew lower, wider circles, checking all the points in all four quarters of the old city where his squads had held the perimeter, while not losing a single human to the Voynix and Kalabani attacks. He knew he should go. The Voynix and Kalabani were rushing in through the ancient narrow streets like water into a hold ship, but he also knew why he was staying. The thrown rock almost took his head off. The combat suit's radar saved him, picking up the hurled object invisible in the twilight gloom and overriding the backpack's controls, sending demon dipping legs and feet over ass, riding him just yards above the pavement of the Temple Mount. He landed, activating all of his impact armor and raising his energy rifle. All of his suit senses and all of his human senses told him that the large, not-quite-human shape standing in the black doorway of the Dome of the Rock was no mere Kalabani. Demon, moaned the thing. Demon walked closer, rifle raised, ignoring the suit's targeting system's imperative to fire trying to control his own breathing and thoughts. Demon, the oversized amphibious shape in the doorway sighed. Thinketh, even so thou wouldst have him misconceive. Suppose this Caliban strives hard and ails no less. Would you have him hurt? I would have him dead, shouted Demon. His body was quivering with old rage. He could hear the rasp and scrape of thousands of Voynix and Kalabani scuttling and scurrying beneath them out. Come out and fight, Caliban! The shadow laughed. Thinketh, human hopes, the while that evil sometimes must mend as warts rub away, and sores are cured with slime, yes. Come out and fight me, Caliban! Conceiveth, Will he put his little rifle down and meet the acolyte of him in fair fight, hand and claw to hand and claw? Demon hesitated. He knew there would be no fair fight. A thousand Voynix and Kalabani would be up here on the Temple Mount in ten seconds. He could hear the scrabbling and scratching in the western wall plaza and on the steps already. He raised the rifle and clicked the targeting to auto, hearing the target confirmed tone in his earphones. Thinketh demon will not shoot, no, moaned Caliban in the Dome of the Rock's door shadows. He loveth Caliban, and his lord Setebos as enemies too much to draw. Oh, oh, a curtain o'er their world at once, yes? No, 
Demon must wait for another day to let the wind shoulder the pillared dust, to meet death's house of the move, and... Demon fired. He fired again. Voynix leaped to the walls of the Temple Mount in front of him. Calabani scrambled up the steps of the Temple Mount behind him. It was dark now in Jerusalem. Even the blue beam's glow, constant for 1,421 years, had gone out. The monsters owned the city once again. Demon didn't have to look through the rifle's thermal sights to know that he had missed, that Caliban had quantum teleported away. He would have to face the thing some other day or night in a situation much less advantageous to him than today's. Strangely, secretly in his heart of hearts, Demon was happy at this thought. Voynix and Calabani both leaped across the ancient stones of the Temple Mount at him. A second before their claws could reach him, Demon Freefaxed home to Ardis. 91. Seven and a half months after the fall of Ilium, Alice and Ulysses, his friends called him Sam, told their parents they were going to the Lake Shore drive-in to watch the double feature of To Kill a Mockingbird and Dr. No. It was October, and the Lake Shore was the only drive-in movie theater still open, since it had portable in-car heaters on the stands as well as speakers. And usually, or at least in the four months since Sam had gotten his solo driver's permit, the drive-in movie had sufficed for their passion. But tonight, this special night, they drove out through fields of harvest-ready corn to a private place at the end of a long lane. What if Mom and Dad asked me about the plot of the movies? asked Alice. She was wearing the usual white blouse, tan sweater loose over her shoulders, dark skirt, stockings, and rather formal shoes for a drive-in movie date. Her hair was tied back in a ponytail. You know about the book, To Kill a Mockingbird. Just tell them that Gregory Peck is good as Atticus Finch. Is he Atticus Finch? Who else could he be, said Sam, the Negro? What about the other movie? It's a spy movie about some British guy, James Bond, I think the guy's name is. The president likes the book the movie is based on. Just tell your dad that it was exciting, full of shooting and stuff. Sam parked his dad's 1957 Chevy Bel Air at the end of the lane, beyond the ruins and inside of the lake. They'd driven past the Lakeshore Drive-In and around the oversized pond that provided the lake for the theater's name. Far across the water, Sam could see the small rectangle of white that was the drive-in movie screen, and beyond that, the glow of their little town's lights against the low October sky. And much farther beyond that, the brighter glow of the real city to and from which their fathers commuted each day. Once upon a time, probably back during the Depression, there had been a farm at the end of this lane, but now the house was gone, only overgrown foundations remaining those and the trees lining the driveway in. The trees were losing their leaves. It was getting chilly as it got closer to Halloween. Can you leave the motor on? asked Alice. Sure, Sam started the engine again. They began kissing almost immediately. Sam pulled the girl to him, set his left hand on her right breast, and within seconds their mouths were warm and open and wet, their tongues busy. They'd discovered this pleasure only this summer. He fumbled with the buttons of her blouse. The buttons were too small, and they went the wrong way. She let the loose sweater fall and helped him with the most troublesome button, the one under her soft, curved collars. Did you watch the President's speech tonight on TV? Sam didn't want to talk about the President. Leaving the lowest buttons on her blouse buttoned, breathing rapidly, he slipped his hand inside her loose blouse and cupped her breast in its rather stiff little brassiere. Did you? asked Alice. Yeah, we all did. Do you think there's going to be war? No, said Sam. He kissed her again, trying to bring her back to the passion at hand, but her tongue had gone into hiding. When they broke apart long enough for her to pull the tails of her blouse out of her skirt, dropping the shirt behind her, her body and bra pale in the dim reflected light from the sky and in the yellow glow of the dashboard radio and dials, she said, my father says it could mean war. It's just a lousy quarantine, said Sam, both arms around her, his fingers fumbling with the still strange hooks and eyes of her brassiere. 
It's not like we're invading Cuba or anything, he added. He couldn't get the damn thing loose. Alice smiled in the soft light, put her hands behind her, and the bra miraculously fell free. Sam began nuzzling and kissing her breasts. They were very young breasts, larger and firmer than an adolescent girl's little bud breasts, but still not fully formed. The areoli were as puffy as the nipples. Sam noticed this in the light from the radio dial, and then he lowered his flushed face to nuzzle and suck again. Easy, easy, said Alice, not so rough. You're always so rough. Sorry, said Sam. He began kissing her again. This time her lips were warm, her tongue was present, and busy. He felt himself getting more excited as he pressed her back toward the passenger door of the Bel Air. The front seat was wider and deeper and softer than the Davenport in their parlor at home. He had to wiggle to get out from under the giant steering wheel, and he had to be careful. Even here, at the end of Miller's Lane, he didn't want to accidentally honk the horn. Lying half atop her, his erection pressing against her left leg, his hands busy on her breasts and his tongue busy finding her tongue, Sam became so excited that he almost ejaculated the first instant she set her long fingers on his corduroyed thigh. But what if the Russians do attack, Alice whispered when he raised his face for a moment to breathe. The car was too damned hot. He turned off the ignition with his left hand. Stop that, he said. He knew what she was doing. She'd chosen the track and line. She wanted him thinking about which one it might be. He wanted only to appreciate what the boy Sam was thinking and feeling. Ouch, said Alice. He had pressed her back so that her shoulders were against the large door handle. He was lowering his face toward her for more kissing when she whispered, Do you want to get in the back seat? Sam could hardly breathe. That phrase had been their signal the last weeks for the serious stuff not just getting to third base, which he had several times now with Alice, but going all the way, which they'd come close to twice but not quite achieved. Alice went around her side, prissily pulling her blouse on, but not buttoning it again, he noticed, and Sam went around the driver's side. The overhead light came on until they'd secured both the rear doors. Sam rolled his window down a bit so that he could have some air. He still seemed to be having a problem breathing normally, and also so he could hear any car approaching down Miller's Lane in case Barney happened to come down here in his old black-and-white police cruiser left over from before the war. The two had to get reintroduced all over again, but within moments he had his shirt open to feel her breasts against his chest, and Alice sprawled lengthwise on the wide seat, him half on her, half falling off, her legs partially raised, and his bent strangely because they were both taller than the back seat was wide. He slipped his right hand up her leg, feeling her own warm breath come more quickly on his cheek when he paused in kissing her. She was wearing stockings. Sam had never felt anything so soft. He felt the garter where the nylon stockings attached to the— oh, Come on, said Ulysses, laughing and speaking through the boy despite himself. This has to be an anachronism. Alice smiled up at him, and he saw the real woman through the girl's dilated pupils. It's not, she whispered, giving him the full length of her tongue now, and sliding her hand down, rubbing his erection through the slightly dampened corduroy. Honest, she said, still rubbing him. It's called a panty girdle, and it's what she wears. Pantyhose haven't been invented yet. Shut up, said Sam, closing his eyes as he kissed her and pressed his lower body against her playing hand. Shut up, please. He couldn't get the metal ring out from around the round snap stud that she later explained was called the garter. It just wouldn't move. Sam kept moving his hand from between her legs where the fabric was wet. He was sure he could feel her warming to him through the fabric. Back to the goddamned son-of-a-bitching garter thing. Alice giggled. I can take the whole thing off, she whispered. As she did so, Sam realized that they needed more room. He opened his driver's side rear door. The light blinded them. Sam! He reached up and switched off the overhead light. For a minute, neither of them moved. Two deer blinded in headlights. But when he could hear the wind through the late autumn leaves over the pounding of his heart, he leaned over her again. The distraction had kept him from coming too soon. 
He tasted her lips, lowered his face to her breasts and licked softly. She pulled his head closer. Her hand went lower, expertly undid his belt, unsnapped the top snap and tugged the zipper down too quickly for his peace of mind. He emerged unscathed and throbbing. Sam, she whispered, as he levitated into position above her. Her stockings and underpants were in a bunch under his knee. He almost panted as he shoved her skirt higher. What? Did you bring, you know, a thing? Oh, fuck that, he snapped through the boy's voice, not even pretending to be in character. She giggled, but he stopped that noise with an open-mouthed kiss. His heart threatened to break through his ribs as he shifted his weight and she opened her legs to him. He caught a glimpse of her dark skirt riding up almost to her bare breasts, of her pale thighs, of the vertical rather than triangular floss of darkness there between her thighs. Easy, whispered Alice as she reached down and found him. She cupped his scrotum expertly, ran her fingers up the length of his penis, captured the glands with her fingertips. Easy, Odysseus, she purred. I am no man, he whispered between pants. She was positioning him. The pre-seminal fluid at the tip of his penis was dampening her thighs as she maneuvered him to the best angle. He could feel the heat flow out of her. She squeezed him hard enough to make him gasp, but not hard enough to make the sixteen-year-old him come. How can you say that? she whispered into his mouth. When this proves otherwise. Alice set the swollen head of his penis against her moist and tight labia, then moved her hand up against his cheek. Sam caught the scent of her excitement on her own fingers, and that alone almost made him come. He hesitated this perfect second before continuing. The flash came from directly ahead of the car, beyond the drive-in movie screen, and it was not brighter than a thousand suns. It was brighter than ten thousand suns. It turned everything in the musky darkness into a photographic negative, all black blacks and pure whites. There was no noise, not yet. You have to be kidding, he said, poised above Alice, as if he was doing push-ups, with only the tip of his erection touching her right now. The city's forty miles away, whispered Alice, pulling him down, trying to pull him. We have a long time until the shock wave gets here. A long time. She gave him her mouth and set her hands solidly on his back and butt, pulling him closer. He considered resisting. To what purpose? This boy Sam was so excited that two or three thrusts in his beloved's perfect virginal cut would probably be all he could take before he exploded anyway. The incinerating shock wave and their youthful orgasms would probably arrive at the same instant, which he realized was almost certainly just as his ageless beloved had planned it. The light was fading some, still bright, bright enough to illuminate sixteen-year-old Alice's slight dusting of purple eyeshadow, and seeing that made him lower his face to hers for a final hot kiss as he began thrusting forward and in. 92. One year after the fall of Ilium. Helen of Troy awoke just after dawn to a dream memory of the sound of air raid sirens. She felt along the cushions of her bed, but her lover Hockenberry was gone, had been gone for more than a month now, and it was only the memory of his warmth that made her hunt for him each morning. She had yet to take another lover, although half the Trojans and Argives left here in New Ilium wanted her. She had her slave women, Hypsipyle included, bathe and perfume her. Helen took her time. These apartments in the rebuilt section near the pillar house near the fallen sea and gate were no comparison to her former palace, but the amenities of life were beginning to return. She used the last of her well-rationed, scented soap in the bath. Today was a special day. The joint council would be deciding on the expedition to Delphi. She had the slave girls dress her in her finest green silk gown and gold necklaces for the morning council meeting. It was still strange to see the Argives, Achaeans, Myrmidons, and other invaders in the Trojan council house. Both the Temple of Athena and the larger Temple of Apollo had crumbled that day of the fall, but the Trojan and Greek masons had erected a new palace where the rubble of Athena's temple had once been 
just north of the main avenue and not far from where Priam's palace had stood with its proud porches and pillars before the gods had bombed it into oblivion. This new palace, they had no other name for their central civic building, still smelled of fresh wood, cold stone, and paint, but it was bright and sunny this early spring day. Helen slipped in and took her place near the royal family next to Andromache, who gave her a brief smile and then turned her attention back to her husband. Hector was getting some gray in his dark brown curly hair and beard. Everyone had noticed it. Most of the women, Helen knew, thought it made him look even more distinguished if such a thing were possible. It was Hector's place to open the meeting, and he did so now, welcoming all the Trojan dignitaries and Achaean guests by name. Agamemnon was here, still strange, occasionally giving everyone that long, unfocused gaze he had worn for so many months after the fall. But he was lucid enough now to be heeded in the joint council discussions, and his tents were still full of treasure. Nestor was here, but he had to be carried to the city, carried up from the tent city of the Achaeans, undefended now on the beach, on a portable chair toted by four slaves. Wise old Nestor had never recovered the use of his legs after that final day of terrible battle on the beach. Also here from the Achaean camp, sixty thousand Greek warriors still lived enough to demand a vote, were little Ajax, Idomeneus, Polyxenus, Teucer, and the acknowledged, if not yet publicly acclaimed, leader of the Greeks, handsome Thrasymedes, Nestor's son. With the Greeks were several men whom Helen did not recognize, including a tall, gangly young man with curly hair and beard. At his introduction and welcome by Nestor, Thrasymedes glanced in the direction of Helen, and Helen lowered her eyes in modesty while allowing herself to blush slightly. Some habits died hard, even here on a different world and in a different time. Finally, Nestor introduced their emissary from Ardis, not Hockenberry, who had not yet returned from his trip west, but a tall, thin, quiet man named Bowman. No Moravex were present this morning. Having finished the welcomings, unnecessary introductions, and ritual words of assembly, Hector established the reasons for this council and what needed to be decided before they could adjourn. So today we must decide whether to launch the expedition to Delphi, concluded noble Hector, and if we do so, who shall go and who shall stay? We also have to decide what to do if it is possible to interdict the blue beam there and bring so many of the Argives' relatives back. Thrasymedes, your people were in charge of building the long ships. Would you tell the council what progress has been made? Thrasymedes bowed, his knee raised slightly on a step and his golden helmet on his leg. He said, As you know, our best surviving shipbuilder, Harmonides, literally son of the fitter, has been in charge of the construction. I shall let him report. Harmonides, the curly-bearded youth Helen had spotted a minute earlier, now stepped forward a few paces and then quickly looked down at his feet, as if he wished he hadn't made himself so conspicuous. He had a slight stammer as he spoke. The thirty long ships are ready. Each can carry fifty men, their armor and provisions adequate for breaching Delphi. We are also close to to completing the twenty other ships as commanded by the council. These ships are broader of beam than the long ships, perfect for, for transporting goods and people should we find such goods and people. Harmonides quickly stepped back into the group of Argives. Very good work, noble Harmonides, said Hector. We thank you and the council thanks you. I've inspected the ships, and they are beautiful, tight, firm, made with precision. And I wish to thank the Trojans for knowing where to find the best wood on the slopes of Mount Ida, spoke up the blushing Harmonides, but with pride this time and no hint of a stammer. So we now have ships to make the voyage, said Hector. Since the missing families on the mainland are Achaean and Argive, not Trojan, Thrasymedes has volunteered to lead the expedition back to Delphi. Would you tell us, Thrasymedes, your plans for that voyage? 
Tall Thrasymedes lowered his leg, holding his heavy helmet easily in one palm, Helen noticed. We propose to sail in the next week when the spring winds bless our voyage, said Thrasymedes, his low, strong voice carrying to the far ends of the large, pillared council chamber. All thirty ships and fifteen hundred picked men. Trojan adventurers are still invited if they want to see the world. There was some chuckling and good humor in the room. We shall sail south along the coast, past empty Coloni, continued Thrasymedes, then to Lesbos, then across dark waters to Chios, where we shall hunt and lay in fresh water, then west-southwest across the deep sea, past Andras and into the Genestius Strait, between Catsilus on the peninsula and the Isle of Sios. Here five of our ships will break away and sail upriver toward Athens, the men crossing on foot for the last way. They will hunt for human life there, and if they find none, they shall march to Delphi on foot, their ships returning and sailing past the Saronic Gulf after us. The twenty-five ships remaining to me shall sail southwest past Lacedaemonia, circumnavigating the entire Peloponnese, braving the straits between Cytherea and the mainland if the weather allows. When we spot Zacynthras off our port bows, we will approach the mainland once again, then east-northeast and east again deep into the Corinthian Gulf. Just past Sile and Locrians, and before we reach Boeotia, we shall sail into harbor, beach our boats, and walk to Delphi, where the Moravex and our artist friends assure us the Blue Beam Temple holds the living remnants of our race. The person named Bowman stepped into the center of the open space. His Greek was horribly accented. Much more so even than old Hockenberry's had been, thought Helen. And he sounded as much the barbarian as he dressed. But he made himself understood despite syntactical errors that would make the mentor of a three-year-old blush. It is a good time of year for this, said Bowman, the tall Ardisian. The problem is... If you do follow our procedures for bringing back the people trapped in the blue beam, what do you do with them? It's possible that the entire population of Ilium Earth was coded there, up to six million people, including Chinese, Africans, American Indians, pre-Aztecs. Excuse me, interrupted Thrasymedes. We do not understand these words, Bowman, son of Ardis. The tall man scratched his cheek. Do you understand the idea of six million? No one did. Helen wondered if this Ardisian was fully sane. Imagine thirty Iliums when its population was at its height, said Bowman. That is how many people may come out of the Temple of the Blue Beam. Most in the council chambers laughed. Helen noticed that neither Hector nor Thrasymedes did. This is why we're going to be there to help, said Bowman. We believe that you can repatriate your own people, the Greeks, with little problem. Of course, the houses and cities, temples and animals are gone, but there's much wild game, and you can breed the domesticated animal population up again in no time. Bowman paused, because most of the people were laughing or tittering again. Hector gestured for the Ardisian to continue without explaining his error. The tall man had used the word for fuck, as it applies only to humans— when he had talked of breeding up the number of domesticated animals. Helen found herself amused. Anyway, we'll be there, and the Moravex will provide transport home for those foreigners. He used the proper word, barbarians, but he obviously wanted another one. Thank you, said Hector. Thrasymedes, if all your many peoples are there, from the Peloponnese, from the many islands, such as Odysseus, Little Ithaca, from Attica and Boeotia, and Molossi and Obesti, and Caldesi and Badiai, and Thrace, all the other areas your far-flung Greeks call home, what will you do then? You will have all those people in one place, but no cities, oxen, homes, or shelters. Thrasymedes nodded. 
Double Hector, our plan will be to dispatch five ships back to New Ilium immediately to inform you of our success. The rest of us shall stay with those freed from the Blue Beam at Delphi, organizing safe trips for families back to their homelands, finding a way to feed and shelter everyone until order is established. That might take years, said Deiphobus. Hector's brother had never been a fan of the Delphi expedition. It may well take years, agreed Thrasymedes, but what else is there to do but attempt to free our wives, mothers, grandfathers, children, slaves, and servants? It is our duty. The Ardisian could fax there in a minute and free them in two, came the resentful voice from the couch where he sat, Agamemnon. Bowman stepped back into the open space. Noble Hector, King Agamemnon, nobles and worthies of this council, we could do as Agamemnon says. And some day you will also fax, not free fax as we Ardisians do, but fax through places called fax nodes. You're not near one here but you will discover one or more back in Greece. But I digress. We could fax to Delphi and free the Greeks in hours and days, if not minutes. But you will understand when I say it is not right for us to do this. They are your people. Their future is your concern. Some months ago, we freed a mere 9,000 some of our own people from another blue beam, and while we were grateful for the extra population, we found it difficult to care for even that few without much planning and anticipation. The world has too many Voiniks and Calabani roaming in it, not to mention dinosaurs, terror birds, and other oddities you will discover when you leave the safety of New Ilium. We and our Moravec allies will help you disperse the non-Greek population, if there is such in this blue beam, but the future of the Greek-speaking peoples must remain in your hands. This short speech, although barbaric in its grammar and syntax, was eloquent enough to earn the tall Ardition a round of applause. Helen joined in. She wanted to meet this man. Hector stepped into the center of the open area and turned in a full circle, meeting almost every individual's gaze. I call now for a vote, simple majority rule. Those who agree that Thrasymedes and his expedition volunteers should leave for Delphi on the next good wind and tide, raise your fists. Those against the expedition, hold your palms down. There were a little more than a hundred people in the joint council meeting. Helen counted seventy-three raised fists, including her own, and only twelve palms down, including Deiphobus and, for some reason, Andromache's. There was much celebration inside, and when the heralds announced the outcome to the tens of thousands in the central plaza and marketplace outside, the cheers echoed back off the new low walls of New Ilium. It was outside on the terrace that Hector came up to her. After a few words of greeting and comments on the chilled wine, he said, I want so badly to go, Helen. I can't stand the thought of this expedition leaving without me. Ah, thought Helen, this is the reason for Andromache's no vote. Aloud, she said, you cannot possibly go, noble Hector, the city needs you. Bah, said Hector, swallowing the last of his wine and banging the cup down on a building stone that had not yet been set in place. The city is under no threat. We've seen no other people in twelve months. We spent this time rebuilding our walls such as they are, but we shouldn't have bothered. There are no other people out there, not in this region of the wide earth, at least. All the more reason for you to remain and watch over your people, said Helen, smiling slightly. To protect us from these dinosaurs and terrible birds our tall Ardition tells us about. Hector caught the mischief in her eye and smiled back. Helen knew that she and Hector had always had this strange connection, part teasing, part flirting, part something deeper than a husband and wife's connection he said, "'You don't think your future husband will be adequate to protect our city from all threat, noble Helen?' She smiled again. "'I esteem your brother Deiphobus above most other men, my dear Hector, but I have not agreed to his marriage proposal.' "'Priam would have wished it,' said Hector. "'Paris would have been pleased at the thought.' "'Paris would have puked at the thought,' thought Helen. 
she said, Yes, your brother Paris would be happy to know that I married Deiphobus, or any noble brother in Priam's line. She smiled up at Hector again and was pleased to see his discomfort. Would you keep a secret if I tell you? he asked, leaning close to her and speaking almost in a whisper. Of course, she whispered back, thinking, if it is in my interest to do so. I plan to go with Thrasymedes and his expedition when it sails, Hector said quietly. Who knows if any of us will ever return? I will miss you, Helen. He awkwardly touched her shoulder. Helen of Troy set her smooth hand over his rough one, squeezing it between her soft shoulder and her soft palm. She looked deeply into his gray eyes. If you go on this expedition, noble Hector, I will miss you almost as much as will your lovely Andromache. But not quite so much as Andromache will, thought Helen, since I will be a stowaway on this voyage if it costs me the last diamond and the last pearl of my sizable fortune. Still touching hands, she and Hector walked to the railing of the council palace's long stone porch. The crowds in the marketplace below were going mad with happiness. In the center of the plaza, exactly where the old fountain had stood for centuries, the mob of drunken Greeks and Trojans milling together like brothers and sisters had pulled in a large wooden horse. The artifact was so large that it wouldn't have fit through the Sian Gate if the Sian Gate still stood. The lower, wider, topless gate, hastily erected near the place where the oak tree had stood, had no problem swinging wide for this effigy. Some wag in the mob had decided that this horse was to be the symbol for the fall of Ilium, and today, on the anniversary of that fall, they planned to burn the thing. Spirits were high. Helen and Hector watched, their hands still touching lightly, silently, but not without communication to each of them, as the mob set the torch to the giant horse, and the thing, made mostly of dried driftwood, went up in seconds, driving the mob back, bringing the constables running with their shields and spears, and causing the noblemen and women on the long porch and balconies to murmur in disapproval. Helen and Hector laughed aloud. 93. Seven years and five months after the fall of Ilium, Moira Quantum teleported into the open meadow, it was a beautiful summer's day. Butterflies hovered in the shade of the surrounding forest, and bees hummed above clover. A black belt soldier, Moravac, approached her carefully, spoke to her politely, and led her up the hill to where a small open tent, more a colorful canvas pavilion on four poles, actually, flapped gently in the breeze from the south. There were tables in the shade of the canvas, and half a dozen Moravacs and men bent over them, studying or cleaning the scores of shards and artifacts laid out there. The smallest figure at the table, he had his own high stool, turned, saw her, jumped down, and came out to greet her. Moira, what a pleasure, said Monmouth. Please do come in out of the midday sun and have a cold drink. She walked into the shade with the little Moravac. Your sergeant said that you were expecting me, she said. Ever since our conversation two years ago, said Monmouth. He went over to the refreshment table and came back with a glass of cold lemonade. The other Moravex and men there looked at her with curiosity, but Monmouth did not introduce her, not yet. Moira gratefully sipped the lemonade, noticed the ice that they must QT or fax in from Ardis or some other community every day, and looked down and over the meadow. This patch ran a hilly mile or so to the river, between the forest to the north and the rough land to the south. Do you need the Moravec troopers to keep away rubberneckers, she asked, curious crowds? More likely to interdict the occasional terror bird or young T-Rex, said Monmut. What on earth were the post-humans thinking, as Orfu likes to say? Do you still see Orfu much? Every day, said Monmut. I'll see him this evening in Artis for the play. Are you coming? I might, said Mora. How did you know that I was invited? You're not the only one who speaks to Ariel now and again, my dear. More lemonade? No, thank you. Moira looked at the long meadow again. More than half of it had its top several layers of soil removed, not haphazardly as from a mechanical earth mover, but carefully, lovingly, obsessively, 
the sod rolled back, strings and tiny pegs marking every incision. Small signs and numbers everywhere, trenches ranging from a few inches in depth to several meters. So, do you think you've found it at last, friend Monmut? The little Moravec shrugged. It's amazing how difficult it is to find precise coordinates for this little town in the records. It's almost as if some power had removed all references, GPS coordinates, road signs, histories. It's almost as if some force did not want us to find Stratford-on-Avon. Moira looked at him with her clear gray-blue eyes. And why would any power or force not want you to find whatever you're looking for, dear Monmouth? He shrugged again. It'd be just a guess, but I would say because they, this hypothetical power or force, didn't mind human beings loose and happy and breeding on the planet again, but they have second thoughts about having a certain human genius back again. Moira said nothing. Here, said Monmouth, drawing her over to a nearby table with all of the enthusiasm of a child. Look at this. One of our volunteers found this yesterday on Site 309. He held up a broken slab of stone. There were strange scratches on the dirty rock. I can't quite make that out, said Moira. We couldn't either at first, said Monmouth. It took Dr. Hockenberry to help us know what we were looking at. Do you see how this forms IUM? And here below, US? And AER? And here, ET? If you say so, said Moira, it does. We know what this is now. It's part of an inscription below a bust, a bust of him, that, according to our records, once read, Utico Palium, Genio Scoratum, Arte Maronum, Terra Tegit, Populus Myret, Olympus Habet. I'm afraid I'm a bit rusty on my Latin, said Moira. Many of us were, said Monmouth. It translates, The earth covers one who is a Nestor in judgment. The people mourn for a Socrates in genius. Olympus has a Virgil in art. Olympus, repeated Mara, as if musing to herself. It was part of an inscription under a bust the townspeople had made of him, and set in stone in the chancellery of Trinity Church after he was interred there. The rest of the inscription is in English. Would you like to hear it, Moira? Of course. Stay, passenger. Why goest by so fast? Read if thou canst, whom envious death hath plast. Within this monument Shakespeare, with whom quick nature died, whose name doth deck this tomb far more than cost. See all that he hath writ, leaves living art, but page to serve his wit. Very nice, said Moira, and quite helpful for your search, I would imagine. Monmouth ignored the sarcasm. It's dated the day he died, the 23rd of April, 1616. But you haven't found the actual grave. Not yet, admitted Monmouth. Wasn't there some headstone or inscription there as well? She asked innocently. Monmouth studied her face for a moment. Yes, he said at last. Something cut into the actual grave slab set over his bones. Didn't it say something about, oh, stay away, Moravex, go home? Not quite, said Monmouth. The grave slab is supposed to have read, Good friend, for Jesus' sake forbear to dig the dust enclosed here. Blessed be the man that spares these stones, and cursed be he that moves my bones. Doesn't that curse worry you a little? asked Moira. No, said Monmouth. You're confusing me with Orfu of Io. He's the one who watched all those universal flat film horror movies from the twentieth century. You know, Curse of the Mummy and all that. Still, said Moira. Are you going to stop us from finding him, Moira? asked Monmouth. My dear Monmouth, you must know by now that we don't want to interfere with you. The old styles, our new guests from Greece and Asia, with none of you. Have we thus far? Monmouth said nothing. Moira touched his shoulder. But with this project, don't you sometimes feel as if you're playing God? Just a little bit? Have you met Dr. Hockenberry? asked Monmouth. Of course. I spoke to him only last week. Odd he didn't mention that, said Monmouth. Thomas volunteers here at the dig at least a day or two every week. 
No, but what I meant to say was that the post-humans and the Olympian gods certainly played God when they recreated Dr. Hockenberry's body and personality and memories from bits of bone, old data files, and DNA. But he worked out all right. He's a fine person. He certainly seems to be, said Mara. And I understand he's writing a book. Yes, said Monmouth. The Moravec seemed to have lost his train of thought. Well, good luck again, said Moira, holding out her hand. And do give my best to prime integrator Astig Che when you see him next. Do tell him that I so enjoyed the tea we had at the Taj. She shook the little Moravec's hand and began to walk toward the line of trees to the north. Moira, called Monmouth. She paused and looked back. Did you say you were coming to the play tonight? called Monmouth. Yes, I think I will. Will we see you there? I'm not sure, said the young woman, but I'll see you there. She continued walking toward the forest. 94. Seven years and five months after the fall of Ilium. My name is Thomas Hockenberry, Ph.D., Hockenbush, to my friends. I have no friends alive who call me that or rather the friends who once might have called me that, Hockenbush, a nickname from my undergraduate days at Wabash College, have long since turned to dust on this world where so many things have turned to dust. I lived fifty-some years on that first good earth, and have been gifted with a bit more than twelve rich years in this second life, at Ilium, on Olympus, in a place called Mars, although I didn't know it was Mars until my last days there, and now back here, home on sweet earth again. I have much to tell. The bad news is that I have lost all the recordings I have made over the past twelve years as both scholic and scholar. The voice stones I handed to my muse with each day's observation of the Trojan War. My own scribbled notes, even the Moravec recorder I used to describe the last days of Zeus and Olympus. I lost them all. It doesn't matter, I remember it all, every face, every man and woman, every name. Those who know say that one of the wonderful things about Homer's Iliad is that no man died nameless in his telling. They all fell heavily, those heroes, those brutal heroes, and when they fell, they went down, as another scholar said, I'm paraphrasing here, they went down heavily, crashing down with all their weapons and their armor and their possessions and their cattle, and their wives and their slaves going down with them, and their names. No man died nameless or without weight in Homer's Iliad. If I tried to tell my tale, I would try to do as well. But where to start? If I am to be the chorus of this tale, willing or unwilling, then I can start wherever I choose. I choose to start it here by telling you where I live. I enjoyed my months with Helen in New Ilium while that city rebuilt itself, the Greeks helping after the agreement with Hector that the Trojans would help them build their long ships in return, once the city's walls were up again, once the city lived again. It never died. You see, Ilium Troy was its people. Hector, Helen, Andromache, Priam, Cassandra, Deiphobus, Paris, hell, even that ornery Hypsipyle. Some of those people died, but some survived. The city lived as long as they did. Virgil understood that. So I can't be Homer for you, and I can't even be Virgil telling the tale from the time of the fall of Troy. Not enough time has passed for that part to become much of a story. Although I hear that might be changing. I'll be watching and listening as long as I am living. But I live here now, in Artist Town. Not Artist. A big house has gone back up on the broad meadow far up the hill a mile and a half from the old fax pavilion, a big house very near where Ardis Hall once rose, and Ada lives there yet with her family. But this place is Ardis Town, no longer Ardis. There are a few more than 28,000 of us here in Ardis Town now, according to the last tax census taken just five months ago. There is a community up on the hill scattered around Ada's new home of Artis House, but most of the town is down here, spread along the new road that runs from the Fax Pavilion down along the river. Here is where the mills are, and the real marketplace, and the tanners' smelly buildings, and the printing press and paper, 
and too many bars and whorehouses, and two synagogues, and one church that might best be described as the First Church of Chaos, and some good restaurants and the stockyards would smell almost as bad as the tannery, and a library, I helped bring that into being, and a school, although most of the children still live in or around Artist House. Most of the students in our artist town are adults learning to read and write. About half our residents are Greek and half are Jewish. They tend to get along, most days. The Jews have the advantage of being fully functioned, that is, they can free fax wherever the hell they want to go, whenever the hell they want to do it. I can do that as well, not fax, but QT. It's in my cells and DNA, you know, written there by whoever or whoever designed me. But I don't QT as much anymore. I like slower forms of transportation. I do help Monmouth with his Find Will project, at least once a week if I can. You've already heard about that. I don't think he ever will find his will, and I suspect he believes that also. It's become a sort of hobby for him and Orfu of Io, and I help out in the same spirit of what the hell. None of us, not even Monmouth, I think, believes that Prospero, Moira, Ariel, any of the powers that be, even this quiet we keep hearing so much about, are going to allow our little Moravec to find and recombine the bones and DNA of William Shakespeare. I don't blame the powers that be for feeling threatened. The play is going on up at Artists this evening. You've heard about that as well. Many of us in Artist Town are going up the hill to it, although I confess the hill is steep. The road and stairs are dusty, and I may pay fivepence to ride up in one of the steam coaches that Hannah's company runs. I just wish the damned things weren't so noisy. Speaking of finding and not finding someone, I don't believe I've told you how I found my old friend Keith Neitenhelzer. The last I'd seen of my friend, he'd been with a prehistorical Indian tribe in the wilderness of what would once be Indiana, say in three thousand more years. It was a hell of a place for him, and I felt guilty because I'd put him there. The idea was to keep him safe during the war between the heroes and the gods, but when I went back to look for old Neitenhelzer, the Indians were gone, and so was he. And Patroclus, a very pissed-off Patroclus, was wandering around there somewhere as well, and I suspected that Neitenhelzer had not survived. But I free-faxed to Delphi three and a half months ago when Thrasymedes, Hector, and his crowd of adventurers interdicted the Delphi Blue Beam, and lo and behold, in about the eighth hour of people emerging stunned from that little building, it reminded me of the old circus act where a tiny little car would drive up and fifty clowns would climb out. About eight hours into the people, mostly Greeks, emerging from that building, here comes my friend Neitenhelzer. We always called each other by our last names. Neitenhelzer and I bought this place where I'm sitting and writing this now. We're partners. Please note, I mean business partners and good friends, of course, but not partners in the strange... 21st century use of that word when it came to two men. I mean, I didn't go from Helen of Troy to Neitenhelzer of Artist Town. I have problems, but not in that particular arena of confusion. I wonder what Helen would think of our tavern. It's called Dombey and Son. The name was Neitenhelzer's suggestion, far too cute for my taste, and it gets a lot of business. It's fairly clean compared to the other places strung along the riverbank here like shingles overhanging an old roof. Our barmaids are barmaids and not whores, at least not here or on our time or in our tavern. The beer is the best we can buy. Hannah, who is, I'm told, Artis's first millionaire of the new era, owns another company that makes the beer. Evidently brewing was something she learned about when studying sculpture and metal pouring. Don't ask me why. Do you see why I hesitate to tell this epic tale? I can't keep my storytelling on a straight line. I tend to wander. Perhaps I'll bring Helen here some day and ask her what she thinks of the place. But rumor has it that Helen cut her hair, dressed up like a boy, and went off on the Delphi adventure with Hector and Thrasymedes, with both men following her around like puppies after a bone. Another reason I hesitate to begin telling this epic tale. I was never worth a damn with metaphors or similes. As Neitenhelzer once said, I'm tropically challenged. Never mind. Rumor has it, hell. 
I know Helen is with the Delphi expedition. I saw her there. She looks good in short hair and with a tan, really good. Not like my Helen, but healthy and very beautiful. I could tell you more about my place and more about artist town, what politics looks like when it's in its infancy, just about as useless and smelly as an infant, or what the people are like here, Greeks and Jews, functioned and non-functioned, believers and cynics, but that's not part of this tale. Also, as I will discover later this evening, I'm not the real teller. I'm not the chosen bard. I know that makes no sense to you now, but wait just a while here and you'll see what I mean. These last eighteen years have not been easy for me, especially not the first eleven. I feel as scarred and pitted psychologically and emotionally as old Orfu of Io's shell is physically. He lives up the hill at Ardis most of the time. You will see him a little later, too. He's going to the play tonight, but he always has an appointment with the kids each afternoon. That's what tipped me off to the fact that even all my years as scholar and scholic did not make me the chosen one to tell this particular tale when the time comes to tell it. Yes, these last eighteen years, especially the first eleven, have been tough, but I guess I feel richer for them. I hope you do when you hear the tale. If you don't, it's not my fault. I abdicate in the telling, although my memories are free for anyone who wants to borrow them. I apologize. I have to go now. The after-work crowd is coming in. The daytime tannery shift is just getting off. Can you smell them? One of my barmaids is sick, and another has just eloped with one of the young Athenians who chose to come here after Delphi, and, well, I'm short-handed. My bartender comes in for the evening shift in forty-five minutes, but until then, I'd better draw the beers and slice the roast beef for the sandwiches myself. My name is Thomas Hockenberry, Ph.D., and I think the Ph.D. stands for pouring his draft. Sorry, humor never was except for a few literary puns and belabored jokes my strong point. I'll see you at the afternoon storytelling before the play. 95. Seven years and five months after the fall of Ilium. On the day of the play, Harmon had business in the dry valley. After lunch, he dressed in his combat suit and thermskin, borrowed an energy weapon from the artist's house armory, and free-faxed down there. The excavation of the post-human stasis dome was going well. Walking between the huge excavation machines, avoiding the downblast of a transport hornet hauling things north, it was hard for Harmon to believe that eight and a half years earlier he'd come to this same dry valley with young Ada, the incredibly young Hannah, and the pudgy boy-man demon, in search of clues about the wandering Jew. The mystery woman he discovered was named Savi. Actually, part of the blue stasis dome had been buried directly under the boulder where Savi had left her scratched clues, leading them to her home on Mount Erebus. Even then, Savi had known that Harmon was the only old-style human on Earth who could read those scratches. The two supervisors on the stasis dome excavation here were Raman and Alcinous. They were doing a good job. Harmon went down the checklist with them to make sure they knew which gear was destined for which community. The bulk of the energy weapons were destined for Hughestown and Chome. The thermskins were going to Bellenbad. The crawlers were promised to Ulanbat and the Loman estate. New Ilium had made a strong bid for the older flechette rifles. Harmon had to smile at this. Ten more years and the Trojans and Greeks would be using the same technology as the old styles, even using the pavilion nodes to fax everywhere. Some of the Delphi group had already discovered the node near Olympus, the ancient town where the games were held, not the mountain. Well, he thought the only solution was to stay ahead of them in technology and everything else. It was time to go home, but first Harmon had one stop he wanted to make. He shook hands with Alcinous and Raman and Freefaxed away. Harmon had come back to the Golden Gate at Machu Picchu, a place where he had been given his life back seven and a half years earlier. He Freefaxed not to the bridge itself, but to a ridge line across the valley from the bridge and the high ruins on the terrace of Machu Picchu. He never tired of looking at the ancient structure, 
the green habitation globules hardly visible from this distance, but he'd come back not just out of sentiment. He was to meet someone here. Harmon watched the early afternoon clouds shift up the valley from the direction of the waterfall. For a while, the sunlight turned the mists to gold, half obscuring the ruins of Machu Picchu, making them appear as half-glimpsed stepping stones there beyond the old bridge's span. Everywhere Harmon looked, life was winning its anti-entropic battle against chaos and energy loss. The grass on the hillsides, the canopy of trees in the mist-shrouded valley, the condors circling slowly on thermals, the tatters of blowing moss on the suspension cables of the bridge itself, even the rust-colored lichen on the rocks near Harmon. As if to distract him from thoughts about life and living things, a very artificial spaceship rocketed from south to north across the sky, its long contrail slowly breaking up in the jet stream high above the Andes. Before Harmon could be sure of the make and model of the ship, the gleaming speck was gone over the northern horizon behind the ruins, trailed by three sonic booms. It had been too large and too fast to be one of the hornets hauling gear north from the dry valley. Harmon wondered if perhaps it was Demon, returning from one of their joint expeditions with the Moravex, plotting and recording the decreasing quantum disturbances between Earth system and Mars. We have our own spacecraft now, thought Harmon. He smiled at his own hubris at even thinking such a thing, but the thought still made him warm inside. Then he reminded himself that we have our own spacecraft, but we can't yet build our own spacecraft. Harmon hoped he would live long enough to see that. This led his thoughts to the search for the rejuvenation vats in the polar and equatorial rings. Good afternoon, said a familiar voice behind him. Harmon raised the energy weapon out of habit and training, but lowered it even before he'd fully turned. Good afternoon, Prospero, he said. The old magus stepped out of a niche in the rocks. You're wearing a full combat suit, my young friend. Did you expect to find me armed? Harmon smiled. I'll never find you without weapons. If one counts wit as a weapon, said Prospero. Or guile, said Harmon. The magus moved his veined old hands as if in defeat. Ariel said you wished to see me. Is it about the situation in China? No, said Harmon. We'll deal with that later. I came to remind you about the play. Ah, said Prospero, the play. You've forgotten or decided not to come, said Harmon. Everyone will be disappointed except your understudy if you're not coming. Prospero smiled. So many lines to learn, my young Prometheus. Not so many as you gave us, said Harmon. Prospero opened his hands again. Shall I tell the understudy that he has to go on? asked Harmon. He'll be thrilled to do so. Perhaps I would like to attend after all, said the Magus. But must it be as a performer, not as a guest? For this play, it must be as a performer, said Harmon. When we do Henry the Fourth, you can be our honored guest. Actually, said Prospero, I've always wanted to play Sir John Falstaff. Harmon's laugh echoed off the crags and cliff face. So I can tell Ada that you'll be there and we'll stay for refreshments and conversation afterward? I look forward to the conversation, said the solid hologram, if not to the stage fright. Well, said Harmon, break a leg. He nodded and freefaxed away. At Artis' house he checked in his weapon and the combat suit, pulled on canvas jeans and a tunic, slipped on light shoes and walked out to the North Meadow where final preparations were going on at the playhouse. Men were rigging the colored lights that would hang over the rows of freshly sawed wooden seats and over the beer gardens and in the trellises. Hannah was busy testing the sound system from the stage. Some of the volunteers were slapping a final coat of paint on backdrops and someone kept drawing the curtain to and fro. Ada saw him and tried walking with their two-year-old Sarah, but the toddler was tired and fussy, so Ada swept her up and carried her up the grassy hill to her father. Harmon kissed both of them and then kissed Ada again. She looked back at the stage in rows of seats, pulled a long strand of black hair out of her face and said, 
the Tempest? Do you really think we're all ready for this? Armin shrugged, then put his arm around her shoulders. It was next. Is our star really coming? she asked, leaning back against him. Sarah whimpered and shifted position a little bit so that her cheek was touching both her parents' shoulders. He says he is, said Harmon, not believing it himself. It would have been nice if he'd rehearsed with the others, said Ada. Well, we can't ask for everything. Can't we? said Ada, giving him the look that had typed her as the dangerous sort to Harmon more than eight years ago. A Sony rocketed low over the trees and houses, sweeping low toward the river and the town. I hope that was one of the idiot adult males and not one of the boys, said Ada. Speaking of boys, said Harmon, where's ours? I didn't see him this morning, and I want to say hello. He's on the porch getting ready for story time, said Ada. Ah, uh, story time, said Harmon. He turned to walk toward the dell in the south meadow where story time usually took place, but Ada gripped his arm. Harmon, he looked at her. Monmouth arrived a while ago. He says that Moira may be coming to the play tonight. He took her hand. Well, that's good, isn't it? Ada nodded. But if Prospero is here and Moira, and you said you invited Ariel, although he wouldn't play the part, what if Caliban comes? He's not invited, said Harmon. She squeezed his hand to show that she was serious. Harmon pointed to the sights around the playhouse, trellised beer gardens, and house where the guards would be posted with their energy rifles. But the children will be at the play, said Ada, the people from the town. Harmon nodded, still holding her hand. Caliban can QT here any time he wants, my love. He hasn't done so yet. She nodded slightly, but she did not release his hand. Harmon kissed her. Elian has been rehearsing Caliban's moves and lines for five weeks, he said. Be not afeard. This isle is full of noises, sounds and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. I wish that were always so, said Ada. I do too, my love. But we both know you better than I, that it's not the case. Shall we go watch John and Joy Story Hour? Orfu of Aya was still blind, but the parents were never afraid he'd bump into something or hit anyone, even as the eight or nine boldest children of artists piled on his huge shell, climbing barefoot to find a perch. The tradition had become for the kids to ride Orfu down to the dell for the story hour. John, at a little over seven, one of the oldest, sat at the highest point on that shell. The big Moravec proceeded slowly on its silent repellers, moving almost solemnly, except for the explosion of giggles from the children riding and the shouts from the other children trailing behind, carrying them from the porch down past the old elm to the dell between the bushes and the new houses. In the shallow depression, magically out of sight of the houses and other adults except for the parents of some of those here, the children clambered off and sprawled on the banks of the grassy bowl. John sat the closest to Orfu as he usually did. He looked back, saw his father, and waved, but did not come back to say hello. The story came first. Harmon, still standing with Ada, Sarah snoring in his arms now, Ada's arm having almost fallen asleep noticed Monmouth standing near the line of hedges. Harmon nodded, but the small Moravec's attention was on his old friend and the children. "'Tell the Gilgamesh story again,' shouted one of the bolder six-year-old boys. The huge crab monster slowly moved its carapace back and forth as if shaking its head no. "'That story's finished for now,' rumbled Orfu. "'Today we start a new one,' the children cheered. This one is going to take a long time to tell, said Orfu, his rumble sounding reassuring and engaging even to Harmon. The children cheered again. Two of the boys tumbled and rolled down the little hill together. Listen carefully, said Orfu. One of his long articulated manipulators had carefully separated the boys and set them gently on the slope, a few feet apart. Their attention turned immediately to the big Moravex booming, mesmerizing voice. Rage! Sing, goddess, sing the rage of Peleus, son Achilles, murderous, doomed. Sing of the rage that cost the Achaeans countless losses, 
hurling down into Hades' dark house so many sturdy souls, great fighters' souls, heroes' souls, but also made their bodies carrion, feasts for the dogs and birds, even as Zeus's will was done. Begin, O oh muse, when the two first argued and clashed, the great king Agamemnon, lord of men, and the brilliant godlike Achilles. Acknowledgements. I would like to thank Jean-Daniel Breck for his permission to use the details of one of his favorite walks down the Avenue Dominil and the rest of that promenade planté. A full description of this delightful walk can be found in Jean-Daniel's essay Green Tracks in the Time Out Book of Paris Walks, published by Penguin. I also would like to thank Professor Keith Neitenhauser for his suggestion of the Renoir as creator quote from the Guermont Way. Finally, I would like to thank Jane Catherine Simmons for permission to reprint her poem Stillborn, as it appears on page 571. End of Olympus by Dan Simmons D-A-N-S-I-M-M-O-N-S -M -M Read by Fred Major in the studios of the American Printing House for the Blind, Louisville, Kentucky, for the Library of Congress, June 2006. Published by Harper Collins Publishers, 10 East 53rd Street, New York, New York, 10022. www.eosbooks.com Further reproduction or distribution in other than a specialized format is prohibited. End of book.